Hi, I'm USA Today best-selling author Jennifer Youngblood. Thanks for joining me today to listen to Promise Me Love. Be sure to subscribe to my channel so I can continue putting my books on YouTube where you can watch them for free. Promise Me Love is the first one of my books that was ever made into an audiobook. Chloe Kinsley struggles to put her life back together after her fiancé Dan is killed. But that's not easy considering that she keeps seeing Dan's ghost. Is her imagination running wild or is Dan reaching out to her? Just when she thinks her life can't get any more complicated, she gets caught up in a love triangle with two very different brothers who are equally commanding and attractive. Will the ghost of the past prevent Chloe from finding true love? Or will the promise of a new love shine through in the end? Chapter 1 The wedding was destined to be the event of the season, maybe even the event of the year. At least that was according to the society page of the Beaufort Gazette, the authoritative social voice of the region. Of course, anything involving her fiancé's parents, the Thurmans, was big news in the small antebellum town of Beaufort, South Carolina. The Thurmans were akin to royalty, with their long line of blood ancestry that ran bluer than the Atlantic. Chloe looked disdainfully at her reflection in the full-length mirror. Too bad the Thurman's social standing didn't equate to good taste in clothing. Why had she agreed to wear this horrible wedding dress? The once white silk had aged or mellowed to a warm vanilla as her mother-in-law described it. This dress is gross! I look like a lump of old mozzarella cheese, she moaned. Her mother stepped up behind her and began fluffing the sleeves. Oh, it's not that bad, she cooed, but the tone in her voice said otherwise. You could always tell Jane you changed your mind and want to wear your own dress. Every girl deserves to wear the dress of her choice on her wedding day. I'm sure she'll understand. I seriously doubt that, Chloe muttered, rolling her eyes. It certainly seemed better days, her mother quipped. Better days? She looked like she was wearing a funeral dress, not to mention the fact that it was squeezing her in two. They could barely get the thing zipped. If only she didn't have to breathe. She gulped in a shallow breath at the thought and felt the fabric stretch in protest. What am I going to do? Dan's going to take one look at me and want to run back to Afghanistan. He'll think you're beautiful, honey, no matter what you're wearing. Chloe ran her hands through her hair. This thing is hideous. I hate it. Well, it's not the most attractive dress. It's just so old and ugly. Why don't you let me talk to Jane? Surely she'll understand. She pointed. Look, the waist is a little snug. Yeah, you do that, Mom. You tell Dan's mom and explain to her why I can't walk down the aisle in a dress that has been in the Thurman family for generations. She made such a big deal about giving it to me and told me this long story about how she wore it and how her mother-in-law wore it and so on. Her mother started chewing her bottom lip. And all these women wear the same size? What size is this thing, anyway? A size six? I haven't the foggiest, but it feels like a size four to me. It's so tight, I can hardly breathe. Chloe turned sideways and pressed her stomach with her hands and looked at her reflection critically. I guess I could not eat for a month. Her mother laughed. I think it'll take more than a dress to separate you from those chocolate chip cookies you're always making. Mom, that's rude. I'm just saying. She did have a point. A warm cookie with a scoop of vanilla bean ice cream was sounding good right about now. Chloe turned and faced herself in the mirror. Maybe I should just wear the stupid thing and make everybody happy. Her mother put her hands on Chloe's shoulders. This is your wedding day, not Jane's. This day belongs to you and Dan, and I can assure you the last thing in the world Dan will be worried about is which dress you're wearing. I'll talk to Jane. She's a reasonable woman, she frowned. I think, she scratched her head. Now let's get this horrid thing off you. Gladly, her mother went to unzip it. The zipper came halfway down and then stopped. Uh-oh, 
What's wrong? It's stuck. Chloe contorted herself in an attempt to look at her back. You're kidding, right? No, unfortunately, I'm not. Chloe threw her hands up in the air. Great, now what? She could feel the blood pumping into her cheeks, and she was starting to sweat. Calm down. Let's try moving it up to see if we can start it all over again. She felt the dress tug, but the zipper wouldn't budge. Tears sprang to her eyes. I should have never tried to put this stupid thing on, she growled. I hate this dress. Chloe, calm down. You're not helping the situation. What am I supposed to do, Mom? Can you try and shimmy it off? If we could just get your arms out of the sleeves. They tried to push her arms out, but it was like trying to push a hot dog through a pinhole. I'll get this thing off if I have to. The sound of the fabric tearing stopped her cold. Oh my gosh! She looked down. The right sleeve was ripped at the seam. Oh no! Oh no! Stop! Don't move a muscle. I'll be right back. Her mom left the room. Chloe looked at herself in the mirror. She looked so ridiculous with the dress half on and half off that she would have laughed were it not for the crying. What a mess! How was she going to explain this to Dan's mom? So much for scoring brownie points with the mother-in-law. At least Dan was coming home next week. If she could just focus on him instead of all these stupid wedding details that were consuming her life. There was a time when she'd look forward to planning her wedding, but now she just wanted to get it over with. It had been a long nine months without Dan. They were fortunate in that they were able to Skype a couple of times a week. The rest of the time they corresponded through email. Dan had seemed distant and guarded when she talked to him night before last, and she couldn't shake the feeling that something was wrong. She knew he was in constant danger and tried not to dwell on it for fear that it would drive her crazy. He wasn't allowed to divulge anything pertaining to his assigned mission, and she learned not to press him about it. But this was different. Personal. What was it that he wasn't telling her? Her imagination had been running wild the way it always did, and she'd begun to fear all sorts of things. Like maybe he was having second thoughts about the wedding. Hot prickles covered her and then went cold. What if he didn't love her anymore? She felt something soft rub against her leg and heard the familiar hum like the sound of a faint motor. She looked down to see her cat, Beastie. She'd named him that when he was a kitten because of the loud purring, but now that he was a full-grown cat, the name was even more appropriate. He weighed 20 pounds. She'd tried putting him on a diet, but nothing worked. He wolfed down everything that was put in front of him and then some. With a thick coat of orange and white fur, he was a dead ringer for an overstuffed Garfield. Forcefully, he rubbed his head against her leg, purring so loudly that she swore she could feel the vibration in her chest. Hey, boy, I see you. I just can't bend down right now because I'm stuffed in a straitjacket. Her mother stepped back into the room. Okay, here we go. Chloe gawked. What are you doing with those scissors? Cutting you out of the dress before you rip the thing to shreds. Mom, you can't cut this dress. Her mother's hands went to her hip. Have another solution? Chloe's shoulders fell. No. I'll cut it down the zipper, and then I'll take it to the alteration shop and have them replace it. They can fix the sleeve, too, and then it'll be as good as new, she grimaced. Poor choice of words. It'll be as good as it was before. Chloe felt a rush of love for her feisty mother, Naomi, who always seemed to have a solution for everything. She swallowed hard and asked her the question she'd been pondering for the past month. Do you think Dan and I are rushing things? I mean, he comes home next week, and then the wedding's three weeks later. Honey, I can't answer that. Only you can. Do you love him? With all my heart. Naomi smiled. Then that's your answer. After the dress fiasco, Chloe decided to take her mother's advice and take a much-needed nap. She closed her eyes and let her mind drift to her favorite topic— Dan. Her mom was always talking about the miracle of unexpected blessings, and that's what Dan had been. She still chuckled, 
remembering how devastated she was when her dad announced at the beginning of her senior year in high school that they would have to move because his company was transferring him to a branch of the corporate office in South Carolina. Then Chloe met Dan. From the moment she stepped out of chemistry class and saw him walking down the hall, she knew that he was the one. After they graduated high school, Dan went to Georgia Tech to pursue a degree in electrical engineering, and she went to the Art Institute in Atlanta to study interior design. It worked out beautifully. The close proximity of the universities allowed them to spend their weekends and holidays together, and Chloe looked forward to the day when they would both graduate and get married. As far as Chloe was concerned, their future was all planned out. And then, out of the blue, Dan announced a month after his graduation from college that he was joining the Marines. Postponing the wedding had been a big deal to her mother. She and Chloe had been planning it since Chloe was a freshman in college. Her mother had already designed Chloe's dress on paper. They had chosen the colors and decided on which type of flowers to use. Of course, that was before they realized that Chloe was doomed to wear the handed-down lump of cheese dress that was a size too small. She walked over and looked out at the giant sycamore tree, shaking and shivering in the wind from the approaching summer storm. The air whipping in through the open window felt good against her hot cheeks. She didn't know how long she had slept before she felt him beside her. He was right there, almost as though he'd never left for Afghanistan. She breathed in his familiar scent that was a combination of musky sandalwood cologne and those soft peppermint sticks that he loved. Diane? She opened her eyes and then rubbed them, not trusting what she was seeing. A smile broke over her face. Diane, she breathed in. You're home. Her heart leapt for joy. I missed you so much. But wait, something was wrong. Her mind was playing tricks on her. When did he get home? She reached out to touch his sandy hair that was casting gold flecks like it did when the sun hit him. But there was only air where he should have been. Dan, come back, she cried. Dan! She awoke to find the pillow wet from her tears. And then she saw the rain splattering in through the open window. She got out of bed, closed the window, and then rubbed down the goosebumps on her arms. Her pulse was still beating rapidly. The dream had seemed so real that she had an uncanny impression that if she turned too quickly, she might catch a glimpse of Dan standing beside her. She caught a trace of sandalwood in the air. Dan's cologne? A shiver ran up her spine, and she glanced out the window at the ominous sky and to the sycamore tree that was practically turning cartwheels in the wind. She closed her eyes and took a deep breath. It was just a dream, she told herself all the while trying to understand why she was feeling so unsettled. She went to the dresser, pulled out the middle drawer, and grabbed her nail polish. Then she sat down in the middle of the bed and began to paint her toenails. Doing something normal helped calm her nerves. That is, until a crack of thunder made her jump. She gasped when the bottle toppled and liquid spilled across the white comforter. Bright red polish. Bright red blood. Dan's blood spilling across the hot white sand. Get a grip! Where had that image come from? She looked up when her mother came into the room. Hey, Mom, I spilled my nail polish. She started explaining, then her voice trailed off when she saw the odd expression on her mother's face. Her heart began to pound. What's wrong? It's Dan, her mother whispered, slumping down on the bed. Chloe jumped up. What's wrong? They said it was a roadside bomb. Her mother's mouth was still moving, but Chloe didn't hear a word. Everything went black. Looking back later, Chloe wasn't sure how she made it past those first few days, and then when things didn't seem like they could possibly get any worse, Dan's mom Jane collapsed after the funeral and was rushed to the emergency room. Chloe put off going to see Jane as long as she possibly could, but eventually the day came that she could no longer postpone the inevitable. I'm going with you, her mother said. Chloe didn't argue. She needed all the emotional support she could get. It was hard for her to believe Dan was gone. The funeral had been closed casket, which made matters worse in some ways because she couldn't even get a last look at him. It was like he'd vanished into thin air. 
Are you ready to go inside? Chloe looked at her mom and then back at the venerable old house with the spacious front porch and ivy trailing up the wide columns. It had always seemed so charming and inviting in the past. Now, the closed gate at the head of the sidewalk looked like a fortress that she could never pass. Dan's world was closed to her forever. Julian, Dan's sister, answered the door and gave Chloe a cold fish hug, involving as little body contact as possible, before quickly releasing her and ushering them into the living room where they found Jane sitting on the couch. She was dressed impeccably, in a deep purple pantsuit, but grief had left an indelible mark on the stately woman's features, making her look much older than Chloe remembered. Tears welled in Chloe's eyes when they embraced, and she let them flow freely down her cheeks. "'Thanks for coming,' Jane said, her cultured voice heavy with sorrow. Chloe nodded. They sat and reminisced about Dan, even though they knew that no amount of talk could help ease the pain. Everything in the room screamed Dan and brought back so many memories that she half expected him to walk through the door any minute. "'He's dead!' she told herself fiercely. He's never coming back. He loved you, Jane said. Chloe bit her lower lip to stay the emotion and looked down at the floor. I know, she whispered. I loved him too. I want you to know that you will always be a part of this family. You are Dan's world, his everything. Julian scoffed and it had the same effect as a shotgun going off in the still room. Chloe's head shot up. Is that really what she did? Scoffed? She and Julian had never gotten along, but this was too much. Chloe glanced sideways at her mother and saw her jaw tense the way it always did before she went on the warpath. Oh, no. Naomi Kensley was no cultured debutante like the wilting Jane Thurman, and she certainly had no qualms about getting to the heart of the matter, regardless of how tactless her methods might appear. Naomi scooted to the edge of her seat. Chloe put her hand on her mom's arm in the hope of preventing her from causing a scene. But it was a futile gesture because her mom wasn't about to let Julian's antics slide. "'What's going on here?' Naomi wanted to know. Don't mind Julian, Jane said. We're all trying to deal with this the best we can. Julian's face went dark. Is that what we're trying to do, Mother? Because it seems to me like you're doing something else. That's enough, Julian. Jane's face grew whiter than the columns outside, and Chloe feared the woman was going to pass out. Jane reached for a tissue, but her hands were shaking so badly that she could barely pull one from the box. Julian glared at her mother. Why don't you tell them the truth? Jane's mouth disappeared into a thin line. Enough! Chloe looked at her mom. Maybe we should go. She didn't know what Julian was trying to pull, but knowing her, there was no telling. The persnickety witch! She'd always made it clear to Chloe that Dan was too good for her, but this was over the top. No, Noemi said, looking straight at Jane. We need to know what's going on. Tell her mother, Julian pressed. At that, Jane broke down in tears. Are you trying to destroy what's left of your brother's memory? Is that what you want? No, mother, he did that himself. I just want the truth, she slung her hair over her shoulder. Oh, all right. I'll tell her. She looked at Chloe. Dan had a girlfriend, a lover in Afghanistan. She was in his battalion. She's been calling here saying that she's pregnant with his baby. The room seemed to expand and contract in one hard punch, and Chloe fought to catch her breath. Everything was spinning. She felt her mother's arms around her and knew she was saying something to Jane, but for the life of her, Chloe couldn't make out any of the words. Somehow she got to her feet. Jane reached out to her. Oh, Chloe, don't leave like this. Please don't leave like this. Chloe backed away. I have to get some air. She squeaked. She looked widely around the room. Chloe, Jane urged. Come sit down. 
Chloe shook her head and ran to the door. She paused long enough to look back at the broken woman who would have been her mother-in-law. I don't belong here. She's right, Julian said, giving her a haughty look. Let her go. She doesn't belong here. Not any more. Chapter 2 Six Months Later Most of the time he came to her in her dreams, but lately she'd been seeing him during the day when she wasn't even thinking about him. That's when she knew she was in trouble. Chloe remembered the expression on her mother's face the first time she described the vivid dream she'd had about Dan right before her mom came into the room and told her that he was dead. She could imagine what her mom would think if she knew she'd been seeing him everywhere. What difference did it make? They all thought she was crazy anyway. A shiver ran down her spine. Was she? These hallucinations were causing her to feel unhinged. She hugged her arms and looked around her room as goosebumps rose over her flesh. That's what they were, weren't they? Hallucinations. And yet, they felt so real. Panic fluttered in her breast. Dan is dead and buried. She kept repeating over and over as her hands clenched into fists. Get a grip, Chloe, her mind screamed. Why was this happening? It was bad enough that Dan had betrayed her, but this was even worse. Why could he not just leave her in peace? Maybe things would be different once she got to her new place. Yes, today marked the start of her new life. Things would get better from here on out. She forced herself to regulate her breathing until her pulse returned to normal. I can do this, she said aloud. She stood on her tiptoes and retrieved her fleece from the top shelf. Then she threw it in the suitcase, zipped it, and headed for the door. An unexpected wave of sadness fluttered over her as she cast a final glance at her room. A chapter was closing in her life, but there was also a glimmer of new beginning on the horizon. If only she could summon the courage to keep walking in that direction— she had to keep walking. Her sanity depended on it. And if moving away from everything familiar was what it took, then so be it. Anything had to be better than this. For six months, she'd walked around in a daze, trying to find meaning in her life. The worst was overhearing the hushed conversations when her parents thought she wasn't listening, like how Dan's mom was footing the bill for the birthing expenses of the girl Dan had gotten pregnant. It was humiliating to hear them whispering behind her back because they thought she was too fragile to hear the truth. If some other girl was having Dan's baby, then why was she seeing him? She was tired of being haunted by the past. Time to move on. Resolutely, she straightened her shoulders as she stepped into the hall and closed the door. The next instant, she nearly mowed over her mom who was standing with her hands on her hip. Sorry, she grumbled. Chloe... I don't feel good about you driving across the country by yourself. She began, picking up the argument that had been going on for days. We've already been through this. I won't be alone. I'm taking Beastie with me. She tightened the grip on the handle of the suitcase and brushed past her, tromping down the steps. Her mom followed close on her heels. Why don't you leave Beastie here for now? I could book you a flight to Salt Lake and you could be there in a few hours. Chloe shook her head. We've already talked about this. I need my car. Her mom paused. Okay, then. I'll take off work for a few days and go with you. I'll call Phil right now. I've built up enough leave that it shouldn't be a problem. I can help take care of Beastie. I just don't feel good about you stopping at hotels by yourself. For goodness sakes. It's a three-day trip. Chloe felt the urge to scream at the top of her lungs. Her mother could be so impossible. She put down the suitcase and turned to face her. Normally, her mom kept her hair styled in a sleek bob that rounded just below her ears. But this morning, it was all over the place. And she didn't have on any makeup, causing her to look older and more vulnerable. She was wearing her favorite terry cloth robe, the one that Chloe had bought her last Christmas. A gush of tenderness rushed over her, making her feel guilty for getting so irritated. Her mom gave her a searching look. You don't have to do this alone. She put her hand on Chloe's arm. Let me help you. Before she could stop it, a tear escaped the corner of Chloe's eye and dribbled down her cheek. Hastily, she wiped it away with the palm of her hand. Mom, 
I'm going to Salt Lake City like you want me to. I'm rooming with some girl I don't even know, simply because she's the daughter of your best friend. Her voice rose. But you have to give a little here. Try to understand I have to find my life. I have to do it my way. She gave her mom a pained look. I'm doing the best I can. Naomi held up a hand. I know that, honey. I just want you to be safe, that's all. She shook her head and then pulled at the tie on her robe, making it tighter around her waist. Is everything okay? They looked toward the door as Chloe's dad stepped into the room. Naomi offered him a tight smile. Everything's fine, Brian. He looked back and forth between Chloe and Naomi with a raised eyebrow. Obviously. Chloe made a face. Mom's worried about me driving across country by myself. Yeah, I'm a little worried about it, too, he admitted. Before Chloe could respond, he went to the cabinet, retrieved a glass, and filled it with water from the sink. Then he leaned back against the counter, studying Chloe with those penetrating eyes that missed nothing. Heat rose to her face as she threw her hands in the air. Not you, too. We've been through this a dozen times already. I'm a grown woman. He placed the glass on the counter. Yes, we know that, he said patiently. Her dad was the voice of reason in the household and the mediator between Chloe and her mom. Chloe was an only child, and she knew it wasn't easy for her dad to be the only male in a household with two hot-headed females that often disagreed. Her eyes met his, and she silently pled for his understanding. If she could get through to him, then he would eventually convince her mom to see things her way. Finally, he looked at Naomi. Chloe's right. This is something she needs to do on her own. We need to be supportive. There was a note of finality in his voice. Naomi crossed her arms over her chest and looked away. Chloe looked at her mom, standing there defiantly, her chin jutted out. She felt herself soften. Look, I'm sorry. The space between them seemed to grow large as her mom's lower lip began to tremble. Can you at least wait and leave after church? I was hoping that we could all go together this morning. It always came down to this. Every argument she'd had with her mom in the past six months had church rolled in somewhere, and she was sick of it. Why couldn't she just let things be? You haven't been to church since Dan's memorial service, Naomi continued. Chloe rolled her eyes. Honey, I know all of this has been hard, and we don't always understand why we have to go through certain trials, but we have to have faith. Can't you see I'm trying to put my life back together the only way I know how? The words came out harsh and broken. Naomi's face fell. You used to listen to me. Why won't you listen to me now? She jerked her hair back from her face. Okay, I'm listening, so talk. You need to pray about it. If you'll just, maybe I don't feel like praying right now. Heck, I don't even think anyone up there is listening. A stunned silence went through the room. She could tell from the stern look on her dad's face that she'd gone too far. Before he could scold her, she sought for the words to make amends. Look, I'm sorry. The words felt heavy in her mouth as she forced them out. I know praying is important to you, and I wish I could tell you that I believe everything you do. Her voice broke. But I don't right now, okay? Can you just give me some space to sort all this out? Tears pooled in Naomi's eyes. Oh, honey. She embraced Chloe in a tight hug. After a few minutes, she pulled away. I'm going with you. Chloe closed her eyes. Mom, don't. I'm a grown woman, for goodness sakes. A trip across the country. Alone. It's just not smart, Chloe. I won't be alone. What? Her mom's face drained, and Chloe realized she'd made a huge mistake. Of all the stupid things to say, now her mom was looking at her in that way that had become all too familiar over the past few months. It was the look that said, You're crazy. What do you mean you won't be alone? Naomi said. Chloe hated the way she was choosing her words carefully, as if she were afraid that one wrong word would be enough to push Chloe over the edge. She blew out a breath. I'll have Beastie with me. That's what I meant. Naomi cocked her head. Chloe, what is it that you're not telling me? 
Her heart started to pound. You're making more out of this than it is. She hated the fear that was creeping into her mom's eyes. Her dad was looking at her the same way. She felt it too, that sickening fear that left her feeling completely and utterly hopeless. You know that Dan is gone, right? Naomi grabbed hold of Chloe's arm. You know that, right? A chill went through the room and sliced through Chloe. She wondered if her parents had felt it. She stumbled backwards. Yeah, Mom, I know. I've got to go. Did you pack some warm clothes? Your coat? The winters get cold. Yes. Their eyes met. Call me or text me every few hours so that I'll know where you are. Naomi bit her bottom lip. Can you at least do that? She nodded and pressed her lips together in a hard line while trying to squeeze back the tears. I will, I promise. I love you. Naomi gave her a cocked smile. I love you too. She looked at her dad. I love you too, she croaked. Tears formed in his eyes as he put his arms around her and gave her a tight hug. It'll all turn out okay in the end, he said gruffly. She nodded, swallowing hard. Not one to show emotion, her dad seemed embarrassed by his tears. He stepped back and took a gulp of water, and then his voice grew practical. Okay, let's get Beastie squared away. He's not going to like being caged up for three days, I can tell you that right now. Chloe chuckled. You're right about that. She picked up her suitcase and was halfway out the door before her mind registered that her mom had said something else. When you don't feel like it, huh? That's when you need to pray the most. Beastie! Yuck! That stinks! Chloe flipped on the windshield wipers and peered through the drizzling rain, searching for a road sign that said rest area. It was day two of the trip, and Beastie was a mess. He'd meowed solidly for four hours the day before until Chloe thought she'd go out of her mind. Thankfully, he'd stopped the incessant meowing today— but his fear of traveling had transferred to his bowels. The car smelled like a sewer plant, despite the fact that she'd stopped every two hours to clean the pet carrier. She wrinkled her nose in disgust. Judging by the putrid smell coming from the back, another cleaning was way overdue. Why had she insisted on taking this wretched cat across country? If only her mother could see her now, she'd be wagging her finger and saying, I told you so. A part of her wished she'd listened to her mom, but she'd not been able to fathom the thought of leaving Beastie behind. He'd been such a comfort to her since Dan's death. Even now, despite the hassle, she was glad Beastie was with her. With a sigh of relief, she spotted a rest area up ahead. She pulled into the parking lot and turned off the engine. A trickle of unease went over her as she looked at the building that seemed deserted. There was one other car in the parking lot besides hers. It was getting dark, and the rain was mixing with the fog. She watched as an older man exited the restroom, got into his car, and drove away. It hit her then that she was alone. With a traumatized cat that had the runs on a lonely stretch of highway, her mother's warnings came rushing back, and she almost started the engine and kept driving, despite the horrendous odor. Then a car pulled up beside her. A young couple with three small kids got out. She let out a sigh of relief, feeling silly for her misgivings. Okay, Beastie, I'm going to clean your stinking litter box one more time. Like it or not, and this'll have to hold you until we get to the hotel. She opened the door to the back seat and retrieved Beastie from the cage. She placed him on the other side of the cage so that he couldn't escape out the open door. He stood and stretched. She averted her nose as she began cleaning up the mess. This is really gross, beastie. The drizzle had turned to a downpour that soaked the back of her legs and feet. Great. It had to pick right now to start pouring. A loud clap of thunder raised the hair on the back of her neck as she flinched. Beastie let out a loud meow and jumped into the floorboard. She swung around and caught a glimpse of someone out of her peripheral vision. Her heart pounded as she looked at the familiar figure standing outside of the car. She dropped the litter box shovel as her hands went to her mouth. Dan! Panic raced through her veins and she closed her eyes. You're not real. This can't be happening. Please go away. 
Her heart was beating so fast that she thought her chest would explode, and she tried to control her breath. In through the nose, out through the mouth, in through the nose. When she opened her eyes, he was gone. She was shaking all over, and then she saw Beastie in the floorboard hunched down like he was also scared. Tears sprang to her eyes. The door to the car was still open, and rain was pouring in. She went to close the door, but then she caught sight of Dan going around the side of the building. She stepped out of the car, straining to see through the rain, oblivious to the fact that she was getting drenched. Anger took hold, replacing the fear. Dan! she screamed. If you've got something to say to me, then say it! Dan! What do you want? Dan! Lightning flashed as thunder rattled the ground, and she saw him walking from the building to the nearby field. Come back here and talk to me! You betrayed me! A blind anger seized her as she took off running through the rain after him. She got about 50 feet from the building when she stepped into a hole and went down hard, skinning the palms of her hands in the process. Then she realized what she was doing. She jerked around, looking at the empty space around her. There was no one there. Dan! Tears began streaming down her face, mixing with the rain. No wonder her father and mother were worried. She was losing it. She stood and began walking back to the building. Then she saw her car and realized she'd left the door wide open. Beastie! Her stomach dropped. She ran back to the car and looked inside. He was gone. What had she done? Beastie had probably gone looking for her. Beastie! She began yelling, walking around the building. Beastie! Kitty, kitty! The words seemed to get swallowed up in the rain, and her panic was building to a frenzy. Just when she'd lost all hope of finding him, she rounded the corner and saw one of the boys belonging to the family that was parked beside her. He was holding Beastie in his arms. He stepped up to her. I don't think he likes the rain. He was trying to get into the door of the restroom when I came out. Her knees went weak with relief as she took Beastie from him. Oh, thank you. She cuddled the trembling cat in her arms. I thought I'd lost him. Thank you, she repeated. He smiled. You're welcome. He gave her a tentative look. What's his name? Beastie. He reached out and rubbed Beastie's head. Beastie. It fits him. His mother called him from the car. Charlie, let's go. See ya. He gave her a curt wave as he trotted off. Not wanting to be left alone at the rest area, Chloe hurried in her car and deposited Beastie in the cage. Thankfully, she'd gotten the cage mostly cleaned before the commotion began. But the bag of poop was still in the car. She tied it up and sprinted to the garbage can in front of the building, where she threw it away and then ran back to the car as fast as she could, her heart hammering. She started the engine and blasted the heat. It was still raining, so she turned on the windshield wipers. As she drove out of the parking lot, she stole a glance at the building through the rearview mirror. She let out a cry as a tremor ran through her, for there, standing by the garbage can where she'd just been, was Dan. She punched the accelerator, not daring to look back. Chapter 3 The next morning dawned clear and sunny, making the incident the night before seem far removed a distant memory rather than something that happened the night before. The open road ahead was encouraging, and she felt her mood lifting as she concentrated on the landscape that was growing more rugged by the mile. The sky felt large above her, whispering of limitless possibilities. A little while later, she realized that she was singing her and Dan's favorite song, I'll Be Right Here Waiting For You, along with the radio. The song had once been a hopeful promise between them, but now the lyrics felt ominous, as if a weight were fastened around her neck. Events from the night before rushed back as a quiet panic overtook her. Was Dan beckoning her to join him in the grave? She pushed away the morbid thought and hit the dial to silence the song, but then realized that the radio was already off. A shudder went through her as she tightened her hands on the steering wheel. She glanced at her reflection in the rearview mirror, a pale face marked with brown eyes that looked like mud puddles of fear with dark hair billowing down the sides. The person staring back at her was a stranger. 
She had to get a grip, or she would end up in the nut house. She turned on the radio and forced herself to get lost in the music. Then she spied a McDonald's up ahead. Being around other people would help restore a sense of normalcy. She stopped and got a soda for herself and water for Beastie. A few minutes later, she was on the road again, feeling better about things. She arrived in Salt Lake just as the sun was setting, turning the sky a fiery orange and blue swirl. The snow-capped mountains to the left of the interstate were standing jagged and tall against the clear blue sky. They were much taller than the rolling mountains in the south, but not nearly as green. But they were substantial and impressive. The mountains to the right were smaller, more like the height of the ones she was used to seeing back home. She'd often heard people refer to Salt Lake as the valley, and now she knew why. Everything was built between two mountain ranges. And it struck her that she could almost see across the entire valley. The lack of trees was unsettling, and she felt exposed as she drove through the open space. As she passed downtown, she caught sight of the spires from the temple, surrounded by high-rise buildings, but she could only glance because she had to keep her focus on the road. It was intimidating to drive on a crowded interstate with multiple lanes of traffic and cars hazardly weaving in and out. Thankfully, her GPS led her straight to her destination, and she was relieved when she turned on to the street of a quaint neighborhood that had a few larger trees. The houses had a historical feel that reminded her of home. She pulled up to a particular house and double-checked the address. This is our new home, Beastie, she said with a sigh. The house was a cross between a craftsman's style and a Tudor, probably built in the late 30s or 40s. Like most of the houses on the street, the siding was made from brown brick that looked aged. The white trim around the windows and doors was coming off in large flakes, a telltale sign that someone had painted latex over oil. Wide steps led up to the front porch, and there was an old rocker situated on one end that someone had started painting dark green and abandoned halfway through the project. The landscaping consisted of a few spindly bushes that looked like they were in desperate need of water, and the yard had patches of brown. The overall feel of the place was neglect, a house that had potential if someone would make the effort to bring it out. She took a deep breath and got out of the car. She could do this. She could do this. She kept repeating the mantra over and over. It was hard to get excited about living with Darby, especially since her mom had pushed her into it. From the minute her mom brought up the idea of moving to Salt Lake, Chloe wanted to get a place of her own, but her mom insisted that she live with Darby to help share the costs. You don't even have to get a job yet, Chloe. Move in with Darby for a while until you get your feet on the ground, she said. But what she really meant was, move in with Darby so that she can keep tabs on you. That way we'll know if you flip your lid for good. Chloe had only met Darby twice, and that was two times too many as far as she was concerned. She was around the age of 10 when Darby and her mother, Angela, came for a visit. Talk about a real sour ball. She'd politely asked Darby to stay away from her favorite stuffed animal, a rabbit she'd had for as long as she could remember, but Darby ripped off the ear and threw it on the ground before running outside to swing. They met again when they were both in high school, when Darby was going through a goth stage with her black fingernails that matched her skin-tight pants and ragged t-shirt. No, Chloe was not impressed with the tall, lanky redhead that was constantly tucking her curly hair behind her ears to keep it out of her face. She looked at the house. This was going to be interesting. Why had she agreed to this? She walked up to the front door, rang the doorbell, and waited. Nothing. She looked back at the car, wondering if Beastie was going berserk. He didn't like being alone. She punched the doorbell again and waited a couple of minutes before knocking. She was trying to decide what to do when the door opened and there stood Darby with her hands shoved into her pockets. Chloe forced a smile. Hey! Hey, Darby said. It's nice to see you again. You too. Her expression was guarded, and it looked like it might break her face to smile. Newsflash, she wasn't any more excited about this arrangement than Chloe was. 
What bargaining chip had Darby's mother used in order to make her agree to it? At least she wasn't wearing black, a definite improvement over the last time. An awkward moment passed with them standing there, looking at each other, until finally Darby motioned, Come on in! Oh, I have to get my cat out of the car, she paused. My mother did tell you about Beastie, right? Yeah, but I haven't mentioned it to the landlord yet. Irritation sparked over Chloe. Regardless of whether or not the landlord approved, Beastie was here. She and the cat were a package deal. Darby could either take them both or she would have to find another roommate. She started to say as much but bit her tongue. It wouldn't do to alienate Darby on the first day. I'm going to get Beastie in my things. I'll be right back. Let me put on my shoes and I'll help. A few minutes later, they had carried everything inside. It took a few seconds for Chloe's eyes to adjust to the dark room. She looked around, wondering why the blinds were closed. Maybe Darby was still into goth. It sure is dark in here. Darby raked her long auburn bangs out of her face. Oh, yeah, I was taking a nap when you arrived. She suppressed a yawn before flipping on the lights. Sorry, Chloe mumbled. Darby waved the comment away. No worries. Beastie started meowing loudly. He's tired of being cooped up in the cage, Chloe explained, moving to the open door, but Darby beat her to it. She dropped to her knees beside the cage. Beastie, huh? Chloe was glad she'd taken the time to stop and clean the cage when she realized she was nearing Salt Lake. Had she not, Beastie would have smelled like a cesspool. Darby opened the cage door. Hey, boy, welcome to your new home. You look just like Garfield. She patted the floor beside her. Come on out. Beastie gave her a suspicious look before tentatively stepping out. At which point, Darby scooped him up and held him against her chest. What a cutie you are, she cooed. Chloe stood there unsure of what to say while Darby fawned over the cat. She started to tell her that Beastie didn't like strangers, but the traitor was purring like a boat engine. When Darby finally put Beastie down and stood, he curled around her legs, making her laugh. He's a keeper. Let's get your bags. I'll show you to your room. Darby had not taken her eyes off Beastie. Chloe was beginning to feel like a third wheel. A few minutes later, they were carrying Chloe's things into a large bedroom, located in back of the house. Okay, now I'll give you the two-cent tour of the place. Chloe was surprised at how small Darby's room was compared to hers. Don't you want the larger room? Darby looked at her funny. I mean, you were here first. Nah, my room's just fine. I thought you'd like more space. Really? Thanks. Maybe she'd misjudge Darby. Living here might not be too bad after all, she decided. Then she saw the kitchen. There were dirty dishes and pans crusted with food piled high in the sink. An empty pizza box, crushed soda cans, and empty potato chip bags littering the counter. Do you have a dishwasher? Chloe asked, hoping that Darby would get the message. Yeah, but I haven't had time to load it. Help yourself. Chloe opened her mouth to respond when a knock sounded at the side door off the kitchen. A tall, slim blonde in her late forties was peeking through the glass portal on the door. Darby! Great! Darby hissed, giving Chloe a shove. Hurry and put Beastie in your room and close the door so she won't see him. Why? Chloe whispered. Because it's Susan Morrison, the landlord. She told my mother she'd have to approve of you before she let you live here. I'll have to warm her up to the idea of having Beastie. Go! Chloe ran into the living room and found Beastie sprawled out on the couch, licking his paws. He wasn't too happy when she scooped him up and practically threw him into her room and then slammed the door. Chloe returned to the kitchen. Darby, for goodness sakes, it stinks in here. Susan wrinkled her nose in disgust. Don't you ever clean? Rather than answering, Darby cleared her throat. This is Chloe Kensley. She's the girl my mother told you about. The woman gave Chloe the once over. I'm going to tell you exactly what I told Darby. No boys, no drugs, no loud music, and no drinking. Chloe will be attending church with me, Darby said. She shot Chloe a hard look. Isn't that right? 
It took a minute for Chloe to find her tongue. Yes, ma'am, that's right. She hoped lightning wouldn't strike, considering she hadn't been to church since Dan died. You won't have to worry about her doing any of those things, Darby said smoothly. Susan touched her hair and let out a self-conscious chuckle. Ma'am, I'm not that old. Yet. Chloe was at a loss for words. Thankfully, Darby jumped to the rescue. She didn't mean any disrespect. That's the way all the people from the South talk. Oh, okay, Susan said, sizing Chloe up. Well, if Darby says you're okay, then I'm sure you'll be fine. Chloe felt strangely relieved. Why didn't anyone tell me we have a new neighbor? A voice boomed. A plump woman with heavy eye makeup stepped into the kitchen. Chloe stepped back against the wall. Geez Louise, what was this? Grand Central Station? The woman looked around. Aren't you guys going to introduce me? Lila, this is Chloe. She's going to be Darby's roommate. She just arrived from South Carolina, the landlady said. The woman held out her hand and Chloe shook it. It was soft and squishy like a sponge. Hi, I'm Lila Farnsworth. Nice to meet you, Chloe. You'll be a welcome addition around here. Darby needs someone nice to keep her company instead of those law enforcement people she's always hanging out with. Chloe saw Darby roll her eyes. Lila gave Chloe an admiring look. Well, at least you're not a bag of bones like Darby. You're curvy. She caught hold of Chloe's arm and squeezed her bicep. I like you. As if she needed anyone to draw attention to the extra pounds she could never seem to lose. Thanks, Chloe muttered, her cheeks burning. Lila turned to Darby and Susan. The reason I came over was to invite you to eat a late dinner with me tonight. Pete's out of town. Both women nodded like getting this last-minute invitation was everyday business. At that, Lila opened the door and stepped out. She paused and looked back over her shoulder at Chloe. Well, you're invited, too. Come over in about 20 minutes. I'll have everything ready by then. She closed the door. Chloe looked at Darby and Susan. Do I have a choice? Susan chuckled. Not really. You might as well get used to it. Yeah, you never know when Lila's going to drop in. Darby jutted her thumb over her shoulder. She lives behind us. Her backyard adjoins ours. A look passed between Darby and Susan. Lila's an interesting character, Susan added. Darby winked at Chloe. I'll fill you in on the details later. Susan shook her head and laughed. You do that. She stepped out the door. See you both in a few minutes. Darby, clean up this wreck or I'm raising your rent. Yeah, yeah, Darby said, tucking her curl behind her ear. The body of Lila's house was stucco that had been painted a mid-toned beige with a creamy white trim that matched the front door. If Chloe had been picking the colors, she would have gone more yellow on the body and added an accent to the window casings and front door. Generally, people were afraid of color and hence most houses ended up being painted nondescript shades of pastel chalk. Lila's yard was well kept with a variety of shrubs and flowers. The only thing out of the ordinary were the white Christmas lights that were still hung over the bushes in the front and the icicle lights that ran along the overhang on the front porch. Christmas lights in summer. Strange. Chloe made a mental note to ask Darby about it. The house was bright and cheerful inside. Thanks to the recessed lighting that was spotted throughout the main living area, the beige walls in the den looked very similar to the outside color, making her think that Lila was a fan of neutrals. The kitchen, done in butter beige, was by far the best feature of the home. It reminded Chloe of the color she'd chosen for Miss Graham's house, Da Vinci's canvas. A trendy selection of tile covered the floor, and the oyster white countertops made of granite were the perfect complement to the white cabinets and trendy metal hardware. White plantation shutters covered the large windows. If the room had been Chloe's project, she would have recommended doing valances over the window to add pops of color and maybe some botanicals and accessories. Even as it sat, the area was great. You have a lovely place, Chloe said. Thanks. Did you do the decorating yourself? Who, me? Not hardly. I got Brooks Design Center to help me. Oh, they did a nice job. 
Well, they should have for what it cost me. I thought I was going to have to take out a second mortgage just to redo the kitchen. A good friend of mine, Lucille Wilson, talked me into using them. But word to the wise, keep your checkbook handy. Once you let loose those greedy designers in your house, it's all over from there. There are sharks on the lookout for fresh meat. I don't see how those people can sleep at night, charging a fortune for every little thing. Look at that print over there on the wall. I paid a fortune for it and then saw one almost just like it at Walmart the other day for a fourth of the price. Lila went on for another five minutes until Darby interrupted her. Chloe's an interior designer. Lila stopped. Really? Yes. Chloe could have strangled Darby, who was standing there all doe-eyed. Was she trying to get Chloe thrown out of the woman's house? What type of work do you do? Lila asked. Residential, mostly. Chloe took a deep breath and decided to forge ahead. I'm interviewing for a job at Marsh Interiors on Monday. A strange look came over Lila's face, and she went a little pale. That's very interesting, she finally said. What do you know about them? Not a lot, Chloe admitted as a trickle of unease ran down her spine. Why? Oh, nothing. I was just wondering. She gave Chloe a strained smile before turning her attention to the dinner she was preparing. What was wrong with Marsh Interiors? What was Lila not telling her? Her stomach nodded. Her mother had found the advertisement for the job online and insisted that Chloe apply for it. I have a good feeling about this one, she said. At first, Chloe was doubtful that anything would come of it, but to appease her mom, she applied. Then she got a call requesting her to come for an interview. This job opportunity had been the one bright spot in her sordid life, and now it was being tainted like everything else. She just couldn't seem to get a break. She felt something and realized that Lila had touched her arm. Unfortunately, Chloe had never been able to mask her feelings. Everything she felt blasted like a neon sign to the world. I didn't mean to upset you. Marsh Interiors does a great business in the Valley, and I'm sure you're going to enjoy working there. My qualm with them has nothing to do with their design services. It's more of a personal nature. Okay, Chloe said slowly. The words were meant to ease her fears. Unfortunately, they didn't. Lila wiped her hands on the dish towel. I'll tell you what. I'm planning on getting new curtains for my living room in the next couple of months. Can you handle that for me? Well, sure. If I get the job. Of course, that's what I meant. Could this conversation get any more awkward? Chloe tried to diffuse the situation by talking about the one thing she knew best design. What type of window treatments are you wanting? Lila seemed to relax on that. Oh, I don't know. I keep telling Pete that the room's too blah. You know the trend is to do mostly white with pops of color. We need something to liven it up. I'll design something that you and your husband will both like. Lila frowned. Why do that? I just thought... Pete doesn't have anything to do with this. It's none of his business what I spend on my design services. Oh, okay. There seemed to be no winning with this woman. Enough about that. She handed Chloe four plates. I could use some help setting the table. Of course, I'll be glad to help. She took the plates from Lila and looked at Darby, who shrugged and walked off. Hey, one of you princesses, get in here and put ice in the glasses, Lila yelled. Darby moaned, and Susan reluctantly got up off the couch. Chloe was surprised at how quickly they'd come in and made themselves at home. Undoubtedly, they'd been here many times before. When they were seated at the table, Lila looked around. Her eyes stopped on Chloe. Would you ask the blessing on the food? The request broadsided Chloe as a look of horror came over her face. She knew that everyone had seen it, hence the awkward silence that settled in the Go ahead. Lila said, her voice encouraging. Seeing no other alternative, Chloe bowed her head and mumbled her way through the prayer. Amen, Lila said heartily when it was finished. Look at all this food, Susan said. It looks delicious. Susan was right. The food did look delicious. There was pot roast, mashed potatoes and gravy, 
green beans, fruit salad, and dinner rolls. Chloe was suddenly ravenous. She scooped a generous portion of mashed potatoes and gravy onto her plate. Were it not for the fact that Lila had mentioned her weight earlier, she probably would have gotten more. She didn't consider herself fat, but she'd never been super skinny like Darby either. Dan had called her shapely. You must have cooked everything in the refrigerator, Lila, Susan said. Pete says, I cook enough for the whole countryside. That's why we'll always be as poor as church mice, he says. That and those design fees Lila didn't tell him about, Chloe thought. Susan took a big bite of mashed potatoes. Speaking of Pete, where is he? He went to Las Vegas for a jewelry exhibit, but he'll be back in time for the weekend. Chloe noticed that a look passed between Susan and Darby. What was it with these two and their silent communication? What does Pete do for a living? Chloe asked, breaking off a piece of her roll. He's a buyer for most of the jewelry stores in the area. Speaking of jewelry, Darby said, spearing a green bean and shoving it in her mouth. Today in my psychology of criminal behavior class, we were discussing that jewelry theft that took place in Park City a few months ago. Oh yeah, I remember that, Lila said. Pete was talking about it, the unsolved Park City theft. She looked at Darby. What were the particulars? A doctor, Clifton, and his wife went out to dinner with friends. They returned home only to find that her diamond necklace, earrings, and an emerald bracelet were stolen from their safe. The diamonds themselves were worth 15 grand. Lila made a tisking sound with her tongue. Anyone foolish enough to keep jewelry worth that much in his or her home is asking for trouble. Well, that's just the thing, Darby said, excitement coating her voice. My professor was saying that the investigators learned that Mrs. Clifton normally kept her jewels in a safety deposit box. But she and the doctor had attended a charity function the night before, and she had not had a chance to return them to the bank. So the thief knew a little about the couple, Susan said. Darby nodded. And get this, there were no signs of forced entry. Even after all these months, the police are trying to figure out how the perps got in. Perps? Chloe was confused. Perpetrators, Darby explained. That's what we call criminals in the law enforcement world. Oh, Chloe felt her cheeks go warm. Darby had answered her so matter-of-factly that Chloe felt ignorant. Everyone else at the table obviously knew what she was talking about. My professor's contact on the force told him that from the looks of this job, it has all the trappings of being a ghost theft. Oh, Susan shivered with delight. Really? Darby's eyes danced. I know. Can you believe it? Chloe was dying to know what they meant by ghost theft, although she didn't dare ask. Luckily, she didn't have to, because Lila saw her bewildered expression. You might want to explain to Chloe about the ghost thief. He's one of the most elusive jewel thieves in the country, Darby said. Lila nodded. Pete's always carrying on about the ghost. In the world of jewels, he's as dreaded as Alan Golder. A real rogue who leaves no trace, she chuckled. Of course, that's just speculation. No one really knows who he or she is. Or if it's one thief or a whole team, Darby added. Susan thought for a minute. Alan Golder? Never heard of him. The startled looks on Darby and Lila's faces were almost comical. What? They belted out. Alan Golder was the best of the best, Lila said. Until he got caught, Darby inserted. Lila waved the comment away. I thought everybody had heard of Alan Golder. He was quite the ladies' man, charming, sophisticated. He would go to all of the top parties and case out the goods right there while he was whining and dining with the best of them, usually with a lady or two on his arm. I believe he even stole from Johnny Carson. He was known as the dinner time bandit because he could rob you blind while you were sitting at the table. I heard that he once ripped a diamond right off a screaming woman's finger while she was standing in her living room. Or was it the bedroom? She shrugged. I can't remember anyway. 
From the way she clucked on another five minutes about the man, Chloe would have thought he was a celebrity rather than a criminal, or perp. Her mind started to wander about two minutes into the monologue. Chloe had already cleared three-fourths of her plate when she looked at Darby. Her plate looked as full as it had been a moment ago. No wonder she was so skinny. She barely ate anything. Chloe was totally exhausted by the time she returned home from Lila's house. Her clothes were still in the suitcase, but there would be time to tackle that tomorrow. She took stock of her room with the two large windows spanning the back wall. The closet was a perk she'd not expected, as it was quite large considering the time period of the house. She'd considered putting Beastie's litter box in the bathroom, but decided against it. Darby wouldn't want to have to deal with it. Instead, she placed it in the back corner of her bedroom. She put his basket and cushion in the opposite corner. With Beastie settled, she crawled into bed and lay there for a few seconds looking at the ceiling. After six months of turmoil, she'd finally made the move, despite all of the uncertainty. Her mind went back to the strange conversation she'd had with Lila about marsh interiors. Lila seemed a little off, so it was probably nothing. At any rate, she needed a job, so she would have to make do with what she was offered. A few minutes later, she drifted off into a sound sleep and didn't wake until morning. Unfortunately, the next night didn't go so well. The nights were always the hardest because she was afraid she would dream about Dan. This time, she'd been asleep for about an hour before she felt the thud that was jarring her like a second heartbeat. At first, she thought she was dreaming, but then she opened her eyes and saw the blaring lights. She got up and walked over to the window. Lila's yard was lit up like Times Square, and there were people all over the place. The thud she was hearing was the bass from the music. She went back to bed and buried her ears in her pillow. A minute later, Beastie jumped on her head. She tried to push him off, but got tangled in her covers in the process. That's it! She threw on her robe and marched down the hall to Darby's room. She pounded on the door. Darby! No answer. She pounded again. What? came the groggy response. She threw open the door. Something's going on at Lila's house. My room is blinding, and it sounds like a rock band is camped outside my window. Darby sat up in bed and rubbed her eyes, sleep coating her voice. You'll get used to it. It's the Farnsworth. They do this every Friday and Saturday night. You're kidding, right? Are Lila and her husband crazy? Well, yeah. What can I say? You met her. Darby yawned. They've been doing this ever since I've been here. People used to call the police, but after a while, the police stopped coming. Now we all just put a pillow over our heads to drown out the noise and go back to sleep. Chloe shook her head, unsatisfied with the explanation. Well, you have some connections with the police department. Can't you do something? Darby blew out a breath. I'm a student at Salt Lake Community College, hoping to get into the academy next spring. Why didn't your mother tell my mom about this? How am I supposed to get any rest? Darby let out an impatient sigh. I must have slipped her mind. I don't know how Lila and her husband can be so inconsiderate of their neighbors. They don't see it that way. They walk to the beat of their own drum. Lila and Pete have a background in theater. They traveled the world until their money ran out and then came to Salt Lake. Pete went into the jewelry business and both of them love socializing. So every weekend they invite their friends and that's what they do. Any more questions? No. Chloe bit her bottom lip. That explained the strange looks that kept passing between Darby and Susan. They knew exactly what was going to happen when Pete returned from Las Vegas. Chloe turned and stomped back to her room. Now I know why I got the big bedroom, she said loud enough for Darby to hear. She got back into bed and pulled the comforter over her head. Susan's silly landlord rules rang in her ears. No loud music? Ha! Huh. Chapter 4 Monday came around all too soon. The alarm clock went off at 6 a.m., but Chloe kept hitting the snooze button and didn't get up until 7. Big mistake. 
Her interview was at 8. When the topic of moving to Salt Lake City first came up, Chloe started searching for jobs. She never expected to find a job opening in her field, much less to have an interview so soon. It was an exciting prospect, and she needed a win because thus far her professional career had been a total disaster. If she missed this interview, she might not get another chance at an interior design firm. She'd have to either take a menial job doing something she hated or go back to South Carolina and face her parents. The thought conjured up feelings she didn't want to deal with right now. An unbidden image of Dan flashed through her mind, and she squelched it. She ran into the bathroom and brushed her teeth. A once-over in the mirror told her that she could go another day without washing her hair. That would save her at least 30 minutes. Had she been back home, she never would have been able to go this long without washing her hair because of the humidity. But here it was drier. Her hair had never looked so good. Too bad she couldn't say the same about her skin. She felt like a prune. Her nose was so dry she wanted to stick a tube of chapstick up her nostrils and rub it around a few hundred times. She hurriedly got dressed and looked at the clock. It was 7.40. She'd made a point of looking up the location of the design firm over the weekend. Thankfully, it was only about seven miles away. With any luck, she might just make it on time. If she could only find her keys... She searched her purse again and then her room. In a near panic, she rushed to the kitchen to look there. Had she left them on the counter? That's when she saw the note. Tears sprang to her eyes and she could hardly believe what she was reading. Darby had taken her car. Last night, Darby said her car was on the fritz and asked if she could borrow Chloe's Honda Fit. Not wanting to be rude, Chloe had given her a vague... Yeah, that would probably be okay, sometime. She certainly hadn't meant today. Darby had heard her tell Lila about the interview. How could she do this? Chloe looked wildly around, hoping that Darby's number was written on something. It wasn't. She'd not even thought to plug Darby's number into her phone. Think, Chloe, think. She looked at the clock on the microwave. 748. Even if, by some miracle, she could somehow find Darby's number, she would never get the car back in time to make it to the interview. Not knowing what else to do, she called the design center, telling the woman who answered that she would be a few minutes late as a result of car trouble, and then she called a cab. Twenty minutes later, she was headed to the interview. Chloe leaned back in the seat and looked out at the drizzling rain that was a rarity for Salt Lake, according to her mother. She tried not to think about how much she needed this job. A month after Dan's death, she'd taken a job as a receptionist and bookkeeper at a beauty salon. She suffered through it for about a month before calling it quits after messing up the shop's books and getting into a verbal fight with the manager. When she told her mom about what happened, she hugged Chloe and laughed. What in the world made you think you could keep books? You're terrible with math, and you've never been able to balance your checkbook, much less one for a business. Her next job was at a paint store where she worked as a color consultant. Chloe had been excited about this one because it gave her an opportunity to use her skills. A Mrs. Jones came in one day and explained that she was painting her kitchen and breakfast room and wanted something bright yet tasteful. Chloe had questioned the woman about her lighting and finally recommended Anjou Pear, a rich golden color. A couple of weeks later, Mrs. Jones came back to the store ranting and raving. You told me the color was Anjou Pear, but several people have since told me that it looks like split pea soup splattered over the walls. Chloe was mortified. I asked you about your lighting and you said it was artificial. It is most of the time, except for when the afternoon sun shines through the windows. That's when the paint looks that awful green. Chloe thought for sure Mr. Welch, the owner of the store, would side with her, but he was outraged. This is your fault. Trinity Jones has been a client of ours for 40 years. You should have asked more questions, and then you'd have known she had that harsh afternoon sunlight. Mr. Welch had the audacity to deduct the cost of the paint from her paycheck. Chloe's thoughts returned to the present. Her mom kept telling her that she really felt good about this job opportunity. I know this sounds strange, 
but I feel like working at this place will help you find the answers to your questions. At first, Chloe had chalked her mom's words up to wishful thinking. But as time wore on, she began to secretly hope she was right. The job came to represent a new hope for the future, a chance to focus on something other than her problems. The cab came to a halt. Chloe leaned forward in her seat. Why are we stopping? Looks like there's a fender bender up ahead. Great! She closed her eyes and mentally tried to prepare for the interview. At 8.35, the taxi finally pulled up in front of the address. The three-story red brick building was on a busy street bordering the downtown district of Salt Lake. It was a graceful blend of the traditional and modern, with its arched windows that were overshadowed by an impressive gable supported by metal framework. The place was intimidating, to say the least. She paid the driver and stepped out into the rain that had turned from a drizzle into a downpour. Why had she not thought to bring an umbrella? One minute she was running for the front door, and the next she was face down on the sidewalk. It happened so fast that the only thing Chloe could remember was throwing her hands out to catch herself. The next thing she knew, a middle-aged woman was standing over her, holding out her hand. The woman helped her to her feet. Let's get you out of the rain. Is that yours? Chloe nodded, and the woman handed her the portfolio case that was now drenched. She fought back the tears that were threatening to overflow, knowing that if she let go, she would soon have trails of black mascara trickling down her face. What happened? the woman asked once they were inside. I'm not sure, but it felt like the heel of my shoe got caught on something. It was the rain. I've lived here all my life, and I've never seen so much rain this time of year. You took quite a fall. Are you okay? Chloe looked down at her knee and at the blood that was oozing from the gigantic hole in her tights. The heel on the right pump was dangling, and the palm of her hands were scratched. This time, she couldn't stop the tears. I'm here for an interview. What am I going to do? I can't go in there looking like this. I only have one shoe. There's a public restroom down the hall. Go in there and clean yourself up, and then you'll feel better. They'll understand. It could happen to anyone, the woman said kindly. Chloe managed a tight smile. Thanks. I'll do that. She went to the restroom and tried to clean up the best she could. Unfortunately, there wasn't a thing she could do about the shoe. She thought about removing the tights but decided to leave them on. At least then, they'd be able to see that she'd made an attempt to look professional. She took the elevator up to the third floor, expecting that Martian Terriers would be located in one of the suites. When the elevator door opened, however, she stepped out and found herself standing in an impressive reception room done in pleasing neutrals with metal accents and a rough-hewn hickory floor that was a weathered gray. Marsh interiors took up the entire third floor. She approached the reception desk. The look on the receptionist's face said it all when she looked at Chloe's ragged appearance. Chloe straightened under the scrutiny and put on her best professional voice. I'm Chloe Kinsley. I'm here for the interview. Unfortunately, I'm a little late. As you can see from my appearance, I had trouble getting here. The corner of the girl's mouth began to twitch like she was trying hard not to laugh. Chloe felt like crying. I'll tell Mr. Singleton that you're here. Have a seat. Luckily, the waiting room was empty. Her knee was bleeding again, and it was starting to throb. Fifteen minutes later, a man in his early thirties stepped out of one of the inner offices and walked in through the back of the reception area. From the way the woman at the desk jumped to attention, Chloe guessed he must be pretty important. He was the no-nonsense type, with his closely cropped dark hair and hard jaw. He looked at Chloe and his steel eyes locked with hers, sending a chill through her, making her hot and cold at the same time. How ridiculous she must look, sitting there in a stained suit, barefoot and holding her shoes in her hands. Her only thought was, please don't let this be the man that's supposed to interview me. His eyes narrowed, and he turned to the woman, ignoring Chloe altogether. Yvette, 
I thought you said Chloe Kensley was here. Chloe swallowed hard. She stood and switched the shoe to her left hand before extending the right hand to him. I'm Chloe Kensley. When Chloe shut the door to Hank Singleton's office, she felt like she'd just closed the door on her career. Hank Singleton, the owner of Marsh Interiors, hadn't given her any slack in the 15-minute interview that should have lasted an hour. She could tell that the idea of losing a shoe on the way to the interview was beyond comprehension as far as he was concerned. She doubted if any of her answers to the interview questions had penetrated that negative halo he'd formed when he saw her standing there barefooted. He'd only given her portfolio a cursory glance and then snapped it shut. Who could blame him? It was still wet from when she dropped it. Chloe looked down at her stocking feet and shook her head. It was the first time she noticed that her big toe was sticking out. No wonder Mr. Singleton thought she was a coot. She would have laughed if tears hadn't been so close to the surface. As she walked past the receptionist's desk, the girl looked up. Are you a size seven? I'm sorry, I don't know what you mean. Your shoes, it looks like we have about the same size feet. I have a pair of sneakers that I use to go walking on my lunch break. You're welcome to borrow them if you'd like. Chloe couldn't hold back any longer. Tears of gratitude welled when she reached for the shoes. Thank you. I was wondering how I was going to go home barefooted. I promise I'll bring them back. She smiled. You're welcome. You have a lovely accent. Where are you from? South Carolina. I just moved here a few days ago. Welcome to Salt Lake, and good luck on your job hunting. Chloe decided to take the stairs on the way out to avoid being seen wearing a suit with a pair of sneakers. Eager to escape, she yanked open the door at the bottom of the stairs and ran head on into a man rushing in. They collided knocking her portfolio and purse onto the marble floor, scattering the contents. The man was the first to regain his composure. Miss, are you okay? I'm so sorry. I wasn't watching. I'm late for an interview. His remark stunned her. Was he interviewing for the same position? The irony of the situation was too much, and she burst out laughing. The next minute, they were both on their hands and knees trying to retrieve her things. He raised his blonde head, and she found herself staring into a pair of startling blue eyes. Did you do this? He held up one of the pages from her portfolio. Yes, I did. Wow, this is great. The color combinations are magnificent. The man stood and helped Chloe to her feet. Thank you. A sense of pleasure warmed her. The man had noticed her work. It had been a long time since anyone had complimented her on anything, and the fact that he was noticing something that she took great pride in was especially gratifying. Her mother's caution, to be wary of strangers, echoed in her mind. Do you have time to get a soda or something? There's a little restaurant not too far from here. They have the best Italian sodas in town. He took hold of her arm and started steering her toward the door. I really have to go. Besides, your interview... Before she could finish her sentence, the two were standing on the sidewalk, and he was flagging down a taxi. At least it had stopped raining. He looked down at her sneakers. New style? She smirked. Long story. Good. You can tell me all about it over sodas. Wait, I don't even know your name. He gave her a dazzling smile. Garrett. She smiled back. Chloe. They rode in silence until Garrett asked the taxi driver to stop in front of a quaint restaurant. Garrett directed them to a cozy table in the corner of a crowded restaurant, and a few minutes later, she was looking across the table at him, sipping on a vanilla soda. All she knew up to this point was that his name was Garrett and that he had the good sense to appreciate her drawings. He was immaculately dressed in a charcoal-grayed pinstripe suit with a silk tie, 
His arresting eyes reminded her of sapphires, and his quick smile made her feel warm, despite her damp clothes. Garrett took a swig of his soda. Mmm, that's good. I love cherry. How's yours? Very good. It couldn't be as good as the cherry. She laughed. I don't know about that. It really is fantastic. He held out his soda and turned the straw in her direction. Here, try mine and see. Her eyes went wide. She didn't want to drink after a person she just met, but she couldn't think of a diplomatic way to turn him down. She took a drink. Pretty good. But, he prompted. A smile touched her lips. The vanilla's better. He made a face. No, I don't believe it. Let me try it. He reached for her soda and took a long swig. A smile broke across his lips. Okay, you win. The vanilla's better. He conceded, handing back the soda. He pointed. You were going to tell me about the story behind those shoes. Believe it or not, I was just coming out of an interview. An interview? You're kidding. With those shoes? The laughter in his eyes was infectious. As a grin broke across her face. Do you want to hear this story or not? I'm sorry. Continue. She wrapped her hands around the glass and took another sip of the bubbly soda. It seems that my roommate thought she needed my car more than I because she took it this morning without asking, and I had to get a taxi. I was late for the interview, and it was raining, and I ran out of the cab to the building. The heel of my shoe got caught in something, and I biffed it on the sidewalk. She showed him her knee and hands. See? Ouch. I'll say. You're telling me that you interviewed with only one shoe on? Well, I took off the other shoe, so technically I was barefooted. You should have seen the look on that singleton guy's face when I tried to explain what happened. Of course, at the time, I didn't realize my big toe was sticking out of the hole of my tights. I think the interview lasted all of 15 minutes. Garrett's eyes widened, and then he slapped his knee and doubled over laughing. She wished she could think it was that funny, After a minute, he regained his composure. Where did you get those tennis shoes? The receptionist took pity on me and let me borrow them. He laughed again. That's hilarious. She shook her head. Well, it would be hilarious, except I was counting on that job. Now I'm not sure what I'll do. Probably hightail it back home. Garrett shook his head. Where is home? South Carolina. Ah, the origin of that captivating accent. His eyes caught hers, and she felt warm all over. Then he reached for her hand and held it in his. His touch was warm and not unpleasant. But the gesture completely caught her off guard, and she had to fight the urge to pull her hand away. It felt terribly inappropriate to be holding hands with a man she'd met only an hour ago. There'll be other job interviews, I promise. But we're not going to worry about that tonight. I'm taking you to dinner. She withdrew her hand. I, I'm i not sure that's a good idea. You have to eat, don't you? Well, yes, but we just met. He leaned back in his chair and flashed another sparkling smile that caused her breath to catch. It's just dinner, Chloe. Come on, take a chance. Get to know me. What could be so bad about that? I don't know. It was the first time she'd been alone with a man since Dan, and Garrett was so sure of himself. So charming. There's this great seafood restaurant. They have the best shrimp remoulade you'll ever taste, and their oysters aren't half bad either. She wondered if now would be the time to tell him she didn't like neither shrimp nor oysters. Do they have steaks? Yep, they do. There was a pause in the conversation. He was handsome, Chloe admitted, taking in his well-proportioned features and wiry frame, maybe even a little too handsome for her taste. She'd never been overly impressed with the pretty boy types. There was a hint of teasing in his eyes. Say yes, where else would I find another date with such interesting shoes? She laughed. 
You've got a point, but I'll have to go home and change first. He made a face. Not the shoes. She smirked. Okay, change them if you must. I'll pick you up at seven. But do you have a car? Of course. We took a cab here, so I just assumed. He chuckled. We'd only just met. I seriously doubt that you would have agreed to get in a car with a complete stranger. The cab seemed to be the more logical choice. Oh, Heat crawled up her neck. He was right, of course, but she wasn't sure how she felt about him being able to read her so well. Her eyes met his in a challenge. And what makes you so sure that I'll get in a car and go somewhere with you tonight? He reached for her hand and began stroking it back and forth with his thumb. I'll take my chances. Garrett insisted on accompanying her in the cab back to her house, even though she told him it would be easier just to give him directions for tonight. When she stepped onto the porch, she gave him a final wave and breathed a sigh of relief when the cab drove away. It had been an eventful morning, and she longed to plop down on her bed and relax for a few hours, after she and Darby had a nice long talk. Her Honda Fit was parked in the driveway. That meant Darby was home. She tried the door, but it was locked. The TV was on. She pounded on the door. Darby, it's me. Open up. No response. Great. There was no telling where the darn key was. Everything was now a jumble in her purse. She knocked again. Darby, can you hear me? No answer. Left with no other alternative, she put down her portfolio case and started rifling through her purse. Finally, she found it. Hi, Chloe. Susan stuck her head out the front door of her house on the left. Is everything all right? Chloe looked across the yard and gave her a strained smile. She hadn't realized they were next-door neighbors. I'm okay, just having a hard time getting this door open. I have an extra key if you need it. She jammed the key into the lock and turned it. Got it, thanks. Let me know if you need anything. Susan closed the door. Yeah, I need something, a new roommate, Chloe muttered under her breath. Susan stuck her head out the door again, making Chloe think for one wild second that Susan had heard her. I'm making barbecue chicken tonight if anyone's interested. She closed the door before Chloe could answer. The first thing Chloe saw when she opened the door was Beastie. Hey boy, did you miss me? He gave her an indifferent glance before sticking his nose up in the air and prancing out of the room. Good to see you too, Chloe called after him. She put her things on the couch and began opening the blinds one by one, allowing sunlight to flood the room. Much better. She was tempted to open the doors and windows to air out the place the way her mother did at home. That would certainly help rid the air of that stale pizza smell. She should have picked up some air freshener when she was shopping over the weekend. Beastie came back into the room. Come here, big guy. Chloe bent down and grabbed him before he could escape. His thick fur was soft against her face. Good kitty, she said, rubbing his back. As usual, he bowed up and let out an irritated meow. She put him back on the floor and gave him one last rub across the back before he darted off. You are a beast, he said. Her stomach growled, reminding her that all she'd had to eat or drink all day was the vanilla soda. She went into the kitchen to make a turkey sandwich, but stopped short when she saw the mess. The turkey she'd bought on Saturday was sitting on the counter, half opened, along with the cheese, mayonnaise, and mustard. Chloe's blood began to boil. She spent her own money for that meat, and Darby thought she was going to let it sit out on the counter and spoil? Burst the car at now this! She stormed out of the kitchen and down the hall to Darby's room, where she threw open the door. We need to talk! It took her a moment to realize that Darby was kneeling beside her bed, praying. Chloe's face drained. Not knowing what else to do, she backed out and closed the door. Darby had not even looked up. Chloe! Chloe recognized the voice. It was Susan in the kitchen. Oh no, beastie! Can I talk to you for a minute? Her heart skipped a beat. Where was that cat? She stepped into the kitchen and felt a wave of relief when she saw that he wasn't in there. Susan looked her up and down. What happened? Huh? Chloe looked down at her skin knee and ripped tights. In all the commotion, she'd forgotten about her haggard appearance. 
Oh, I fell getting out of a taxi this morning, but I'm fine. Your knee. The blood had dried, matting her tights to the wound. It looks worse than it is. It'll be better once I get it cleaned up. You look a little pale. Just hungry and tired, she said as Beastie scampered into the room and brushed against Susan's leg. Susan raised an eyebrow. The reason I came over is to talk to you about your cat. If Susan had knocked Chloe in the chest with a ton of bricks, it wouldn't have felt any heavier. I thought Darby had told you about Beastie. If there is a problem... Susan held up her hand. Don't be silly. I want to borrow him. Borrow him? I've seen signs of mice in the closet on the built-in porch. A clutch of anxiety went through Chloe. She'd almost lost Beastie at the rest stop. What if he were to somehow get out of Susan's porch? She might never see him again. I'm not so sure that's a good idea, she said, selecting her words carefully so as not to offend the landlord. He's still getting used to being in this house. I don't want him to somehow get out and get lost. Susan dismissed the concern with a wave of her hand. Oh, he won't get out. I'll take good care of him, I promise. Chloe could tell that any argument she could present would fall on deaf ears. Okay, you can borrow him. But as you can see, Beastie doesn't miss many meals, so I'm not sure how good he'll be at catching mice. But you're welcome to give it a try. Susan laughed. Let's hope there's a hunter in you somewhere. She scooped him up and took him out the door. Ciao! Chloe stood there shaking her head. After all the worrying she'd done about the darn cat and Susan had known about him all along, Chloe made herself a sandwich and was cleaning up the mess when Darby came into the kitchen. Embarrassment rushed over her as she thought about how she'd interrupted Darby during her prayer. She thought Darby would call her on it, but Darby simply said, Hey! Hey! I have a test in my next class. I was praying for help. Darby opened the refrigerator door and took out the milk and then cast a sidelong glance at Chloe. What happened to you? You're a mess. She took a long swig right out of the jug. Don't do that! Chloe ran hot water over the dishes in the sink. She squirted dish soap and swirled it around to make suds. What? Darby asked innocently. Chloe's brows knitted together as she shut off the faucet and turned to face Darby. You know what? She took the milk out of Darby's hand and put it on the counter. Don't drink out of the jug. There are plenty of glasses in the cabinet. Darby put the milk back in the fridge and slammed the door shut. You're so picky about everything. Chloe's hands flew to her hips. Enough was enough. We need to have a talk. Okay, talk, Darby said. But you'd better make it quick because I have to get back before my next class. First of all, I don't appreciate you taking my car without asking. Because of you, I was late for my interview this morning. I did ask you last night. No, you asked if you could ever borrow my car, and I said, maybe sometime. Okay, then what's the problem? I didn't mean that you could use it today. I meant that we could talk about it, and that maybe down the road, that might be a possibility. Sorry, Darby rolled her eyes. Is that all? Chloe could have strangled her. You don't just take someone's car and leave them a note. What kind of person does that? I thought your interview was tomorrow. No, it was today. Today! Her voice had risen to near yelling, and she clenched her fists in an attempt to remain in control of her emotions. Geez, sorry. I didn't think it was a big deal. Well, it is. I guess you didn't get the job. What's that supposed to mean? Darby shrugged. I can tell by your sulky attitude that you didn't get the job. Chloe gritted her teeth. What did you say? Darby cut her eyes at her. You heard me. Chloe had never considered herself a violent person, but at that moment she thought about ramming her fist down Darby's smart mouth just to shut her up. Instead, she picked up the dishcloth, wadded it, and threw it across the room. Why did you do that? Darby demanded. Chloe's voice rose to a fever pitch. Because I don't want you taking my car again without asking, and I'm sick of cleaning up after your messes. Hey, calm down. You're blowing this way out of proportion. 
No, I won't calm down. Look at this place. She grabbed the butter knife that Darby had left laying on the counter and slung it into the sink, splashing dishwater onto the counter and floor. My mother told me you were a little crazy, but I certainly didn't expect this. Chloe's head began to spin. What did you say? She could tell from the look on Darby's face that she knew she'd gone too far. Nothing. It was nothing. Tears welled in Chloe's eyes. Look, I shouldn't have said that. I was out of line. I'll be in my room, Chloe said, running in that direction and slamming the door behind her. Chapter 5 Chloe pulled out her suitcase and started slinging clothes into it, knowing all the while that a few minutes later she would have to take them all out again and put them back in her closet. Oh, she would go home in a heartbeat if she could. But what would that solve? Her parents thought she was crazy. The reason Darby's words cut so deeply was because Chloe knew that Darby had gotten the information from her mother, who no doubt had heard it from Chloe's own mom. Good grief! Was her mother babbling her business to the entire world? She sat down on her bed and blew out a breath. Not that she could blame her parents for thinking she was crazy. Seeing Dan, or thinking that she was seeing Dan, was crazy. Even as a child, Chloe craved order. Her mother used to joke that Chloe was the only four-year-old she'd ever seen that would meticulously straighten all of the shoes in the closet. She'd always been sensible, to the point of exasperation. So where did this thing with Dan fit in? She'd watched those shows on the Discovery Channel where people with hushed voices talked about feeling the presence of a ghost. She'd always pass them off as coots like those people who swear they've been abducted by aliens experimenting on their bodies. Dead people don't come back no matter how much you want them to. Fear needled its way through her stomach. She needed help. She'd already spent so much time in counseling. What was the next step? A psychiatric ward? She hugged herself and tried to take deep breaths. These kinds of thoughts weren't helping the situation. Chloe? Darby was knocking on the door. Go away! More knocking. Go away! Chloe said loudly. Leave me alone! Well, that's just it. I can't. Chloe looked at the closed door in disbelief. What? I need you to take me back to school. Chloe let out a laugh, and Darby was calling her crazy. To think that she actually thought Chloe was going to take her anywhere. There was no freaking way. Darby knocked again. Chloe, please, I really need your help. I can't miss this next class because I have a test. Chloe shook her head and looked at the ceiling. Great. Next, Darby would be blaming her for failing a test. Fine, I'll take you. Just give me a minute. Chloe, what? Could you open the door so we can talk? Chloe jumped off the bed and threw open the door so quickly that Darby practically fell into the room. Sorry, she said dryly. I didn't realize you were leaning against the door. Darby recovered herself and looked around. Gosh, you are a neat freak. Excuse me? No wonder you were upset about the kitchen. Your bedroom looks like it came right out of Pottery Barn. Thanks, I think. No, I really like it. Maybe you could help me pick out a few things for my room. It was a lame attempt to patch things up between them, but at least Darby was trying. Chloe shrugged. Sure, whatever. Darby picked up a frame from the dresser. I recognize your mom. This must be your dad. Yeah. The picture had been taken on the beach during a family vacation. Darby put the picture down and sat on the edge of the bed. She tucked a curl behind her ear. Look... About what I said, I didn't mean don't worry about it. You know, crazy is a relative term. Chloe just looked at her, making Darby shift uncomfortably. What I mean is that my mom got it in her head that I was going to be a nurse like my Aunt Linda. And she about lost it when she realized that I wanted to be a police officer instead. The whole family thinks I'm crazy. As if a career choice could possibly compare to what she was going through. I understand what you're trying to do, but it isn't necessary. I already told you I'd take you back to school. I know. I just thought maybe we could talk about it. 
Chloe crossed her arms over her chest and leaned against the dresser. So what do you want to know? Well, this guy who died. My fiancé, Dan? Yeah, Dan. Do you really think you've seen him? Since his death, I mean. Hearing the words spoken out loud made the situation seem even more absurd. Darby gave her a nervous laugh. (laughs) I guess I deserved that. It's just that my mother told me, I'm not sure what you've heard, but whatever it is, I can assure you that it has most likely been blown way out of proportion. Darby gave her a speculative look. So you haven't been seeing a ghost? Chloe looked her in the eye. Do you believe in ghosts, Darby? Her eyes grew round. No, of course not. Well, me neither. Darby looked relieved. Any more questions? From the way Darby was chewing on her inner jaw, Chloe guessed she had a million of them. No, Darby finally said. No more questions. Good. Let's get you back to school. Just one more thing. Chloe stopped. I'll make a deal with you. I won't pay any more attention to this nonsense about you seeing your dead fiancé if you'll be a little more tolerant about my lack of housekeeping skills. Chloe chuckled. Lack of housekeeping skills, huh? I guess that's one way to phrase it. Darby smiled as she stood and held out her hand. Deal? They clasped hands. Deal. Hey, Darby said on the way out the door. If Dan does show up here one night, maybe we could put him to cleaning the house. Ha ha, real funny. Chloe was relieved that Darby was meeting with a study group and would be home late. The last thing she wanted was for her mother to get wind of her going on a date with a virtual stranger. Her nerves were jumping on ends, but it made her feel alive in a way she hadn't felt in a very long time. She had to put the past behind her once and for all and a date with a good-looking guy was the fastest way to do it. She was giving her cheekbones a final dusting with bronzer when she heard the doorbell. Here goes, she said to her reflection. Garrett, she said a little breathlessly when she opened the door. Hi. He looked her up and down, not trying to hide the appreciation in his eyes. Chloe had toyed with the idea of dressing down, but had ultimately decided to dress up instead choosing her favorite red blouse, black pencil skirt that hit just above the knees, and wedge sandals. It was a good thing, too, because Garrett looked dashing in his royal blue button-up shirt and jeans. Never date a guy that's prettier than you, Chloe, her mom had always told her. As good as Chloe looked this evening, Garrett looked better. He really was stunning, with his thick head of wavy blonde hair and sparkling smile. No tennis shoes? There was a hint of amusement in his eyes. She looked down at her sandals. Well, I did think about it, but then decided to wear these old things instead. He shook his head. I guess they'll have to do. They laughed. You ready? He asked. Sure. He surprised her by giving her a peck on the cheek and then pulling a single rose from behind his back. Her eyes widened. Thanks. I love flowers. She felt so darn awkward and unsure of herself around this sophisticated man. I'll be right back. Just let me put this in water. She walked quickly into the kitchen and grabbed the first thing she could find, a drinking glass with a chip in the top. It's a little too early for some guy to be sweeping you off your feet, she told herself. She needed to keep her feet planted firmly on the ground so she wouldn't get hurt again. She couldn't handle another heartbreak. When she walked back into the living room, she felt more composed and sure of herself, but that was short-lived. You drive a convertible BMW, she said when she stepped outside. He smiled and hit the clicker. Yep. Why was she not surprised? This guy had to have a flaw somewhere. She reached for the door handle, but he was faster. In fluid motion, he opened the door and helped her into the car. Thanks she mumbled. He drove the streets like they were an old familiar friend and seemed completely at ease, unlike her. She could feel her pulse pumping in her neck and her hands were clammy. They weren't talking and the silence was getting the best of her. She searched for something to say. You drive well. What? 
Her throat went dry. It was a stupid thing to say. She was just about to repeat it when he chuckled and put a hand over hers. Your hands are like ice. He gave her a confident smile. Relax. I don't bite. We're just going to dinner. Yes, she was acting a bit absurd and blowing things way out of proportion. She gave him a nervous laugh and then settled back in her seat. Garrett turned on the CD player, and the band Coldplay came over the speakers. I love the way the city looks at night, he said. Chloe looked out at the thousands of lights shimmering against the velvet darkness. When I was little, I used to pretend that they were stars that had fallen to the earth. Or diamonds, Chloe added. Garrett laughed and raised her hand to his lips. Spoken like a true woman. A few minutes later, they pulled into the parking lot of a trendy restaurant with a stacked stone exterior. Two large gas lamps, one on each side of the massive wooden door, flickered, casting shadows against the stone. When they entered, Chloe was impressed to find that the interior was just as charming as the outside. The aroma of freshly baked bread hung heavy in the air, making her mouth water. She took in the solid mahogany shelves filled with bottles of wines of different varieties and vintages. The shelves were a pleasant contrast to the opposite walls, which were a dark brick. An oval doorway led from the foyer into the actual restaurant. Wide wooden planks covered the floor, and intricate wrought iron encased the light fixtures. The place had a true authentic flavor, and judging from the amount of people waiting to be seated, she guessed the food must be good. How many? A blonde receptionist with a mouth too small for her teeth smiled at her. Two, Chloe said. What's the name? Chloe hesitated, not sure if she should give her name or let Garrett give his. The girl's polite smile changed to recognition when she saw Garrett step up. She retrieved two menus. Your table is ready. Right this way, please. She led them to a table by the window and then looked at Garrett. Is this okay? He rewarded her with a gracious smile. It's great. Thanks, Tammy. Chloe thought the woman was going to melt into a puddle right then and there. It was unsettling how much power this man wielded over the opposite sex. Do you come here often? Chloe said, wondering how many other women he'd brought here before her. He winked. Just when I want to impress someone. Chloe blushed and changed the subject. Whoever decorated this place did one heck of a job. I love the combination of the rustic with the trendy. This restaurant has a very comfortable feel. Garrett didn't comment, but instead opened his menu. As I told you earlier, the shrimp remoulade is excellent, and so is the calamari. Calamari? Isn't that... Octopus, he finished for her. Her face must have said it all, because he started laughing. It's really very good. They cut it in thin slices and fry it. I'm sorry, I just don't think I could ever eat octopus, regardless of how it's prepared. He looked disappointed. But you could order some if you want she said, trying to lighten the mood. Before he could answer, their waiter arrived, bringing them a basket of aromatic bread with honey butter. He took their drink orders, and Garrett ordered a sampler plate for the appetizer. How is the job hunting going? Garrett said. I found a couple of interesting-looking positions, Chloe lied. I'm going to send out a few resumes tomorrow. The truth of the matter was that she'd been counting on getting the job with Marsh Interiors and was now going to have to formulate a new plan. How's your job searching going? He gave her a funny look. My job search? Yeah, this morning when we ran into each other, you said you were late for an interview. He cocked his head, giving her an appreciative look. You have an excellent memory. So what type of job was it? I'm sorry, I'm not following you. What type of job were you interviewing for? He gave her a smooth smile. Let's not talk about work tonight. He reached for a slice of bread. Tonight we celebrate fate. She lifted an eyebrow. Fate? Yes, fate brought us together. She leaned back and crossed her arms. Really? I thought it was circumstance. I was going one direction and you were going the other. We ran into each other. She shrugged. It's as simple as that. He laughed. I like you, Chloe Kinsley. You're all right. His eyes caught hers. Call it what you will. 
I'm glad that our paths crossed. Chloe looked at the man who was approaching their table. For a second, she thought it was the waiter bringing the appetizer, but it was someone else. He was wearing a polo shirt and black slacks. She guessed him to be in his early 40s. He had a stocky build, and it was obvious from the bulging biceps and tapered waist that he spent a lot of time in the gym. His hair was thinning on top, and he had a closely trimmed goatee. Recognition instantly lit Garrett's features as he held out a hand to the man who clasped it in his. When did you get back in town? The man said. I've been trying to get in touch with you. The night before last, I was going to give you a call, Garrett said quickly. But things have been hectic. I see, the man said curtly. The tension between the two was sharp enough to cut, making Chloe feel uncomfortable. Garrett forced a smile. Relax, man. I'll stop by first thing in the morning. How's that? Good. Then as quickly as it had come, the stress seemed to fade from Garrett's features as he flashed a disarming smile in Chloe's direction. This is a friend of mine, Chloe Kinsley. She's a newcomer to the valley. Chloe, this is Sam Loudon, a business associate of mine. Nice to meet you, she said mechanically. The man's cold eyes swept over her. Likewise. We're just getting ready to eat. Do you want to join us? Garrett said. Chloe could only smile, hoping the man would refuse. No, I've just eaten. I'll catch up with you tomorrow morning at eight, right? There was an unmistakable warning in his voice. Sure thing. See you tomorrow. Garrett's voice was cheerful, but it sounded forced, making Chloe wonder what business Garrett was conducting with a man like that. The man left just as the waiter arrived with their drinks. Chloe squeezed the lemon into her water and took a sip, not tasting a thing. Garrett gave her a puzzled look. You okay? Yes, I'm fine. But she wasn't fine. Something about that man had set her on edge. It was a jolting reminder that she was on a date with a virtual stranger. She was way out of her league. Garrett studied her. What are you thinking? You have an odd expression on your face. Before she could answer, the waiter arrived to take their order. The appetizer arrived a few minutes later. They ate in silence until Garrett spoke. Don't let Sammy get under your skin. She frowned. Sammy? That man looked nothing like a Sammy. She suppressed a shiver. Yeah, he goes by Sam now. But when we were kids, he always went by Sammy. To me, that's what he'll always be. He comes across as a hard-nosed businessman on the outside, but he's really quite likable once you get to know him. I doubt that, she quipped. Garrett started laughing. Enough about Sammy. I want to talk about you. He reached across the table and placed a hand over hers. She had to fight the impulse to snatch her hand away. This was moving way too fast. Your hand is like ice. Are you cold? No. She pulled her hand away. Her reticence seemed to amuse him as he leaned back in his seat. Tell me more about how you came to be in Salt Lake. She took a sip of her water and crossed her legs and then gave him a short version of her life up until this point, leaving out Dan, of course. She told him about graduating from AIA and about all the odd jobs she'd worked at since, ending with how her last job was a consultant in a paint store. After graduating, I sent out over a 100 resumes, I think I got five interviews. Four of the places were looking for someone to sell paint. Garrett laughed. You're kidding. Well, I guess it wasn't quite that bad, but almost. And now, he prompted. The only legitimate interview for an interior decorator was for Marsh Interiors, and you know how that turned out. Chloe wiped her mouth and then folded her napkin. You can't blame the guy who interviewed me. I wouldn't hire someone who couldn't make it to an interview fully dressed. Well, if you put it that way, I guess you're right. What would you say about giving it another try? Chloe shook her head vigorously. There's no way I'm going back there and humiliating myself in front of those people. I could tell they thought I was the scum of the earth. The waiter arrived with their food. Chloe's steak and loaded baked potato looked mouth-watering. Garrett's tilapia with stuffed crab looked good, too. What do you think? Garrett said after she'd taken her first bite. Delicious. 
Would you like to try a bite of my stuffed tilapia? She wrinkled her nose in response. No, thanks. He laughed. You're missing out. They ate for a few minutes in silence until Garrett said, This Martian terriers thing. It couldn't have been that bad. Oh, yes, it was. She hoped that he would be able to tell from the tone in her voice that she was done talking about the interview. I'm tired of talking about me. Tell me about you. What do you want to know? Chloe shook her head. Well, for starters, you never answered my earlier question about which job you were interviewing for. My background is in architecture and design, but I'm dabbling in real estate on the side. Really? What type of design do you do? Interior design, both residential and commercial. Chloe took a sip of water, just as she'd suspected. Garrett was there in the building because he was interviewing for the same job at Marsh Interiors and didn't have the heart to tell her. A part of her was tempted to press him more about it, but she decided to let it go for now. Still, it was exciting to think that they shared the same background. Her estimation of Garrett went up a couple of notches, and she was itching to ask more about design. It would be great to be able to discuss her trade with someone. What are your plans for tomorrow? She nearly choked on her food. My plans? Was he asking because he wanted to go out again? I guess I'll take the woman's sneakers back to her and then start looking for a job. Good, was all he said, leaving her to wonder what he meant. When the meal was over, Garrett glanced at his phone. It's getting late, and I have some business to take care of before tomorrow. I'd better get you home. The next day, Chloe spent a couple of hours searching the Internet for job openings. Her thoughts kept going back to her date the night before. Garrett had taken her home and walked her to the door. She'd been worried that he would try to kiss her goodnight, but he gave her a peck on the cheek instead. He didn't mention going out another time, and as she watched him drive away, she realized that she didn't know if she would ever see him again. Perhaps he'd gone out of her life as suddenly as he'd come into it. At this point, it was hard to know if she was disappointed or relieved. Pickings were slim for jobs in design. The more she looked, the more frustrated she became. It was going to be nearly impossible to find a job in her field. Her next course of action would be to go around to all the design centers and introduce herself to the owners. If that didn't work, then she would have to get work wherever she could. She grew tired of searching and started surfing the net. That's when she noticed one of the topics on Fox News. The headline read, Coca-Cola heiress's jewels stolen from her Buckhead home over the weekend. Buckhead was an upscale suburb of Atlanta, Georgia. Chloe read that the jewels were estimated to be worth around $30,000. The article alluded to the fact that the authorities were still investigating the case, but were starting to suspect that it was another ghost theft. Chloe printed out the article to show Darby. She would love this, and it would go a long way toward mending their relationship. Darby was trying, so she needed to try too. When she'd gotten home from her date that night before, she was surprised that Darby had cleaned up the kitchen and the living room. Chloe had intended to compliment her the next morning, but Darby left for school before she got up. Beastie walked through the room and purred. Even the cat appreciated a clean house, she thought. Good morning, Chloe bent down and rubbed his back. He bowed up and then ran off. Fickle cat, she grumbled. After taking a quick shower, Chloe wrapped a towel around her head and one around her body. She was reaching for the blow dryer when the phone rang. Hey, are you up yet? Her mother's familiar voice came over the phone. Mom, how are you? I'm fine, honey. How are you? I didn't hear from you after the interview yesterday. Chloe sat down in a chair and told her mother all that had happened. I know you felt good about this job, Mom but it was a total and complete disaster. So much for new beginnings, she finished bitterly. The accusation of all that Chloe would never say aloud hung heavily between them. Because her mom kept harping about her good feelings about the job, Chloe got her hopes up only to have them dashed. Well, she could add this disappointment to the long list that was piling up.
There was a pause on the other end of the phone before her mom spoke. I'm sorry it didn't work out. I did feel good about it. Maybe that means that something else good is right around the corner. Chloe began twirling her hair around her finger. She seriously doubted that. Her mom's voice became practical as she launched into her pick-yourself-up-off-your-rear-end routine. Well, things happen for a reason. You need to return that girl's shoes and start looking for another job. Chloe was nodding her head as if her mother could see her. I know, Mom. Don't worry. I've already started looking. Just remember what I've always told you, Chloe. Pray like everything depends on the Lord, and work like everything depends on you, and everything will turn out okay. She rolled her eyes. I remember, Mom. She quickly changed the subject. By the way, how's Dad? Same as usual. You know how your dad is. He's missing you terribly, but he tries hard not to let on. Emotion clogged her throat as she felt homesick all of a sudden. I miss y'all, too. Tell him I said hello and that I love him. I will, honey. I love you, too, Mom. She could tell from the pause on the other end that her mom was trying to maintain her composure. Everything will work out, Chloe. I have a good feeling about you being there. Not that again. Okay, Mom. Gotta go. Bye. She ended the call. At this point, she was in survival mode, hanging on by her fingernails. She'd almost mentioned Garrett to her mom, but changed her mind. It would only freak her out, and she would most likely never see him again. She moped around for a few hours, feeling sorry for herself, and then she gave herself her own version of pick yourself up off your rear end. After that, she felt a little better. She spent the second half of the day watching TV and catching up on things she never had time for, like painting her nails and toenails. She put off going to Marsh Interiors until the following day, promising herself that she would hit it hard on the job search tomorrow as well. Today was a day for recouping. And despite the interview fiasco, she was glad she'd come to Salt Lake. It felt good to be in a new place. Perhaps a change of scenery was just what she needed to put the past behind her. Since she'd been here, she'd not dreamt of Dan, nor had she seen him. Maybe he was finally gone from her life. The thought was reassuring. At 5.30, Darby came through the door with her cell phone to her ear. The exam wasn't as hard as I thought it would be either. I do have to say, though, that going to the study group really helped. Chloe waited until she clicked off her phone before speaking. What do you want for dinner? I'll fix us something to eat. Wow, that's really tempting. But we'd better not cook anything because Susan's dropping off a casserole. Really? That's nice of her. Don't you feel funny eating her and Lila's food all the time? Darby shrugged. I could eat Lila's food all day, but Susan's? She stuck her finger in her mouth and pretended to gag. Is it that bad? Yeah, Susan thinks because Lila cooks so well that she can too. But the poor woman could scorch water. Well, I feel bad that she's going to that much effort for us. Don't feel bad. She wouldn't be happy if she weren't controlling something over here. They went into the kitchen where Darby opened the fridge and took out a Ziploc bag of strawberries, opened it, and popped one into her mouth. If the casserole's really nasty, then we can always get a pizza later. Okay, Chloe said reluctantly. She was learning that pizza was Darby's go-to food. And while she also liked pizza, she couldn't eat it 24-7. In the interest of getting along and mending fences, she decided not to make a big deal about it this time. Her thoughts turned another direction. Hey, I've got something for you. She returned a minute later and handed Darby the sheet of paper detailing the jewel heist in Atlanta. Darby read it with eager eyes. I was just talking about this with one of the guys in my class. They're thinking it might be another ghost theft. How can they tell? Well, the thief's so skilled that he leaves no trace. It's nearly impossible to do that. Normally, there's a random fingerprint or broken window. Something. 
Anyway, when there's absolutely no trace that the theft has taken place, it's considered to have been done by the ghost. Could there be more than one of them? Darby considered the question. I suppose. Yeah, anything's possible. But it's highly unlikely. The only thing is... She scrunched up her face. What? Well, it's not like the ghost to pull two jobs within a month of each other. He usually spaces them out. That way, there's less likelihood of him getting caught. There was another heist in San Francisco two weeks ago. That one is suspected to have been a ghost theft as well. It's not smart business. Now he's got the whole country looking for him. If you ask me, I'd say he's getting cocky. Or desperate. Darby looked at her funny. For the money, I mean. How could a thief who's raking in 15 to 30 grand each haul need money? Chloe shrugged. Well, you never know. He could have a lot of debts. High living's not cheap. A smile curved her lips. And the price of electricity is out of sight these days. They burst out laughing at the same time. A knock at the door caught their attention, and they looked to see Susan standing outside. No matter what the casserole looks like, just smile and say thanks, Darby said under her breath. The white sand was blistering hot under her feet. The shots fired around her like a thousand firecrackers exploding in rapid succession. She ran without reason. Her only thought was of Dan. Dan was out there in the whirling storm, and she had to get to him before it happened. The scene changed, and she was sitting on her bed. The whiteness of the comforter billowing around her, and then the bottle tipped. Blood-red polish flowing across the white. Dan's blood flowing on the sand. Dan's blood flowing on her hands. Chloe shot up in bed and moaned. Her hands all sticky. She was wet all over, drenched in her own sweat. She looked wildly around the room, her mind trying to distinguish between the dream and reality. A rustle caught her attention, and she looked toward the window. There was something there. The dread that choked over her was all too familiar as goosebumps rose over her flesh. She saw his face in the window. Dan! She gasped. She struggled to get out of bed, but got tangled in the covers and tumbled to the floor. The next second, she was on her feet and at the window. Dan! She peered out, her eyes scouring the yard for a trace of him. The swing in Lila's backyard was rocking wildly back and forth, and she had the insane impression that Dan was sitting there, waiting for her to join him. She ran down the hall to the front door. Without another thought, she unbolted the door, threw it open, and ran out into the night. Dan! She called her voice sounding hollow and strange as it floated across the night air. She ran around the backyard toward the swing, but stopped before she got there. The night was perfectly calm, not even the slightest hint of a breeze, and the swing was still. Chapter 6 When her alarm clock went off, Chloe hit the snooze button three times before dragging herself out of bed. The events from the night before came rushing back, bringing with it the despair that was all too familiar. So much for new surroundings and a fresh start. She went to the window and looked out, not sure what she was expecting to see. The swing looked cheerful in the morning light. Nothing sinister about it, just a plain wooden swing. She turned away from the window. She needed help. And the terrible part was that she was too afraid to tell anyone. A cold sweat broke across her forehead, and she sat down on the edge of the bed, trying to get a good breath. It'll be okay, she told herself. This too shall pass. I'll make it go away. After a few minutes, she felt better and more in control. She forced her mind away from the night before and focused on the day ahead. Today was the day she would have to go back to the design center to return the woman's shoes. Afterwards, she would continue her job search. By the time she got out of the shower, she could almost convince herself that the events from the night before were only a bad dream. To ensure that she wouldn't chicken out of going to Martian Terriers, Chloe phoned the receptionist and told her she would stop by to return the shoes. 
Then she turned her attention to getting dressed. She selected a pair of white pants and a tangerine blouse. She finished off the ensemble with a bangle bracelet and long earrings that dangled. She checked her appearance in the mirror and decided that she looked the part of an up-and-coming interior designer. Now she just needed to come across as a professional and avoid any pits in the sidewalks. Chloe's dark hair had a natural wave to it, but she flat-ironed it until it glistened like polished stone. Then, thinking the straightness was too severe, she used a curling iron to round the ends, giving her a softer look. She then applied tinted moisturizer, a few strokes of mascara, and lipstick, and she was ready to go. Darby didn't have any classes today, but she was already up and singing in the shower. With a little luck, she could grab a bagel and be out the door before Darby was finished. She didn't know whether or not Darby had heard her open the front door in the middle of the night, but she hoped to avoid any questions. Beastie came into the room and rubbed against her leg. She bent down to pet him, and he scurried out the door. You little traitor. You thought I was Darby, didn't you? What was it about that darn cat? It had taken him all of a week to transfer his affections to Darby. Five minutes later, and she was out the door and rushing head-on into Susan. Good morning, Chloe. Where are you off to? Just run in a few errands. Chloe said vaguely, not wanting to have to explain herself. Well, I'm glad I caught you. I wanted to see if I could borrow Beastie again. It sounded like she was asking to use the vacuum cleaner. Uh, sure. Do you want me to get him for you? No, I'll get him. She breezed past Chloe. Okay, bye, Chloe said, but Susan was already inside the house. So much for privacy, Chloe muttered under her breath. The girl who let her borrow the shoes was standing behind the desk when Chloe arrived at Marsh Interiors. She thought she remembered Mr. Singleton calling her Yvette, but wasn't sure, so she didn't call her by her name. I can't tell you how much I appreciate you letting me borrow your shoes, Chloe said, holding them out to her. She smiled. Glad to help. Well, thanks again, Chloe turned to leave. Wait, I told Hank you were coming today to return my shoes, and he said he would like to speak with you. Chloe froze. What does he want to speak with me about? Can I tell him you're here? She nodded. A second later, Hank Singleton appeared. He was younger than Chloe remembered, and a lot better looking. As a matter of fact, he reminded her of someone, but she couldn't quite put her finger on whom. What was it about him that seemed familiar? His features, his demeanor, or the expression on his face. Maybe all the above. Good morning, he said briskly, extending his hand like they were meeting for the first time. She smiled and reached for his hand. You wanted to see me, Mr. Singleton? He looked her up and down, making her feel that she was somehow subpar in his watchful eyes. Hank. She looked at him, not sure how to respond. You can call me Hank, he clarified. Oh, okay. An awkward laugh escaped her lips. Hank. He gave her a funny look. Now she knew why she hadn't found him attractive before. Talk about stiff. He motioned. Please, step into my office. She sat perched on the edge of her chair, waiting for him to speak. I feel that I owe you an apology. The last time we met, I'm afraid I may have been rude. May have been rude? He practically threw her out of his office. But she couldn't exactly bring that to his attention. Well, I guess it's not every day that a person shows up shoeless for a job interview. Admittedly, it was a poor attempt at humor, but she expected him to at least give her a courtesy laugh for the effort. When he didn't, her face flamed. You have to admit the circumstances were a bit unusual. She nodded. Yes, it's not every day that the heel of my shoe gets caught and that I go plowing into the sidewalk. He didn't even crack a smile. This guy was tough. I'm afraid we didn't have much of an interview last time, he said. No, we didn't. Well, if you don't mind, I'd like to interview you now. She licked her dry lips. Of course. 
Chloe could have sung hallelujahs all the way out of Hank Singleton's office. He offered her a job on the spot at a higher salary than she'd expected. Yvette looked up from her desk and gave Chloe a knowing smile. Things went better this time. Much! I got the job! Congratulations! Hank stepped out of his office and looked at Chloe quizzically, as if to ask why she was still there. Yvette, I need to see you for a minute. She shot out of her chair so fast that Chloe halfway expected her to salute him. Geez, what kind of man was he, anyway? See you Monday, he said curtly before turning his back to her. Chloe nodded, not that he stood around long enough to notice. She'd been dismissed and forgotten about for the moment. From the looks of things, this was going to be an interesting place to work. But she'd gotten the job. It was all she could do to keep from dancing her way to the car. She reached for her phone. Mom, I got the job, she said breathlessly. Congratulations, honey. Which one? At Marsh Interiors. Wow, honey, that's great. I told you I felt good about that job. There was a hint of reproof in her voice, which Chloe ignored. When do you start? Next Monday. I'm so excited. I can hardly stand it. You sound good. I am good, Mom. There was a pause. Is everything okay? I mean, well, have you had any more dreams? No, Mom, you don't have to worry. I'm not cracking up. The words came out sounding more abrupt than she'd intended, and she heard her mother's sharp intake of breath. I'm fine, she said a little kinder. Really, if you don't believe me, just ask Darby. I believe you, honey. Another pause. I just worry about you, that's all. Well, don't, she snapped. A beep interrupted them. Mom, I've got another call coming in. I'll call you back later, okay? Love you. She answered the call, surprised to hear Darby's voice. Chloe, you've got to get home now. Chloe's heart lurched. Had something happened to Beastie? She would have never let Susan take him. What's wrong? Nothing. Shoes. What? A man arrived a few minutes ago from Dillard's department store, and he's been bringing in boxes of shoes for the past five minutes. Confusion swirled around Chloe. But I didn't order. Darby's squeal cut her off short. Are those Birkenstocks? You won't believe this. Tom's, Janani Benini, Calvin Klein, Jessica Simpson, Antonio Milani, Nike. Oh my gosh, this is incredible. What size shoes do you wear? She let out an impatient huff when Chloe remained silent. Hello? Are you there? I'm here. I thought you were talking to that man in the background. Well, you want to know my shoe size? Yeah. Seven and a half. Darby started laughing like she was deliriously happy. Yes! Chloe shook her head. I don't understand. What's going on? Why are you naming shoe brands? Who did you say was there? Darby was too busy talking to the man to answer. Thank you! What for? Chloe said and then realized that Darby wasn't talking to her. She rolled her eyes. Darby was so exasperating. Why did she even bother calling when she was obviously caught up in another conversation with some delivery man? You there? Darby practically yelled. Chloe held the phone away from her ear and winced. I'm here. There's a card. This was getting old fast. She blew out a breath. Darby, I don't have a clue what you're talking about. Mind if I open it? What? The card. Is it addressed to me? Darby laughed. Well, duh. Who else? Chloe rolled her eyes. As if I have a choice in the matter, she mumbled. Go ahead. Ooh, this is juicy. Huh? It says, Dear Chloe, I hope you'll accept this little token of my appreciation for the wonderful evening we spent together. I look forward to many more. Yours truly, Garrett. What token? Chloe asked dubiously. Darby hooted. 
an entire house full of shoes. Chloe had just about had enough. It was all she could do to keep her voice even. If she'd been talking to Darby in person, she would have strangled her. I haven't heard a word you've been telling me. You keep spouting off things in disjointed sentences, and half the time, you're not even talking to me. Could you please tell me what the heck is going on? Okay, already. I'll start from the beginning. Jeez, don't get your panties in a wad. I was getting caught up on homework, and the doorbell rang. I went to answer it, and there was a man standing on the porch. He said he was from Dillard's department store and that he had a delivery for Chloe Kensley. Then he started bringing in boxes of shoes. What kind of shoes? All kinds. Some are dress shoes, others are casual. There's even a pair of Timberland hiking boots. If you don't want them, then maybe I could... How many pair of shoes? Just a minute. Let me count them. There was some rustling in the background before Darby returned a couple of minutes later. Thirty-two in all. I've never seen so many beautiful shoes in my life. How did you... She blustered. I mean, when did you meet... Who is this guy? Chloe was stunned. He sent her 32 pair of shoes after one date. Unbelievable. Are you there? Yeah, just shocked, she laughed. I can't believe he sent me all of those shoes. Why shoes? Remember the other day when I went for the interview that ended so disastrously? She didn't spell out that Darby's taking her car was the largest contributor to the mishap. Anyway, I ruined my shoe and had to go to the interview shoeless. On my way out, I ran into Garrett, literally, and we ended up going out. On a date? Yeah. But you never said anything. You never asked. Darby laughed. Well, aren't you just a little spitfire? Everyone's all worried about your pining away over your dead fiancé, and here you are going out with some guy. Is he cute? Oh, he's more than cute. Another squeal. <laughs> this one followed by a deviant giggle. <laughs> what does he look like? Blonde, lean, kind of like Brad Pitt. Almost too handsome, if you know what I mean. Oh, no, a man can never be too handsome or rich like this one obviously is. If you say so, Chloe had been driving the entire time they were talking and now was less than five minutes away from their house. Do you mind if I try some of them on? Chloe smiled at the eagerness in Darby's voice. Knock yourself out. I'll be there shortly. The first thing Chloe saw when she stepped through the door was Darby sitting in the living room floor, trying on shoes. A feeling of awe tingled over her as she looked at the assortment of beautiful shoes. Wow, she murmured, dropping her purse on the couch. Wow, indeed, Darby agreed, shoving her foot into a gold high-heeled sandal. Chloe sat down on the floor beside her. I don't know what to think. She picked up a pair of toms that were white, woven pattern made of canvas. This guy must be really something. Yeah, she put down the toms and reached for the skinny red sandals made by Gianni Beanie. Did you say he left me a card? Darby motioned. It's on the side table, she said absently, her attention immediately going back to the shoes as she removed the gold sandal and tried on the pink Nike tennis shoes. Chloe went to the table and picked up the card. It was just as Darby had read it over the phone. A simple note, nothing more. She turned it over. It was blank on the back. Mixed motions warned inside her as she looked at the shoes. They were amazing. Any girl's dream. And yet she felt guilty for accepting such an extravagant gift from someone she'd only just met. Her mother would be mortified if she saw this. Then it dawned on her that she had no way to contact Garrett. He'd not left his number on the card, and she'd not even thought to get his last name. How could she have gone on a date with a guy and not even got his last name? A sense of shame came over her as she stood looking down at the pile of shoes. The right thing to do would be to return them to Dillard's, but that would be awkward and rude, 
and she didn't even know from which Dillard's they'd come. She blew out a breath and gathered her hair into a ponytail, holding it high on her head. Darby looked up and saw her expression. Are you okay? Yeah, just a little overwhelmed. No one has ever given me something like this before. She frowned. I'm not sure what to think. That's your problem. You think too much. I just don't want to give Garrett the wrong idea. We went out to dinner once. We're not a couple. I'm not sure what his expectations are. She motioned to the shoes. Maybe we should return them. Darby gawked. Don't be such a Debbie Downer. Relax. An amazing guy gives you a few pair of shoes. So what? Not just a few pair of shoes, but a 32 pair of expensive shoes. Look, you came here to start a new life. You've met a great guy who obviously appreciates you. What's the problem? I don't know. It's just all happening so fast. Darby looked her up and down, her lips puckered. You really are wound up tight. At this rate, you're going to blow your cork before you're 30. She tugged on Chloe's hand. I want you to do yourself a favor. Sit down. Chloe made a face. What? Sit down, Darby repeated insistently. Begrudgingly, Chloe complied. The guy sent you shoes, not a wedding ring. Go on a few dates with him and see how it goes. If it doesn't work out, you can go your separate ways. What have you got to lose? The exasperated look on Darby's face made her feel foolish. Maybe she was making a big deal out of nothing. I suppose it wouldn't hurt to give him a chance, Chloe said thoughtfully. Good. It's settled, Darby said matter-of-factly. She handed her the red sandals. Try these on. I don't want to try them on, Chloe countered. Beastie sauntered into the room. Hey, boy, Chloe said. Come here. He gave her a disinterested look, walked past her, and then rubbed against Darby's leg. See, even Beastie wants you to try them on. Darby began stroking his back, and he purred loudly. Chloe's eyes narrowed. The traitor. Do yourself a favor for one small moment. Be less like you and more like me. Live a little, she shrugged. What can it hurt? If only she could be more carefree and cavalier like Darby. She'd played by the rules for her entire life, and it had gotten her nowhere. Maybe Darby was right. Maybe she did need to let go a little. Fine, I'll try on the shoes, she grumbled. A minute later, she held out her foot for inspection, much like Darby had done earlier. What do you think? A smile curved Darby's lips as she gave Chloe an appreciative look. Fabulous! I believe there may be hope for you yet. Chapter 7 Chloe's eyes popped open at the first sound of her alarm clock. She'd gotten a good night's sleep, devoid of any loud music blaring from Lila's house and no dreams of Dan. She stretched and threw back the covers. Today was the first day of the rest of her life and the day she would start her new job at Marsh Interiors. This time, she was determined to make sure that everything went smoothly. She hopped out of bed and stood, eyeing the clothes she'd laid out to wear the night before. In the light of day, they looked too formal, so she hung them back in the closet. She sifted through her clothes, finally deciding on a pair of chocolate-colored pants and a matching blouse, trimmed in an Aztec gold design. Her 14-karat gold loop earrings would add the perfect touch, and she would wear her hair piled high on her head because her mom said it made her look more professional. And, thanks to Garrett, she had some stylish Antonio Milani pumps to complete the outfit. After applying bronzer to her cheeks, mascara, and peach lip gloss, she decided she couldn't do any better. Hurriedly, she grabbed her purse and headed for the door. Beastie trailed after her but made a beeline for Darby's room when Chloe bent down to pet him. See you tonight, Beastie. I know you'll miss me, she said sarcastically while closing the door. When Chloe arrived, Yvette led her to a desk in the back adjacent to a glassed-in office where one of the executives worked. She gave Chloe a stack of employment papers to complete. 
I'll come back in about an hour to take you around to introduce you to everyone. Chloe nodded and took the papers. She had just finished completing them when Yvette returned. Do you have any questions? Chloe shook her head. No, it was pretty self-explanatory. You can always change things if you need to. They're not strict about it. Thanks. That sounds great. Yvette gave her a cheerful smile. Let's introduce you to the team. Chloe stood and smoothed down her pants. Okay, let's do it. Yvette chuckled. The first day is always the hardest. You'll get the hang of things pretty quick. We're a small team, but very efficient. She introduced Chloe to Kate Dillon, the only other designer at Marsh Interiors. Kate looked to be in her late 40s and fit the part of the successful designer to the letter. Her blonde hair curved on her shoulders, and she was dressed to the nines. She was only passably cordial, and it was clear from the way her bright blue eyes raked over Chloe that she would view her as competition on every level. When Kate started peppering her with questions about the trade, Yvette had to step in and rescue her. Now don't go monopolizing Chloe. I still have to introduce her to a couple more people. Of course you do, Kate said, offering a smile that didn't reach her eyes. Disappointment settled over Chloe as they stepped out of Kate's office. The woman was obviously not pleased that Hank had hired her. In her interview, Hank had told her Kate had been the only designer for years, but due to an increase in business, she was no longer able to handle everything, hence the need to hire another designer. Hank had warned her that Kate was a little concerned that he was hiring someone else. That was a blatant understatement. At least Kate was the only other designer she would have to deal with. When too many designers worked in one place, things tended to get fiercely competitive, with everyone vying to get the best projects, a group of female sharks circling around the fresh meat trying to get the biggest piece. Next, Chloe met Butch Stanley, who handled the books. He was a large, jovial man in his mid-fifties who looked like he would be more at home in a manufacturing setting than in an upscale design firm. He was a breath of fresh air compared to Kate. He told her several jokes before Yvette finally said they needed to leave. When they were walking down the hall, Yvette turned to Chloe and lowered her voice. The last person I want to introduce you to is Hank's brother. He's one of the most eligible bachelors in Salt Lake, a real lady killer. Her eyes flashed with what looked like resentment. Be careful, she continued. If you don't keep your guard up, he'll sweep you off your feet and then dump you the second some new girl comes along. It was obvious from Yvette's bitter tone that she was speaking from experience. Chloe straightened her shoulders. Thanks for the warning, but I can assure you I have no intentions of getting mixed up with the owner's brother. The words came out harsher than she'd intended, but Yvette looked more relieved than surprised. Chloe realized then that Yvette still had feelings for Hank's brother. She felt an unexpected connection with Yvette, who was obviously nursing a broken heart. Chloe knew exactly how it felt to be used and then cast aside. A fierce dislike for Hank's brother welled in her breast, even though she'd never met him. Yvette stopped at the office that was next to Hank's. She put her hand on the doorknob. You ready? Chloe gave her a brief smile. Of course. Yvette knocked once and then opened the door. I brought the new employee to meet you. She motioned for Chloe to follow. The office was totally different from Hank's. The walls were bright white. The decor was modern and sparse, giving it a cold feel. The desk was made of metal with two red lacquer chairs facing it. There was a sitting area to the right that was comprised of a charcoal leather sofa with two club chairs arranged around a glass coffee table. The combination would have been monochromatic were it not for the exotic multicolored rug underneath the furniture. It looked very expensive. Large photographs of outdoor scenes mounted on acrylic adorned all of the walls except for the one behind the desk, where there was a streamlined bookshelf that was expertly arranged with abstract sculptures and books. Hank's brother was sitting in a red high-back leather chair with their back to them. He had a phone to his ear. A moment later, he ended the call and turned. Chloe reached and took hold of one of the chairs to steady herself. 
Her mouth dropped when Garrett rose and came around the desk. He extended his hand as if they'd never met. I'm Garrett Singleton. It's a pleasure to meet you. Welcome aboard. She opened her mouth to ask him what kind of joke he was pulling, but the warning expression in his eyes stopped her. It's nice to meet you, she said, thrusting out her hand. He took it in his, holding it longer than was necessary. Chloe's face flamed when she saw Yvette look at her in Garrett's clasped hands. She quickly removed her hand. Garrett gave her a coy look. Nice shoes. Her eyes went round as she looked down at the pumps. Humiliation burned through her veins, and she wanted to crawl under the rug. She cringed at the furious look that twisted over Yvette's face. Garrett smiled, never taking his eyes off Chloe. Thanks, Yvette. I'll do the introductions from here. You can go back to work. Yvette looked like she might protest. She gave Chloe a withering look before turning and leaving the room. Chloe's knees gave way, and she sat in one of the chairs across from Garrett's desk. You have a lot of explaining to do. Garrett laughed and returned to his seat. What do you want me to explain? Why didn't you tell me you were Hank's brother? That's why he hired me, wasn't it? I thought it was odd when Hank called me into his office that day when I returned the shoes. And when you said you had an interview, you meant that you were going to interview me. Accusation hung heavy in her voice. Garrett held up his hands. Hold on. Let's not get ahead of ourselves. First of all, I promise I had nothing to do with Hank's decision to hire you. I just told him that he needed to give you another chance. And he did. Besides... He's the one that wanted to interview you from the get-go, so it wasn't too hard to persuade him to interview you again. Her eyes went hard as everything came together. It hurt to think that she'd been had. You should have told me who you were from the beginning. He spread his hands in defeat. You're right. I should have. But you were so upset about botching the interview that I didn't want to risk it. She shook her head. I don't understand. Had you known who I was, you never would have agreed to have dinner with me. His eyes met hers. Don't deny it. You're right. I wouldn't have, she admitted. A smile tugged on his lips as he leaned back in his seat and crossed his legs. But see, you did have dinner with me, and we had a wonderful time. He leaned forward, eyeing her. Let me rephrase that. I had a wonderful time. What about you? He was really giving her a puppy dog look. She didn't know whether she wanted to hug him or slap him. There was a naive, childlike quality about Garrett that was endearing and frustrating all at the same time. Everything seemed like it was a game to him. He kept looking at her with those probing eyes, and she felt herself soften. Yeah, it was nice, she said stiffly. Silence settled between them, and she shifted in her seat, unsure what to say next. Had she known who Garrett was, she never would have gone out with him. Dating the owner's brother was a complication she didn't need, not to mention the fact that she didn't relish the thought of making an enemy out of Yvette. But there was no going back. She had gone out with Garrett, and there was still the matter of the shoes. She sought for a way to open up that conversation as she watched him pick up a lime green exercise ball. From the way he began methodically squeezing it, she could tell it was something he did routinely, almost without thinking. About the shoes. They look nice on you. Yes. She took a deep breath. You didn't have to do that. He waved the comment away with a flick of his hand. I know. That's why they call it a gift. I would have called you earlier to thank you, but I didn't know how to reach you. The words rushed out in a nervous huff. He put down the ball. Chloe, relax. It's going to be okay. He stood and came around the desk. Then he sat down in the chair beside her and reached for her hand. He flashed her that dazzling smile that had caught her attention from the beginning, and she could see the confidence radiating in his blue eyes. How we met is not important. There was something so captivating about him that it took effort to hold her train of thought. It's not? He chuckled. No, it's not. 
He began rubbing his thumb back and forth against the top of her hand. Heat crawled up her neck. This whole thing felt terribly inappropriate. What's important is that we did in fact meet. He continued smoothly, gazing into her eyes. She felt like a fly that was caught in a spider's web. And the spider in question happened to be very easy on the eyes and ultra charming. Yvette was right. He was a lady killer, and if she weren't careful, she'd be his next casualty. As she was trying to figure out a way to diplomatically remove her hand, the door opened. Her heart dropped when she saw Hank step into the room. His face went a shade darker when he realized that Garrett was holding her hand. Chloe wanted to die right then and there. Garrett dropped her hand and let out an uneasy laugh. <laughs> hey, bro. I was just welcoming our newest employee. I can see that, Hank shot back. His eyes met Chloe's, and she cringed at the disappointment she saw in them. A hot shame pelted over her, so much for making a good impression on the boss. Yvette told me where you were, Hank said briskly. I'm sure she did, Chloe wanted to say. She pressed her lips together in a tight line. I need to get you briefed on the current projects so that you'll be up to speed at the staff meeting this afternoon at 2 p.m. Of course, Chloe stood. See you later, Garrett touched her arm. Irritation sparked over her as she gave him a curt nod and quickly stepped around him. Garrett needed to take his Casanova attitude down a notch or she'd be out of a job faster than she could blink. Her eyes went to Hank, who looked like he could bite nails. He motioned. This way. He turned on his heels and charged off down the hall so quickly that she had to practically jog in order to keep up with him. Chloe looked up as Hank strode into the conference room and took his place at the head of the table. Yvette came in behind him, a notepad in hand. Kate entered next, followed by Butch. Everyone commenced to make small talk. Chloe had not seen Garrett since the incident in his office, and she wondered where he was. Judging by the way Hank kept glancing at the clock, she figured he was wondering the same thing. Hank had spent two hours going over projects with her in explicit detail. Several times, she was tempted to try and explain her association with Garrett, but there never seemed to be a good time. Furthermore, Hank's demeanor was so businesslike that it bordered on rudeness. Clearly, he was determined to keep the relationship on a purely personal level. At ten minutes past the hour, Hank cleared his throat. Thanks, everyone, for being here today. We need to get started. First, I'd like to officially welcome Chloe Kensley. Let me say on behalf of the entire team that we are looking forward to working with you. Thank you. She looked around the room. I'm excited to be here. Garrett strode in and chose the seat beside her. Hank gave him a look that could kill. You're late, he said flatly. Sorry, it couldn't be helped. I got held up on a phone call. He turned his attention to Chloe, smiling at her like she was the only person in the room. Welcome to the team. She swallowed and nodded, ignoring the curious looks that were flashing between Kate and Butch. Yvette was scowling like she wanted to wring her neck. Chloe pulled at her collar that suddenly felt tight around her neck. When Garrett placed his hand on her knee, she knocked it away, giving him a look that said, Back off. A look of surprise flickered over Garrett's face, but he recovered quickly. Chloe angled herself so that she was facing away from him. Date or no date, he had no right to treat her like his plaything. If she had any hope of gaining her co-worker's respect, she would have to distance herself from Garrett. Hank turned to Kate. How's the Westland Project coming? Kate opened a file and pulled out a series of sketches. She placed them in the center of the table for all to see. Kate pointed to the first sketch, which depicted a majestic antebellum home with six columns across the front of a spacious porch. The first phase, the exterior, is now complete. Phase two will consist of a remodel of the main level, including a complete rebuild of the kitchen. The client wants to maintain the traditional style of the home, but yet give it a fresh appeal that's more of a traditional nature. As it is now, the kitchen is too small, she pointed. We'll remove the wall between the kitchen and the adjoining room, creating a larger, more functional space. 
Of course, we'll add all of the modern updates, including double gas ovens and two dishwashers. Mr. Westland is a weekend chef, and he and his wife love to entertain. Do you have the contractors lined up? Yes, I've contracted with Chet Matheson to do the work. His crew is planning on starting this coming Monday. How are we on the budget? So far, so good. The Westlands understand that we didn't originally account for the upgraded appliances, and they're willing to pay the additional cost. Chloe looked at the sketches of the home. Her eye caught on a photograph, and she pulled it closer to get a better look. The home was in a historical section, and it was even more impressive in the photograph than in the sketches. Talk about good bones. What she would give to get her hands on that house. As if reading her mind, Hank looked at Chloe. I would like you to work with Kate on this project. That sounds great, she said enthusiastically, smiling at Kate, who looked anything but pleased. I don't think that's a good idea, Garrett said. All eyes turned to him. Why not? Annoyance was written over Hank's face. I have a couple of projects that I would like Chloe's expertise on. From looking at her portfolio, I can tell that she's an expert on color and textiles, which is precisely what is needed on the Hamptons project. We're pushing that tight deadline, and with my upcoming travel schedule, I don't think I can do it alone. Chloe's heart sank as she looked at Hank, waiting for his answer. The last thing she wanted was to work closely with Garrett. He was starting to tick her off. Fine. I'll work with Kate on the Westland project, and you can keep Chloe busy. Hank said. The way Hank said it made Chloe feel like a piece of meat. Heat scorched over her as she lifted her chin in the air. I can work with Kate and Garrett. Hank looked doubtful. Are you sure? These are some demanding projects, and the work has to be pristine. No detail left undone. Her eyes cut into Hank's, and she didn't back down one inch. Contrary to what you might think, this isn't my first rodeo. I'm perfectly capable of doing both projects and anything else you want to throw at me. She heard Butch suppress a chuckle. Hank met her gaze full on. Okay then, let's see what you're made of. Chapter 8 Susan placed a basket of hot bread in the center of the table and sat down. Okay, tell us all about it. Shortly after Chloe had arrived home from work, Susan announced that she was baking lasagna, which she would bring over so they could have a celebratory dinner for Chloe on completing her first day on the job. Even though Chloe was mentally exhausted and wanted nothing more than to eat a quick dinner and go to bed early, she was touched by the gesture. And so she looked around the small table where she, Susan, and Darby were gathered. She suddenly felt grateful that she was surrounded by people who cared. Chloe reached for a roll and spread a generous slice of butter on it, trying to formulate her thoughts to give a full report. It went about the way you would expect for the first day. She went through the list, naming things that had happened, leaving out the parts about Garrett. I've been assigned some great jobs and I'm excited to be able to prove myself. She finished by telling them about the Westland Project and how she was thrilled to be working on a historical home. How exciting! Susan said, helping herself to a second slice of lasagna. I would love to tour the home when you're done. Yes, I'm sure we can work something out. I mean, I haven't met the owners yet, but most people are excited to show off their finished homes. Susan looked at Darby. How was your day? We finished up a segment on serial killers. My professor was debunking the myth that there are no black serial killers. Chloe nearly laughed out loud at the contrast between her work and Darby's schooling. She managed to keep a straight face by focusing on her food rather than the conversation. The lasagna was not the best she'd had, but thankfully it was leaps better than the chicken casserole Susan had made a few days ago. Yeah, I've heard that, Susan said. Well, it's not true. Have you heard of Anthony Sowell, Wayne Williams, Andre Crawford? Darby began telling about the murders in graphic detail, to the point where Chloe lost her appetite. She looked at Susan's horrified expression and knew she'd better say something to change the conversation. You said you'd just finished up that segment. What are you studying now? Oh, we're starting into theft. My professor is an aficionado of jewel thieves. Have you guys heard of Bill Mason? 
She went on to tell them all about the heists. When Darby got to talking, there was no shutting her up. Her mouth started moving at warp speed, and all she and Susan had to do was to supply the perfunctory, uh, huh, or wow, in the appropriate places. This went on for about 20 minutes until someone knocked at the back door. Before they could open it, Lila rushed in. Hi, girls. Breathless excitement tinged her voice. I have something I want to show you. She placed a box on the table and then looked at the food. Looks good. Susan gave Chloe a knowing smile. Why don't you have some dinner with us while you're here? I think I will. First, let me show you what I've got. She opened the box that was full of earrings and necklaces. Pete brought back a bunch of odds and ends from the jewelry show. He's willing to sell them for a song. Lila fixed herself a plate while Susan took the pieces out of the box and laid them on the table. She and Darby acted like children in a candy store, picking up each piece and holding it up to them. Speaking of jewelry, we were just talking about all the heists that were taking place lately. I know, Pete said it was the talk of the show. Susan handed Chloe a pair of ruby earrings set in a cluster of diamonds. These would be beautiful on you and your dark hair and eyes. Chloe held the earrings up and admired them. They caught the light and reflected it back in sparkles. Are they real? Lila chuckled. I wish. She waved a hand. Mostly cut glass, but it's still quality stuff. How much do you want for them? It would be at least two weeks before Chloe got her first paycheck, and her funds were running low. Moving across the country had cost her more than she thought it would. How does six dollars sound? Amazing, Darby interjected. I saw a pair of earrings like them in the mall for 40 bucks. She reached for a pair of emerald earrings. How about these? The same. I'll take these, Chloe said. How much for the matching necklace? Lila pursed her lips. Tell you what, I'll sell you both of them for $10. Thank you, that's very generous. Chloe could think of at least three outfits that would go well with the jewelry. She had a few nice clothes, but would need to buy more now that she was working full time. In the meantime, she would have to think of a clever way to stretch her existing wardrobe until she could afford to buy new things. The doorbell rang. Darby looked at Chloe. Who could that be? Are you expecting anyone? No. Darby went to answer it. A second later, she came back, a mischievous grin on her face. It's for you. Really? Who is it? Chloe wrinkled her nose. Not another delivery. Please let it not be another delivery. She couldn't handle that tonight. After the staff meeting, Chloe had made a hasty exit, so she wouldn't have to talk to Garrett. She'd successfully managed to avoid him the remainder of the day. Surely he'd not sent her something else. Delivery? I didn't realize you got a delivery, Susan said, interest lighting her eyes. Chloe stood. Who is it? Darby flashed a mischievous smile. Go see for yourself. As Chloe left the kitchen, Darby began wagging her tongue again, telling Susan and Lila all about how Garrett had given her the shoes. She figured at the rate Darby was going, she would have Chloe's entire life history spelled out by the time she returned to the kitchen. When she stepped into the living room, she was stunned to see Garrett standing by the front door, holding a single red rose in his hand. She stopped in her tracks. Hey! He gave her a hesitant smile. Hey! He held out the rose. This is for you. I know I brought you one last time, but I couldn't resist doing it again. She took it. Thanks, he motioned to the couch. May I sit down? She thought fast. The last thing she wanted was for anyone to come into the living room and see Garrett. Or worse, what if he had overheard them talking about him? Um, let's go outside and sit on the front porch. Okay, or we could go for a drive. Yes, let's do that. While she didn't relish the thought of being alone with Garrett, it would give her the chance to talk to him uninterrupted without anyone looking on. Hold on, let me tell my roommate I'm going out. She made sure to place the rose on the table in the hall before she went back into the kitchen. When Chloe stepped into the room, Darby was at the point in her narrative where Chloe learned that Garrett was Hank's brother. The instant she saw Chloe, she stopped talking and gave her a sheepish grin. Were your ears burning? 
I was just filling these guys in on your day. Susan lifted an eyebrow, a coy expression on her face. When you told me about your first day, you left out all the juicy parts. Chloe shot Darby a withering look. No, just the humiliating parts. She made the mistake of confiding in Darby about the day's events right after she got home from work. That would certainly never happen again. Darby's face turned cherry red as she tucked both sides of her hair behind her ears. Oh, don't get miffed at Darby, Lila said, patting Darby's hand. Susan and I had to practically beat the information out of her. Yeah, I can tell, Chloe rolled her eyes. Darby smirked. Geez, sorry, I didn't realize you'd be so touchy about it. There was so much more that she could have said at that moment, but she decided to take the high road instead. I'm going for a drive with Garrett. I'll be back after a while. Susan, thanks for dinner. And Lila, I'll get you the money for that jewelry tomorrow. No rush, Lila said. Susan winked. Have fun with your man. Thanks, she mumbled as heat crept up her neck. Chloe watched as Garrett took his napkin and thoroughly cleaned each piece of silverware before arranging it beside his plate so that it was equally spaced. He'd already sent his pie back because it wasn't hot enough for his taste. His car was immaculate, and even though it was getting late and they'd had a busy day at work, he still looked as neat and fresh as he had when she first saw him earlier in the day. Now that she thought about it, his office was perfect too. There was not a single thing not even a sheet of paper out of place. She was a neat freak herself, but Garrett took things to the next level. He had a set of ideas of how things were supposed to be, and he expected everyone, including her, to get in line with those expectations. Well, he would have to get used to disappointment where she was concerned, because she certainly wasn't going to jump on command. She picked back up on the conversation they had begun when they got into his car. It's like I told you earlier. I don't feel comfortable getting involved with someone that I work with. If we didn't work together, then maybe things would be different. But as it is... She let the words dwindle out. He leaned back against the booth and gave her a casual smile, but she could tell he was getting agitated from the way he kept drumming his fingers on the table. And I told you, it's not a big deal. Well, it's a big deal to me, he shrugged. If you're that worried about it, I could always talk to Hank and get him to let you go. That way we could date and you wouldn't have to worry about it. She went stiff as her heart began to race. What? Her throat felt tight, and she swallowed hard. How could you say something like that? She blinked rapidly to stay the tears. I'm joking. I would never do that. I'm trying to lighten up the mood a little. He looked apologetic. Hey. I was just kidding, honest. She clasped her hands tightly in her lap and looked away. I shouldn't have said that. I didn't realize it would upset you. I truly am sorry. He touched her arm. He looked sincere, but how could she be sure? Now that the words had been spoken, she would always have the fear hanging over her. She got the feeling that if she ended things here and now, that he would cause her serious problems. And she needed this job. It was like trying to dance around a landmine without getting her foot blown off. I give you my word that our relationship has nothing whatsoever to do with your job. She still didn't fully trust him, but she relaxed a little. Okay. She had to try and make him understand where she was coming from. Garrett, my reservations about the relationship have nothing to do with you. You're fantastic. He beamed, but she wasn't finished. I'm just not ready for a serious commitment right now. I'm still dealing with some things from a past relationship that went terribly wrong. He gave her a sympathetic smile. Who isn't? He sat up and rubbed a hand across his forehead. We don't have to rush things. He peered into her eyes, and she was struck by how incredibly handsome he was. And she could tell from his confident expression that he knew it. He thought if he kept looking at her with those puppy dog eyes that she would melt and give him whatever he wanted. It was tempting. He was so captivating and charismatic, and he obviously liked her. Maybe she should be more like Darby and throw caution to the wind. Let's just take things slow and see where they end up. No pressure. He reached for her hand. 
What about you and Yvette? She knew she'd hit a nerve when she saw him tense. He let go of her hand. What did she tell you? Only that you're the most eligible bachelor in Salt Lake. A real lady killer. He scoffed. Yvette doesn't know what she's talking about. She arched an eyebrow. Really? Because I kind of got the impression that the two of you dated and that you broke up with her. The corners of his lips turned down. We only went out on a couple of dates. That's it. I never let her on or pretended that it was anything more than it was. Oh, you mean dates like what we're on right now? It's not like that, he said quickly, giving her a pleading look. This is different. She cocked her head. How so? He looked flustered for a minute until a sly smile stole across his lips. You're baiting me, aren't you? Her eyes turned to saucers. No, I'm just trying to figure you out. Amusement twinkled in his eyes. Oh, you want to know more about me? Yes, I do. Well, I think I can handle that. He said with a sure smile. And just like that, he was in control of the conversation once more as the charm oozed out. He talked about his love for cars and extreme sports like rock climbing, bungee jumping, skydiving, and even snow kiting, whatever the heck that was. The more he talked, the more uncomfortable Chloe became. She and Garrett had nothing in common, making her wonder what it was he saw in her. Tell me about your childhood, she said when the conversation lagged. He rested his arm on the back of the booth. I grew up in the valley. My father left when I was three, leaving my mom to take care of Hank and me. Oh, I'm so sorry, he shrugged. I don't remember much about him. We grew up in an apartment building. My mom was a saint who did everything she could to put a roof over our heads and food on the table. She worked as a sales clerk in a department store and did laundry and ironing for the neighbors. Is Hank your only sibling? Yes, he paused as a pained expression came over his face. It's just the two of us now. Mom passed away from leukemia five years ago. He picked up his glass and swirled around the ice before lifting it to his lips. She got the impression that he was swallowing down his emotions along with the drink. I'm sorry, she repeated, not sure what else to say. Loss was hard, and she knew from personal experience that there were no words that could help ease the pain. He acknowledged the comment with a slight nod. How many years apart are you and Hank? Two years and four months, he smiled. Want to guess who's the oldest? Hank, for sure. A playful smile tugged at his lips. Yeah, he looks quite a bit older than me, doesn't he? She wrinkled her nose. A little, maybe, but he acts older. He gave her a crestfallen look. You think so? She took a sip of her drink. Yes, I do. Hank's the responsible one, for sure. So how did the two of you end up in business together? Hank went to BYU and got a business degree. I went to the U and studied architectural design. The University of Utah? He nodded. We both have a knack for design, so we decided to pool our resources and work together. From the looks of things, it looks like y'all have built a successful business. Thanks. I like to think so. So you're doing the real estate thing on the side? Huh? When we went to dinner, you said you dabbled in real estate. He had said that, hadn't he? She tried to remember exactly how he phrased it. Oh, yeah. I do a little here and there. Travel quite a bit. She waited for him to say more. When he didn't, she continued. Oh, yeah. You just got back into town that night we went to dinner. That's when we saw your friend. Was it Chloe's imagination, or did he seem nervous all of a sudden? How did your meeting with him go? Fine. He brought his napkin to his lips and signaled for the waiter. Can we get our check, please? He forced a smile. It's getting late. I need to get you home. We have a busy day of work ahead of us tomorrow. Chloe's senses went on full alert. Garrett had been so open about his childhood. But the minute she mentioned his meeting with that murky-looking man, he clammed up. She was starting to think that Garrett's carefree attitude was a carefully constructed front that masked a much more complex individual underneath. She wondered what secrets he was hiding beneath his easy smile. 
Later that night, as she was drifting off to sleep, it occurred to her that the entire time she'd been talking to Garrett, she was trying to decide how much of her past she was willing to share with him. But as it turned out, the exercise was a waste of time because Garrett talked about himself the whole time and had not asked her a single question about herself. She couldn't decide if that were a good or bad thing. Chapter 9 A boiling heat was the first thing Chloe noticed, followed by the intense brightness of the sand causing the sockets behind her eyes to ache. There was no refuge from the fiery sun that was scorching everything around her. She looked ahead at what looked to be a checkpoint of some sort. Then she saw Dan, in his camouflage desert combat uniform, approach a van. He said something to the driver who held out his identification for inspection. Dan nodded as another soldier walked around to the passenger side, who began methodically checking the vehicle. Chloe tried to bridge the distance between them, but her foot got mired in the treacherous sand that was dragging her down deeper and deeper. Dan turned, and she saw recognition lighten his features as he smiled. Everything slowed, searing the events into her mind. Dan's smile turning to shock, then horror, as a loud explosion shattered the air, the van breaking into pieces, acid smoke stinging her eyes, razor-sharp shrapnel cutting her face. She cried out, but the sound got snuffed out by the commotion around her. Her tears gushed, turning to blood that sliced red whelps onto the white sand. Dan! Come back, Dan! Chloe, wake up! She fought against the hands that were shaking her. She had to get Dan. She had to help him. Why did you leave me? She cried. Chloe! She opened her eyes, looking around wildly, not seeing anything. Then everything came into focus. She was in her room, lying on the bed. Darby was standing over her. Her curly red hair was flying in all directions. Chloe went still, her mind trying to sink the dream with her surroundings. She touched her face and realized it was wet with tears, and she was bathed in a sticky sweat. She sat up in bed and leaned against the headboard. Darby sat on the bed beside her. What could she possibly say to smooth this over? Humiliation burned through her veins as she hugged her arms. I'm sorry, I was having a nightmare. Darby's eyes met hers, and even in the near darkness, she could see the worry on her face. That was more than a nightmare. It sounded like you were reliving some traumatic event, and you were calling out for Dan. Chloe raked her hair out of her face. She could feel Darby's eyes, looking at her like she was a freak. It was a dream, she muttered. A silly dream, she gritted her teeth. Geez, everyone has nightmares from time to time. It's not a big deal. Darby touched her arm. Stop. Chloe jerked around. Stop what? You need help. Tears welled in Chloe's eyes as she angrily brushed them away. I don't need help. I just need time. You're still seeing him, aren't you? Your fiancé? Chloe rocked back as the words circled around her stripping away her carefully crafted barrier of protection, making her feel naked and exposed. It's okay. You can tell me. There was enough moonlight shining through the window that Chloe could see Darby's anxious expression. But there was also something else there as well that she'd not counted on. Compassion. She was tired of pretending, tired of trying to fight this thing alone. Something gave way inside of her, and she slowly nodded. Yes, I still see him she said quietly. A sob wrenched her throat, and she put her hands to her mouth to stay it. But it was too much to contain. She started gulping and then sobbing. Darby sat patiently beside her until she got it all out. Finally, Chloe sniffled and wiped her nose with the back of her hand. I'm sorry. <laughs> you got more than you bargained for when you agreed to room with me. You didn't know you were getting a crazy person. It was her greatest fear laid open. She was crazy, and now she'd admitted it out loud. Everything hung in the balance as she waited for Darby's response. I think you've been through a rough time, and that it has left scars. You think? Chloe let out a sarcastic laugh. Darby held up her hand. Let me finish, but I don't think you're crazy. Hope sprang in Chloe's breast. Really? Really? Chloe couldn't tell whether or not Darby really believed that or if she was only trying to make her feel better. 
I do think you need to see someone about this. Fear clutched her throat. No. You can't keep suffering like this in silence. Chloe clutched her sheets. I just need time to sort this out. Her voice became pleading. You can't imagine what it's like to lose the person you loved more than anything in the world, but to also learn that he betrayed you. Her voice broke. And the worst part is that I can't even confront him about it. Which is probably why your subconscious mind keeps dredging him up. Yeah, you're probably right. Darby gave her a cautious look. That is what it is, right? You're imagining that you're seeing him. You don't actually believe you're seeing him for real, do you? Of course not. Chloe said adamantly to leave no room for doubt. She didn't know what to think anymore, but she would never admit that to anyone. I know it's my mind. I just have to learn to deal with it. Darby shifted on the bed. Have you tried prayer? Chloe groaned. Not you too. You sound just like my mother. According to her, the whole world's problems could be solved through prayer and go into church. Well, she might be right, Darby chuckled. Chloe shook her head. I'm sorry, but I just don't believe that. Not anymore. Darby cocked her head. I'll tell you what. I'll make you a deal. Weariness crept over Chloe. What sort of deal? You start coming to church with me on a regular basis, and we'll keep this little incident between us. Chloe didn't know whether to laugh or cry. She shook her head. Really? You'll keep it between us? Yes. If you agree to go to church with me, I will. This wasn't making any sense, and she was the one accused of being crazy. What does attending church have to do with anything? Contrary to what you might think, the Lord has not forgotten you, Chloe Kensley. He knows who you are, and he knows what you're going through. The only way you're going to get over this thing is to turn to him. Emotion welled inside of Chloe. Oh, how she wished those words were true. She only shook her head and looked away. Darby touched her hand. Do we have a deal? Chloe looked at Darby. How can I count on you to keep something like this under wraps when you can't even keep a simple confidence? You blabbed to Susan and Lila about Garrett the minute I stepped out of the room. Darby's eyes went wide and she started fidgeting with her hands. I guess I deserved that. You're darn right you did. I'm sorry, okay? She pushed her hair out of her eyes. I didn't think it was a big deal. You're just so uptight and private about everything. What I told Susan and Lila was perfectly harmless. This is different. I just don't know if I can trust you. Darby let out an incredulous laugh. Trust me? Really? I'm not the one seeing the dead guy. Chloe's jaw went hard. There's only one solution here. She arched an eyebrow waiting to hear the rest. I guess we're just going to have to learn to trust each other. She held out her hand. I'm making you the deal of the century here. Take it or leave it. Come to church with me and we'll forget this whole thing ever happened. She looked her in the eye. You have my word. Chloe clasped her hand. Deal. Chapter 10 Hello, Garrett. This is Chloe. I'm at the Douglas job for our scheduled appointment. You assured me that you would be here. The appointment was at 2, and it's now 5 minutes after. Call me. She ended the call with a frustrated sigh. Today marked her one-month anniversary at Marsh Interiors, and she could count on one hand the number of times Garrett had actually shown up for an appointment. In the staff meeting on her first day, she assumed that when Garrett said he needed her help on a project, it was an excuse to spend more time with her. When in reality, he wanted her on the project so that she would do all the work. He always had some excuse for his absence like traveling out of town to take care of a real estate deal or getting held up on another appointment. It was so dang infuriating. And the worst part was that he promised he would be here for this appointment in particular. Mrs. Douglas was a longtime client of Marsh Interiors, and he was going to introduce Chloe and get her up to speed on the project. Garrett had all the files and had assured her he would bring them to the appointment. So she didn't even have those. She was going into this one completely unprepared. Her relationship with Garrett was complicated, to say the least. On the off times that he was actually in town, he insisted on taking Chloe out. 
She enjoyed her time with Garrett, and there was something enticing about a drop-dead gorgeous guy who was trying his best to win her over. Each date seemed to get more elaborate, and he was always buying her expensive clothes. She would be lying if she said she didn't enjoy dating Garrett. He was fun-loving and exciting, a pleasant distraction from the past. Admittedly, a part of her felt guilty for letting things continue because she wasn't sure how she felt about him. When they were together, he doted on her and said all of the right things. But then there were times like today when he left her hanging out to dry. More than anything, she needed someone she could count on. She glanced at the clock on the dash. 2.10. She couldn't put this off any longer. She took a deep breath and let it out slowly. Then she reached for her purse and design bag. As she walked up the front steps leading to the front door, she tried to remember what little Garrett had told her about the project. Mrs. Douglas was one of their oldest and most valued customers and had requested what she called her last makeover. She suppressed a shiver. Last makeover sounded so morbid. What kind of person was this Mrs. Douglas? She searched her memory, trying to recall her first name, but it was blank. By the time she rang the doorbell, she was so angry with Garrett for leaving her in the lurch that she would have slapped him had he been here. She chuckled at the irony of the thought. Had he been here, she wouldn't be mad at him to begin with. As the door opened, she squared her shoulders, trying to feign a confidence she did not feel. Her professional smile automatically spread across her lips. Hi, I'm Chloe Kinsley. Nice to meet you. She didn't know how she expected Mrs. Douglas to look, but she was taken back when she saw the frail, silver-haired woman who looked to be in her mid-seventies. She was holding on to a walker. Please, come in. I've been expecting you. She gave Chloe a warm smile that instantly put her at ease. She followed Mrs. Douglas inside to a spacious foyer that opened to a sunken den. The room had an open floor plan that led into a modern kitchen, complete with granite countertops, a tile backsplash, and all of the upgrades imaginable. The palette throughout the space consisted of subtle variations of shades of pastel blues, creamy beiges, and chocolate accents. Mrs. Douglas sat down in an overstuffed chair next to a gas fireplace and motioned for Chloe to sit across from her on the sofa. You have such a lovely accent. Texas, maybe? South Carolina. Mrs. Douglas nodded. Of course. How do you like Salt Lake? I'm really enjoying it. It's much drier than I'm used to, and I feel like I'm always putting on lotion. She laughed. Yes, it's dry. I'm sure you miss the humidity. Chloe thought for a second. Yes and no. My skin misses it, but my hair does much better out here, and it's not so hot. Yes, that's very true. I'll be curious to hear what you think about the winter. She made a face. I hear there's lots of snow. I'm not used to driving in it. That'll be intimidating. But it won't feel as cold here. Miss Douglas countered, holding up a finger. Hmm, that's good to know. I hadn't thought about that. Chloe shifted in her seat, dreading this next part. She figured she'd broach the topic before Mrs. Douglas did. I hate to tell you this, Mrs. Douglas, but I'm afraid it's just me today. Garrett got held up and won't be able to make it. She waved the comment away with a flick of her hand. I know, dear. He called me and told me he couldn't be here. Oh! Heat rushed to Chloe's face, and she could feel her temples pulsing. Garrett had called this woman and not her. He'd really gone too far this time. Mrs. Douglas gave her a funny look. Are you okay? She forced a smile. I'm fine. So I take it, this is not the first time that Garrett was a no-show for an appointment. For a second, she thought she'd heard her incorrectly. Excuse me? She chuckled. I've known Garrett since he was a tot. And while he has many talents, dependability is not one of them. A laugh bubbled in Chloe's throat. No, it's not. She agreed, looking at the woman before her through new eyes. She'd mistakenly attributed her fragile body to a weaker mind, but nothing could be further from the truth. This woman was sharp and ultra-observant. Okay, I guess we need to talk about my home. Mrs. Douglas, I probably shouldn't say this, considering that you've hired Martian Terriers to help you, but your home is absolutely gorgeous. 
Are you sure you need a makeover? Her eyes sparkled in quiet amusement. Please, call me Glory. Of course. What a pretty name. Glory smiled appreciatively. Thank you. She clasped her hands together. Let me give you the tour. Oh, and to answer your question, I just had the main areas redone last fall, so they're fine. They were much more than fine. The place looked like it had come right out of a traditional home magazine. As if reading her mind, Glory added, I'm afraid Hank and Garrett like to spoil me a bit. They insisted on giving me every comfort imaginable. She smiled. Of course, I'm the envy of all the ladies in my bridge club, although at my age, some of this feels a little excessive. She sighed. But I don't argue. Besides, it's nice having the company while the work is being done. I get to meet new friends such as you. A feeling of warmth came over Chloe as she smiled. Thank you. The feeling is mutual. Glory's easy manner reminded her of a southern lady. She felt as if she'd known her forever and could talk to her about anything. An image of Dan flashed through her mind, and she suppressed a shiver. Well, almost anything. She forced her mind back to the project. Which areas are you wanting to redo? Let me show you. Glory led her into a study. The walls were painted a deep burgundy. The desk was mahogany, and there was an arrangement of ivy sitting atop it. The window treatments were made from a striped fabric that was gold and hunter green. The sides were dripping with a heavy gold fringe. Pictures of landscape scenes with gold ornate frames hung on the wall. The ensemble screamed early 90s. The expression on her face must have said it all because Glory took one look at her and started laughing. She lifted an eyebrow. Still think I don't need your help? Yeah, I guess I spoke too soon. I mean, this was great for its time, but... She sought for the right words, not wanting to offend Glory. Yes, I know, it's dreadful. I may be old, but I'm not blind. She pushed her glasses on her nose. Yet... Chloe got down to business, asking a string of questions that would allow her to put a plan together. Are you wanting a look that's similar to the main area of the house? I want it to flow, yes, but I also want it to be unique. I agree. Let's talk about the items in the room. Is there anything that you're particularly attached to? Glory pursed her lips, thinking, Well, I would like to keep the clock because it was a gift from my late husband, Ed. Chloe jotted that down. How about the desk? No, I'm not particularly attached to it. Good, because I'm thinking that we should go with a wood that's lighter, maybe a weathered look. She shrugged. Sounds good to me. I just want it to look good in the end. Chloe's eyes fell on a channeled back chair in the corner. The back section arched up at a sharp point on the left side and then angled down, creating a dramatic curve effect, reminding her of a fan. The fabric was a thin, salmon-colored silk. It was whimsically modern a total misfit in the otherwise traditional room. She pointed. Tell me about this chair. Glory chuckled. It's dreadful, isn't it? Well, it does stick out like a sore thumb in this room. She paused. And I'm not sure if it'll fit well with the new design scheme either. She hoped that sounded tactful enough. Although I suppose we could have it reupholstered if you're attached to it. Glory chuckled. You really wouldn't make a good bridge player because your expressions give you away. Heat flamed over Chloe's face. Oh, I'm sorry. I hope I haven't offended you. This part of the job was always tricky because people were ultra-sensitive when it came to which of their furnishings stayed and which of them went. Not in the slightest. I agree with you 100%, and that's what I've been telling Garrett. But he keeps insisting that it will go with anything. I keep moving it from place to place, trying to hide it out of the way. He wanted to put the thing in the den. Can you believe that? Chloe made a face. Really? It doesn't go with your style at all. She couldn't imagine how Garrett could possibly think the chair would look good in Glory's house. She was starting to doubt Garrett's design know-how. One more thing to add to the growing list of doubts she was having about him. For some reason, Garrett likes it. 
and I wouldn't hurt his feelings for the world. She wrinkled her nose. But it's your house, Glory. You have to like it. Chloe detested those designers that insisted on decorating a house according to their taste, not taking the client's taste into consideration. You have to understand, those boys and I have a long history together. Those boys? Meaning Hike and Garrett? She nodded. You see, I knew their mother. She had a hard time raising two boys on her own. I had to step in a couple of times to head off disaster. But that's a story for another time. She motioned back. Back to the room. What do you think? Well, the large window is fantastic. And you were smart to redo the flooring in the entire house when you did the main areas. She nodded. That's what Hank said. It certainly makes the project easier. With some new paint and furnishings, we can make it stunning. I'll work up a design scheme and then present it to you. Once you approve, we'll get to work. That sounds great. Oh, I almost forgot to ask. Do you have a budget? I let Hank and Garrett take care of that part. Oh, okay. That was unusual. She jotted that down. Let's go back into the den. My legs are getting tired from standing. Of course. They took their former seats. Do you mind if I snap a few pictures before I go? Not at all. She scooted back in her seat. You can do that on your way out. First, I want to hear about you. I didn't bring my portfolio, but I'll be glad to send you some images of my work through email. Glory shook her head. I'm not worried about that. You seem to know what you're doing. I mean, tell me a little about yourself. Chloe figured she might as well make herself comfortable because it was obvious that Glory had no intention of letting her go out the door anytime soon. She started by telling about her parents and what it was like to grow up in South Carolina. They talked about how the food out west compared to the food in the south. Then the conversation drifted to more personal topics. And before Chloe knew it, she was telling Glory about Dan's death and his betrayal, leaving out the parts about seeing his ghost. All the while, Glory listened patiently, a kind expression on her face. When Chloe finished, Glory let out a sigh. For one so young, you've already weathered your share of storms. Life has dealt you some pretty hard blows. But things will get better. One day you'll realize that you have become a better person because of your experiences. Moisture filled Chloe's eyes. Thank you. A comfortable silence settled between them until Chloe spoke. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to go into all that. I'm glad you did. Life is about making connections. And when you get my age, you realize that those connections are all that really matter in the end. Everything else is superficial, a distraction. I suppose you're right. A particular light came into Glory's eyes as she peered over her glasses. Now tell me about you and Garrett. Chloe's jaw dropped. What? You know about that? Glory chuckled. <laughs> like I said, there's not much I don't know about those two boys. This is where things could get sticky. Did she dare tell Glory how truly conflicted she was about Garrett? It's that bad, huh? Glory let out a dry chuckle. Like I said earlier, your expression says it all. I'm not sure how I feel about Garrett. I mean, he's handsome and charming, says all the right things. But, she prompted, but I just don't know. I guess I'm still trying to get over the thing with Dan. Maybe in time, she shrugged. I guess it's still too soon to say. I know we've just met, but I feel like we have a connection. Yes, I feel it too. I may be out of line here, but I don't think Garrett's the right one for you. Really? She didn't know if she were insulted or relieved by the comment. Why do you say that? She asked carefully. Garrett still has a lot of growing up to do, and until he comes to terms with himself, he'll never truly be able to love anyone else. For him... Life is all fun and games. The only problem with that 
is that someone else is left to foot the bill and clean up his messes. Exactly! Chloe leaned forward in her seat. Glory had hit the nail on the head. You need someone responsible. Yes! Someone who has the capability to care for you the way you care for him. Yes, I would like that very much. You need Hank. Chloe's eyes bulged, and she nearly choked on her own saliva. Hank? Glory gave her a coy smile. Don't tell me you've never considered him. He's every bit as handsome as Garrett in a different way. Her face went hot, and she was at a loss for words. Of course she'd noticed Hank. A girl would have to be blind not to notice him, but he didn't seem the slightest bit interested in her. And she was dating his brother. Hank is responsible. He would be a good match for you. You know, Hank has had his share of heartache, too. Later, she would wonder what Glory meant by the last part. But at the moment, all she heard was that Hank would be a good match for her. She had the urge to start laughing out loud. I don't know, Glory. Hank is so business-oriented and serious all the time. I couldn't imagine dating him. Really? Business-oriented and serious. I suppose I've been called worse. Chloe's blood turned solid when she heard the male voice. She about fell out of her chair when she saw Hank step around the sofa. Glory let out a nervous laugh. Oh, Hank, we didn't hear you come in. He cut his eyes to Chloe. Obviously. He went over and gave Glory a peck on the cheek. Then he sat down in the chair beside her. Chloe's face was on fire, and she felt like she might have an out-of-body experience. Not knowing what else to do, she just sat there, her hands clasped tightly in her lap. Glory gave her a mischievous smile. I was just encouraging Chloe to expand her options a little. Hank shook his head. Yes, in my direction, I gather. Glory, you're always up to no good. Then he surprised Chloe by winking at her. Don't worry, I won't hold it against you, that you don't want to go out with me. I have horns, and I have been known to bite, occasionally. Her eyes flew open wide, and she let out an uneasy laugh. Then it hit her that he was teasing her, and he was enjoying it very much. Before she could voice a response, he turned his attention to Glory. How are you doing? What did the doctor say? Oh, the usual. I'm going to die, Glory countered. He jerked around. What? A smile played on Glory's lips. Eventually. She patted his arm. I'm sorry, I couldn't resist. She looked at Chloe. Hank is always worrying himself sick over me. Well, someone has to keep you out of trouble, Hank said with a scowl but Chloe could see the relief on his face now that he realized Glory was okay. Glory was much more than a client to Hank. She was like a second mother. The tenderness in his voice, the way he looked at her. It was so touching that it caused emotion to well inside of Chloe. She realized then how much she missed her own mom. She'd been too caught up in all the drama over Dan that she'd taken her for granted. She vowed to call her as soon as she got home from work. The three of them chatted for another 20 minutes, and Chloe found herself laughing at the stories that Glory told about Hank. You see, I made these apple pies for the church social. Hank groaned. Not the pie story. Glory hit his hand. Now you just hush. I'm telling this story. I had left the pies on the table when Hank snuck into the kitchen. Glory continued on. Hank shook his head and caught Chloe's eye. Time seemed to slow as he gave her a cocked smile. I'm sorry you have to listen to all this, he seemed to be saying. Her pulse bumped up a notch as a tingle ran through her. Glory was right. He was just as handsome as Garrett in a real, more down-to-earth sort of way. Had his dark hair been longer, it would have been wavy. His eyes, which she thought were gray at first, were actually an even cross between blue and green. His strong jaw was his most prominent feature, indicative of his take-charge personality. He was taller than Garrett and more rugged-looking where Garrett was more debonair. With his chiseled features, Hank reminded her of a G.I. Joe doll 
whereas Garrett was more of a Ken doll. She'd heard it said that life was merely a series of moments. Maybe it was because Glory had brought it to her attention, or maybe it was the way she felt when his eyes caught hers. But in that moment, everything changed. She would never think of Hank Singleton in the same way again. As she sat there watching him interact with Glory, his eyes kept meeting hers, and she wondered if things had changed for him too. It had happened the same way with Dan. She could pinpoint the exact moment when she knew that they would be together. The next thoughts that ran through her mind hit her with enough force to nearly take her breath away. Maybe Glory was right. Maybe she was dating the wrong brother. Chapter 11 Hank left Glory's house before Chloe, who still had to take pictures of the project. Hank never said why he'd stop by, and Glory never asked, making Chloe think that he visited her on a regular basis. It took all of five minutes for Hank to get out the door before Glory started gloating. I told you that Hank would be a good match for you, she said, a smug smile on her face. The collar on Chloe's shirt felt tight as she began pulling at it. Now, Glory, no need to beat a dead horse, she said lightly. She wagged a finger. You can deny it all you want, but I could see it in your face. I'm good at detecting the matters of the human heart. Her face fell. Really? I am that obvious? Only to me, dear. A twinkle lit her eyes. He likes you too, you know. She scoffed. He barely even knows I'm alive. To him, I'm just one of his employees. A very attractive employee with a darling accent. She crossed her arms over her chest and gave Chloe a devilish smile. He talks about you. She seriously doubted that. He told me what a talented designer you are, and coming from Hank, who never compliments anyone, that's saying a lot. She was unprepared for the warmth that shot through her. He'd noticed her work. Glory couldn't imagine how much those words meant to her. You know, I probably shouldn't be thinking about anyone right now, not when everything is still so fresh with Dan. It boggled her mind that she was even considering going out with Hank. Where had this come from? She had enough on her plate trying to keep Garrett at arm's length while dealing with seeing the dead fiancé thing. Was she one of those people that went around looking for trouble? One of my favorite quotes is from Helen Keller. Oh? Chloe wondered where this was going. It goes like this. When one door of happiness closes, another opens. But often we look so long at the closed door that we do not see the one which has been opened for us. Now she knew where this was going. She fought the urge to roll her eyes. Glory meant well, but she had no idea what she was going through. Glory looked her in the eye. You can't keep living in the past. Even if Dan had lived, you wouldn't be with him right now because of what he did. It's time to move on. The words were spoken kindly, but they hurt all the same. Tears welled in Chloe's eyes, and she began blinking rapidly to stay them. It wouldn't do for her to break down on a job. She reached in her purse for her phone. I'm going to grab a quick shot of the study. She needed to get away from Glory before she totally lost it. Glory nodded in understanding. There was a look of sympathy in her eyes. By the time she returned to the den, Chloe was more in control of her emotions, the professional designer once more. Okay, I have everything I need. Give me until the end of the week to put together a plan. Could we meet again this Friday? Does two work for you? That works for me. I'm looking forward to seeing your plan. I have some ideas that I think you'll love, she paused. But I still don't know what we're going to do about that chair. Move it to a different room, maybe. Glory made a face. It is hideous, isn't it? Yeah, I hate to say it, but it is. I'm really not sure what Garrett was thinking. She shook her head. A speculative light came into Glory's eyes. I'll tell you what. I'll make you a deal. A deal? Where was this going? Because of the last deal she'd made with Darby, she was now attending church every Sunday. What was it with these Westerners and their deals? What kind of deal? She asked cautiously. 
You go on one date with Hank sometime in the next couple of weeks, and I'll let you get rid of that chair. Chloe's eyes took a wild look. But I'm dating Hank's brother. Glory squared her jaw. Do you want to get rid of the chair or not? But Hank hasn't even asked me out. She held up her hand. It's a deal? Her mind raced through the possibilities. She could always ask Hank to go somewhere on the guise of looking at a project. That could count as a date. Okay, it's a deal, she said. A sense of deja vu fluttered over Chloe as Glory extended her hand, just as Darby had. They shook on it. As Chloe was going to the car, her phone started buzzing. She looked down. It was Garrett. Of course you would call as I'm leaving the appointment, she muttered, rather than answering. She shoved the phone back into her purse and kept walking. Chloe let out a groan of frustration. She'd looked through her entire closet and couldn't find her yellow blouse. She wanted to wear it with a pair of white pants. Where was that stupid thing? She had brought it to Salt Lake with her, hadn't she? Yes, she remembered putting it into her suitcase. It had to be here, somewhere. Ten minutes later, she'd searched her entire room. She glanced at the clock. If she didn't hurry and get ready, she'd be late for work. Finally, she settled on a red knit shirt and black pants. Not her first choice for a sweltering August day, but it would have to do. At least it didn't feel as hot here as it did back home. She'd slept in this morning because she didn't get an ounce of sleep the night before. The all-too-familiar dreams of Dan tormented her. But this time, Garrett was added to the mix. She was running down an alley, trying to get away from the pursuer that was closing in. A sick fear constricted her throat, propelling her to keep running as fast as she possibly could. Her lungs felt like they would explode as her legs grew heavy. Then she stole a glance over her shoulder and realized that it was Garrett who was after her. She'd awoken, clutching the sheets. After that, she'd lain awake for over an hour trying to get back to sleep. She didn't dare get up and look out the window for fear she might see Dan outside by the swing. Finally, she dozed off around 3 a.m. When her alarm went off at 6, she'd hit the snooze button and slept another 40 minutes. Oh, well, it wasn't as if she had to clock in. So what if she was running a few minutes late? She could always make up for it by staying later. She glanced at her phone as she was heading out the door. Garrett had called her seven times since yesterday and sent her three texts. She'd not responded to any of them. After the weird experience with Hank at Glory's house the day before, she wasn't ready to talk to Garrett. That's probably why she had the nightmare about him. She still didn't understand why she'd felt the strong connection to Hank. A tingle went through her as she thought about what it would be like to see him at the office today. Would anything be different between them? Maybe she was imagining things. After all, just because Glory thought they would make a good couple didn't necessarily mean that Hank felt the same way. She frowned. Was she grasping at straws here? Hank was her boss. And he'd given her zero indications that he was interested in her. Well, except for yesterday. But what if she'd read too much into the situation? And how was she supposed to act around Garrett? It was obvious that he wasn't just going to willingly fade out of her life. Good morning, she nodded as she walked by Yvette's desk. Good morning, Yvette made a point of looking at the clock on the wall and then back at Chloe. Hank asked if you'd come in. I told him that you weren't here yet, that you must be running late. She flashed a snarky smile. Ever since Yvette realized that she and Garrett were dating, she had had it in for Chloe. Normally, Chloe ignored her snide comments, but today they rubbed her wrong. Well, aren't you just a little helper? That was mighty kind of you to keep such close tabs on me, she fired back, mimicking Yvette's cheerful tone. She reached in her bag and pulled out a file folder. And since you're so helpful, why don't you be a dear and make three copies of each of the sketches for the Westland's kitchen? You can put them on my desk when you're done. Oh, and I need you to call King Hickory to find out where we are on the sectional order for the Lamberts. Resentment flashed in Yvette's eyes. Will there be anything else? That'll be all for now. I'll let you know when I need something else. She flashed a toothy smile. 
thanks. While Yvette was still trying to untangle her tongue, Chloe chuckled inwardly and walked past her. Technically, it was Yvette's job to act as a floating assistant to the architects and designers, but Chloe had never required her to do anything. Well, that was about to change. At first, she'd felt beholden to Yvette because she loaned her her tennis shoes on the disastrous day of the interview. And she felt sorry for Yvette because Garrett had obviously jilted her. But her pettiness was starting to get old. If Yvette wanted to keep dishing out crap, then Chloe was prepared to dish it right back. Years of dealing with Julian, Dan's horrible sister, had sharpened Chloe's wit considerably, and she was tired of putting up with nonsense. No, Yvette did not want to tangle with this southern girl. A few minutes later, Yvette was all but forgotten as Chloe stood in front of Hank's door. Butterflies fluttered in her stomach as she knocked. Come in, he called. He looked up from his desk and gave her a brief smile. Have a seat. She sat down and crossed her legs. He leaned back in his chair. How are things going? Are you starting to feel comfortable with everything? Yes. Where was this going? Hank was back to being his normal, business-like self, making her feel foolish for thinking they'd had a connection. Disappointment settled over her as she clasped her hands together tightly in her lap. I am starting to get a feel for how things go. Good. Kate tells me the two of you are making progress on the Westland Project. Her mouth started moving at warp speed in order to keep up with her mind, which was ticking through the checklist. Yes, the contractors are almost finished building the cabinets, and we have the granite guys scheduled to come in next week. Once they're done, we can have the backsplash installed. All of the appliances are ordered. We're narrowing down the paint colors. I'm in the process of picking out fabrics for the window treatments, and we've scheduled for the guys to give us an estimate on plantation shutters. He chuckled and held up his hands. <laughs> yes, I read all of that on the weekly report you sent over on Friday. Oh, red blotches started splashing up her neck. He gave her a lopsided smile, like he'd done at Glory's house the day before. Relax, I'm not trying to give you the third degree. I just want to catch up. Okay, she forced a smile. I thought I was relaxed. She was mildly insulted that he assumed she was nervous around him. Of course she was nervous, but that was beside the point. He motioned at her hands. I can see that. She hadn't realized that she'd been wringing them. How embarrassing. Amusement lit his expression as he looked at her face that was now the color of her shirt. This got her ire up, and she momentarily forgot that he was her boss as the words slipped out. Was there a point to this conversation, or did you just call me in here to watch me squirm? His eyes went wide. Oops, she'd done it now. Just as she was trying to formulate an apology, he started laughing. <laughs> I guess I deserve that, he said dryly. Then he looked at her, and she felt that same connection with him that she'd felt the day before. Her pulse bumped up a notch, and she felt hot all over, like her knit shirt was sticking to her like saran wrap. But this time, it had nothing to do with embarrassment. I want to thank you for taking such good care of Glory. You're very welcome. But the honor is all mine, I can assure you. She's an extraordinary woman. I feel like I've made a new friend. She feels the same way about you. Really? She cocked an eyebrow. How do you know? She told me. When? We talked last night over the phone. Oh, her mind started racing. Had Glory told him all of the things they'd talked about? A sense of horror came over her. She tried to think. Had she told Glory anything about Hank that might incriminate her? Did Hank know she was supposed to go out on a date with him? Glory is like a second mom to me. I try to check in with her most evenings to make sure she's okay. Wow, that's very thoughtful. He dismissed the compliment with a wave of his hand as he sat up in his seat. Anyway, I wanted to let you know that money is no object where she is concerned. Give her whatever she wants and make sure all of the invoices come directly to me. Okay, I'll do that. Was Hank footing the bill for all the expenses? That was expensive, super expensive. Thinking their chat had come to an end, Chloe uncrossed her legs and prepared to stand until Hank stopped her. Um, 
There's one more thing. Yes? He began fiddling with his pen. It was her turn to be amused. Was he actually nervous around her? The thought was somewhat thrilling. Kate tells me that you're an expert at making your own custom botanical arrangements. Her first inclination was to downplay her skill, but the words her mother often spoke rang in her ears. When someone gives you a compliment, you simply smile and say thank you, even if you don't feel like you deserve it. Thank you, she blurted. He gave her a funny look, and she realized that thank you was probably not an appropriate response. She cleared her throat. <clears throat> I mean, yes, I make my own arrangements. Most interior designers simply pick them out of a catalog, but Chloe liked to design her own because she could make something unique that was completely original. After lunch, I'm going to the Riddles Project. If you don't mind, I'd like you to go with me and take a look at her dining room. Lily Riddle needs a centerpiece for a party she's hosting. It would be nice to offer her something original. Of course, I would be glad to. It was good to know that her talents were being appreciated and utilized. I'll have to special order all of the flowers from my wholesale supplier in Alabama. He raised an eyebrow. Really? Alabama, huh? Yep, I have the best supplier in the nation as far as I'm concerned. Okay, order away. And I'll need a workspace and floral tools. He laughed. <laughs> you are demanding, aren't you? She stiffened for a split second until she saw the teasing look in his eyes. A smile twitched at the corner of her lips. Yes, but I'm worth it. She quipped and then realized what she'd said. I mean, it'll be worth it, she corrected. Her eyes going wide. Geez, could she have sounded any more corny? I'm sure you are, he said softly, causing a thrill to shoot through her. She could feel her pulse hammering in her ears as her eyes locked with his. He really was strikingly handsome, with his rugged features and suntan that emphasized his light eyes. She liked the way crinkles appeared around his eyes when he smiled. It made him seem down-to-earth and real. Her gaze went to his lips, and for a fleeting moment, she wondered what they would feel like against hers. She could almost make herself believe that he was reading her thoughts and that maybe he was thinking the same thing about her. A sense of panic flooded her. She really did need to keep her imagination in check. He was her boss, for goodness sakes. This high school crush she had on him was getting out of control. It had come on so suddenly that it had blindsided her. Was she grasping for straws because she was so desperate to move on from Dan? Was that why she was becoming so enamored with Hank all of a sudden? Before she could make a complete fool of herself, she broke the connection and looked down. Chloe, she heard him say. And then the door opened and there stood Garrett. A suspicious look came over his face as he looked back and forth between the two of them. Am I interrupting something? It was more of an accusation than a question. No, Chloe said guiltily, stumbling to her feet. Hank and I were just going over projects. Amusement lit Hank's eyes, as she could tell that he was enjoying watching her squirm. She gave him a questioning look as irritation sparked over her. Garrett noticed the exchange. His eyes narrowed. He closed the distance between them with two steps. Before she could stop him, he leaned over and gave her a kiss on the lips. She jerked away from him as the heat of humiliation burned through her veins. She told him never to do that at the office. She looked at Hank, whose face had gone a shade darker. What are you doing? She seethed, looking at Garrett. He gave her a disarming smile that made her want to slap him. I've been trying to call you. The last thing she wanted to do was to get into an argument with Garrett in front of Hank. She ignored the comment and moved to walk past him, but he caught her arm. Hey, what's going on with you? His expression grew earnest. Let's not do this here, she said through gritted teeth. He was clutching her arm so tightly that it hurt. Let go of my arm. His expression went hard. Hank stood. I believe she asked you to let go of her arm. Do as she said. The warning in Hank's voice was unmistakable, and Chloe saw the hesitancy creep into Garrett's eyes as he released her arm. Then he smiled again, but his eyes remained cold. He gave Hank a scathing look and held up his hands. I see how it is. 
I take one trip out of town and Big Brother moves in on my territory. He looked at Chloe. We'll discuss this later. There was a hint of promise in his voice that sent a shudder running down her spine as he left the room. Hank gave her a concerned look. Are you okay? She nodded. Yeah. Garrett can be a little overbearing at times. Overbearing? Really? That was putting it mildly. A band-aid approach to a serious situation. He was treating her like his property and it was starting to scare her. If he gives you any problems, or if you ever need to talk about anything. Thanks, I'm okay, she said tersely, hugging her arms. He looked unconvinced, but thankfully he dropped it. I'll meet you in your office at 11.30, and we'll go to the Riddles home together. Chapter 12 Hank stormed into Garrett's office without knocking. What was that about? Garrett leaned back in his chair and propped his arms behind his head. Have a seat. I'll stand. Suit yourself. Garrett picked up his exercise ball and began squeezing it. Hank placed his fingertips on the desk and leaned in, eyeing Garrett. You had no right to treat Chloe that way. Oh, don't get your trousers in a wad. Chloe knows I didn't mean anything by that. It was a lover's quarrel, that's all. The anger that surged through Hank caught him off guard. First of all, your romantic escapades have no business trickling into the workplace. And second, Chloe is not like your other women. A hard smile twisted over Garrett. My other women, huh? What's wrong, big brother? Not jealous, are you? Hank wanted to knock the smug expression off Garrett's face. He pointed, watch it. I won't let you hurt Chloe like you did Yvette. My relationship with Chloe is nothing like what happened with Yvette. Hank lifted an eyebrow. Garrett switched girlfriends like most people switched brands of soap. Most of the time, Hank never bothered to learn their names. Chloe's a valuable part of my team, and I won't let you mess with her head. He threw down the ball. Is that all she is to you, a valuable part of your team? His voice grew taunting, because it looked like it was something more. Just remember I claimed her first. She belongs to me. He pointed at his chest, his face growing flush. Chloe is a person, not a slab of meat. She can make her own choices. Garrett's eyes glinted in a challenge. I guess we'll have to see which one of us she chooses, won't we? They glared at each other. Garrett leaned forward. By the way, I hate it when you get all sanctimonious on me. You've changed since you went and got all churchy. We used to go to clubs and have a good time. You were the first to pick up women back then. He gave him a look of disgust. What happened to you? You're a pathetic shell of the man you used to be. You don't know what you're talking about. Hank roared and then immediately regretted the outburst. Garrett could get his temper riled faster than anyone. He raked his hands through his hair, trying to get control of his emotions. A benign smile spread over Garrett's face as his voice grew silky smooth. I just miss you, man. I miss the guy I could relate to. We used to have so much fun together. When you changed, you took my best friend away. His voice caught. I'll never forgive you for that. The hurt in Garrett's voice stabbed through Hank as a sense of guilt came over him. Regardless of how much they fought, they were still brothers, first and foremost. Nothing could change that. He just wished there was a way to get through to him. Garrett was still living in the past, and it was time for him to grow up. Life is not all fun and games, bro. There's a price that goes along with it. From the time they were kids, Hank felt a responsibility to take care of his younger brother. And even though they were adults, Garrett was still like a child in many ways. It was like he thought he was immune to the ugliness that came from his high-rolling lifestyle. But Hank knew better. The devil always collected his dues. I'm not like you. I can handle the pressure. Hank sat down. He let out an incredulous laugh. <laughs> is that what you think this is about? The pressure. He rubbed his hand across his forehead. Running an honest business is a heck of a lot more pressure than anything I ever did before. You keep telling yourself that. Then Garrett's earlier comment registered. Hank cocked his head. You said you weren't like me, that you could handle the pressure. He gave Garrett a penetrating look and a cold feeling settled in his gut. What did you mean by that? Please tell me that you're not involved in anything. It was his worst fear, the one that kept him up at night. 
He'd almost confronted Garrett several times but decided against it. There was no sense in adding more tension to their already strained relationship. And a part of him didn't want to know what Garrett was doing. Plausible deniability was what kept him sane. He wanted to believe that Garrett really was putting together real estate deals all of those times when he was away. Of course I'm not involved in any crap. I may like the gambling and women, but I'm not stupid. Swear it. Swear that you're not getting involved with Sam or any of his group. We both know how that will end. I swear to you, Garrett said, not flinching. Okay, Hank finally said. That's good enough for me. Even as he spoke the words, he hoped for both of their sakes that Garrett was telling the truth because the knot in his stomach told him otherwise. He'd spent his life trying to protect his little brother from the bullies of the world. The problem was, he didn't know how to save Garrett from himself. Garrett was sitting in his car in the parking lot when Chloe and Hank emerged from the building. His jaw tightened when he saw Hank touch her arm, and then she laughed at something he said. They walked toward Hank's SUV. It was all he could do to keep from jumping out of his car and pummeling Hank when he saw him stride over and open Chloe's door for her. Chloe looked up at Hank in appreciation, and he caught something else, too. A look that passed between them. It was the same look he'd seen when he stepped into Hank's office and saw the two of them. A sinking feeling came over him as he watched them drive away. He was losing her. He stared unseeingly ahead as a hot anger surged through him. How could Hank do this to him? Surely he could see how much he cared for Chloe. Had it not been for him, Chloe would have never started working at Marsh Interiors. He'd talked Hank into giving her a second chance. He thought back to when he and Hank were in high school. They both liked the same girl, Tabitha Stevens, the head cheerleader. In the end, Garrett had backed down and let Hank have her. He clenched his fist. It was Hank's turn to back down. Chloe was not like all of the other girls he'd dated, independent and smart. Chloe was the kind of girl a guy could settle down with, the kind he could make a commitment to. Well, at least she was the kind of girl he would try to make a commitment to. A part of him wondered if he could truly ever be faithful to just one woman, but he was certainly willing to give it a shot with Chloe. He needed something big, something that would stake his claim on her and turn her away from Hank. Then it hit him. He knew exactly what to do to win her back. A smile spread across his face. No girl could resist what he was about to do, not even Chloe. His phone buzzed. A cold sweat came over him as he read the text. I've been patient long enough. We need to meet ASAP. No excuses this time. Rather than responding, he started the engine and drove out of the parking lot. He forced his mind away from Chloe and methodically began going through the upcoming job. If everything went according to plan, he would be able to take care of the problem at hand. First, he would deal with Chloe before she could become attached to Hank, and then he would head out of town and take care of business. His phone buzzed again. Dread clutched his gut as he glanced at the text. I won't be put off any longer. Call me. When Chloe returned home that afternoon, the mystery of the yellow shirt was solved. Darby was wearing it. She was sprawled out on the couch drinking root beer and munching on tortilla chips. Hey, she said, not taking her eyes off the TV. Chloe put down her purse and design bag. Hey, how was your day? She sat down on the love seat. Okay, I guess. I have loads of homework, which I'm not too happy about. But what can you say? That's life. She shoved a handful of chips into her mouth. Yeah, I can tell you're into your homework. She made a point of looking at the chips and drink. Darby made a face. Geez, I'm taking a break, okay? Chloe chuckled, holding up a hand. Hey, I'm not judging you, she pointed. Nice shirt, by the way. I was looking for that this morning. Oh, Darby let out an uneasy laugh. Oops, sorry. I hope you don't mind if I borrowed it. She looked contritely at Chloe. Yes, she did mind. While she and Darby were getting along better, there were still things that annoyed the heck out of Chloe. And borrowing her things without asking was one of them. She tried to think of a diplomatic way to phrase her frustration. I don't mind you borrowing it, but I do wish you would have asked first. Fine, I'll try to remember to do that next time, she mumbled before turning her attention back to the TV. Not sure what else to say, she sat there for a minute and then stood. I'm going to my room to rest for a bit before I start making dinner. 
Okay, Darby said absently. See ya. Chapter 13 Chloe glanced at the clock on the microwave, 6.31. Her guests were coming at 7.30. She'd have to hurry to get everything done in time. Since her arrival in Salt Lake, she and Darby had eaten dinner almost every night with either Lila and Peter or Susan. Chloe was beginning to feel guilty and decided to reciprocate, so she invited them over for dinner. Darby insisted on helping, but it was obvious that she'd never cooked a day in her life. Chloe decided to make them a southern meal, one of her favorites, fish. She gave Darby one job, the simple task of frying catfish, while she finished making the slaw, hush puppies, and the lemon meringue pie. Undoubtedly, that one job was too much because Darby put the fish in the skillet, turned it down on low, and went into the living room to watch TV. Thankfully, Chloe noticed it before the fish was ruined and turned the temperature back to high. There were times when she felt that she was forging a bond with Darby, and then other times, like today, when she got on her nerves. As she worked to finish the meal, Chloe's thoughts drifted back to earlier in the day when she went with Hank to look at the Riddle project. Hank had been genuinely interested in her ideas, as was Lily Riddle. Afterwards, when they were driving back to the office, Hank began asking about her. She told him about growing up in Beaufort, South Carolina, and how she'd been thrilled when she was accepted into the design program at AIA. After a while, the conversation started to feel like a repeat of the one she'd had with Glory, and she wondered how much Glory had told Hank about her. She got the feeling that he was trying to find out about Dan, even though he never would come right out and ask. She kept steering the conversation away from that topic, and she could tell Hank was getting frustrated. For some perverse reason, this pleased her. There was definitely a spark between them. She'd felt it several times when his hand accidentally brushed against hers at the Riddles' home. And he was easy to talk to. Furthermore, he was genuinely interested in what she had to say. Her attraction to him was not only physical, but intellectual as well. He was a wealth of knowledge where design and architecture were concerned, and it was refreshing to discuss a topic she loved. She smiled, remembering what he said when he dropped her off at her car. He gave her a speculative look, his voice casual. So, Glory tells me, the two of you struck some sort of deal. Her heart began to pound, and she could feel the blood rushing to her face. Glory, just wait until I see her again. Hank laughed at her horrified expression. <laughs> She's harmless. She means well. The mother hen comes out in her sometimes. She'd like nothing more than to get me married off to some nice girl, as she calls it. Yeah, I can tell. She put quite a sales pitch on me where you're concerned. Amusement lit his eyes, making them look more blue than green. Really? Remind me to thank her later. He uttered in a low tone that sent a tantalizing shiver down her spine. Time seemed to slow when he leaned in, closing the distance between them. She was shocked at the wave of desire that rolled over her as she looked at his lips. The instant before his lips touched hers, an image of Dan flashed before her eyes and she jerked back. He gave her a quizzical look. Did I do something wrong? No, you didn't, she said quickly, feeling like an imbecile. She'd kissed Garrett a few times, but this was different. This felt permanent, like a commitment. It's not you. It's me, she said hoarsely, looking away to hide the moisture in her eyes. Was she so damaged that she would never be able to have another relationship? Hank touched her arm. When he spoke, his voice was surprisingly kind. Hey, look at me. She turned to face him as a single tear rolled down her cheek. Tenderly, he wiped it away. Then he brushed a strand of hair from her face. It's about Dan, isn't it? She nodded, not surprised in the slightest that Glory had told him everything. I want to get past it. I really do. But I just can't seem to will myself to do it. She blew out a breath of frustration. And it's not just the Dan thing. He tensed. What else? You're my boss. There, she'd said it. She'd been thinking it ever since Glory planted the silly notion in her head that she and Hank would be good together. I don't think we should get involved. It could confuse things. I really need this job. His eyes locked with hers, and she felt herself getting lost in the depth of them. You have to fight against this, her mind screamed. The last thing you need is another complication. 
you have enough to deal with as it is. She knew she should heed the warnings, but all she could think about was that his eyelashes were thicker than any man's had a right to be, and his features were so chiseled they might have been carved from stone. He really was handsome in a Captain America save the world way. All thoughts of Dan or anyone else fled, and all she could think about was Hank. In that moment, she had the distinct impression that it was too late. Whether or not she admitted it, she was becoming emotionally attached. It had snuck up on her before she realized, I promise you, whatever happens between us will have absolutely no bearing on your job. She searched his face to see if she could trust him. Really? Really, he said earnestly. I give you my word. She relaxed. From what she could tell, Hank seemed to be a man of his word. She had no doubt that he meant what he said. But it was easy to say it now, when things were good between them. He switched gears. Getting back to Dan. She went still. I've been where you are. I know exactly what you're going through. You do? It went through her mind for a split second that he was talking about seeing Dan's ghost. But then she remembered she'd not told Gloria about that. Thank goodness. Yeah. He leaned back in his seat, his eyes taking a distant look. I loved someone so much that I would have gone to the end of the earth and back had she asked me to. He had his hand on the steering wheel, gripping it for all it was worth. What happened? She prompted, wanting to keep him talking. She had to find out what made Hank Singleton tick. He gave her a sad smile. She betrayed me. I went away for a while, and she didn't wait for me. She found someone else. Dumped me hard when I needed her most. A thousand questions tumbled through Chloe's mind, and she suddenly remembered Glory saying that Hank had been through a rough time. She hoped he would share more, but he didn't. Silence settled between them. This time she touched his arm. I'm sorry. He nodded. Thanks. It happens. I'm not the only one, he said, keeping his voice light. But she could tell from the look on his face that the betrayal still stung, his eyes locked with hers. Obviously. A smile broke across her lips. Obviously. The mood lifted as they chuckled. I better get going, she said, reaching for the door handle. Being in such close proximity to him was making her heady. A few more moments alone with him and she'd be throwing caution to the wind and kissing him. That would not be a good thing. Not good at all. He caught her hand. Her pulse increased when he began rubbing his thumb back and forth across the top of it. About that date. She raised an eyebrow. What date? She asked innocently. Her heart was pounding so furiously that she felt like it was trying to claw its way out of her chest. He flashed an angelic smile that was so stunning it left her breathless for a second. She realized that Hank could be just as charming as Garrett when he wanted to be. One date is all I ask. One date, huh? You seem mighty sure of yourself, she teased. One date will be enough. The words were spoken with such certainty that she believed him, and it scared her. She couldn't go through another heartache again. I don't know, she began, shaking her head. He trailed a finger along the curve of her jaw. One date, he murmured, capturing her eyes with his. The temptation to kiss him was so strong that she could hardly stand it. Okay, one date. She heard herself say as she quickly opened the door and got out of the car before she made a complete fool of herself. Darby broke into her thoughts, bringing her back to the present. You seem mighty chipper this evening, over there smiling to yourself. Chloe shook her head. Was I smiling? I didn't realize. She looked at Darby, who was arranging napkins on plates. I was just thinking about all the projects I have going on at work. Sure you were. I was, Chloe responded, her eyes going wide. Whatever. The doorbell rang a minute later and Darby went to answer it. Panic gripped Chloe. They're early. She still had to finish the mac and cheese and green beans. While she appreciated punctuality, arriving 45 minutes before a dinner appointment was not good etiquette. When Darby returned to the kitchen, there was a sly expression on her face. What? Chloe said. The object of your thoughts is at the front door. She made a face. The object of my thoughts. 
what are you talking about? I know you were thinking about him earlier, and now he's here. For a split second, she wondered if it were Hank at the front door. Then reality set in. Darby didn't even know who Hank was. Garrett's here, she said flatly. Yup, in the flesh, Darby flashed a coy smile. Better not keep him waiting. Talk about eye candy. Wow. Chloe wiped her hands on a dish towel and turned off the green beans. Apprehension trickled down her spine as she walked into the living room where Garrett was sitting on the couch. He stood when he saw her as an easy smile spread over his face. Hey. Hey, what are you doing here? His smile fell a notch. I just came by to see you, since you've obviously been too busy to return my texts or calls. There was a slightest hint of reproach in his voice. It immediately set her on edge. She tucked a strand of hair behind her ear, thinking about the unfinished dinner that was waiting in the kitchen and the guests that would arrive in a half hour. Garrett, it's really not a good time right now. His expression fell. Why not? Darby and I are making dinner for our neighbors, and they're due to arrive soon. This won't take long. I've got a plane to catch this evening anyway, but I wanted to stop by before I headed out of town. Where are you going this time? He hesitated. Boston. She nodded. He took her hand. Come outside with me for a few minutes. I really don't have time. This couldn't continue. She was going to have to end this, but how? Talking to him was like talking to a fence post. He never listened to anything she had to say, but rather talked at her all of the time. It was all about Garrett. I won't take no for an answer. He led her outside to his car and opened the passenger door. Have a seat. I told you, I don't have time. I have guests arriving in a few minutes, and I have to finish dinner. The last thing she wanted was to get in his car, knowing him he'd drive off with her. His jaw clenched. Relax. This will only take a few minutes, I promise. Fine. She blew out of breath and got into the car. The only reason she did so was because he had a plane to catch soon, so he was on a time crunch. He went around the driver's side and got in. She sat there with her hands on the door handle in case she needed to make a hasty exit. He angled himself so that he was looking directly at her. When he saw her hand on the door handle, he let out a dry chuckle. Well, this is a first. Most girls would jump at the chance to sit in the car with me, and you're acting like you can't wait to get away. Wow, he really was narcissistic. I'm not most girls, she said coldly. He laughed. I know. That's why I find you so fascinating. The way he spoke the word fascinating crawled under her skin, making her feel more annoyed than ever. Garrett, we really need to talk. I can't keep pretending. He put a finger on her lips. All the while, the irritation was building to the point where she felt like she would explode. Just let me get this out, okay? She nodded, biting back the anger retort that was on the tip of her tongue. I know things have been tense between us lately. I've been traveling a lot, and you've been distracted with work. Was he that out of touch with reality? She didn't know whether to laugh or cry. Her voice rose. Distracted at work? I would hardly call work a distraction. Work is a necessary part of life. And I'm getting tired of you leaving me in the lurch all the time. You promised that you would be there for the appointment with Glory. But as usual, you left me high and dry. It's getting really old, Garrett. And furthermore, I'm not your property. Look, I didn't come here to argue with you. Then why did you come here? I told you it's not a good time, but you didn't listen. You never listen. That's the problem. Chloe, stop. The unyielding edge to his voice shocked her into silence. When she made an attempt to withdraw her hands from his, he held on to them, not letting her go. A sense of panic pelted over her and she felt the same sinking feeling she'd experienced earlier in the day when he grabbed her arm in Hank's office. His expression grew soft as he looked into her eyes. I'm sorry. She shook her head and looked away. Chloe, his voice was pleading. I've never felt like this about anyone before. You rock my world. Rock his world? What were they, fifteen? How had she allowed herself to get into such a sticky situation? 
I know I've made a lot of mistakes, but I promise I'll fix them. Garrett? Don't say anything. He cut in, letting go of her hands. He reached in his pocket and retrieved a small black box. Here. She looked at the box and then at his hopeful expression. Take it. He said eagerly. Time was ticking away and her guests were due to arrive any minute. Reluctantly, she took the box and opened it. Her breath caught as she looked at the exquisite pair of pearl and diamond earrings. The large jewel at the top was fiery red, with a layer of small, bright white diamonds encrusted around it. The large diamond trimmed in gold was attached underneath it. And then a milky white pearl artfully hung below that. The gold piece that held the pearl was also encrusted with diamonds and mimicked the stem of a plant. Are these real? She gawked. He laughed. Of course. I can't accept this. It's too much. Now don't insult me by refusing my gift. The words were spoken jokingly, but she could tell by his tight jaw that he was serious. Put them on. Excitement tinged his voice. Now? She shook her head. No, I don't think so. I want to see them on you. That way I'll have an image in my head to take with me on this trip. One of the most handsome men she'd ever seen was giving her an expensive pair of earrings, and it was scaring her to death. All she wanted to do was get as far away from him as possible. On the one hand, there was something childlike and endearing about him. That's what had drawn her to him to begin with. On the other hand, he had a dark side that was controlling and unnerving. An image of Hank flashed through her mind, and she had the strong desire to talk to him right now. If only he were here. He would know what to do about Garrett. Feeling like she was detached from the situation, she removed the earrings she was wearing and replaced them with the diamonds. Garrett was beaming. Perfect. A work of art. He brushed the curve of her jaw with his hand. It was an intimate gesture that made her uncomfortable. She didn't need to be out here alone with Garrett when she was having such strong feelings for his brother. Chloe saw movement out of the corner of her eye. Susan was walking across the yard to her front door. Saved by the landlord. I've got to go. Before he could stop her, she opened the door. He leaned over to kiss her, but she turned her head so that his lips grazed her cheek instead. I'll see you when I get back, he said, disappointment coating his voice. His eyes penetrated hers as if he were willing her to return his affections. She could feel the emotion building and swallowed hard to keep it at bay. She forced a smile. Yeah, I'll see you then. Hey, Susan, she called, knowing that her chances of escape were better with someone else close by. Susan turned and gave her a broad smile. She hurriedly got out of the car. See you later, she said, closing the door and getting away as quickly as possible. She could feel his eyes watching her as she walked across the yard. When she made it to the front door, she turned and acknowledged him with a wave. He gave her a sardonic smile, saluted, and then drove off. Okay, everyone, dig in, Chloe said when they all were seated at the table. Darby cleared her throat. Chloe, before we eat, it would be nice if we could offer a blessing on the food. Heat crawled up Chloe's neck until it covered her face. She had to squelch the irritation that bubbled in her throat. That would be great, Darby. Would you say it? Sure. A few minutes later, when everyone was engrossed in the meal, Chloe surreptitiously studied Darby. She certainly put Chloe in her place. But it hadn't been done maliciously. Darby truly wanted to pray. She was starting to feel a little envious of Darby and her faith. Then again, Darby hadn't gone through hard times like she had. Had she experienced a tenth of the heartache Chloe had, Darby would most assuredly be singing a different tune. As soon as the thought entered her head, she felt guilty. After all, there was no sense in being mean-spirited. She should have been the one who asked the group to offer a blessing on the food. She would have to remember to do that next time. Susan was the first to speak. Well, what's going on with everybody? Chloe placed a hush puppy on her plate and passed them to Lila. Just lots of work for me, trying to finish up a few projects. She wasn't about to go into the Garrett saga. What about you? Susan looked at Darby. Darby helped herself to two pieces of fish. We're really getting into some interesting stuff in my intro to forensic science class. Do you know how long it takes rigor mortis to set in after someone dies? 
Lila nearly choked on her fish. What? Pete laughed and winked. Darby, you can tell us later after dinner's over. Silence settled between them as they began eating. Chloe, everything's absolutely delicious, Lila said, scooping a second helping of mac and cheese onto her plate. Pete reached for another piece of fish. Yes, it is. This is some of the best fish I've ever eaten. Thank you, Chloe said appreciatively as a warm glow settled over her, helping to ebb some of the tension she felt over Garrett. It was good to be amongst friends. The conversation drifted to easy topics as everyone ate until the food was gone. Finally, Pete leaned back and patted his stomach. If I ate like this every night, I might have to go up a pant size. Lila cut her eyes at him. Hey, what are you trying to say? But my cooking isn't good? I'd be careful how I answered that, Susan said, wagging a finger. Pete's face turned red as he pushed his glasses up on his nose. Now, don't go putting words in my mouth. I'm not saying that at all. I love your cooking, honey. It's just that the southern food is so delectable. Delectable, huh? She winked at Chloe. We'll see how delectable it is when you're sleeping on the couch tonight. Susan belted out a hearty laugh. Oh, she told you. See why I love this woman? Pete draped his arm around Lila. She keeps me on my toes, and she's beautiful to boot. He planted a kiss on her cheek. Your flattery won't work, she said. But it was obvious from the glow on her face that she loved it. It was fun to watch Lila and Pete. They were obviously crazy about each other. Lila has lots of talents, and she's an amazing cook, too, Darby added. Yes, she is, Chloe added. A few minutes later, Chloe began serving the pie. She tucked a strand of hair behind her ear and then handed Susan a slice. Wow, where do you get those, Susan said. What? Those earrings, they're beautiful. All eyes turned to Chloe as she frantically began searching for an answer. A friend gave them to me. Some friend. Send a few of those friends my way, would ya? Susan said with a throaty laugh. Not just a friend, Darby said slyly, but a boyfriend. Knowing glances bounced between the women at the table, Chloe could feel her face blazing and she wanted to strangle Darby. Pete, look at those earrings, Lila said. Are they not incredible? So unique. Pete nodded, but it was obvious that he was more interested in the pie than the earrings. You're not even looking at them, Lila complained, catching his arm. Look! He let out a sigh and looked. The next events happened so quickly that Chloe would later wonder if she'd only imagined them. His face went chalky white, and shock registered in his eyes. He moved to stand and in the process inadvertently knocked over the pitcher of lemonade beside him, sending it toppling over where liquid spilled across the table and onto the floor. Chapter 14 Garrett turned away from the attractive blonde who was sitting nearby, trying her best to make eye contact with him. Any other time, he would have humored her and struck up a conversation, but today he had other things on his mind. He propped up his bicycle, and when he was sure it wouldn't fall over during the ferry ride, he rested his hands on the railing. Then he turned his attention to the white foam that was spraying up from the roaring water that was being churned by the large engine underneath the ferry. For a few minutes he let his mind get lost in the commotion, liking how the mist from the water felt cool against his face. It was an overcast day, and the bay was turbulent, very fitting for his emotional state. Ideally, he would have put this job off for at least another month, until he was satisfied that he'd studied all the angles thoroughly so that he could be prepared for all contingencies. But he was backed against the wall and needed to produce some cash fast. Things were getting tense where Sam was concerned, and he was not going to be put off much longer. Even though Garrett was traveling under an assumed name, it was too risky to fly into Oakland due to the tight security and ongoing surveillance. So he rented a car instead, using one of his aliases and a credit card that couldn't be traced back to him. He spent the previous night in a Marriott courtyard in Larkspur and was taking the ferry into San Francisco. Once the job was done, he'd exit the city on his bicycle, pick up his car in Larkspur, and drive back to Salt Lake. 
It would take him about an hour and 40 minutes to bike from San Francisco to Larkspur. But he chose that mode of transportation because in the event that the theft was discovered quickly, the law enforcement would be monitoring cars leaving the city, not someone on a bicycle, taking mostly bike paths. He'd started laying the groundwork for this job almost a year ago. He'd chosen San Francisco for a few reasons. First, he'd be traveling here on a regular basis because he was heading up a project through Marsh Interiors to redo a vacation home for one of their longtime clients. So Hank wouldn't get suspicious. Second, he knew the city like the back of his hand. Lori was an original from San Francisco, and her younger sister, Francine, lived here. All during his youth, Glory had taken Hank and him here every summer in order to give their mother a break. They would spend part of the time in San Francisco and the other part in Bodega Bay, a coastal town about an hour and a half north up the Pacific coast. Third, there was a great deal of wealth in San Francisco that was ripe for the taking. Speaking of wealth, all he needed was one really good score to get him out of this jam. His blood quickened at the thought. The ferry moved past San Quentin Prison. The architecture of the structure was more befitting of a cathedral rather than a prison. He could never pass by the place without thinking about all those poor saps who were caged up like animals, rotting away their lives passing them by. His gaze lingered on the tall fence around the yard with the razor-barbed wire at the top. He suppressed a shiver and turned away, focusing his mind onto other things. Careful planning and a level head was the only difference between him and those unlucky inmates. He looked out in the distance to where the Golden Gate Bridge was stretching its legs gracefully across the bay. Even though it was covered with patches of fog, it was still a majestic sight. There were only a handful of sailboats out today, and one brave kite surfer who was fast losing the battle against the elements. Garrett watched him, pitting his strength against the relentless wind while getting jerked around hazardously like a scrap of paper. He took in a deep breath, drawing strength from the salty air. He really did love San Francisco. If all went well, he'd bring Chloe here. Maybe teach her how to sail. His heart quickened at the thought as he pictured her brown eyes that were so expressive and her open smile. He'd known many beautiful girls in his lifetime some of them even more beautiful than Chloe, but there was something about her. He couldn't quite pinpoint what it was exactly that captured him, and the fact that Hank desired her was icing on the cake. As much as he loved his older brother, there was a part of him that resented having to walk in his footsteps all of the time. No matter what he accomplished, it seemed that Hank's achievements were always grander, and now he turned into a pompous churchgoer. He scowled, Focusing his thoughts back to Chloe, a smile came over his lips as he remembered her startled expression when she saw the earrings. And then she'd asked if they were real. He could only imagine her reaction had she realized that the earrings were a one-of-a-kind pair that were worth somewhere in the neighborhood of twenty grand. He usually broke each piece of jewelry he acquired into component parts so they were unidentifiable, but these particular earrings were so unique that he couldn't bring himself to do that. Giving them to Chloe was not part of the original plan. Not until Hank stepped in, trying to take what was his. He'd been keeping the earrings for insurance, in case he needed a quick fix way to appease Sam until he could get cash. In the back of his mind, he wondered if giving them to Chloe was a good idea. She'd not seem too thrilled about them. What if something went wrong tonight, and he couldn't get the goods? He'd be sunk. He supposed he could always steal the earrings back if push came to shove. Although twenty grand was a pittance compared to the amount he owed. He pushed the negative thoughts away. The job would go according to plan, and he would get the jewels. That's the way it had to be. The mark, Phyllis Masterson, had first come on his radar when he was attending a high society party last summer. He often frequented parties and clubs so that he could keep his ear to the ground gathering useful information and tips on the owners of valuable jewels and antiquities. Phyllis was a 50-year-old divorcee whose ex-husband owned three of the largest vineyards in Sonoma, a spa, and two restaurants. She shamelessly flaunted her high-priced jewelry by wearing it to all of the local parties and charity events. He spent a month trailing her to learn her habits. Also, he wanted to make sure that the jewelry would be worth the trouble it would take to steal it. He was able to get close enough at her party to verify that the necklace was indeed real, 
and worth a fortune. He learned that Phyllis had a daughter in her mid-twenties who was a sucker for charming men. Natalie was an undergrad student at Berkeley, studying English, so Garrett simply pretended to be a fellow student in one of her classes where he sat a seat away from her. A chance meeting in the library prompted her to invite him to join her study group. All in all, it had taken less than a week for Garrett to convince Natalie Masterson to fall head over heels for him, which was not a small feat considering that Natalie was a high society girl who was as spoiled as she was beautiful. He'd pulled out all of the stops, wooing her with tickets to a sold-out concert, dinner at the hottest sushi restaurant in town, sailing on the bay, a night tour of Alcatraz, and a hot air balloon ride in Napa that included a champagne breakfast at an exclusive spa. Of course, Natalie thought she was falling for Damien Bradford, the only son of a wealthy investment banker. He assumed the persona that was closest to his real personality, a playboy who attended Berkeley as a pastime when he wasn't busy traveling the world or finding other extravagant ways to spend his father's money. He'd only dated Natalie nine days when she brought him home to meet her mother. Phyllis lived in a three-story Victorian home that was sandwiched between a row of other homes of the same style, facing Marina Boulevard. The home was easily accessible, with the garage and entry door on the bottom level. Also, it was located so that he could make a speedy exit. Even though the logistics were ideal, he still couldn't be sure he could pull off the job until he met Phyllis face-to-face -to, -face to see what type of person he was dealing with. His fears vanished the moment he met her and realized that he could work her like putty in his hands. Phyllis had undergone enough plastic surgery to make her look at least ten years younger than her age. She let him know immediately that she was attracted to him. Garrett suspected that she was trying desperately to hold on to her youth and that he was a distraction from her otherwise dull existence of endless parties, trips to the spa, and shopping. But as long as she served her purpose... He really didn't care. He started seeing Phyllis behind Natalie's back. It didn't take him long to learn that Phyllis liked to drink. On one occasion, she got so soused that Garrett had to help her to bed. While she was passed out, snoring loudly, he scouted out the location of the safe she kept hidden behind a large abstract art painting on her bedroom wall. The safe, a 2.1 cubic capacity size with a digital keypad, was surprisingly low budget considering the value of the contents it housed. Like most people who lived in upscale neighborhoods, Phyllis had a false sense of security, and he suspected that her jewels were insured for the maximum amount. His thoughts went back to the safe. He was not an expert at cracking safes by any means, but given enough time, with the right tools, he felt sure he could crack this one. He considered using a blowtorch to break down the reinforcement plates so that he could drill the lock but that would take a long time, and it was noisy. Then he came up with a plan that would be seamless and require little effort during the actual heist. The night before Phyllis was to attend an art gala, he showed up at her home and got her rip-roaring drunk. When she passed out, he installed tiny cameras that he hired Asa, his longtime friend, to create, cameras that would be extremely hard to spot unless one had a trained eye. He placed one behind a lighting sconce on an adjoining wall and the other on the opposite wall tucked between a framed photograph and book that were resting on a shelf. The cameras linked to his laptop allowed him to watch as Phyllis opened the safe. He figured that having both angles would ensure that he would be able to see the combination that she punched in regardless of how she was angled. It worked like a charm. Then a day later, he simply removed the cameras before anyone was the wiser. The only glitch in the plan would be if Phyllis were to change the code to her safe for some reason. Then again, he felt sure that she wouldn't unless she felt threatened. It took effort to change things, and Phyllis didn't seem like the type to bother with it. He hoped. Next, he turned his sights to the alarm system on the house itself. He briefly toyed with the idea of getting the code from Phyllis or Natalie, but decided that it would be easier to simply disable it. All things considered, the job would be relatively simple, much simpler than others he'd done in the past. He spent a few weeks becoming intimately familiar with Phyllis's habits and the comings and goings of her neighbors. When he got that down to a science, there was only one thing left to do, sever his connection with Phyllis and Natalie.
He went to Phyllis's house on a night when he was sure Natalie would stop by. Like clockwork, she showed up to find Phyllis and him in the middle of an intense makeout session on the couch. Natalie was, of course, heartbroken and enraged. She ranted and raved, slapped his face, and called him every name imaginable. He played the part of the regretful boyfriend, apologizing profusely and taking all of the blame. He even went so far as to admit that he'd been the one that had come on to Phyllis when she was having a weak moment. His apology fell on deaf ears as Natalie threw Garrett, or rather Damien, out on his ear, telling him that she never wanted to see him again. He sorrowfully told her that he understood and would never bother her or her mother again. All the while, elation pulsed through him. He loved it when a plan came together. All he had to do then was simply wait a month or so to make sure that Phyllis wouldn't connect him with the break-in. Even if she did somehow suspect him, he was banking on the fact that she would be too embarrassed to admit she'd stooped as low as to sneak around with her daughter's boyfriend. If his instincts were correct, he suspected that Phyllis would want to keep the break-in quiet by collecting the insurance money and moving on. Had he not been on a time crunch, Garrett would have spent at least a day or two doing surveillance to make sure that everything was the same as it had been two months prior. However, with Sam breathing down his neck, that was not an option. He would be going into this thing unprepared, hoping there were no surprises. Apprehension clawed over him as he willed himself to remain calm. His success depended on keeping a level head. Twenty minutes later, as the ferry approached the Embarcadero Pier, his anxiety had been replaced by a fevered anticipation, making him feel more alive than he had in weeks. When the attractive blonde caught his eye and offered him a hopeful smile, he flashed her a dazzling one in return. She seemed to go soft all over as a look of pleasure came over her face. A thrill shot through him. He loved the control he wielded over the opposite sex. This was a good omen that things would go according to plan tonight. He found himself whistling as he stepped off the ferry and got onto his bike. After the job was done, things would be different. Now that Chloe was in the picture, the idea of settling down and living a normal life didn't seem all that far-fetched. Of course, there was still the unpleasant business with Sam. But after this was taken care of, it would be smooth sailing from there. Chapter 15 Quit pacing! You're making me nervous! Chloe stopped and looked at Darby, who was sitting Indian-style on the couch with her laptop in her lap. Oh, sorry, she mumbled. I didn't realize I was. She rubbed her hands back and forth and then sat down in the love seat. Hot date with Garrett? Yeah, something like that. Darby's eyes flickered over Chloe. Well, you certainly got all dolled up. Are those the guest boots that Garrett bought you? Yes, it's the first time it's been cold enough to wear them. I know. I'm excited about fall. The leaves in the canyon are starting to turn. I'm trying to talk Steve into taking me into Big Cottonwood next weekend. Steve was Darby's on and off boyfriend. Darby would tell her that she'd broken up, and then a couple of days later, she'd be out on another date with him. It was funny that Darby mentioned the canyon, because that's where they were going. The trees were one thing that Chloe missed about the South. She was looking forward to going into the canyon to see some foliage because it was virtually non-existent in the valley. Although as nervous as she was, she probably wouldn't pay much attention to the trees. Her heart felt like a flopping fish on dry land, and her hands were annoyingly sweaty. She rubbed them on her jeans for the umpteenth time and blew out a breath. Darby's head shot up as she frowned. Hey, I thought you said that Garrett went to Boston for a few days to attend a conference. Chloe's eyes went wide. Busted. She began nodding slowly. Yeah, I did. Darby immediately closed her laptop and turned her full attention to Chloe. Interest lit her perceptive eyes. So this date is not with Garrett. Chloe wrinkled her nose. Not exactly. When she didn't offer more information, Darby motioned to her to continue. Don't leave me hanging here. She hated to say the words out loud, knowing how they would sound. I'm going out with Hank. Darby's jaw dropped. Hank? Your boss? Chloe started squirming in her seat. Yeah. 
The same Hank that's Garrett's brother. That Hank, Darby asked incredulously. Yes, that Hank. She hated that Darby was making such a big deal about it. It wasn't her fault that Garrett wouldn't listen to reason. She tried to break up with him. She liked Hank, really liked him. Yes, she felt guilty that he was her boss and Garrett's brother. She'd never intended to fall for him. She supposed she could thank Glory for that. Darby laughed. <laughs> wow, aren't you the little heartbreaker? Two brothers? She chuckled. I don't know if I should be admiring you or pitying you. Definitely pitying me. I pity me. The words left a sour taste in her mouth. How in the heck had she gotten into such a mess? So does Garrett know you're going out with his brother? No. Darby scratched her head. Okay, I'm not trying to butt into your business, but it sounds like you're playing with fire here. She fought the urge to laugh in Darby's face. Darby was always butting into her business, even though the rational part of her argued that she didn't owe Darby an explanation. The words tumbled out all the same. I've tried over and over to tell Garrett that it's over. He's so bullheaded about it. No, he's just buying you expensive earrings, stuff like that. I never asked him to buy me all those things. Chloe snapped. Angry tears welled in her eyes. He treats me like I'm his property rather than a person. He won't leave me alone. I'm starting to get worried. Darby placed her laptop on the sofa and leaned forward, a look of concern on her face. Exactly what is he doing? Is he making you feel threatened? She spread her hands as she attempted to gather her thoughts so that they would make sense. No, not in a stalker sort of way. He's very controlling, which I don't like. And he has this dark edge to him. I'm never quite sure what to think about him. He says all the right things, but it's all surface. I don't feel like I know the real Garrett, and he really doesn't want to get to know me. It's like I'm a prize to be won. Well, you need to tell him flat out that it's over. Chloe fought the urge to scream. I've tried that. He refuses to take no for an answer. Is that why you're going out with his brother? So he'll get the answer loud and clear? No, that's not why I'm going out with Hank. I'm going out with Hank because I care about him. And because for the first time since Dan died, I feel like I have a second chance at life. She didn't say that part out loud. It was too personal. There was something else, too. Ever since she'd been preoccupied with Hank, she hadn't had a single dream about Dan. She was holding her breath, hoping with all her heart that the trauma was finally behind her. A thoughtful look came over Darby's face. Wow, you really do like him. Is he as handsome as Garrett? Well, he's not as pretty as Garrett, if that's what you're asking. But he's handsome, very handsome, in a manly way. Darby lifted her arm, forming her bicep into a muscle. A manly man, huh? I've got to see this. Chloe smirked. I mean, he's ruggedly handsome. And if you ask me, that's much better than being a pretty boy. The doorbell rang. Chloe jumped up. He's here, she said unnecessarily. Darby laughed. Calm down. No hyperventilating. She gave her a sly look. You know, you could play a little hard to get. Oh, shut up, Chloe countered as a ghost of a smile stole over her lips. Before Chloe could answer the door, Darby stood. Chloe smoothed down her hair and adjusted her shirt. I'll get it. Oh, no, you won't. I've got to see this guy myself. She flung open the door. Hi! Hank cleared his throat. Hi, is Chloe here? Darby stepped back and motioned. Yes, she is, she said in a voice that was way too cheerful and an octave too loud for the given situation. Then she looked down and saw that he was holding a bouquet of tangerine-colored calla lilies. Are those for me? She put her hand over her chest, batting her eyelashes. You shouldn't have. A trace of amusement touched Hank's features as he stepped inside. Don't worry, I didn't. He flashed a disarming smile. Not this time, anyway. Darby looked surprised and then laughed. Good one. She held up a finger. Chloe chuckled inwardly. It had taken all of two seconds for Hank to have Darby eating out of the palm of his hand. She was quickly learning that Garrett didn't hold a monopoly on the family charm after all. 
When Hank spotted Chloe, he gave her that cocked smile she was coming to love as he stepped up to her. Hey. Hey. He held out the flowers. These are for you. She took them and brought them to her nose. Thank you. He winked at Darby. Maybe you could put them out somewhere where your roommate could appreciate them too. The name's Darby. It's nice to meet you, Darby. Darby looked him up and down. Likewise. Then she took the flowers out of Chloe's hands. I'll put these in water for you. A devilish light danced in her eyes. And I'll be sure to put them someplace where Chloe and I can both enjoy them. Hank laughed. <laughs> Sounds good. Chloe assumed that Darby would leave at that point. But she just kept standing there, gawking at Hank like he was some sort of specimen on display. So where are you two headed? Darby said. Chloe shot Darby a warning look that said, Stop making an idiot of yourself. Just get out of here and leave us alone. Of course, Darby ignored it. Chloe wanted to strangle her. She gave Hank an apologetic look, but then realized that he wasn't the least bit put out by Darby's nosiness. On the contrary, he seemed amused by her antics. I'm taking Chloe to one of my favorite spots in American Fort Canyon. I love the canyon this time of year, Darby gushed, envy coating her voice. Chloe knew she had to do something immediately before Darby invited herself to come along. She took Hank's arm. Well, we'd better get going. Don't wait up. I never do. Darby turned her attention to Hank. It was nice meeting you. Nice meeting you, too. Darby looked at Chloe. Very manly. Much better than the pretty boy. You chose wisely. Heat scorched Chloe's face of all the low-down, ridiculous things to say. It was like Darby got her jollies out of tormenting her. Hank gave her a questioning look, to which she only shook her head. Darby chuckled and breezed past them. You two have fun, she said sweetly. Don't do anything I wouldn't do. So, what do you think? I think it's one of the most incredible things I've ever seen, Chloe said breathlessly, as her gaze took in the expanse of the majestic scene below. They'd driven up high in the canyon and walked a short distance to an overlook where they could get a bird's-eye view of the Tibble Fork Reservoir below. From this vantage point, it looked like a sparkling oval of cut glass that was one of the most vivid blues she'd ever seen. The aspen trees were ablaze with a crisp yellow that popped against the rich green of the giant evergreens that were dotted uniformly across the landscape like a company of rigid soldiers standing at attention. A jagged mountain range stood in the distance, decorated with silvery white threads of snow. Never had she imagined that the canyon would look like this. There was something so profound about the larger-than-life scene that it caused a sense of awe to come over her. It's perfect, she whispered, feeling as though a heavenly artist had created a pristine painting that was untouched by the ugliness that marred the rest of the world. Hank reached for her hand and linked his fingers through hers. It's one of my favorite places, he said, also keeping his voice soft. It was like there was such a sense of peace about the scene that he didn't want to ruin it by speaking too loudly. I can see why. She suddenly forgot about the scenery and became more aware of Hank and how he was standing so close and holding her hand. It felt comfortable being here with him, comfortable and exhilarating at the same time. He pointed. The mountain in the distance is Mount Timpanogos, or Timp, as most people call it. It's the second highest mountain in the Wasatch Range. What's the highest? Technically, Mount Nebo is the highest, but not nearly as prominent as Mount Temp. Do you know how Mount Nebo got its name? Before she could answer, he continued, From the biblical Mount Nebo overlooking Israel, it's thought to be the place of Moses' death. His voice took on the tone of a teacher as he continued the history lesson. A smile curved over her lips as she watched how engrossed he was in the conversation. He went on for another five or so minutes and then gave her a contrite smile. I'm boring you stiff aren't I? She laughed. Not exactly, but you did start to lose me at the part where you were listing the peaks and their exact elevations. He grimaced. Sorry. The look of embarrassment that came over his face was endearing, 
and she felt like she'd caught a glimpse of how he might have looked when he was a teenager and less sure of himself. He let go of her hand and rubbed his neck. Yeah, that's the geek in me coming out, I'm afraid. You're just so darn smart, you can't help yourself. A look of surprise flittered over his face, and then he chuckled. I guess I deserve that. I think it's cute. He turned and looked at her. Do you now? A playful smile touched the corners of his lips. Her breath caught as she looked up into his eyes, trying to decide if they were more blue or green. She never thought she could feel this way again. And yet here she was with this gorgeous guy that was captivating her thoughts and driving her to distraction. He stepped up close to her and brushed a lock of hair away from her face. I got so caught up in one beauty that I'm neglecting the real beauty that's standing before me. A dart of warmth shot through her as he leaned in. Delicious anticipation danced down her spine as she closed her eyes, but nothing happened. When she opened her eyes a second later, he was staring down at her, a conflicted expression on his face. What's wrong? she implored. He shook his head and looked away. She caught hold of his arm, confused by the sudden turn of events. I can't do this, he said, raking his hands through his hair. I thought I could, but I can't. She went cold. What can't you do? The words came out flat and dead. I can't kiss the same girl who's been kissing my brother. He might as well have carved out her heart and rolled it down the canyon. A burning humiliation came over her, and she felt like a tramp. For a split second, she went dizzy and felt like she was detached from the situation, watching it from a distance. Then anger took hold, snuffing out all the rest. You initiated this date! Tears formed in her eyes. You brought me here, shared things with me, made me care about you. She hated how desperate those last words sounded. She hated herself for letting her guard down and thinking she could love again. And what she really hated most at the moment was Hank Singleton. I'm sorry, Chloe. I never meant to lead you on. She let out an incredulous laugh. <laughs> really? What in the heck did you think you were doing? I don't know. I thought I could deal with the Garrett thing. But just before we kissed, an image of him flashed through my mind and I felt sick to my stomach. He's my brother, after all, and he cares about you. I can't double-cross him that way. Garrett is my responsibility. Her fingers were itching to wrap themselves around his treacherous neck and squeeze until his head popped off. She balled her hands into fists. Garrett? She spat. It's always about Garrett. Her voice was near yelling, but she didn't care. Her blood was pumping so furiously that her head felt like it would split in two. For your information, I don't give a hoot about your selfish brother. I'm sick and tired of him trying to force me to date him. Garrett is a moron. And if you don't have the sense to realize that it's you I care about, then you're a bigger moron than he is. And furthermore, a wave of dizziness assaulted her as stars began exploding around her. She stumbled back. Hank caught her arm to steady her. Panic rose thick in her throat. What's happening to me? She pressed the tips of her fingers into the bridge of her nose. I feel like I'm going to pass out. You're not used to the altitude, and when you got so upset, it intensified everything. It's my head. A blinding pain was shooting across her forehead, making it hard to think about anything else. Try to relax. Breathe in through your nose and out through your mouth. She sputtered, gulping for air. I can't get a good breath. Calm down, Hank ordered. I can't calm down, she protested, tears gathering in her eyes. He grabbed both her arms. Look at me, he ordered. She shook her head. Look at me. Fine, I'm looking. You're going to be okay. Try to regulate your breathing. Breathe deep in through your nose and out through your mouth. In two, out two. In two, out two. A couple of minutes later, when she was finally able to draw a good breath, the panic subsided a little. Her head was still throbbing, but it had turned into a dull headache rather than a splitting one. Hank took her hand. Come on, 
I've got some ibuprofen in the car. Let's get you to lower ground. Chloe stretched out her hands toward the crackling fire, appreciative of the warmth it provided. Now that the ibuprofen was kicking in, she was starting to feel more normal. She and Hank had hardly spoken since the near-kiss incident. All this considered, she expected him to take her straight home and was surprised when he pulled over at a picnic stop, located in a lower section of the canyon. What are we doing? Chloe wanted to know. He winked at her. You'll see. Twenty minutes later, they were sitting cozily around a roaring fire. Hank had brought items to make s'mores, but Chloe wasn't the least bit hungry. Her stomach still felt queasy. And more than anything, she just wanted to go home and forget that this disastrous evening had ever taken place. Hank went to work roasting marshmallows. Then he made a couple of s'mores and downed them. No sense in letting all of this stuff go to waste, he explained. Chloe waved a hand. I'm glad someone's able to enjoy it, she said sourly. Hank's eyebrows shot up. When she saw the look of amusement that came over his face, her eyes narrowed. What? she flung out, tired of playing these silly games. Nothing, he said lightly. Don't mind me. I'm just eating s'mores, minding my own business. She scowled and turned her attention to the fire. Hank had made it perfectly clear that there was no hope for them romantically. Why he felt the need to drag out this ridiculous charade was beyond her. She was more than a little surprised and very irritated when he pulled his chair so close to hers that they were touching. She expected him to at least say something. When he remained quiet, she turned to him. What are you doing? His eyes met hers in a challenge, and then he shrugged. Same as you, sitting here staring into the fire, trying to determine what it is that you find so fascinating about it. Your eyes have been glued to it since we got here. She hugged her arms tightly. Moron, she muttered under her breath. He laughed softly. She spun at him, her eyes blazing. I'm glad you find this so amusing. You made it perfectly clear that there can never be anything between us, so why don't you just cut the crap and take me home? What would be the fun in that? He murmured, rubbing her arm. She jerked her arm away like she'd been burned. What are you doing? Is this some sort of sick game to you? Chloe, we need to talk about what happened earlier. Save it, she barked. You've already said enough. She moved to stand. I'm tired. Can you please just take me home? Her voice cracked with emotion and she swallowed it down. She wouldn't give him the satisfaction of seeing her break down. He caught her arm. We need to talk. His eyes locked with hers. Please. She blew out a breath and sat back down. Fine. Talk. I had no idea you've been trying to break things off with Garrett. I certainly had no idea how you felt about me. Garrett and I did go out a few times, but we were never a couple. And yes, I've been trying every way I can think of to end things with him, but he won't listen. I just assumed. Well, you assumed wrong, she cut in. Yeah, I can see that. I'm sorry. I guess I was being a moron. His apology caught her off guard, and then she saw the sincerity in his expression. Her defenses crumbled slightly, and she felt herself soften. I'm afraid where my brother is concerned, I have a skewed perception of things. She stared into the fire, watching sparks shoot up from the pit and then disappear into the night. From the minute I met Garrett, he came on strong. Sounds like him, Hank said dryly. He immediately started giving me extravagant gifts and taking me on elaborate dates. At first, I was impressed. I mean, who wouldn't be? I was new in town, all alone, and this handsome, charming guy was showering me with attention. She glanced over and saw that Hank's jaw went hard as he nodded. Garrett is quite the Casanova, that's for sure. He is. Chloe agreed. He let out a self-deprecating laugh. <laughs> I guess a date to the canyon to make s'mores kind of pales in comparison, huh? No, actually, it doesn't. Tonight's the most fun I've had in a very long time. She wrinkled her nose. Well, at least it was until you lamb-blasted me. 
He winced at the accusation. I said I was sorry. I know, and I appreciate it. But, he prompted, his eyes penetrating hers. Her heart picked up a notch, and he began lightly rubbing circles over her arm with the tip of his finger. This time, she didn't pull away. She should have pulled away. But it was like he had this magic power that compelled her to stay where she was. But I don't know if I truly believe it. It took a lot for me to open myself up to you. And then you turned me down flat. Made me feel like a fool. She halfway expected him to retreat at that, but he leaned in closer. Despite her best effort to remain calm, her treacherous heart started hammering. She couldn't deny the fierce attraction she felt for him. The flickering fire highlighted his chiseled jaw, and the growing dusk had turned his eyes to fathomless pools of smoky blue. She felt like she could get lost in them. You are direct. He gave her an appraising look. I find it makes life easier. A small smile escaped her lips. I suppose it does. Hank gave her a crooked smile that shot darts of warmth through her. She had the feeling that they were suspended in time, where it was only the two of them. When he reached for her hand and linked his fingers through hers, she didn't pull away. Suddenly, she wanted him to understand where she was coming from. I haven't always been so direct. Really, how so? She searched his face and was pleased to note that he seemed interested, really interested, in what she had to say. He patiently waited for her to gather her thoughts. I knew things weren't right between Dan and me, but I didn't have the nerve to confront him about it. I thought if I ignored it, then it would go away. It was the first time she'd spoken those words aloud. Getting them off her chest was more liberating than she could have ever imagined, and she quickly continued before she could change her mind. Ultimately, I convinced myself that I was only imagining things and that once he came home from Afghanistan, things would be different. She swallowed hard. Of course, he didn't come home. And then I found out that he'd betrayed me. She didn't try to hide the bitterness she felt, nor did she attempt to wipe away the single tear that rolled down her cheek. Hank squeezed her hand. Dan was a fool. Thank you. She could tell that he truly meant it. A comfortable silence settled between them until she spoke. I decided that I would never remain silent about the things that mattered. Had I confronted Dan, I feel sure that he would have confessed, and I could have told him how I felt. I could have dealt with it when he was still alive. Her voice caught. Now, I'll never be able to tell him. I have to carry it around with me. Don't fool yourself. Even if you had been able to confront him, it wouldn't have hurt any less. She turned to face him. Do you really believe that? I know it, he said quietly, his eyes meeting hers. It dawned on her that he was speaking from experience. He'd been hurt too. What exactly happened to you? His eyes took a faraway look. Like you, I was in love. Veronica, or V was everything I thought I ever wanted and more. In the end, she left me, when I needed her the most. The jealousy that jabbed her came as a surprise. He'd obviously been madly in love with this V girl. Was he still? She hoped he would expound. Disappointment settled over her when he didn't. You mentioned before that you had to go away for some reason. What happened? Was it her imagination, or did he grow tense? She fleetingly wondered if he were going to flat out ignore the question, but finally he answered. I did something that I'm not proud of. Made mistakes. What kind of mistakes? She could tell that her questions were making him uncomfortable, but she needed to know his past. He was hiding something. A quiver of apprehension ran down her spine. He released her hand and looked into the fire. This time, she touched his arm. Hank. Whatever it is, you can tell me. His jaw started working, and then he gave her a sad smile. I betrayed the trust of a close friend, and I'll never forgive myself for it. He seemed so responsible, committed, 
the last person who would ever betray a trust. How? He shook his head. I got in over my head with business matters. Things didn't go according to plan. It was a bad situation. She frowned. He was being so cryptic. Whatever this thing was, it was obviously forbidden territory. She'd shared her feelings about Dan. Why couldn't he share his with her? Maybe they were a lost cause. A hard knot settled in her stomach. He seemed to be reading her thoughts. Look, I know you have a lot of questions, and I promise I'll share everything with you. He gave her a pleading look. Eventually, but it's too hard to talk about right now. I told you that whatever it is, I'll understand. Her brows knitted together in frustration. He gave her a tender smile that was tinged with sadness. Please, can you be patient for a little while? That's all I'm asking. I just wish you would trust me enough to tell me. If we're going to have any chance of having a relationship, then we're going to have to trust each other. I've been through too much to take things on blind faith. I need to know if you're being straight with me. He swore under his breath. This was nothing to do with not being straight with you. Then tell me. The anguish that washed over his face cut her to the core. Haven't you ever had something happen that was so painful that you couldn't share it with anyone? Not even someone you care about. Yes, she did have something that was too painful to share. There was no way she was going to admit she'd been seeing Dan's ghost. Her mind raced through the possibilities, wondering what it was that Hank was not sharing. How could she fault him for holding something back when she was doing the same? Then her eyes went wide as she caught the meaning of his words. A tiny smile flittered over his lips. Yes, that's right. I have feelings for you, too. That's why I couldn't kiss you earlier. Not until I was sure that you didn't have any real feelings for Garrett. What? Heat scorched up her face, followed by a blinding anger. You were baiting me. How could you? She sputtered, feeling as though she'd been socked in the stomach. I wouldn't call it baiting, exactly. I just needed to know where you stood. Where I stood? She let out a harsh laugh. You nearly caused me to pass out. Tears pooled in her eyes. Chloe, calm down. I didn't know it was going to affect you so drastically. I had to find out if you had feelings for Garrett. I meant what I said about not wanting to betray my brother. You egotistical jerk. She stood. Take me home now. He jumped up and grabbed her arm. Wait a minute. This is not a game. This is my life we're talking about. And I refuse to be some pawn that the two of you are fighting over. You're not a pawn. I care about you, Chloe. As he searched her eyes, she was torn. There was something mesmerizing about his confidence. Not only was he exceptionally good-looking with those rugged features, but also more important, he was real and down-to-earth, the kind of guy she could build a life with. A part of her wanted to throw caution to the wind and kiss him just to see how it would feel to have his lips on hers. The other part of her wanted to slap him. Yes, slapping him would definitely be the better option. Her breath caught as he pulled her into his arms. He leaned in and captured her eyes with his. A thrill ran down her spine, causing her to go weak in the knees. She had the fleeting impression that everything she'd ever hoped to find was right here in front of her. If only she could summon the courage to reach out and grab it. I want to believe you, she whispered, but... The protest got drowned out when his lips came down on hers. She put up a fight for a half a second, but then let out a groan of submission as her arms went around his neck. He parted her lips with his, causing molten fire to surge through her as his tongue connected to hers making her feel weightless for a second. She allowed herself to get lost in the wonder of him as he deepened the kiss, turning her blood electric. Wow, he murmured, his eyes dancing. That was something. She tried to pull away, but he held her fast. I meant what I said. I don't play games. Everything I feel for you is real. He searched her face. Do you believe me? 
She nodded and looked away before he could see the tears. Too late. Hey, are you okay? He cupped her cheeks. Yeah. How embarrassing. It was just like her to act like a big baby. I'm sorry. It's just been a long time since I felt this way. The words faded into the night, and she hoped he would understand what she was trying to say. He gave her a tender smile that was filled with such promise that it nearly took her breath away. Me too. He pulled her close, and she rested her head against his chest. For one small moment, she felt like happiness was within her grasp and that everything might turn out okay. Chapter 16 Garrett's entire plan was contingent on the need for Phyllis to be out cold when he entered the home and took the jewels. As much as the woman drank, there was a good chance she would drink herself into a stupor without any help from him. However, he decided to sway things in his favor by sending her champagne, something she couldn't resist. A bottle of Dom Perignon 2003 Rosé. It had cost him a whopping $385, but it would be worth every penny if the jewelry were worth what he estimated. He included a card that read, From a Secret Admirer at the Club. Phyllis belonged to a private club. He decided to mention it as a red herring in the event Phyllis somehow connected the champagne with the break-in. Of course, it was simply a bottle of champagne, nothing more, and he'd gone to great lengths to ensure that it couldn't be traced back to him. Most people would drink one glass, perhaps two, if they couldn't resist the robust flavor. But not Phyllis. She'd down the entire bottle in practically two gulps and then go looking for more. He was wearing all black, including a ski mask and gloves. He had the eerie sense of being an extension of the dark night surrounding him. His senses were on full alert as he noiselessly made his way through the living room and kitchen. It had been a piece of cake to disable the alarm. So far, everything was going according to plan. Even as the thought went through his head, he heard a slight noise. He paused, his heart racing, as he strained to hear. Nothing. His fears rose up with a vengeance, becoming hideous things in the night that threatened to vanquish his courage and send him retreating before he could accomplish the objective. What if Natalie, the daughter, had decided to spend the night? Or worse, what if Phyllis had found a new boyfriend? Maybe he was here spending the night. One mistake is all it would take to trip him up. What if Phyllis had not drunk the champagne? He needed her to be in a deep sleep for the plan to work. A trickle of sweat rolled between his shoulder blades, and his backpack of tools suddenly felt too heavy for his shoulders. Thankfully, habit took over from there, and he forced himself to snuff out the fears. He busied his mind with concentrating on the details as he walked up the stairs. Phyllis's bedroom was the last room on the end of a long hall, as he walked, every creak in the floor sounded to him like a shotgun going off. His heart was nearly pounding out of his chest when he stopped in front of Phyllis's room. Ever so carefully, he turned the handle and pushed open the door. Relief washed over him when he heard her snoring loudly. He strained his eyes to see through the darkness and finally determined that there was only one lump under the covers. She appeared to be alone. He went over to the window and parted the drapes slightly, allowing a sliver of moonlight to shine into the room. He didn't want to open the drapes too wide in case someone happened to be watching from outside. Nor did he want to use the flashlight any more than was absolutely necessary. He scoped the room, his eyes pausing on the bedside table. He spotted the empty bottle of Dom Perignon and a half-empty bottle of scotch. Just as he'd planned. The sight gave him a boost of courage he needed to continue. He walked over to the abstract art piece and removed it from the wall. Here's where it would all come together or go up in smoke. If Phyllis had changed the alarm, then all of his planning was for naught. He cupped the flashlight in his hand and flicked it on, trying to focus the light on the keypad rather than around the room. He swallowed hard and punched in the code. Holding his breath, he turned the handle. Exhilaration flooded him when the door opened. Not taking the time to examine the contents, he reached inside and scooped them into a bag. Then he closed the safe and replaced the piece of art. With any luck, Phyllis wouldn't realize for several days that anything had been taken. He was approaching the bedroom door when it all fell apart. Stop where you are! He froze, his heart in his throat. Where had the person come from? Turn around! 
He slowly turned as his mind frantically searched for a solution. He had a tranquilizer gun in his backpack, but how was he going to get to it? Was the person holding a gun? He could still hear Phyllis snoring like a foghorn. When he was fully turned, the high-pitched voice spoke again. What's your name? Who are you? Come closer. Hesitantly, he stepped toward the voice. If he could somehow get the backpack off his shoulders without the person realizing. Then he stopped and did a double take. A hysterical laugh bubbled up in his throat when he realized what was happening. There in the corner, tucked in the darkness, so that he'd not seen it before, was a birdcage. And inside sat a large green parrot peering back at him. He suspected that he'd woken it when he shined the flashlight at the safe. What's your name? the bird demanded. Garrett began slowly stepping back from the cage. The bird grew agitated as it flapped its wings. What's your name? it shrieked. What's your name? Phyllis stopped snoring and shifted in the bed. Panic seized Garrett. The stupid bird was going to wake her up. He began stepping back further from the cage in an attempt to leave the room, but the bird grew louder. Come back here! Come back here! What's your name? The bird would continue to squawk and carry on until it awoke Phyllis. Hurriedly, he shoved the bag of jewels into his backpack and zipped it up. Who are you? the parrot said. Who are you? Phyllis was snoring again, and he didn't know how long it would last. He picked up the cage and carried it to the window. The movement shocked the parrot into silence. Not knowing what else to do, he opened the window. Then he opened the door to the cage and held it to the open window. When the parrot stayed put, he reached in and grabbed it. It let out a blood-curdling shriek as Garrett threw it out the window. He watched it as it flapped its wings frantically a few times before finally catching the wind and flying away. He held his breath for a second, hoping against hope that Phyllis's snoring would continue. He about jumped out of his skin when she snorted. He waited, everything hanging in the balance until she finally settled into a regular pattern of snoring. He quietly closed the window, pulled the drapes together, and put the cage back in the corner. Then he hurried to the door, not looking back. Thank you. I look forward to meeting you, Chloe said as she ended the call. She immediately added the appointment to her calendar on her phone. Finally, clients were calling and asking for her specifically. This referral had come from Stephanie Brooks, an existing client of Marsh Interiors. Chloe had helped her pick out fabric for a new sofa and love seat. Evidently, she'd been so pleased with the result that she recommended Chloe to a friend who wanted help redoing her entire house. A smile spread across her face. She couldn't wait to tell Hank. Thinking of Hank and their date to the canyon over the weekend caused a spark of warmth to spread over her. When she'd arrived at the office this morning, she was unsure how to act around him. Even though they were beginning a relationship, he was still her boss. She feared that everything would feel forced and awkward, but it was just the opposite. He immediately put her at ease and was as warm and open as he'd been in the canyon. They'd even gone to lunch together. Thankfully, Garrett was still out of town, so she didn't have to deal with him. She pulled a tube of lipstick from her purse and applied a fresh coat. Then she powdered her face and fluffed her hair. As she stood and adjusted her clothes, butterflies began fluttering in her stomach. She chided herself for getting so worked up because she was going to Hank's office, but the jitters continued despite her effort to stop them. She was falling for him, hook, line, and sinker. Hank had consumed her thoughts all weekend, which was a good thing, because it had crowded out all thoughts of Dan. She'd not felt even the slightest hint of his presence, and she'd slept soundly. There was life after Dan, and it felt good. Maybe it was still too early to call it, but if things kept going as they were, she would finally be free of him. It had been a long time since she felt this lighthearted. As she rounded the corner to Hank's office, the heated conversation stopped her in her tracks. She heard Hank's voice first. Well, Detective, I'm disappointed. The news broke of the theft yesterday, and it took you eight hours to get over here to question me. I expected you to come this morning rather than at the end of the day. A voice she'd never heard before answered. Is this like a joke to you? This job has your M.O. all over it. No sign of forced entry, either in the home or the safe. Either the thief somehow knew the code to the safe, or he was exceptionally good at cracking it. I suspect it was the latter. 
course you do, Hank fired back, sarcasm dripping from his voice. That's why you're here. Every time some Joe Schmo pulls a job, you come around like a mangy dog sniffing for scraps. The man let out a nervous laugh. Hey, no need to get personal, man. I'm just doing my job. That song and dance worked the first half dozen times, Jared, but it's starting to get old. Don't blame me for running down the leads. It's not my fault. You're the best in the business. Was the best, Hank countered firmly. The operative word here is was. I'm no longer in the business. You and I both know I'm clean. So you say, Jared smirked. This job was not done by a run on the mill schmo. It has all the markings of another ghost theft. Only this time there was one thing missing from the scene, a parrot. Apparently the thief let the bird out the window. According to the police report, the poor victim was more distraught over losing her bird than she was about losing her jewels. Go figure. Ghost theft. Why did that sound familiar? Chloe inched closer to the doorway and peeked in. Hank was sitting behind his desk, and a man with black hair was sitting across from him. She couldn't tell for sure, but she thought she detected a faint Latino accent. A thousand questions pelted her at once, making her feel sick to her stomach. Why was Hank being questioned by a detective? Was he a thief? Or had he been? She should have known he was too good to be true. A bitter feeling settled over her. And then she remembered where she heard the term ghost theft. Darby had been talking about a notorious jewel thief that was known by that name. Was Hank the ghost thief? The idea seemed preposterous, like something out of a movie rather than real life. She should have turned away that instant, but she couldn't. She had to hear the rest. For curiosity's sake, tell me, if you were pulling this job, how would you do it? Jared's voice was conversational, musing. I didn't do it, Hank said flatly. And no, I'm not playing this ridiculous game. He paused, and then his tone became speculative. Does the chief know you're over here, wasting valuable department time on this? Maybe you should put your focus on crimes that take place in Salt Lake rather than in another city. I'm sure you have enough things to worry about in your own backyard without searching for more. Due to recent cutbacks in your department, I would assume that resources are more valuable now than ever. Chloe could tell the way the detective shot up in his chair that Hank had touched a nerve. Watch it. There was a hard edge to his voice. All aspects relating to you are my jurisdiction, regardless of where the crime takes place. Things will go a lot easier for you if you'll cooperate. Hank let out a humorous laugh. I'm allowing you to step foot in my office and badger me with these ass nine questions. I'd say that speaks highly of my cooperation, wouldn't you? The detective let out a nervous laugh. <laughs> no need to get testy. You know how things go, Hank. Need to know where you were Saturday evening. He'd assumed a friendly tone, like they were best friends, but Hank wasn't buying it. Well, I sure as heck wasn't anywhere near San Francisco, he roared. His jaw was as hard as the floor on which Chloe was standing, and the way he was leaning forward in his seat reminded her of a coiled snake ready to strike. Hank was a force to be reckoned with. She didn't know whether she should be scared or impressed by his diehard attitude. Where were you? Jared pressed. I was at American Fork Canyon. The relief that washed over Chloe made her go weak in the knees. Hank was no thief. He was telling the truth. He had been in the canyon with her all evening. There was no way he could have pulled off a robbery in San Francisco. Is there anyone who can vouch for your whereabouts? A disgusted look twisted over Hank's face as he shook his head. You don't have a shred of evidence, do you? That's why you're here. You're grasping at straws. I'm disappointed, Jared. I expected more from a seasoned professional like you. Stop playing games. I need a name. Who were you with Saturday night? Hank was holding a pencil in his hands. He broke it in half with a loud crack. I like you, Jared, underneath that tough guy detective persona. I think you're a decent guy. But I'm getting sick and tired of being put through the ringer every time some bozo steals something. You should have thought of that before you became a criminal. Hank's face went a shade darker, and Chloe feared for a second that he might punch the detective. Let me be as clear as I can. I did my time, paid my debt to society. Let it go. Sorry, men. 
doesn't work that way, unfortunately. Hank stood. This conversation is over. Unless you have a warrant for my arrest, I suggest you get out of my office. It's always a pleasure, Jared said, standing. I'll be in touch. It was at that moment Chloe realized she should make a hasty retreat, but it was too late. As Jared stood, turned to leave, Hank looked up and saw her. Before either of them could say anything, Chloe's mouth began moving at warp speed. Hank couldn't have stolen anything from San Francisco because he was with me in the canyon on Saturday night. Chloe, don't, Hank said. Her hand went up to her hip. Don't what? Tell the truth? You are with me. You don't owe him an explanation. The detective stepped up to her. Now that she could see his face, she could tell that he was part Hispanic and looked to be in his early forties. He extended his hand. Jared Flores. She grasped it. Chloe Kinsley. He looked her in the eye. Were you speaking the truth? Was Hank with you in the canyon on Saturday night? She glanced at Hank, who looked like he was mad enough to spit nails. Yes, she said with conviction. Jared stroked his chin as a thoughtful expression came over his face. You seem like a nice, upstanding girl. Chloe tensed, sensing a setup of some sort. Where was this going? Are you sure you want to get mixed up with a convicted felon? The ground seemed to shift underneath her feet as her face drained. She looked to Hank for confirmation. The humiliation on his face said it all. Jared shot her a look of pity. You didn't know. He shook his head in feigned sadness as he clucked his tongue. Why am I not surprised? That's all it took to get Chloe hot around the collar. She straightened her shoulders and lifted her chin. Let me repeat that Hank was with me all evening. He picked me up at my home and spoke to my roommate who can also vouch that Hank was with me. In case you have any lingering doubts on the subject, she gave him a withering look. She saw the look of gratitude on Hank's face and thought she saw disappointment come over Jared's face. But she couldn't be sure. He turned to Hank and gave him a perturbed smile. Why didn't you just come out and say you're with her? It sure would have saved a whole lot of trouble. Hank shot him a venomous look, and Chloe got the feeling that he might have done the detective bodily harm had she not been there. I told you, I'm tired of being your scapegoat. It doesn't matter what I say or do, you always assume that I'm guilty. He rubbed his neck. This conversation is over. You know your way out. Jared looked like he might say something more, but then gave Hank a nod before walking briskly out of the office. When it was just the two of them, Hank motioned. Close the door, would ya? He sat down in the chair beside Chloe. I'm sure you have a lot of questions. He sounded tired and defeated, like the fight had gone out of him. She nodded. He took a deep breath and let it out slowly. Where to begin? She clasped her hands tightly in her lap. Why don't you start by telling me how it is you came to be a convicted felon? Yep, I suppose it always goes back to that. He gave her a grim smile. Well, the upside in all of this is that I'm about to tell you what I was hesitant to tell you in the canyon. Now there won't be any secrets between us. The word secret sounded so ominous. There were so many conflicting emotions churning inside of Chloe that she could hardly stand to sit there. But she needed to hear the truth, so she waited for him to continue. In some circles, the name Hank Singleton is synonymous with one of the most notorious jewel thieves in the world. His eyes locked with hers. Do you understand what I'm saying? A lump formed in her throat and she nodded. Are you the ghost that everyone keeps talking about? He looked surprised. You know about that? Yeah, Darby's studying to be a cop, and one of her college professors is obsessed with him. Are you the ghost? She repeated. Yes, and no. I was the original ghost, but I'm not now. I served my time, and I've been clean ever since. He paused. I swear to you that I'm clean. Her head began to swim as the words pelted over her. Served time, clean ever since. It all felt surreal. I don't know how to deal with this, she croaked, moving to stand. He caught her arm. Sit back down, please, let me explain. Tears gathered in her eyes as she slumped back into the chair. 
Hank was one of the last people she would suspect of being a criminal. He was so straight-laced and methodical about all aspects of business. And he was a good person, a man of integrity. She'd felt that, hadn't she? The idea that he'd lived this other life was so preposterous that she could hardly believe it. His eyes took a distant look. Garrett and I grew up in an apartment building. Our father left when we were kids. And our mother worked herself into the ground at a menial job trying to keep us clothed and put food on the table. Chloe nodded. This was a similar version to what Garrett had told her. Anyway, our mother was gone a lot. The time when we weren't getting into trouble, Glory looked after us. Also, we spent a lot of time with Clayton, the building manager. Clayton was something of a renaissance man. He taught Garrett and me all about his trade, how to repair air conditioners, heaters, refrigerator stoves, leaky faucets. You get the idea. He looked at her. He also taught me how to pick locks and disable alarm systems. A furrow appeared in her brows. Was Clayton a thief? No. He was as straight as an arrow. Didn't have a dishonest bone in his body. He just liked to tinker with things. One time we even rebuilt a car engine. Anyway, Clayton was a good man, but his son was a different story. Trouble followed Sam like a second skin. When Sam realized that I had a talent for picking locks and disabling alarms, he introduced me to a lifetime friend who was a locksmith. I started working there after school in the afternoons, and it wasn't long before I learned the ins and outs of safes. You mean how to crack safes? He nodded, a look of remorse coming over his face. I never started out with the intent to become a jewel thief. Cracking safes was like solving a fascinating puzzle, and it felt good to be highly skilled at something. Anyway, after I graduated from high school, I went to BYU and studied business. I was in my senior year when my mom got sick with leukemia. He paused, and she could tell he was trying to gain control of his emotions. Before she realized what she was doing, she placed a hand over his. He turned his hand over and linked his fingers through hers. A minute later, he cleared his throat and continued. The treatments were expensive and the insurance wouldn't cover them. A tortured look came into his eyes. You can't imagine how helpless it felt to watch her getting weaker every day, knowing there was nothing I could do. She could no longer work, so I took an extra job to help pay the bills. Things were getting bad, and I didn't know how much longer I could continue to hold everything together. And then Sam drove down to Provo to pay me a visit. He offered me a way to get caught up on the bills and pay for my mother's treatments a hundred times over. It was a mistake, and I was foolish. I see that now, but at the time it seemed like the only solution, and I was good. His eyes burned with a hot intensity. I was the best. Sam, that name rang a bell. What's Sam's last name? He gave her a funny look. Why? Because I believe I met him once when Garrett and I went out to dinner. His jaw clenched. Loudon. Something clicked in her mind. Yeah, that sounds right. A shiver ran down her spine as she remembered the cold feeling she had around him. He's muscular with thinning hair and a goatee. Garrett said he was a business associate. She could tell from Hank's stricken expression that she'd caught him off guard. He was squeezing her hand so hard it hurt. Are you okay? She tried to extricate her hand from his and then he realized what he was doing. Sorry, he said, loosening his grip. When did this happen? A few days before I came to work for you. Is this bad? It could be, he admitted. Anything that has to do with Sam is bad. She let that bit of information sink in, glad that she'd pegged Sam correctly. She didn't blame Hank for being worried about Garrett, but he wasn't her primary concern at the moment. She steered the conversation back to Hank. If you were as good as you say you were, then how did you end up in prison? He let out a dry chuckle. <laughs> That's a fair question. A knock sounded, and then the door opened. Yvette stuck her head in. Her eyes went from Hank to Chloe and then to her clasped hands. A furious expression came over her face as she zoned in on Chloe. Playing both sides, I see. Before Chloe could articulate a response, Hank jumped to her defense. Excuse me? What did you just say? 
Yvette's face grew chalky, and she started blinking rapidly. I only meant that I can't believe she's chumming up with you when she's... When she's what? Hank demanded, his voice cracking like a whip through the room. Nothing, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have said anything. Hank arched an eyebrow. If you value your job, you'll stop making cutting remarks about situations you know nothing about. Her face turned scarlet. Furthermore, I expect you to show Chloe the same respect you show me. Is that clear? Yes, she squeaked. I trust you came in here for a reason. It seemed to take her a second to collect her thoughts. You have a call. It's from St. Mark's Hospital. The lady on the line said it's important. Hank frowned, and he went to answer it. Chloe's heart dropped when she saw his face crumble. It's Glory. She's had a stroke. Chapter 17 Wariness settled over Garrett as he turned onto his street. The trip to San Francisco had worn him out, and he wanted nothing more than to get into a shower and crash in his own bed. As he pulled into the driveway, he spotted Sam's sedan, parked on the street in front of his house. Instinctively, his hand touched the backpack containing the jewels. Rather than pulling into the garage, he parked in front of it and got out, leaving the backpack in the car. His heart dropped when he saw not only Sam get out of the car, but also an overly muscled guy who had a raw look in his eyes, like he would jump at the chance to start smashing things with his meaty hands. Rather than going to them, Garrett stayed near his car, his senses went on full alert as he flashed an easy smile. Hey, Sammy. Sam gave him a curt nod as he and the large man approached. You're a hard person to reach. Sorry, I've been out of town. I've heard that one before. His eyes narrowed into black slits. You've been avoiding me. Garrett chuckled. Now you know I'd never do that. He motioned at the Hulk. Who's the big guy? His name's Bill and I sometimes bring him along to ensure that I collect. Is that really necessary? We've been friends all our lives. A silent panic came over Garrett as he glanced at the Hulk that looked more like a machine than a man. Garrett had no doubt that the meathead could do some serious damage if he were unleashed. Sam's eyes turned to stones, letting Garrett know there would be no mercy. You owe my boss 200K, and I've been sent here to collect. No excuses, man. I've been patient, but I can't wait any longer. You're making me look bad. Lines creased Garrett's forehead as he leaned closer to Sam. Come on, Sammy. You know I'm good for it. Sam sneered. You certainly talk the talk. I'll give you that. Okay, it's like this. I don't have the full 200K right now. I'm sorry to hear that. Marbles appeared in the corner of Sam's jaws. Garrett's pulse began to race as he saw Bill clinch his fists. He held up his hands. But I do have something that I think your boss will be interested in. Interest lit Sam's eyes. I'm listening. He leaned in and lowered his voice. I have jewels that are worth at least 100K. I'm sorry to hear that. Your time is run out. I told you when I gave you the loan that you would have to pay it back in full, on time. Remember? I know. I just didn't expect to run into so many complications. But I can do another job and get the rest. I swear it. Sam shook his head. The biggest complication here is you and your gambling habit. No matter how many jobs you do, you gamble it away faster than you can take it in. That's why you got into trouble to begin with because you owed the casino. You came begging to me, and I took pity on you. He spread his hands. And now you owe the boss. I just need a little more time. A cold sweat broke across Garrett's forehead. Please, man, for old time's sake, I'm begging you. Talk to your boss. Tell him that I'm good for it. Garrett held his breath as he waited for Sam to speak. Do you have the jewels with you? Yeah. They're in my backpack in the car, in the passenger seat. Sam motioned to Bill, who immediately went to retrieve them. The hall should bring in around 105 k I can do another job and get the rest. You can even take the BMW as collateral. That's another 35 40 k He remembered the earrings he'd given Chloe. 
And I can get my hands on a pair of earrings that are worth another 20K. Garrett looked wild-eyed at Sam. Please, man, give me a chance to make this right. I'm no good to you injured. Or dead, he added silently. Bill handed the black drawstring bag to Sam, who looked inside. His expression grew thoughtful. Garrett had the impression that time had come to a halt and everything depended on this one moment. All right, we may be able to work out a deal, for old time's sake. Okay, anything. The relief that surged through Garrett was so swift that it left him lightheaded. We're going to take a ride and talk things over. There's something I want to show you. A ride? Garrett went tense. A suspicion clouded his eyes. I would, man, but I'm really tired. You see, I just got back into town. It's not optional, Sam cut in. He motioned to Bill. Help him to the car. Garrett's apprehension mounted to a frenzy when they pulled into the parking lot of what looked like an abandoned warehouse. He fleetingly wondered if Sam were taking him there to die. A sick panic clawed over him, and he had to will himself to remain calm. Rather than answering, Sam exited the car. Bill left the driver's seat, came around, and opened Garrett's door. Having no other choice, Garrett stepped out. This way, Sam said gruffly with a wave of his arm. Garrett moved to follow, but he wasn't fast enough for Bill, who shoved him in the back. Take it easy, Garrett grumbled. Every impulse commanded him to run, but he forced his feet to keep moving slowly forward. It was dark inside the warehouse, and it took a minute for Garrett's eyes to adjust. They walked to the back where Sam stopped in front of what looked like the door to an office. He pulled a set of keys from his pocket and unlocked it. They stepped inside the pitch-black room. When Sam flipped on the light switch, Garrett's breath caught, for in the center, bound to a chair, was a man dressed in an expensive white shirt and tie. He was blindfolded and gagged. The second the light came on, he began thrashing wildly. What is this? Garrett asked, a sense of horror overtaking him. One of the men who owes my boss a considerable amount of money. Unfortunately for him, his extension has run out. Sam's voice was so casual he might have been discussing the weather rather than the fate of the bound man. Nausea overtook Garrett as his gaze went to the man who was writhing and grunting. Then he looked at Bill, whose blank expression had been replaced by an eager intensity as he began cracking his knuckles. He'd been incredibly naive where Sam was concerned. No, not naive, downright stupid. It went through his mind that Sam wasn't the longtime friend he thought him to be and that Hank was right all along. Sam laughed. Hmm, Bill lives for these moments. He gave him the nod. Bill stepped up to the man and ripped off the blindfold. The man jerked his eyes around the room and then settled on Sam. This is ludicrous. I demand an explanation. I told you I'd get the money. I just need more time. There was a haughty tone to his voice, like he was ordering a subordinate to make him a copy or bring him a file. It seemed so out of place in this setting that Garrett's mouth dropped slightly. He looked at Sam, whose thick neck had gone a deep red. He was stroking his goatee while watching the man with open disdain. Garrett knew the man was in serious trouble when Sam spoke. This here's my boy, Danny. I'm not your boy, the man said hotly. And I demand that you release me this instant. Sam was now eyeing him with fascination. His voice had a faint, taunting edge to it. When I first met Danny, he was riding high. He glanced at Garrett. A Harvard grad with a big house on the benches in Draper. Yep, Danny didn't grow up fighting for everything like we did. He was handed it all on a silver platter by Mommy and Daddy. He grunted. Danny came to me for a loan. Something about starting a multi-level company that was going to make him a millionaire overnight. You see, Danny's like most of his neighbors high up there on the hill, hawking everything he has to pay for that expensive lifestyle with his beautiful wife, boats, cars. He laughed to himself. Danny even offered me a piece of the pie on the condition that I was willing to work hard and clean up my image a bit. He looked at Danny. Isn't that right? Wariness was creeping into Danny's eyes. You know, there are many sophisticated ways of torturing people, but Bill and I prefer the old-fashioned way, don't we? Wariness in Danny's eyes had turned to naked fear, 
and his lower lip was starting to tremble. I made a mistake. His voice sounded pitiful and small, a sickening reminder to Garrett that he'd sounded much the same way. He could feel the man's fear growing larger and more terrible until it began to ooze off the walls, going sour and rotten. P Please, let me go. I'll get you the money. His face seemed to fold in on itself as he began to sob in long, ragged gulps. Garrett felt the man's humiliation, almost as though it were his own. To see such a man reduced to a pitiful state unnerved him in a way few other things had. He despised the man for being so weak, and he loathed Sam for openly mocking him when he was at his lowest. Revulsion welled inside him, and it was all he could do to prevent a look of disgust from forming over his face as he looked at Sam. He was a bottom dweller, a two-bit thug. How had he not seen it before? It was like a tooth being unearthed to expose a decaying root. It had been there all along, but was so cleverly hidden that he'd never noticed it. Please. Danny's cry tore through the room. I'll do anything. Just please don't do this. Yeah, Sam said in a bored tone. I've heard that one before. He gave Bill a nod. Bill punched Danny so hard that the chair toppled sideways, causing him to hit the floor with a loud thud. Stop it, he cried. Please, I'll get the money. Bill grabbed the chair and sat it upright. Then he began mercilessly pounding Danny's face. There was a sharp crack as blood started spewing from his nose. The sound of flesh giving way under the brute strength of Bill's knuckles was too much for Garrett, and he averted his gaze. Finally, the beating stopped, and Danny slumped over eyes closed. His face was misshapen and bloody, resembling raw hamburger meat. For a second, Garrett feared that he was dead, but then he let out a sob. Please, he whimpered. I'll do anything. I promise I'll get the money. Sam stepped up and grabbed him by the hair of the head. Then he bent down next to Danny's face. Not such a big shot now, are you, Danny boy? You don't look so good. What will your wife think of you now? How will she ever explain this to the neighbors? Garrett fought the urge to retch. It was bad enough to watch the man get beaten to a pulp, but then to have Sam openly mocking him was revolting. Sam's voice went hard. You'd better get the money, or your lovely wife and kids will be next. And we won't be as kind to them as we were to you. Danny's eyes shot up as a new terror came over him. I'll get it, he said hoarsely. I'll get it, he sobbed. Sam studied him. Yeah, 48 hours, Danny boy. When he let go of Danny's hair, his head fell heavily to his chest. He looked at Bill. Get this trash out of here. He motioned to Garrett. Come, we have much to discuss. A curious numbness settled over Garrett as he walked back to the car. This time, Sam got behind the wheel and motioned for him to get in the passenger seat. Sam started the engine and began to drive. A few minutes later, Garrett turned to him, not trying to hide the bitterness in his voice. Was that charade really necessary? A trace of amusement crossed Sam's features. Is that what you think that was? You could have tortured that man anywhere, anytime. You didn't have to wait until you had an audience. I told you I would get the money. He felt sick, sick at heart and desperate. It's like this. If it weren't for our friendship, I wouldn't be giving you a chance to make things right. Some friendship, Garrett muttered. Sam slammed on the brakes, causing them to lurch forward. He threw the car into park and then grabbed Garrett's shirt with his fists. You're treading on thin ice here. The snap of my fingers, I can have Bill rearrange that pretty face of yours to the point where you won't even be able to stand the sight of yourself. The malicious light in Sam's eyes caused a trickle of fear to run down Garrett's spine as he held up his hands in defeat. Sorry, man. He swore and let him go. Then he jabbed a finger in Garrett's chest. Don't push me too far. Sam put the car into gear and they drove in silence. By the time they'd pulled into Garrett's driveway, Sam had changed back to his usual controlled self. He turned to Garrett, his voice businesslike. 
Here's how this is going to work. Your extension is over. Garrett started to protest, but stopped when he saw the warning look in Sam's eyes. There's only one way out of this. There's a job coming up, a big one. You'll pull it off, and your debt will be paid in full. Fear rose thick in Garrett's throat. But I told you, I would give you the jewelry and the BMW. That should take my debt down 150 k And then I'll give you the earrings, which means I'll only owe you another 30 k I can easily get that. Sam let out a cutting laugh. Sorry, man. That might have worked several weeks ago, but the price has now gone up. A little thing I like to call interest. What? Garrett felt the sensation of being strangled with invisible hands. He fought to get a good breath as his mind raced through his options. Then he realized Sam was speaking. This job requires a certain skill set. A skill set which, unfortunately, you don't possess. I don't understand. If I can't do the job, why are you even talking to me about it? There's a safe involved. A very sophisticated safe. It all came together in a sucker punch that nearly took his breath away as the world began to spin. He could feel the fingers of hysteria trying to claw into his mind. This whole thing was a setup. You never wanted the money. You used me, exploited my weakness. Sam made a face. Oh, don't sound like such a whiner. It's not my fault you're a compulsive gambler. His voice became practical. You have access to a person we need. It's as simple as that. Hank, Garrett said flatly. You want Hank? Of course he wanted Hank. Everyone wanted Hank. He was the superstar. A mixture of bitterness and worry settled over him simultaneously. A cruel smile spread over Sam's face. You're a fast learner. Garrett balled his fist. No, absolutely not. Hank will never go for it. He's gotten his life cleaned up and gone all churchy on me. Now he's an upstanding business owner. He'll never go for it. Well, you'll just have to convince him. Hank has always looked after you. I'm sure he'll step up to the plate when he realizes what's at stake. Despite the fear, anger took hold. Oh, yeah. And exactly what is at stake here? A burning hatred pulsed through his veins as he locked eyes with Sam. Do you really need me to say it out loud? He let out a long sigh. If you value your life, then you'll convince Hank to do the job. Garrett just sat there, mulling through the options. How much time do I have? A couple of weeks, give or take. The plans are being put into motion. This is a time-sensitive thing. Where's the job? Sam shook his head. That's all you get for now. Get Hank on board and we'll talk. What if I can't convince him? Sam's eyes cut into his. Then I won't be able to stop what comes next. And I can assure you that what happened to Danny Boy is child's play compared to what we'll do to you. This is your last chance. Don't screw it up. Chloe and Hank were in the hospital room with Glory. Chloe was sitting off to the side, and Hank had scooted a chair next to the bed and was holding Glory's hand. I told you, Hank, it's nothing to be alarmed about. It was just a mini-stroke. Glory shook her head in exasperation. You always get so bent out of shape at the smallest little thing. I told the nurses not to call you, but they insisted. She shook her head. I tell you, I feel perfectly fine. A mini stroke is not a small thing, he countered. Did you not hear what the doctor said? It's a warning sign that you might have another stroke within 48 hours. Dr. Mills said you have as much as a 5% chance of having another stroke. She pursed her lips. Dr. Mills is a nice man, but he doesn't have a clue what he's talking about. Chloe chuckled and then clamped her lips shut when she saw the look of exasperation on Hank's face. Glory laughed. See, even Chloe knows I'm right. Doctors practice medicine. They practice it. Hank, it's not an exact science. No one can predict how the body will react. And if what Dr. Mills says is true, then I have a 95% chance of not having another stroke. The odds are in my favor. That's a good thing. We should be celebrating right now. 
Hank let go of Glory's hand. Then he blew out a breath and rubbed his neck. Chloe was coming to learn that he often rubbed his neck when he was frustrated. When he looked to her for help, she stood and went to his side. Glory, Hank is right. You need to take better care of yourself. She looked disappointed. Not you too. You need to stay on your low-salt diet, Hank said. No cheating. Dr. Mills thinks it's the high blood pressure that triggered it. I'm an old woman with very few pleasures in life. If I want to eat salted popcorn while I watch my shows, then I will, and neither you nor the doctor is going to stop me. She thrust out her chin and peered at him over the rim of her glasses. Hank scowled. Well, you're certainly as cantankerous as ever. I guess that speaks for something. Glory chuckled and reached for Hank's hand. I'm going to be okay, and I won't overload on the popcorn. Her eyes went soft. Okay? Okay. He relented. It was a tender thing to watch the two of them banter back and forth. This was the side of Hank that Chloe loved. It had felt so right to be with him, but how could she reconcile this wonderful guy with the criminal that was being questioned by the detective? Glory gave him a motherly smile. You always think you have to take care of everyone, but you need to start taking better care of yourself. She gave Chloe a meaningful look. I'm glad you finally have a good woman by your side. It makes all the difference in the world. You two can take care of each other. Chloe's eyes shot open wide as her face fell. She looked at Hank with a panicked expression. Hank's eyes seemed to be asking for a commitment that she couldn't make not with his past looming over them. He could read the hesitation on her face. His shoulders slumped as he looked away. Glory frowned. Things were going so well between the two of you. What happened? Hank forced a smile. Nothing, Glory. Don't read too much into things. Don't play games with me, Hank Singleton. I may be old, but I'm not stupid. I know you as well as I know myself, and Chloe's thoughts show on her face. Heat pummeled over Chloe as she rocked back. That's a good thing, Glory assured her. I mean that as a high compliment. It's refreshing to see someone who's open and honest. She eyed Hank. Now what's going on? There's been another theft, and Detective Flores came to the office to question me. Chloe heard it, and I told her about my past. You told me portions of your past, Chloe cut in, but I haven't heard the full story. Yeah, that's what I meant. I'll tell you everything, I promise. The door opened and a doctor entered the room. He looked at Hank. Can I have a word with you? I want to go over the particulars of Mrs. Douglas's diet so that we can be sure that she follows it to the letter. Of course. Hank stood, and he and the doctor left. They treat me like a child, Glory muttered. She motioned to the chair where Hank had been sitting. Chloe sat down. Glory looked her in the eye, and Chloe had the impression that she was somehow seeing into her soul. Hank has made his share of mistakes, but he's a good man. Tears pooled in Chloe's eyes, and she began blinking rapidly at an attempt to hold them back. I don't know what to think, she admitted. But what I do know is that I can't go through another heartbreak like I did with Dan. And I can't allow myself to fall in love with someone who isn't what he appears to be. Her mouth formed a hard line and she waited for Glory's rebuttal. Glory gave her an affectionate smile. You know that Hank's a good man. You felt that. Listen to your heart. She shook her head. Doubts coming faster than she could field them. I don't know. Maybe I got so caught up in the confidence of your words that I made myself believe that Hank was the one. Or maybe I wanted so desperately to rid myself of Dan that I latched on to Hank. A funny look came over Glory's face. You speak of Dan as though he's still alive. He's already out of your life and has been for some time. Oh, I mean Dan's memory, she inserted quickly. That's what I was saying. You know, Chloe, 
You're a strong girl with a mind of your own. I did very little to convince you that Hank was the one, only to suggest that the two of you should go on a date. She thought back. Was that really the case? Everything had changed that day at Glory's house, and she assumed it was because of the things Glory said. Was there more to it? Glory caught her hand, and she was surprised by the strength of it. I've prayed for a long time that someone good would come into Hank's life, and when you met, I knew that person was you. Don't throw happiness away because of a silly misunderstanding. I hardly think a criminal record is a silly misunderstanding, she retorted. Glory pursed her lips together and remained silent for a moment, and then a peculiar light came into her eyes. Have you prayed about it? Because if you will, I know you'll get the same answer. Irritation clouded Chloe. What was it with all of these people and their talk of prayer? Do you believe in prayer? Glory prompted, her sharp eyes roving over Chloe, keen on discerning the slightest nuances in her body language. She briefly considered telling Glory a fib to smooth things over, but figured Glory would be able to see right through her. So she spoke the truth as delicately as she could. I used to believe in prayer. And now? Now after losing Dan and dealing with his betrayal, I'm not so sure. She could tell from Glory's downcast expression that it was not what she'd expected to hear. Glory gave her a kind smile. Don't lose hope. Prayer is real, and I can assure you that no matter how alone you feel, the Lord is mindful of you. He knows your heart and your struggles, and He cares. The words took her completely off guard, burning into her heart before she could shut them out. She looked at Glory's lined face and how her eyes were filled with the wisdom of a lifetime of meaningful experiences. And there was more. When she was around Glory, she felt like she radiated light and goodness. For a split second, she felt envious of Glory's certainty about God. It reminded her of how Darby and her own mom felt. She wished that she could feel the same way. A calm feeling flowed over her. It was as warm as the gentle rays of the sun on a summer's day, and for a moment, she felt a whisper of peace. Peace that somehow, some way, everything would work out. Glory put her hand over hers and smiled. You're going to be all right. I know it. The words of encouragement meant more than Chloe could express as tears flowed freely down her cheeks. She nodded. They sat in silence for a few moments until Glory tilted her head, like she'd just thought of something. What? Has Hank told you how he got arrested? No. We didn't get that far. She patted Chloe's hand. Ask him. All of the problems came rushing back as Chloe clenched her jaw. The frustration that covered her felt all too familiar. Her shoulders were so tense that they were starting to ache. What difference does it make how Hank was arrested? He was a jewel thief. I know you love him like a son, but even you have to admit that's no small thing. More tears rolled down her cheeks. Before Glory could answer, Chloe continued, I'm sorry. Don't mind me. I'm a mess right now. No need to apologize. Tears are a good cleaner for the soul. A wise smile spread over Glory's lips as she gave Chloe a penetrating look. Just ask him. Chapter 18 The intoxicating aroma of spaghetti sauce bubbling on the stovetop caused Chloe's stomach to rumble. After they left the hospital, Hank insisted on taking her to his condo so that he could make dinner. She'd almost declined his offer because she was weary to the bone and emotionally spent, but she couldn't deny the fact that despite everything, she still had feelings for him. And they needed to talk. More than anything, she needed to hear him out, give him a chance to explain his past. She was sitting on the bar stool chair next to the island in the kitchen, and Hank was by the stove working away. She'd asked if he needed any help, but the only thing he allowed her to do was to chop vegetables for the salad. I've got this, he said with his trademark crooked smile. He changed into a short sleeve charcoal gray t-shirt and jeans when they got back to his apartment. And she couldn't help but notice how his bicep moved underneath the shirt as he reached for the stockpot to drain the spaghetti. 
He really did have an incredible physique, and as much as she hated to admit it, was devastatingly handsome. A pretty boy that was rough around the edges. He felt her scrutiny and gave her a questioning look that caused heat to rise up her neck. For some reason, all she could think about was how it had felt so right when they kissed in the canyon. What are you thinking? There was a hint of amusement in his eyes that made her suspect he could somehow read her mind. She had to think up a response, fast. Of course, she went back to the old standby, design. Your place really is fantastic, although I wouldn't expect any less considering you have access to every product imaginable. Her gaze took in the straight-line cabinets accented with trendy, sleek hardware and the understated subway tile backsplash that seemed to be an extension of the cabinets. The white, gleaming quartz on the counters added the crowning touch. Yeah, one of the perks of owning a design center, I suppose. A smile tugged at her lips. I suppose. The distance between them seemed to shrink as her heart began to pound. Before she could stop herself, a genuine smile spread across her lips, and she felt a connection with him that was deeper than anything she could have expressed. He put down the wooden spoon he was holding and might have gone to her side had she not caught herself. What was she doing? She was alone in a condo with a convicted felon, openly flirting with him. She needed a reality check. She got up from the chair and walked over to the window and looked out at the magnificent view. The condo was located at City Creek Landing, which was in the heart of downtown Salt Lake. City Creek was a posh shopping center that was located next to Temple Square. The assembly hall, with its fanciful spires that reminded her of icicles, took center stage with a corner of the temple showing on the side. Lights from the city twinkled in the distance. Her pulse bumped up a notch when Hank stepped up behind her and began rubbing her arms. Before she could move away, he began lightly planting kisses down her neck. Her breath caught as tiny pulses circled down her spine. How could it feel so right to be in his arms when it was so wrong. Her intense attraction to this man was getting way out of control. She had to distance herself from him so that she could think clearly. She closed her eyes and allowed herself a moment of pleasure before turning to face him. When she looked at him, the depth of urgency in his eyes took her by surprise. Chloe, you know how I feel about you, he murmured. He began caressing her jaw with the tip of his finger. Hank, this is not a good idea was all she had time to say before his lips came down on hers, gentle at first and then harder. A feeling akin to electricity raced through her veins, and she went a little dizzy in the wake of it. The feel of his lips moving against hers was all-consuming as he leaned in closer to deepen the kiss, arching her back in the process. All reason flew out the window as she slid her arms around his neck and returned his kiss with an urgency of her own. It wasn't until he pulled away that she realized what she'd done. I shouldn't be here. She began walking away, but he caught her arm and turned her around to face him. This is right, he said, his eyes cutting into hers, willing her to give in. And you know it. I can tell from the expression on your face. A hint of teasing came into his eyes. Glory's right. You are very expressive. Her mouth dropped. Really? He looked into her eyes. Really? He uttered, his breath going warm against her face. His eyes were smoldering blue, and his defiant chin might have been carved from stone. There was such certainty in his words that she almost did give in, but thankfully reason took control. I don't even know who you are. You will. You'll know everything, I promise, he said smoothly. You're hungry, and the food's getting cold. Let's sit down and eat and then I'll tell you everything you need to know. He flashed a lopsided smile. I promise. Her resolve was giving way, and she could tell from the confidence in his demeanor that he knew it. She cut her eyes at him. Do you always get your way, Hank Singleton? He chuckled as his eyes roved over her in a leisurely way that got her pulse to jumping again. I suppose that remains to be seen. She could tell from the look in his eyes that he was aware of the control he had over her. And while that was irritating, she was hungry, and the food smelled amazing. All right, she heard herself say. Was there any use in putting up a fight? She was coming to learn that as charming as she thought Garrett to be, 
He was nothing compared to Hank. How could she have ever thought him to be a stuffed shirt? He was more exciting and alive than anyone she'd ever been around, including Dan. Heaven help her, she was falling for him, and there didn't seem to be anything she could do to stop it. She could only hope that his explanation about his past would be reasonable enough to help her come to terms with the whole thing. A little while later, they were sitting on the sofa side by side, staring at the flickering fire in the fireplace. Dinner was excellent, and Hank had deliberately kept the conversation centered on light topics. She found herself laughing at his jokes and enjoying his company. A mellow haze had settled over Chloe, and it was nice just to be able to sit and relax for a few moments. Hank was holding her hand, his fingers linked protectively through hers. He seemed to be patiently waiting for her to begin the conversation. She almost hated to break the spell by talking, but it had to be done. She took a deep breath and turned to him. Okay, I'm ready to talk. He nodded. What do you want to know? His jaw went tense, and she could tell he was bracing himself for the questions. Glory said that I should ask you why you were arrested. He looked startled and the air seemed to chill as he withdrew his hand from hers. He rubbed his neck and swore. Seriously, when did she tell you to ask me that? The fury simmering in his eyes caused all her previous fears to return with a vengeance. In the hospital? She gave him a hard look. You told me that you would answer any question, holding nothing back, and you act like some moron when I ask you the first thing. She rubbed a hand across her forehead. You know what? This was a mistake. She moved to stand, but he caught her arm. Chloe, wait. She could tell that he was fighting some inner battle. I'm not upset with you for asking the question. I'm frustrated with Glory for prompting you to, that's all. She arched an eyebrow. It's obviously a touchy subject. Yeah, he paused. The first thing you have to understand is that Glory never had any children of her own and Garrett and I have become like her family. Yes, I know that. Glory can only see the good in me. She tries to make me out to be more than I am. She let out a dry chuckle. Oh, well, that's obvious. He looked surprised, but the comment seemed to help take the edge off. She put a hand on his arm. Tell me what happened. He nodded. I told you how I became a jewel thief. Yes? to help pay your mother's medical bills. It sounds so altruistic, but the truth is, his eyes met hers and she winced at the pain she saw in them. The truth is that once I started down that path, it was very seductive. The thrill of it gets in your blood. You keep telling yourself that you'll stop after the next big score, but it's like a highly addictive drug. He swallowed hard. What I'm trying to say is, that I started to enjoy being the ghost. I was good at it. The money I got from the jewels didn't matter to me nearly as much as the adventure of the chase, the satisfaction that I got from knowing I could get into places few others could. A sense of horror was starting to overtake her. Was he saying what she thought he was? She forced the words from her throat. Are you trying to tell me that you're still a thief? He gave her an incredulous look. No, I told you, I'm clean. I'm only trying to make you understand that I'm not the saint that Glory makes me out to be. She rolled her eyes. I get that. Jeez, would you just tell me how you were arrested? It was the biggest job I'd ever done. In the past, I'd relegated my theft to private residences. But I decided to try my hand at robbing a jewelry store. Really? That sounds risky. Yeah, it was. Very risky. But I was cocky. He shook his head. And naive. I had this friend, a fence, that I relied on for tips about possible jobs. This fence was a jeweler who ran a reputable business. Occasionally, when he got low on cash, he would do a few under-the-table transactions. Anyway, he and I were pretty tight. This fence had a nephew named Guy, who'd gotten himself into a tight spot when his girlfriend became pregnant. Guy was desperate for money. He was also a computer whiz. This job required me to hack into the mainframe of the system to access the code to the door where the safe was located. 
The first phase of the job went off as planned. I cracked the safe in record time, and we thought we were home free. Guy inadvertently triggered a silent alarm when he logged out of the mainframe. We were exiting the building and would have had time to leave before the police arrived. But there was an off-duty cop who heard the call on his radio and was in the area. I was already in the getaway car and thought Guy was right behind me. Even though he was looking at her, Chloe could tell he was in another place in time. The off-duty cop ordered Guy to freeze, but he kept going. He was shot in the chest. I jumped out of the car and went back to help him. His voice caught, but there was nothing I could do. He died in my arms. His eyes grew misty, and he swallowed to choke back the emotion. Silence settled between them as Chloe processed the information. So you could have gotten away, but you went back to help. That was obviously the part that Glory wanted her to know. I should have never let Guy go on the job with me. He wasn't ready. I knew it. But I let my friendship with the fence cloud my judgment. Guy was only 22 years old. Regret simmered in his eyes. It was my fault. I still see his face sometimes when I close my eyes. She wished there was something she could say to ease his pain, but there was nothing. I'm sorry, she finally said, reaching for his hand. I got sentenced to two years in prison. I served eight months and was released on good behavior. I'm now on probation. She let that sink in. The thoughts of dating a felon still gave her the willies, and a part of her wondered how she would get past that. What made you decide to go clean? As trite as it may sound, I found religion in prison. They had these missionaries that would come in and teach the inmates. My cellmate was meeting regularly with them and attending church meetings. He convinced me to come along. I was at such a low point in my life that I knew I had to do something. The guilt over Guy's death was eating me alive. He looked at her. I'll never forget the peace that came over me when I offered my first heartfelt prayer. The gravity of his words sank in, causing tears to glisten in her eyes. Chloe, I've made a lot of mistakes, but I changed. I realized that it is possible to carve out a new life, a life that doesn't involve crime. She thought of something else. How did you do it? Did you hide some jewels somewhere so that you could use them to start your business? He chuckled dryly, a look of reproof in his eyes. <laughs> I wouldn't exactly be a changed man if I used the spoils from the thefts, now would I? Well, how did you do it? I didn't. It was glory. I surrendered all my assets, everything I had acquired, before I went to prison. When I was released, I didn't have a penny to my name. He gave her a rueful smile. I can't begin to tell you how difficult it was to try and get a normal job with a criminal record. As always, Glory saved the day. It was her idea to start Marsh Interiors. Marsha is Glory's middle name, so we named it Marsh Interiors in honor of her. Glory used every penny of her husband's retirement and even got a loan to cover the rest. I owe her everything. His voice broke. I know she won't live forever, but I just can't bear the thought of not having her here. A tear rolled down Chloe's cheek. Hank used his thumb to tenderly wipe it away. She's a strong woman, a steel magnolia, as my mother would say. Most definitely, like this other southern belle that I know. The compliment caused a feeling of warmth to shoot over her. Then she thought of something else. The girl you mentioned, she searched her memory. V, tell me about her. She hated the caution that crept into Hank's eyes. What do you want to know? You said she left when you needed her the most. Did she leave you while you were in prison? Yes. She waited for him to expound, but he didn't. She tried to figure out the best way to phrase the next question, but ended up blurting it out after all. Do you still have feelings for her? She watched for his reaction. There was a long pause. I guess a part of me will always have a soft spot for V. She's a large part of my past. A ping of jealousy went through her as she nodded and looked away. He put an arm around her. But if you're asking if I care about her the way I care about you, the answer is no. He gave her a searching look. 
I'm assuming from the way you kissed me earlier that you feel the same way. His voice had a teasing edge. Her face flamed. He laughed. I love it when you blush. Stop, you're embarrassing me, she protested. Well, he persisted. How do you feel about me? He leaned in. Let's just say that I have very strong feelings for you. His eyes danced with delight. I can live with that. He began brushing his finger along her collarbone, causing tingles to cascade over her. Now that you know all the dirt on me, you have to tell me something incriminating about you. His voice went husky. It's only fair. It was hard to concentrate when his close proximity was driving her crazy. Something about me, hmm? Let's see. I'm a sucker for chocolate chip cookies and ice cream. Can't stay away from them no matter how hard I try. His finger moved to her chin and then up the curve of her cheek. You'll have to do better than that. His voice was barely above a whisper. I'm a clean freak. Already knew that. She made a face. How? Your office is pristine. Not a sheet of paper out of place. You've got to give me something here. The playful lilt in his voice was infectious, making her a little reckless. Okay. Every once in a while, I see my dead ex-fiancé. The words came out before she could call them back. Time seemed to stand still as her eyes went wide, making her think she'd just made the biggest mistake of her life. Then he burst out laughing. He laughed until tears came to his eyes. You really are too much. He shook his head, a look of admiration on his face. Thanks. I needed that, especially after today. She laughed along with him, but inside she was horrified that she'd actually told him that. Luckily, he thought it was a joke. A few minutes later, he grew serious. He caught hold of her hands. I meant what I said earlier. I'm falling for you, Chloe. I'm falling for you, too. She whispered as he drew her into his arms, his lips capturing hers. She got lost in the moment until a condemning voice interrupted them. Well, what do we have here? She jerked back and looked up to see Garrett. Hey! Was the only sound that gurgled up out of her throat. You lousy double-crosser, I can't believe you would do this to me. She tried to articulate a defense, but then realized the words were aimed at Hank. Hank's eyes narrowed. I didn't do anything to you. Chloe's a grown woman and can make her own decisions. She's been trying to tell you for weeks that it's over between the two of you. But you won't listen. Sit down and let's talk about this rationally. Chloe managed to find her voice. I have been trying to tell you over and over. A crazed look came into Garrett's eyes as he let out a harsh laugh. He ran both hands through his hair. Rationally. He swept his hand across the mantel, sending the glass vase and picture frame crashing to the floor where they shattered. Chloe let out a gasp as Hank jumped to his feet. Stop it, he ordered. Get control of yourself. Garrett spun around. Don't you dare tell me what to do. I came to you for help, only to find out you've been running around with that tramp behind my back. He shot her a venomous look. I trusted you. Chloe rocked back, stunned. Hank punched Garrett in the jaw with a loud pop, sending him spiraling to the floor. Chloe's no tramp, he said savagely. You have no right to barge into my home and act like this. Garrett stumbled to his feet, holding his jaw. There were tears of rage in his eyes. You're a lousy excuse for a brother. They both stood, glaring, until Hank blew out a breath. He put a hand on Garrett's shoulder. Why don't you sit down so we can talk about this? Garrett's face went a deep scarlet, and he jerked out of Hank's grasp. He began swearing at the top of his lungs, calling Hank every name in the book. Enough. Hank yelled, but Garrett continued to rant and rave. Finally, Hank got up in his face. Get out. Garrett's eyes bulged like he was strangling on his own tongue. Oh, so now you're throwing me out? He laughed. Figures. We'll talk about this when you've had time to calm down. You're not thinking clearly. Always the voice of reason, Garrett sneered. Big brother comes to the rescue. Big brother gets the girl. It's always about you, isn't it, Hank? Hank frowned. I don't know where this is coming from. 
What's going on with you? Garrett threw his hands into the air. Nothing. Nothing that requires any help from you. He pointed at Chloe. And in case you're wondering, we're over when I say it's over. He turned on his heels and stomped out, slamming the door behind him. Chloe sat staring into the fire as Garrett's words kept running through her head. We're over when I say it's over. An ominous shiver ran down her spine, and she hugged her arms to ward it off. She looked at the jagged pieces of broken glass scattered across the floor. Never before had she witnessed such unbridled wrath. Garrett's outburst bordered on madness, and then he'd threatened her. A feeling of utter helplessness came over her, and for a split second she felt like she'd been thrust back to square one, back to when she'd learned of Dan's death. An unreasonable fear seized her, and she had the impression that if she looked at the large window at that very moment, she would see Dan watching her. Her heart began to pound, and she could feel a sickly sweat oozing over her forehead. Then she had the eerie feeling of being separated from the scene and watching it from a distance. Thankfully, her phone buzzed, jerking her out of the stupor. She looked over to the nearby chair where she'd left her purse. She got up to retrieve it. When she realized it was her mom calling, tears gathered in her eyes. She didn't answer it, but it helped give her the reality check she needed to make some hard decisions. Hank returned from the kitchen holding a broom and garbage bag. I'm sorry about Garrett. He began, I don't know where that came from. She nodded and began methodically helping him clean up the mess. They worked in silence, each lost in their own thoughts. When they were finished, Chloe reached for her purse. Would you mind taking me home? Hank gave her a concerned look. Are you okay? No, I'm not okay. She couldn't hide the tremor in her voice. You heard him. He threatened me. Garrett's a hothead. He doesn't mean half of what he says. He'll cool down. She began winding the strap of her purse around her hand, trying to figure out the best way to express her feelings. She looked up at him, silently pleading for him to understand. Hank, I can't do this. He went tense. What do you mean? I can't get involved with you, not with all of this stuff happening. I'm sorry, she offered, turning away before he could see the tears that were forming in her eyes. He caught her arm and turned her around to face him. Don't let Garrett get to you. He's harmless. A surge of anger went through her. That's easy for you to say. I'm the one he threatened. Well, he didn't outright threaten you. I heard what he said, she shot back, glaring at him. It certainly felt like a threat to me. Are you really going to let my spoiled brother come between us? I thought you were stronger than that. His words were the final spark that ignited the fire that had been smoldering in her from the moment she found out about Hank's history. Tears began streaming down her cheeks. It's not just Garrett, she cried. It's everything. I can't deal with your past or your demons. I've got too much crap in my own life to take on someone else's. I need a normal life, and that includes a normal guy who simply gets up and goes to work every day. Furthermore, I refuse to be caught in the middle of you and Garrett, she shuddered. He's crazy. She could almost see the chasm between them getting wider and wider with every word she flung out, but she had to tell him the truth. When she was finished, they stood there, eyeing one another, until finally Hank spoke. I'm sorry you feel that way. The hurt in his voice evoked fresh tears, and a part of her longed to run her hand over the lines of his face to smooth out the tension. But she merely nodded. Let's get you home, he finally said. Chapter 19 Even though Hank had initially assured her that her job would remain secure regardless of what happened between them personally, Chloe was worried that everything would come crashing down. She soon learned that her fears were groundless, because Hank was the picture of professionalism, so much so that it was irritating the heck out of her. She was still torn up about everything that had happened and missed him terribly, but he didn't seem to be phased in the slightest. Either he was a superb actor or his feelings for her weren't genuine. Over the past week, they'd settled into a stiff routine of speaking to one another only when necessary. She noticed that Hank did his best to avoid having a one-on-one -on -one conversation with her. 
For some reason, she kept having this perverse desire to storm into his office and demand that he talk to her. Then she had to remind herself that she was the one who ended things. She'd been so shocked over Garrett's outburst that night, and so afraid of what he might do that it had clouded her judgment. Now that a few days had passed without incident, she was thinking that she might have overreacted. She longed to sit down and talk to Hank about it, but he was acting so unapproachable, and she couldn't bring herself to do it. Garrett had not shown his face at the office, and she wondered if Hank had seen him. Also, she'd had no news of how Glory was doing. She tried calling a few times, but there was no answer. She was scheduled to meet with Glory the first of next week to go over the final plans for the study. Hopefully they could connect then. Her phone buzzed. It was a Utah number, maybe a prospective client. Chloe Kensley, she said, adopting her professional tone. Chloe, this is Lila. Oh, Lila, hi, how are you? I'm fine. There was a slight hesitation. I'm just wondering if you might have a little time this afternoon. We need to talk. Okay, she said slowly, wondering what this was about. There was a clutch of urgency in Lila's tone. Is this about the window treatments you're wanting? Window treatments? Yeah, we talked about me taking some measurements and designing something for you a while ago. I just assumed that's why you were calling. Lila let out a nervous laugh. Oh, yeah, you can do that while you're here. Silence came over the phone. Lila, are you okay? Of course, I'm fine, she said quickly. Can you come at four? Chloe did a mental review of her schedule. She would have to move a few things around, but she could make it work. Sure, I'll do that. Good, see you then. Before Chloe could say bye, Lila ended the call. She sighed and put down the phone. What in the world was that about? With Lila, there was no telling. She was a strange cluck. Likeable, but strange. She forced her mind away from Hank and back to the project she was working on. A half hour later, she was standing in front of Yvette's desk. Do you have the Pantone color deck? The painter wants to start the Matthews job tomorrow. Before we baz the paint, I need to double-check the colors on the rug we ordered. Yvette cocked an eyebrow. You can go onto the supplier website and get a list of the Pantone colors, and then you can check them against the online Pantone guide. That's the easiest way to do it. The haughty tone in her voice caused the hair on the back of Chloe's neck to rise. She straightened her shoulders and looked straight at Yvette. The last thing she needed was a lesson on how to do her job. Yes, I suppose that's one way to do it, if you trust that your computer screen is giving you an accurate rendering of the color. I, however, prefer to use the foolproof method. She held out her hand. The deck, please. Yvette scowled and pulled out the bottom drawer of her desk. She reached for the deck and held it out to Chloe. When Chloe went to grab it, Yvette wouldn't let go. Chloe gave her a questioning look. Yvette leaned forward. I noticed that things aren't going so well with you and the boss. That's a real shame. My personal affairs are none of your business. Her eyes turned to tiny slits, and she wanted to wipe that smirky smile off Yvette's face. I suppose that's what you get for dating brothers. Did Hank break your heart? Dump you on your rear end? I guess he's not that much different from Garrett after all. The look of triumph on her face disgusted Chloe. Yvette was one of those people who enjoyed kicking people when they were down. There was only one way to face a person like her, head on. She jerked the Pantone deck out of Yvette's hand. You know what? I pity you, Yvette. You're a small person who gets her jollies out of other people's misery. Yvette's face fell as Chloe continued. Contrary to what you think, Hank did not dump me on my rear end. Furthermore, he is nothing like Garrett. Nothing! Her voice rose, but she was beyond the point of caring. She was on a roll, and it felt good to put Yvette in her place. Hank's a kind, warm, generous person. Any girl would be lucky to have him. There was so much more she could have said, but she stopped remembering where she was. Anyway, I don't know why I even wasted my time trying to explain anything to you. You're so blinded by your resentment of Garrett that you can't see straight. 
Yvette's face had turned the color of chalk, and she just sat there like a mute, her eyes as big as saucers. The first thing that ran through Chloe's mind was that she must have gotten Yvette good because the horrid woman was at a loss for words. But then she realized that Yvette was more worried about what was going on behind Chloe than she was about anything she'd said. She slowly turned, and there stood Hank. There was the slightest hint of amusement on his handsome face, letting her know that he'd heard every word. She gathered herself up and gave him a scathing look before walking back to her office. How could she have been so stupid? Humiliation burned through her veins. As she sat at her desk, trying to figure out a way to dig herself out of this one. She'd not meant to say those things about Hank. She'd not even consciously realized she'd been thinking them until she voiced them out loud. The past few days without Hank were absolute misery. She knew for certain that she was overdone because all she could think about was Hank and how she'd blown it. Knock, knock. She looked up to see the object of her thoughts leaning against the doorframe. He flashed a confident smile. Hey. Her face started flaming. Hey. She muttered under her breath, leaving it at that. If Hank wanted to have a conversation with her, then it would be up to him to initiate it. I need to go to Lily Riddle's home to pick out a color for her living room. She was both relieved and disappointed that he'd come to discuss a work-related topic. I thought Kate was handling that project. Yeah, she is. But she can't come today. Something about taking her daughter to the doctor. Anyway, Lily's eager to get something picked out because she's hosting another party next week. You know how she is. I figure it would be easier to just go over and pick something out to keep her happy. She's one of our best clients, after all. She couldn't help but notice how good he looked in his black shirt and matching dress pants. It was unfair for any man to look that good. Do I have a choice? I really could use your help on this one. Oh, and would you mind bringing the Benjamin Moore fan deck, the classic collection? She sighed heavily, even though she was secretly pleased that he wanted her to accompany him on a job. Fine. Okay, he said briskly. Let's leave in five minutes. It had taken all of 15 minutes to pick out the color for Lily's living room, and it was no surprise that Hank was the one who selected it. In fact, Chloe was pretty sure he knew which color he wanted before he even set foot in the client's home. Her suspicion was confirmed when he missed the turn that would have taken them back to the office. Where are we going? I thought we could take a little detour. What detour? She asked suspiciously. He just shook his head and smiled. She covertly studied his profile, liking the stubborn set of his chin. Hank Singleton was accustomed to taking on the world, and it showed. A few minutes later, he pulled into the parking garage below his condo. You're taking me to your place? He chuckled. Don't look horrified. I thought we could take a stroll around Temple Square. It's a beautiful fall day, and we have lots to discuss. Before she could argue, he got out of the car, came around, and opened her door. They walked in silence past the assembly hall and tabernacle. When they approached the temple, Hank steered her over to a bench where they sat down. Chloe's eyes rested on the yellow, purple, and orange mums that dotted the landscape. Whenever I feel my life is spinning out of control, I come here. I love the peaceful feeling that this place has. Chloe looked up at the gleaming white temple with its majestic spires reaching to the heavens. It is nice here. He turned to her, a ghost of a smile forming on his lips. That was some tongue lashing you gave a vet. And to think I was worried about her causing you problems. I guess it's true what they say. What's that? Dynamite comes in small packages. Her face instantly went hot. Hank chuckled. She grimaced, touching her cheeks. I hate that I'm such an open book. He reached for her hand. When she didn't pull away, he continued. Did you really mean all those things you told Yvette? She could see the cautious hope simmering in his eyes as he waited for her to answer. Yes. She admitted, I did. A pleased look came over him. Good. I've thought a lot about what you said. She wrinkled her nose. Which part? The part about you needing a guy who's normal. Oh, that. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to fly off the handle. Garrett freaked me out. 
and on top of the jewel theft thing, it was a lot to take in. I understand. His eyes met hers. In the sunlight, they were more green than blue. I promise you I can be that normal guy. I care about you, Chloe. Her breath caught as he flashed her a disarming smile. Had there ever been any other option? Life was dull and colorless without Hank. I care about you, too. He planted a tender kiss on her cheek and then put an arm around her. She scooted into the curve of his shoulder, liking how protective it felt to have him next to her. How's Glory doing? I've been trying to reach her, but she hasn't answered my calls. She's still in the hospital. Is she okay? She's doing great. The doctors just want to make sure that all the tests come back clean before they release her. She'll most likely be able to go home tomorrow. She relaxed. Good. She paused, hating to ask the question, but she needed to know. Have you heard from Garrett? She felt him go tense beside her. No. Have you? No, not a word. She frowned. Is that normal? Do you think he's okay? Yeah, I'm sure he's just embarrassed. He'll turn up when he's ready to face things. Has he always been so volatile? Hank chuckled. Yep, pretty much since birth. His phone buzzed. He sat up and retrieved it from his pant pocket. I guess we'd better get back to the office. I forgot that I have a client coming in this afternoon. What time is it? 2.30. I'm supposed to be at a client's house at 4. I guess I better get back, too. They both stood. He caught her arm. Thanks. She tilted her head. For what? Giving me another chance. She smiled. Don't make me regret it. No chance of that, he said and leaned down to kiss her. Chapter 20 Thanks for coming, Lila said, motioning for Chloe to sit across from her in the overstuffed chair. Chloe glanced around the living room, making a mental note of the neutral palette. Lila had once said she wanted to add pops of color to the room, and Chloe was inclined to agree. As Lila mentioned, the space had been done by a designer and possessed all of the textbook elements necessary to make it presentable. However, it lacked originality and personality. Lila's living room looked like a ho-hum showroom in a furniture store. Adding stylish window treatments, new pillows, and a few unique accessories would take it from ordinary to extraordinary. She realized that Lila was studying her. I'm sorry, I was doing an assessment of the room so that I'll know what to recommend for window treatments. She waved a hand of dismissal. Oh, don't worry about that right now. I want to talk to you about something else. Okay. A sense of foreboding crept over her as she turned her attention to Lila, who was shifting around on the sofa like she was sitting on a pincushion. There was a strained expression on her face, and her hands were fidgety. Is everything all right? You didn't sound like yourself on the phone earlier. Lila's robust complexion was one of her best features, but today her skin was pale, like someone had added a gray filter, and the lines around her eyes were more prominent. She cleared her throat. How are things at work? Fine, Chloe said mechanically. I like my job. I have some great projects that I'm working on, and are you still dating the younger singleton brother? Garrett? No. Relief swept over Lila's features. Good. She leaned forward. Do you know Garrett? No. Confusion swirled around Chloe, and she tried to figure out where Lila was going with this. I don't understand. If you don't know Garrett, then why are you relieved that I'm not dating him? Lila trailed her fingers through her short, dark hair before letting out a nervous laugh. I don't know Garrett. But I know Hank. The words were spoken deliberately, and she paused, giving Chloe a piercing look. There was a hidden meaning in Lila's words, a clue that Chloe was supposed to grasp without Lila having to come right out and say it. A shadow came over the room as the sun went behind the clouds. Pete was in the jewelry business. Had he crossed paths with Hank? Apprehension snaked down Chloe's spine. A thought came rushing back. Something Lila said when they first met. When you learned that I had an interview with Marsh Interiors, you said that you had a problem with them of a personal nature. Her throat felt thick and sticky, like it was suddenly filled with glue. She swallowed. What did you mean by that? Did I say that? 
She let out a half laugh. I don't remember. Yes, you did. Chloe locked eyes with her, not backing down an inch. Is there something you're trying to tell me about, Hank? You're involved with him, aren't you? The words were spoken like an accusation. Chloe drew in a swift breath. Would that be a bad thing? Yes, I'm afraid it would, Lila said quickly, a look of sympathy in her eyes. Blood began pumping furiously through Chloe's veins. Why? She croaked. Then she realized her hands were gripping the arms of the chair for all it was worth. She let go and clasped her hands tightly in her lap. Lila scooted back in her chair. Let me tell you a story. She paused, gathering her thoughts. As you know, Pete has worked in the jewelry industry most of his adult life. For years, he ran an actual store. That all changed a few years ago when he got into a bit of trouble. What kind of trouble? Chloe began chewing on her bottom lip, bracing herself for the worst. Just as she suspected, Pete had crossed paths with Hank. I really shouldn't be telling you this, Lila said, lowering her voice and looking over her shoulder as if she were afraid someone might overhear them. I don't want to drudge up the past. I certainly don't want to cause Pete any legal problems. But I feel I need to tell you. For your own safety. A furrow appeared between Chloe's brows. If you're trying to tell me about Hank's past, I already know that he was a jewel thief. Lila drew back, surprised. He told you? She nodded. And you're still dating him? Yes. Irritation pricked over Chloe. The cold, hard facts of Hank's past life belied the changed man he'd become. In that moment, she had an inkling of the prejudice he must face on a daily basis as he tried to outlive his reputation. Hank's a good guy. He's not the same person he was before. She hated the doubt that crept into Lila's eyes. You don't believe it, she said flatly. I didn't call you here today to talk about Hank's qualities. I called you here because I'm concerned for your safety. But I told you, Hank's no longer a thief. Her voice raised a fraction as she sat up taller in her seat. I appreciate your concern, but I'm a big girl. I know what I'm doing. It's worse than I thought. You're in love with him. Oh boy, is this bad. She rubbed a hand across her forehead. Chloe made a face. I'm not in love with him. I care a great deal about him. But I'm not in love, she repeated, her face growing warm. Lila gave her a knowing smile that was tinged with concern. Call it what you will, but it's obvious that you are. Was she? She tried to think. She had strong feelings for him, but love? She couldn't stop thinking about him and longed to be with him 24-7. Admittedly, she'd been pretty miserable when she thought they were over, but love? She wrinkled her nose. Let me get back to my story, and this will make more sense. Okay, Chloe said dully. Pete ran a good business, an upstanding business for the most part. What I didn't realize until much later is that he supplemented his income by acting as a fence for a few transactions that weren't exactly above board. All of the dots came together. He's Hank's fence. Yes. Chloe processed that bit of information. Of all the people to be her neighbors, it was turning out to be a very small valley. She thought of something else. Did Pete have a nephew named Guy? Yes. The distraught look on Lila's face said it all. No wonder she didn't like Hank. Chloe could hardly blame her. A wave of sympathy came over her. Hank told me what happened. I'm sorry. Lila nodded, her lower lip trembling. When Guy died, Pete took it hard. He felt like the whole thing was his fault because he talked Hank into taking him along on the job. Yes, that's what Hank said. Pete's sister was completely devastated. Guy was her baby and the only boy. The poor woman fell apart and had to go into counseling. For a while, I was afraid she might have to be hospitalized. She shook her head. It was bad for the whole family. I thought Pete was coming to terms with it, getting better, until one afternoon, her voice caught. I was out shopping, 
And out of the blue, I had the strongest impression that I needed to get home immediately because Pete was in trouble. I tried to call his cell phone, but he didn't answer. I was standing in line waiting to check out, and the feeling became so intense that I left my items and rushed home. Her eyes filled with tears. When I got here, Pete was sitting on the back deck with a gun in his hand. He said he could no longer live with the guilt. Had I gotten here a minute later, it would have been too late. Tears filled her eyes. Chloe felt moisture form in her eyes as well. Wow, I'm sorry. I didn't realize. Even as the words dribbled out, Chloe was struck by how futile they sounded. She knew from personal experience that mere words did little to mend a broken heart. Lila was still torn up about it, and she obviously held Hank responsible, which is why she'd called her here today to discuss it. Even though she understood where Lila was coming from, she felt the need to defend Hank. It was Guy's death that prompted Hank to turn his life around. I can understand why you don't care for him, but he's a good guy. Hank carries the guilt of Guy's death as well, he told me. Lila sighed in frustration. You're missing the point here, Chloe. Chloe's jaw tightened. Okay, then why don't you come right out and tell me whatever it is you're trying to say because I'm having a hard time figuring it out. Lila wet her lips and locked eyes with Chloe. All my life I've known things, premonitions about things that are going to happen. Sometimes it comes to me as a feeling. Other times it comes as a dream. When I had that feeling about Pete, I knew I had to get home immediately. She brushed back a lock of hair with a shaky hand. It took effort for Chloe to prevent her face from showing the shock she was feeling. Lila was crazy. She knew she was eccentric, but this was madness. You don't believe me. Disappointment sounded in Lila's voice. She spread her hands. I don't know what to think. Chloe glanced at the clock hanging on the wall. The faint ticks coming from it sounded ominous, like they were counting down the time until disaster struck. You know, I need to get going. I have some things to take care of this evening. Chloe, Lila urged, look at me. Chloe peeled her eyes away from the clock and fixed them on Lila. I'm telling you the truth. You have to believe me. This was a sticky business. Lila was a good neighbor and had been uber kind to her since her arrival. She tried to phrase the words in a way so as not to offend her. I can tell that you're sincere and that you think you're telling me the truth, but from the minute we met, I sensed a deep sadness in you. I knew that you'd been through a difficult time. She locked eyes with Chloe. I didn't know for sure what that sadness was until I saw your soldier out by the swing. Chloe began blinking rapidly. I'm sorry, what did you say? An invisible vice clutched her chest and she had to fight to get a good breath. It was an episode similar to what she'd experienced in the canyon, but this time it had nothing to do with the altitude. I've seen him, Chloe. He visits you often. No, she sputtered. This is insane. Darby told you about Dan. Did you tell Darby that Dan has been coming to you? Did you tell her he was by the swing? That night, when you ran outside frantically looking for him. The chair seemed to fall out from under her as Chloe clutched the arms for support. No, she squeaked. I've never told anyone. She had the feeling that she'd left Earth and was on some alien planet where the basic rules that governed life didn't apply. Take a deep breath. Lila urged, calm down. This is impossible, Chloe sputtered. I told you I know things that other people don't. Some call it a gift, others a curse. She let out a humorless chuckle. Uh, lately, it's starting to feel more like a curse. I haven't seen your soldier lately. That's how I knew you'd fallen in love with someone else. Tears began spilling down Chloe's cheeks and splattering over her shirt like a thundercloud that had been gutted to release rain. Her mind whirled, trying to make sense of this. If you've seen him, then that means that Dan is real. Yes, he's real. I mean, 
He's a ghost or spirit or whatever you want to call him, but he's real. She let those words sink in, her rational mind trying to come to terms with it. All this time, I thought it was... The words came out in a choke, and she bit her lower lip, shaking her head. She began again. I thought it was... Crazy? Lila inserted. You thought it was crazy? Chloe nodded, her eyes wide. You've really seen him? Yes. Lila waved a hand. But that's not why I wanted to talk to you. She blew out a breath. Unfortunately, there's more. She shook her head. More? How could there be more? I've been having dreams about you, Chloe. Her face drained, and she had a tortured look in her eyes. Terrible dreams. You're trapped, and you can't breathe. Water is gushing in. Lila closed her eyes and put a shaky hand to her mouth. I'm sorry. I debated about whether or not to tell you, but I wouldn't be able to live with myself if I didn't warn you. A cold, insidious fear slithered over Chloe, making her feel weak. She had the impression that the chair in which she was sitting was some crazy merry-go-round going at warp speed, and she couldn't get off. The whole conversation was utterly ridiculous, and yet Lila knew about Dan. She wanted to jump up and start screaming at the top of her lungs until everything returned to normal. You're in danger, Lila whispered. I don't know when and I don't know how, but something horrible is going to happen to you. It's connected with Hank. You need to get as far away from him as you can get. That's your only hope of survival. Chapter 21 Later that night, Chloe and Darby were sitting on the couch watching an episode of CSI when Chloe casually turned. What's your take on Lila? My take? Darby frowned. I'm not sure what you mean. She called me over to her house today and told me some personal things about her and Pete. Really? Interest kindled in Darby's eyes. What? While Chloe didn't relish the thought of sharing details about Lila's personal life, she desperately needed to get a second opinion on the situation, and Lila had not asked her to keep a confidence. Chloe told Darby about Lila's prompting to return home and how she'd saved Pete from committing suicide. As she finished the story, she could tell from the look on Darby's face that she wasn't the least bit surprised. You've heard this before? Darby rolled her eyes. A million times. Do you believe her? A thoughtful expression came over her face. I guess so. I mean, it's a good thing she was in tune enough to receive a prompting on his behalf. Pete's her husband. They should have a strong connection. Do I think Lila makes it out to be something more than it was? Yes, I do. Lila's kind of superstitious. If you haven't already figured that out. That's an understatement, Chloe muttered. She was starting to feel better about things. She let out a half laugh, keeping her voice light. She told me that she keeps dreaming that something terrible's going to happen to me. As her eyes met Darby's, she knew the fear she was feeling was being broadcast on her face. Darby blew out a breath of frustration. I love Lila, but she's a few short of a dozen, if you get my drift. Chloe made a face. Do you think I should be concerned? She told me that the danger concerns Hank and that I should stay away from him. A trace of amusement came over Darby. Really? That's what she said. Hank seems like a great guy to me. He is a great guy. That's what I tried to tell Lila. She wasn't about to tell Darby about Hank's past. Nor was she going to tell her about how Lila had seen Dan. She still couldn't explain that one. But there had to be some rational explanation. There just had to be. She realized that Darby was talking and focused on what she was saying. Now, if she told you to stay away from Garrett, I might be persuaded to believe her. Chloe laughed. Yeah, me too. But Hank? She shook her head. I think she's wrong on that one. Something in the way she phrased the words caught Chloe's attention. Has Lila ever been right about any of her predictions? Well, she did tell me three months before you moved in that I would be getting a new roommate. She hesitated, an uncomfortable look coming over her. And despite the fact that we come from two different worlds and have absolutely nothing in common, 
we would end up becoming the best of friends. The feeling of tenderness that flooded over Chloe caught her completely by surprise. Thanks, she said quietly. Then the fear returned with a vengeance. Lila was right about us. Maybe she's right about Hank, too. Darby shook her head. Lila likes to act like she knows more than she actually does. She has a keen sense of intuition that allows her to pick up on people's feelings and fears. If you want my opinion, I think that's the secret behind her predictions. She waved a hand. Of course, she is wrong about as often as she is right. She told me that I would unknowingly be the key that solved a high-profile case. Really? That obviously hasn't happened, nor do I think it will. Chloe was starting to feel better about things. She loved Darby's practical take on life and how it helped restore a measure of sanity. Look, it's obvious that you're crazy about Hank, and he seems to feel the same way about you. She gave Chloe a probing look. Am I right? She nodded. Tears pressed against her eye sockets, and she blinked to keep them at bay. Guys like Hank don't come around every day. No, they don't. Of that, Chloe was certain. Hank was one in a million. Take my advice. You'd better hold on to him. A smile stole across Darby's lips. If you don't have the sense enough to keep him, then I might have to go after him myself. Chloe laughed. I don't think so. Don't worry. I have sense enough to recognize a good thing when I see it. Chloe was standing near Yvette's desk when the woman came sauntering into the reception area of Marsh Interiors like she owned the place. Dressed to the nines in a short skirt and sweater, she was tall and willowy with shoulder-length glossy hair the color of sable that bounced on her shoulders as she walked. She had the languid look of a pampered model that expected the world to fall at her feet simply because she was beautiful. When she reached the desk, she slung back her hair and moistened her pouty lips. Hi, Yvette. It's been a while. I need to see Hank. Would you tell him that I'm here? She said in a sultry voice that was more of a command than a request. A strange light came into Yvette's eyes. He usually doesn't see people unannounced, but for you, I'm sure he'll make an exception. The woman laughed. Of course he will. Yvette went to pick up the phone. I'll call him. She leaned over and put a hand over the phone. Oh, don't do that. You'll spoil all the fun. By this point, Chloe was starting to dislike this haughty woman who was acting like she had some claim on Hank. She arched an eyebrow and straightened to her full height. The woman seemed to notice that Chloe was standing there. She looked her up and down, a quiet challenge in her eyes. Chloe jutted out her chin. Have we met? No, I don't think so. The woman smirked, dismissing her with a flick of her hair. I'll show myself in, she said, eyeing Chloe once more. She pushed her purse strap back up on her shoulder and strode in the direction of his office. Chloe put her hand on her hip. Even though they'd barely spoken, some instinctual part of her detested that woman. She was clearly on the make and had Hank in her sights. Was she a client? She certainly didn't like the idea of him working closely with someone like that. Then again, Hank worked with myriads of clients. It wasn't like she could police them all. If she and Hank were to have any hope of building a lasting relationship, then she would simply have to trust him. She looked over and realized that Yvette was studying her, an amused expression on her face. She glared at Yvette, hoping her eyes would convey all that her tongue wasn't allowed to say. What? A crafty smile formed on Yvette's lips. Aren't you going to ask who that was? Why should I do that when it's obvious you're going to tell me anyway? Her face fell a notch. Okay, I won't tell you. She harumphed. Yvette's petty games were grating on her last nerve. Who was it? Chloe demanded. Excitement tinged her voice as she went in for the kill. That was Veronica Grant, or V, as Hank calls her. Hank's old girlfriend. Her lips formed a mock pout. He was crazy in love with her, but she broke his heart. It took all of the intestinal fortitude Chloe could muster not to tromp into Hank's office and drag that long-legged hussy out by the hair of her head. Knowing that wasn't an option, she did the only other thing she could. Sat behind her desk, fuming. It took her all of five minutes to decide that she was not going to sit by and let someone swoop in and steal her man right out from under her nose. She and Hank were scheduled to have lunch at noon. 
which was about ten minutes from now. She'd wait until then before going into his office to get him. Hank was so engrossed in the house plans he was studying that he didn't realize she'd come into his office until she was standing in front of his desk. His eyes went round as he rocked back. Then his mouth formed a hard line. V, what are you doing here? She leaned forward, her eyes sparkling with mischief. Can't an old friend even stop by and say hello without being given the third degree? He crossed his arms tightly over his chest, his eyes taking in her flawless appearance. She was as beautiful as always, beautiful and dangerous. Old friend, huh? What do you want? She trailed a red fingernail over the top edge of the building plans. Hard at work, I see, still pretending to be an honest businessman. Her voice was soft and taunting. There was a time when he would have taken the bait and played right into her hands. But she no longer had any control over him. He let out an impatient sigh. I'm on a deadline. What do you want? She batted her eyelashes and gave him her best come-hither expression. I've missed you, she purred, reaching across the desk and caressing the top of his hand. Hank wondered how many other men had been snared by that same line. Really, he said in a bored tone, removing his hand. I doubt that. Her face fell. You don't believe me. He looked her in the eye. No, I don't. She let out an uneasy laugh and sat down just like that. She dropped the pretense and smirked. I never could fool you, could I? He lifted an eyebrow. Oh, you fooled me pretty good, once. His voice went hard. But then I came to my senses. She trailed her long fingernails through her hair. Always so serious. Remember all of the good times we had? She chuckled. That night we had dinner on the rooftop of your apartment building. You brought me flowers, and we danced under the canopy of stars. There was a wistful expression on her face. You are my first love, Hank. I fell hard for you. Yes, you made that perfectly clear when you dumped me. Speak of the devil, how is Sam? That's not fair. I was scared and alone. Sam was there when I needed him. A shoulder to cry on. Tears misted her eyes. I never cared for Sam like I do you. Why can't you get it through your thick skull that I made a mistake? How many times do I have to say it? The mistake was mine, forever trusting you. You and Sam deserve each other. As he sat there, looking at her, he wondered how he could have ever been taken in by her wiles. True, she was devastatingly beautiful and said all of the right things. But there was no substance. She was an elaborately wrapped box that was empty inside. An image of Chloe, warm and expressive, flashed through his mind, and he was so grateful for her. He rubbed his neck. Like I said, I'm busy, so if there's nothing else. I came to talk to you about Garrett. His head shot up. You've seen Garrett? When? Even though he kept assuring Chloe that Garrett was fine, he was worried about him. He'd been calling and texting him repeatedly, and had even stopped by his house the night before, but Garrett wasn't there. Something was wrong. You could feel it. He came to me two nights ago. He's in trouble, Hank, and he needs your help. His muscles went rigid. What kind of trouble? All I know is that he owes a truckload of money to Sam's boss. They're wanting him to do some job to square the debt. Hank swore under his breath. It was his worst fear. He balled a fist and put it to his mouth. I'm worried, Hank. Her voice trembled. Sam's doing all he can to hold off his boss, but it's not looking good. If Garrett's in trouble, then he needs to go to the police. She scoffed. The police, right. A lot of good that'll do him. You know better than anybody how these people are. She gave him a meaningful look and lowered her voice. What he needs is your help. The job involves a safe, a very sophisticated safe from what I hear. He gave her a dark look. Did Sam send you here? I've told him that part of my life is over. I'm clean. I intend to stay that way. Her eyes turned to circles. No, 
Sam doesn't even know I'm here. I told you I came on my own accord because I'm worried about Garrett. Well, that's mighty magnanimous of you to be so concerned about my little brother. This is a first for you, isn't it, V? To show concern for another person. Fire brimmed in her eyes. Don't mock me. After all we've been through, I think I deserve better than that. He leaned forward, clutching the arms of his chair, his knuckles white. Then don't you come in here, batting your eyes, in a poor attempt to manipulate me into doing Sam's dirty work. It always goes back to Sam. You're pathetic, so blinded by your jealousy for Sam, that you can't see that I'm crazy about you. Her voice broke, and a single tear dribbled down her cheek. Contrary to what you think, I'm neither blind nor jealous. Whatever we had in the past is dead and buried. The sooner you get that in your head, the better. He sincerely hoped that she would be able to tell from the disinterested tone in his voice that he was serious. She stood. You're a fool, Hank Singleton. A stupid fool. I'm here on Garrett's behalf. When he came to you for help, you threw him out on his ear. He let out a disbelieving laugh. Is that what he told you? Knock, knock. Chloe said as she stepped into the room. Her presence had the effect of snuffing out the conversation. When she gave Hank a questioning look, he forced a smile. Hey. Hey, I just came to see if you're ready to go to lunch. V spun around, her cold eyes looking Chloe up and down. Now I'm getting the full picture, she said, acid coating her voice. This must be the famous Chloe that Garrett told me about. I thought that was you earlier. Chloe met her gaze full on. You have the advantage of knowing who I am when I haven't heard a single thing about you. A look of fury swept over V as she let out a harsh laugh. <laughs> well, aren't you the little dish? A southern girl with wit. No wonder you have the guys fighting over you. She smirked. Hank always was a sucker for brunettes. She finished with a flip of her hair. V was just leaving. Hank cut in. Yes, I was. Her eyes bore into Hank's. Don't say I didn't try to warn you about Garrett. As she walked by Chloe, she paused. Better enjoy him while you can, because he transfers his affections quickly. Chapter 22 Darby chose her usual seat on the front row. This class, Psychology of Criminal Behavior, was her favorite, partly because of the course material, but mostly because of Logan MacDonald, her dashing professor that she'd affectionately nicknamed Professor McDreamy. In his early thirties, he was tall and lean with hooded black eyes that seemed to hold some tantalizing secret. His features were sharp and masculine, and he made a point of giving it to the class straight. A no-nonsense, a flesh-and-blood Tommy Lee Jones. Darby could tell from the wistful looks on the faces of the other female students that she wasn't the only one whose flame burned for the professor. His ring finger was bare, but she assumed that he must have a serious girlfriend because he showed no interest in the female attention he routinely received. That all changed about midway through his lecture. The room was stuffy, and out of habit she gathered her curls in her hands and pulled her hair up on her head to cool her neck. For some reason... This caught his attention. He stumbled over a word and paused, his thoughtful eyes catching hers. When she offered him a hesitant smile, he returned it. A bolt of warmth shot through her, and she looked around, wondering if the other students had noticed the interaction. Throughout the lecture, Professor McDreamy kept glancing her direction. After class, he approached her desk. Her heart began to pound erratically. Great lecture, she blurted and then winced inwardly. Could she have sounded any more stupid? Thanks, he said casually. I appreciate your comments. It helps to keep the discussion going. I think half the students would sleep through the class if they could. She just sat there. It had been much easier to feel confident when she was in a room full of people. Now that they were alone, she couldn't think of a single sensible thing to say. Blast it! An awkward silence passed. He cleared his throat. <clears> throat> I was going over your term papers. You make some strong points about why repeat offenders need harsher parole restrictions. They chatted about that for a few minutes, and then he pointed. 
Nice earrings, by the way. A flush crept over her cheeks as she tucked a curl behind her ear. Thanks. They're very unique. Where'd you get them? At one of the department stores? She flashed an unassuming smile. Really can't remember. She wasn't about to tell him that they were a gift to Chloe from an ex-boyfriend and she'd borrowed them without asking. A fluid smile spread over his face and she thought she would melt at the sight of it. Well, they look very nice on you. He gave her a hopeful look. This may sound a bit unorthodox since I'm your professor, but I was wondering if you'd like to have dinner with me sometime. I'd love to, she blurted out before he could change his mind. They exchanged phone numbers and set a date for Friday. After that, Darby practically floated out of the room. When Darby was out of hearing range, Logan pulled his phone from his pocket. Hey, Jared. How's it going? It's Logan. Yeah, I know it's been a while. How's the investigation into the ghost thefts coming along? I was afraid of that. The ghost is notorious for leaving no trace. Excitement brimmed in his voice as he clutched the phone tighter. Well. Today's your lucky day. Detective, I just might have a lead for you. Garrett waited until dark to enter Glory's home. Carefully, he made his way to the study. He shined the flashlight around the room, looking for the chair. His heart dropped when he realized it wasn't there. Glory must have moved it to another room. Even though he'd never been questioned by the police regarding the ghost thefts, he felt sure that the police kept tabs on him, Considering the fact that he was Hank's brother, he went to great lengths to cover his tracks, and that included making sure that he never stored the loot at his home or anywhere the police would suspect. He was at an auction when he came across the unique chair that had a secret compartment. The genius of the plan was in its simplicity. He placed the chair in Glory's home, repeatedly telling her how much he loved it. While Glory wasn't crazy about the chair, she would never get rid of it because she knew how much he loved it. He'd been tempted to have it recovered so that it wouldn't stick out like a sore thumb, but he didn't want to run the risk of the upholsterer discovering the compartment. Not only did he store jewels in it, but also passports for new identities and emergency cash. Methodically, he searched the home room by room looking for the chair. He went so far as to search Glory's room even though she was sleeping in her bed. Frustration mounted inside of him when he realized that the chair was not there. A part of him wanted to wake Glory up and demand to know what she'd done with the chair. Of course, he couldn't do that. Not without drawing suspicion to himself. If he weren't out of time, he could simply pay Glory a visit and casually ask about the chair, but it was too late for that. Everything was in place. Getting the contents from the chair was the final step. Think. He had to think. Beads of perspiration formed on his forehead as he tried to figure out what to do next. Garrett tightened his hands on the wheel as he glanced in the rear-view mirror. When he'd gotten the text from Sam telling him that his time was up, he knew he had to act fast. He smirked. Sam was so predictable. Garrett figured that he would send his goons to his house in order to retrieve him. So when he saw the parked car on the street, he sped off knowing they would follow. He continued up the windy road of the canyon, grateful that the BMW handled so well. Everything was closing in at a rapid-fire pace and he wondered how things had gotten so out of control. His mind flittered to Hank and then to Chloe. He didn't hate them, but he would never be able to forgive them, especially not Hank. His brother had betrayed him, turned his back on him when he needed him the most. It hurt like crazy, but there was nothing he could do about it. He pressed his foot on the gas, making the car go faster. He smiled when he looked in the mirror and saw the car behind him was swerving in order to keep up. Take that, you lugheads, he muttered. Then he went faster, increasing the distance between him and the other car. He laughed out loud when he looked back and saw that the car was lagging further and further behind. He increased the speed even more. A minute later, the BMW spiraled out of control and went off a steep embankment, rolling over and over until it landed with a loud crash. A second later, it burst into fiery flames that from a distance looked like a huge bonfire billowing acrid smoke into the night air. She first became aware of a dank darkness that was so complete she couldn't even see her hand in front of her face. She was alone, trapped in a tunnel that seemed to have no end. The blackness pressed against her eyes, suffocating her, and then the darkness gave way to a faint light. 
and she saw Dan in the distance, beckoning to her, and her pace in order to reach him. But her legs grew heavy, like she was trudging through deep water. Her chest constricted, and she couldn't breathe. The scene changed, and she was in frigid water that was pouring in around her. She tried to scream, but no one could hear. A roaring started in her mind and rang through her ears. Then she saw Hank. There was a look of sheer determination on his face as he held out his hand. She strained with all her might against the water and finally grasped it. In that moment, she felt safe. He pulled her through the water, and then she was falling. Chloe jerked to a sitting position. For a split second, her mind fought to grasp reality, and then she realized that she was in her bed. She was bathed in a sticky sweat, and her heart was flopping in her chest. She rubbed her eyes and groaned. Stupid nightmare! She could thank Lila for this one. She'd felt like she was drowning. She reached for her phone. 5 a.m., she returned it to the nightstand and lay back against the pillow. Her alarm wasn't scheduled to go off until six. She lay there, allowing her mind to drift, as she felt herself settling back into blessed sleep. Then her phone buzzed, jarring her awake. She reached for it and frowned. Hello? Chloe. Hank, are you okay? There was a long pause. Hank? What's wrong? An unreasonable fear seized her. It's Garrett. He's been in a car accident. Tears sprang to her eyes. Is he okay? She choked. No. He's dead. Hank's voice broke and she could hear the soft gulping of weeping on the other end. She jumped out of bed and threw back the covers. Are you at the condo? Silence. Hank, are you at your condo? She repeated. Yes. I'm on my way. Garrett's funeral was to be held at a mortuary located on Highland Drive. They were at the viewing and the funeral would follow. The sweet, sickly smell of carnations permeated the air, and Chloe felt like she'd been catapulted back to those torturous days spent in the funeral home mourning Dan. Her stomach churned, increasing the feeling of dread that was tying her in knots. Thankfully, it was a closed casket funeral. Of course, the reason it was a closed casket was because Garrett's body had been so badly burned that he was only able to be identified through his dental records. There were too many similarities to Dan. His body had been burned beyond recognition, too. She shuddered at the thought. She stepped up to the casket, which had a blanket of red roses spread over the top. Then she heard the sniffle and saw Yvette sitting nearby. Her eyes were stained with tears, and she was bringing a tissue to her nose. Even though she wasn't Chloe's favorite person, she felt sorry for her. It was obvious that she loved Garrett. She stood, looking at the large picture of him. It was taken at a boat dock with a sailboat directly behind him. The wind was rustling his hair, and there was a faint, mocking smile on his flawless face that was so characteristic of Garrett. Like he was somehow exempt from the normal hardships of life. He looked so alive and ready to take on the world that she could hardly believe he was gone. Tears brimmed in her eyes. She glanced over to where Hank was greeting guests. There was a rigid expression on her face, and his jaw was rock hard. It was obvious that he was doing all he could to hold it together. Her face fell a notch when she saw V enter the room. She was wearing a tight black dress that came about six inches above her knee. Patterned tights and swanky stilettos completed the ensemble, giving the impression that her legs stretched on endlessly. Her hair was pulled into a chignon, and she wore a single strand of black pearls and matching earrings. Chloe suddenly felt frumpy in her modest dress and sensible shoes, as she had at Marsh Interiors when V strode in like she owned the place. She made a beeline to Hank, completely ignoring the fact that he was in the middle of a conversation with someone else. She threw her arms around him and gave him a kiss on the cheek. I'm so sorry, darling, she gushed as tears began flowing down her perfect cheeks. A sharp stab of jealousy went through Chloe, nearly taking her breath away. She was starting to hate that woman and how possessive she acted around Hank. Almost as though they were still an item. She did feel a smidgen of relief when she saw Hank go stiff in V's arms and pull away as quickly as possible. V whispered something in his ear, and he gave her a curt nod. 
She was trying to decide if she should go to Hank's side or keep her distance when he scoped the room in a desperate attempt to find her. There was a look of relief on his face when he realized she was standing nearby. He motioned for her to join him. She straightened her shoulders and strode over to him, trying to appear more confident than she actually was. Hank put a protective arm around her and pulled her close. You remember, Chloe. I can't even begin to express what it has meant to have her by my side these past few days. The look of hatred that twisted over V's face was almost comical. If V had any lingering doubts about where she stood with Hank, the message was crystal clear. Of course, we met at your office. She flashed a fake smile. How nice to see you again. Thanks, Chloe said curtly. She guessed from the cold look on V's face that she would have clawed Chloe's eyes out if she could have. V gave Hank an accusing look. It's obvious the two of you are very happy together. We are, Hank said. Well, if you'll excuse me, I need to pay my respects to Garrett. She put a hand on Hank's arm, letting it linger there longer than was necessary. Again, I'm truly sorry for your loss. Malice glittered in her eyes as she looked at Chloe. Without uttering another word, she turned on her heels and strode over to Garrett's casket. It was a lovely funeral, Glory said. As if there is such a thing, Hank muttered darkly. Glory looked to Chloe for help, but she could only shake her head. The three of them were sitting in Glory's den. Glory's sunken face made the deep sorrow in her eyes look even more pronounced. She was so frail that she looked as if she might break at the slightest touch. She seemed to have aged a decade since Chloe had last seen her. Grief did that to a person, eating away the best part of them until only the empty shell remained. She knew that firsthand. As concerned as she was about Glory, it was Hank she was worried about the most. He was withdrawing himself, mechanically going through the motions, only speaking when necessary. The naked anguish in his eyes was almost too much to take. The funeral wasn't lovely, as Glory put it, but brutal. The entire time, V, who was sitting a row to her right, kept looking over and shooting death glares, not to mention the fact that all throughout the service she had the uncanny impression that she was reliving Dan's death. She'd come away from the funeral feeling more disturbed than she'd felt in a long time. Despite everything, I'm glad the two of you have each other. Glory's comment jolted Chloe from her thoughts and back to the present. Yes, it's a good thing, she said automatically looking at Hank. Don't you think? He was staring into space, and it was obvious he did not hear a word of the conversation. Glory shot her a concerned look. She touched Hank's arm. Hey, are you okay? This seemed to jerk him out of his stupor. He offered a tight smile that didn't reach his eyes. Yeah, it's been a long day. I guess I need to get you home. Hank, look at me, Glory ordered, her aged voice cutting through the room with more power than Chloe would have thought possible. This is not your fault. You've spent your whole life trying to take care of your brother. I loved Garrett like a son, but he was his own worst enemy. Her lower lip quivered as tears began flowing down her cheeks. It's not your fault she repeated. It was an accident. There's nothing that you nor anyone else could have done to prevent it. Tears gathered in Hank's eyes as he nodded, but Chloe could tell from the hard look on his face that he didn't believe it. That morning, she'd rushed to his condo after hearing the news of Garrett's death. Hank was nearly inconsolable. He kept saying that if only he'd stepped in and helped, then Garrett would still be alive. She kept trying to tell him that it was an accident, a horrible accident, but no matter what she said, it didn't sink in. At first, she attributed Hank's behavior to the fact that he'd always felt responsible for Garrett, but now she was starting to wonder if there was something he wasn't telling her. She had the feeling that he was holding something back, and it was tearing him up inside. Her heart ached because she knew what he was going through. That sinking feeling of lonely desperation that was like a poison. The only thing she could do was to stay by his side until he pulled out of it. After leaving Glory's, they drove to Chloe's house in silence. When they arrived, Hank pulled alongside of the street and turned off the engine. He turned to face her. I still can't believe he's gone. 
She took hold of his hand. I'm sorry. Tears spilled down her cheeks. I want you to know that I'm here for you. His jaw started working, and she could tell that he was fighting to control his emotions. That means the world to me, he gulped. It feels like my insides have been ripped out. His voice broke. Garrett had a lot of faults, but he didn't deserve to die. No, he didn't, Chloe said quietly, her voice ringing with conviction. They sat in silence for a few minutes until Hank spoke. I need to get away. There was a desperate layer to his voice. I need to sort through a few things. Okay. A sense of dread came over her. The last thing she wanted was to be separated from Hank, but this wasn't about her. It was about Hank, and he needed to deal with it in his own way. More than anything, she needed to be supportive. Where will you go? Glory owns a small home that's near Bodega Bay, just up the coast from San Francisco. I thought I would go there for a few days to clear my head. Relief fluttered through her. A few days wasn't so bad. She could live without him for that length of time. I think getting away is a good idea. She gave him a loving smile. I'll miss you, but I completely understand. He tightened his grip on her hand. There was a sense of desperation in his eyes. I want you to come with me. What? Could she do that? Up and leave for a few days with a guy. Her mother would have a conniption fit. Please, he continued. I need you. There was so much pain in his voice that she would have agreed to almost anything at that moment, just to ease his suffering. And then it hit her. She wanted to go with him. Time seemed to stand still as he awaited her decision. Okay, I'll go, she heard herself say. He rewarded her with the first real smile she'd seen him give since Garrett's death. Thank you. He brought her fingers to his lips and planted a kiss on them. A tiny spark of life seemed to come back into him. I can't wait to show you the bay. We'll leave tomorrow afternoon. I'll make all the arrangements. That sounds great, Chloe said, wondering how in the heck she was going to explain this one to her mother. Mom, I have to go away for a few days to Bodega Bay, which is near San Francisco. Chloe braced herself for the explosion that was sure to follow. What? Why? Her mother had a strangled sound like she was choking, and she could imagine her standing in the kitchen, her feet firmly planted on the floor in a battle stance with her hand on her hip. She would be frowning with wrinkles forming across her forehead. I have to take a work trip with my boss. She winced slightly as the words left her mouth, hating that she was not being honest. There was no way she could tell her the truth. Her mother didn't even know she was dating Hank. For that matter, she'd not told her about Garrett either. There was no way she could explain everything now. Is there anyone else from your office going? The concern in her mother's voice pricked her conscience. No, it's just Hank and me, she said, knowing this wasn't going to sit well. I don't feel comfortable about this, Chloe, her mother continued. It's not fair of your boss to expect you to go on a trip with him, alone. What kind of man puts his employee in that position? Chloe raked her hands through her hair, feeling weary to the bone. He's a good man, Mom. You have nothing to worry about. I'm sure he's a good man, but it's not appropriate for a young lady to go off alone with a man, regardless of how nice he is. She rolled her eyes. If it makes you feel better, he's a good Christian man. I assure you he only has my best interest at heart. I'm going to call and talk to him myself. Once he understands my hesitation about the situation, he'll surely... No, Mom! Chloe blurted out. You can't. Panic raced over her. I'm a grown woman. You have to trust me on this. There was a long pause. Chloe, what's going on here? Is this really about work? She let out an uneasy laugh. Of course it's about work. What else would it be about? Beastie rubbed against her leg. When she leaned down to pet him, he began purring loudly. I can't put my finger on it, but something about this doesn't seem right. And considering that you've been so evasive lately, trying to get information from you is like pulling a hen's tooth. What is it that you're not telling me? Nothing, she lied, hating herself for it. It's all above board, I assure you. I don't like it, she snapped. I don't like it at all, she sighed. Mom, sooner or later, you're going to have to start trusting me. 
I do trust you, Chloe. It's your boss that I don't trust. I'll have my phone with me the entire time. You can call any time you want. You bet I will, Naomi inserted quickly. It's getting late. I'm tired and I need to get some rest. Okay, we'll continue this conversation tomorrow. There was a hint of promise in her tone, letting Chloe know that the conversation wasn't over. Sounds good. Love you. Love you too. Chloe ended the call with a frustrated huff and then realized Darby was standing in the doorway with her arms folded over her chest. A sly smile spread across her face. Work trip, huh? She scowled. Jeez, do you always eavesdrop on conversations? Darby shrugged. Only on the good ones. Actually, I just wanted to check on you to see how you were doing considering everything that's been going on. It's been rough, she admitted. Hank's blaming himself for Garrett's death. She made a face. But that's ridiculous. It was a car accident. How could that possibly be his fault? I don't know. She pressed her fingers into the corners of her eyes and groaned. It doesn't make any sense. She looked at Darby. Grief rarely does. I guess you know that better than anyone. Yeah, unfortunately I do. A playful light came into her eyes. So Hank wants you to go away with him? Just for a few days. To clear his head. Uh-huh, she arched an eyebrow. Things must be getting pretty serious. Yeah, she looked at Darby. I'm crazy about him. I know you are, and he seems to feel the same way about you. Yes, I think he does, she waved a hand. Go on your trip. Have a wonderful time, and don't worry. When your mom starts pumping my mom for information, I'll be sure to drill it in that it's nothing more than a simple work trip, she made air quotes. Guilt pummeled over Chloe. Thank you. I know I should have told my mom the truth. A fringed look of horror came over Darby's face. Yikes! If you had, she'd have been on the first plane out here, Chloe chuckled. You're right about that. I figure what your mom doesn't know won't hurt her. Hank is your boss and I'm sure you'll manage to somehow squeeze in the topic of work during the trip. Chloe gave her an appreciative smile. Thanks. You're welcome, she winked. I've got your back. Chapter 23 Chloe was going with him to Bodega Bay. That was one bright spot in the midst of the tragedy, something he could hold on to. Hank willed himself to concentrate on the trip and all of the things he would show Chloe once they arrived. That lasted about five minutes, and then his mind was drawn right back to the thing he was trying to avoid, the brutal guilt he felt over Garrett's death. It bubbled up like acid in his throat, and no matter how hard he tried to swallow the pain, it kept plaguing him over and over. He kept asking himself if there was anything he could have done to avoid it. The accident report showed that Garrett was not only speeding but also driving recklessly up the canyon. The officers investigating the accident had brought up the possibility of suicide but that was so far-fetched and out of the question that he didn't give it a second thought. Garrett's instinct for survival was stronger than anyone's he knew, including his own. In Hank's mind, he could think of only two logical scenarios that would have led to Garrett's erratic behavior. Either he was drunk out of his mind, or he was being chased. His gut told him it was the latter, especially considering the fact that V had swallowed her pride and come to him, asking for help on Garrett's behalf. Garrett was a compulsive gambler, and was always getting in over his head. If a person gave Garrett $20, he owed $40 by the end of the week. Hank had bailed him out too many times to count. He'd bailed him out until he couldn't do it any longer. Finally, when Garrett's debts were starting to put the business in jeopardy, he cut him off. It was around that same time when Garrett had started his real estate company. Even though Hank had hoped with all of his heart that Garrett was on the straight and narrow, a part of him had known the truth. For some time, he'd suspected that Garrett might be the copycat ghost thief. The thefts had all been relatively simple as far as thefts went. A walk in the park for Garrett, who knew almost as much about the business as he did, with the exception of cracking safes. Garrett had not possessed the patience needed to learn that. Even as methodical as Hank was, it had stretched him to the limit, taking him years to become an expert. Like him, Garrett was agile enough to climb anything and loved the thrill of extreme sports. A personality such as his would thrive in the intoxicating world of theft. Unfortunately, Garrett had not learned that the victory was hollow. 
the thirst for the thrill of the chase could never be satisfied, for there would always be a more exciting or lucrative job looming on the horizon. Oh, he'd convinced himself that Garrett was clean, but that was mostly because he didn't want to face the fact that his brother was getting in deeper and deeper over his head. Hank was so desperate to separate himself from his past that he turned a blind eye to what Garrett was really doing. Every time Detective Flores came sniffing around, asking about the reoccurring ghost thefts, it lay on Hank's tongue to drop some hint that would lead him in Garrett's direction. After all, it was his time in prison and the grief over Guy's death that had prompted him to go on the straight and narrow. But prison had been hell, and he didn't wish that on anybody, especially not his own brother. A part of him wondered why the detective never thought to investigate Garrett. Then again, Jarrett was so determined to pin the thefts on him that he couldn't see past the end of his nose, and he didn't know Garrett like Hank did. At the funeral home, he about lost it when V leaned in and whispered that Sam needed to talk to him about Garrett's debts. It was all Hank could do to keep composure. In that instant, any lingering sentiments that he felt for V vanished. He saw her for what she was, manipulative and dangerous. His thoughts went to Sam as a burning anger pulsed through him. He tightened his hands on the steering wheel. If Sam had anything to do with Garrett's death, so help him. He took a deep breath and let it out slowly, trying to get a handle on his emotions. In the old days, he would have hunted Sam down and made him pay for what he'd done. But Hank was a changed man. He'd promised himself that he would never go down that path again. A part of him realized that if he were to open up that part of himself again, it might destroy him this time. And there was Chloe to consider. There was no doubt that he was falling in love with her. She and Glory were the only two things he had left, and he wasn't about to do anything that would put them in harm's way. If Sam were somehow responsible for Garrett's death, then he was going to have to trust that the investigators would come to that conclusion and the law would take its course. Even as he thought the words, he knew there was no hope of that ever happening. Still, he couldn't allow himself to get dragged into some sordid game of revenge. Had he not been afraid that Detective Flores would think he was an accessory to the thefts, he would have called him up and told him that he suspected that Garrett was the thief. He stepped out of his car and heard something in the parking garage. His muscles went tense as he looked over his shoulder. When he realized there was no one there, his pulse returned to normal. He chuckled inwardly. Old habits die hard. He wondered if he would ever stop looking over his shoulder. He got in the elevator and punched the button to go up to his floor. As the door opened and he walked down the hall toward his condo, he felt an eerie sensation of being watched. He quickened his steps in order to reach his condo, but stopped dead in his tracks when he saw the white envelope leaning against the door. He picked it up and turned it over. It was blank. He looked back in the direction from which he'd come. No one was there. He unlocked the door, stepped inside, and locked it behind him. He placed his keys on the counter and opened it. His breath caught as he began to read. I was sorry to hear about Garrett's passing. Unfortunately, he left some unsettled debts. We need to talk. I always collect, one way or another. S dash dash dash. Hank swore and crumpled up the note in his fist. Then he tossed it across the room. Tears stung his eyes as rage boiled inside him. Now he knew for sure that Sam was responsible for Garrett's death. Chloe would later remember it as a soft flutter against her lips. She sat up in bed rubbing her eyes. She'd been in a deep sleep, thankfully, a dreamless sleep, when something had awoken her. She touched her lips. It almost felt like someone had kissed her. That was odd. Had someone been in her room? She frowned as the familiar panic raced through her veins. Not this again. Things had been going so well that she thought Dan was finally disappeared from her life. Tears gathered in her eyes as she looked around the dark room. Her gaze went to the open suitcase on the floor and the clothes that she'd neatly folded and placed inside it. Then her eyes fell on Beastie. He was sitting in the chair that Glory had given her, watching her intently. She had the impression that his keen eyes were trying to tell her something as he glanced at the window. She looked in the direction that Beastie was looking and rocked back in horror, for there in the window was a face. A scream tore through her throat before she could silence it. Darby came rushing into the room. Her hair was all over the place, her eyes wide. What's wrong? Chloe was sitting in bed, clutching the covers in her fists. 
There was a stricken look on her face. Darby went to her side. Are you okay? I saw him, she managed to squeak out. Concern filled Darby's eyes. You saw Dan? Chloe began shaking her head back and forth. No, it wasn't Dan. Then who? Garrett. A new dread filled her eyes as she spoke. I saw Garrett. Okay, start at the beginning and tell me what happened. Darby's voice was controlled and practical, sounding very much like the cop she one day hoped to become. She and Chloe were sitting in the kitchen. The morning sun was streaming in through the window and splashing onto the floor, making the events from the night before seem less ominous. More than anything, Chloe regretted screaming and bringing everything to Darby's attention. If she had it her way, she would have dubbed the incident a nightmare and never mentioned it again, but it was obvious that Darby had no intention of letting it go. I was sound asleep and I felt something touch my lips. Felt something? What, beastie? No, it was soft and light. Her face colored slightly. The only way I could describe it is like a butterfly landed on my lips, like a soft kiss. Are you sure you didn't dream the whole thing? She shrugged. It could have been a dream, she added quickly, even though she didn't think it was. It had felt so real. But she didn't want Darby to think that she was losing it, and so she had to appear rational. You've been pretty distraught over Garrett's death. Yes, I have. Okay, so you're sleeping and you feel something touch your lips. Then what happened? I looked around the room to see if anyone was there. Of course, no one was. My suitcase was open and my clothes were in it. Everything was exactly the same way it had been when I fell asleep. She stopped, her heart picking up a notch. No, everything wasn't the same. Not exactly. That's what had been bothering her the night before. Darby picked up on her body language. What? Chloe cocked her head. Did you come into my room and move my laptop from the chair? Really? Darby made a face. Why would I do that? I don't know, she paused. When I went to bed last night, I left my laptop on the chair, she motioned. You know, the crazy one that my client gave me. Yeah, the one that you keep talking about recovering? When I woke up, Beastie was curled up in the chair and my laptop was on the desk. Darby looked skeptical. Are you sure? Could you have moved it from the chair to the desk before you went to bed? Chloe searched her brain, trying to remember. Yeah, it's possible. She shook her head. But I could have swore I left it on the chair. I was reading about Bodega Bay before I went to bed, and I didn't want to have to get out of bed and put it on the desk, so I left it on the chair. Darby tucked a loose strand of hair behind her ear. Why would anyone move your laptop from the chair to the desk? The skeptical tone in Darby's voice was irritating. I don't know. She raked her hair out of her face. Look, I know, this all sounds crazy. I probably did dream the whole thing, she paused. But, Darby prompted, but it felt so real. Something woke me up, and then Beastie was looking at the window. He sent something was off, too. I looked at the window because Beastie was looking in that direction. As the words trailed off, she knew how ridiculous she sounded. She hated the uncertainty that crept into Darby's eyes, the look that said, You're crazy. How many times had she seen her mother give her that same look? Well, maybe we should ask Beastie, Darby said, an exasperated look on her face. Or better yet, maybe Beastie moved it. Chloe rolled her eyes. No need to get smart about it. The conversation was taking a turn for the worse. She had to try and salvage things the best she could. She forced a light tone into her voice as she continued. I'm sure it was a dream. That's the only logical explanation. Darby studied her with sharp eyes. Yes, she said, looking relieved. You've been super stressed over Garrett's death. It's not uncommon to have nightmares about it. Exactly, Chloe agreed. Darby gave her a suspicious look. Are you just saying this to try and minimize the situation? Goodness, no, Chloe said with a shaky laugh. Darby was unconvinced. Maybe you should get help. Talk to a therapist. You've been through so much. What could it hurt? A shiver of horror ran down Chloe's spine as her lips formed a hard line. It was bad enough that she'd been seeing Dan, but Garrett too? She couldn't think about it too much or the horror would overtake her, and she'd never get back to normal. 
I tell you, I'm fine, she looked Darby in the eye, daring her to disagree. Okay, Darby held up her hands, but you have to promise me that if anything else strange happens, that you'll get help. Silence. Promise me, Darby said, eyeing her. You have my word, she paused. Hey, this is changing the subject, but don't you have a hot date this weekend with your professor? A look of pleasure came over Darby's face. Yes, Logan and I are going out. Oh, I see you're on a first-name basis now. Chloe teased, relieved that she'd managed to steer the conversation away from her. What about Steve? Aren't the two of you still dating? Darby made a sour face. I don't know what we're doing half the time. One thing I do know is that we're not married, so if I decide to go on a date with someone else, then that's my business. Steve can just get over it. Chloe chuckled. All righty then. I guess that solves that. I'm sorry I won't be here to meet the professor. Darby wrinkled her nose. Me too. But if I have anything to say about it, this will be the first of many dates to come. You can meet him next time. Sounds great. They looked over as Beastie strode into the room. Hey, boy, come here, Darby said. Chloe was about to remind her that Beastie never followed orders. When he walked over and forcefully rubbed his head against Darby's leg, she gathered him up in her arms and began stroking his fur. He began purring like a loud motor. Chloe made a face. Really? You are a traitor, beastie. Whether you realize it or not, you belong to me, not Darby. Darby chuckled. Hey, don't be a spoil sport. Beastie knows a good thing when he sees it. We're big buds, aren't we, beastie? She rolled her eyes. It's because you keep feeding him those cans of tuna. That's not the only reason, Darby cooed. It's also because of my magnetic personality and killer good looks. Right, beastie? A pout formed over Chloe's lips, even though she wasn't nearly as upset about Beastie's transfer of affections as she was when she first moved in with Darby. Fickle cat, she muttered, rolling her eyes. Don't listen to her, Beastie. The conversation lapsed into a comfortable silence until Darby looked her in the eye. I'm glad you're going on this trip. It'll be good for you and Hank to get away. He's a good guy, and he's good for you. The meaning of her words were clear. You need to get away before you completely flip your lid. Yeah, I'm glad too. Chapter 24 Darby scowled when they pulled into the parking lot of In-N-Out Burger. She liked burgers as much as the next person, but it was hardly where she wanted to be taken for a date. Is this okay with you? Logan asked, giving her a sideways glance. Yeah, it's fine, she said curtly. After they'd placed their orders, they sat down in a booth. Logan gave her a courtesy smile and then began drumming his fingers on the table like he couldn't wait to leave. That left her trying to figure out something to talk about. When he wasn't blabbing on about a case in a lecture setting, he didn't have much to say. Big disappointment. Professor McDreamy wasn't so dreamy after all. He was a dud. It was going to be a long night. She suddenly wished she'd not been so quick to throw Steve under the bus. So is this one of your favorite restaurants? It's okay, he said casually. Her eyes narrowed as she sat up taller in her seat. So is this where you take all your dates? A look of surprise flickered over him. Oh, I'm sorry. I guess this isn't the greatest place to take a date. Would you like to go somewhere else? Yes, she wanted to go somewhere else. She wanted to be swept off her feet, romanced. She wanted a Hank Singleton like Chloe had. That's what she wanted, not some stiff shirt that was acting like it was a chore to go out with her. No, you've already paid for the food. We might as well eat it. I'm sorry. He gave her a placating smile. I'm afraid I'm not much for dating, and it shows. This mollified her a little. Before she could think of a reply, their number was called and he went to get their food. They ate in silence, except for the couple of times when Darby could think up some inane thing to say. Finally, she grew tired of trying. There was no point in making conversation. Hopefully, after this, he would take her home and she could forget all about this disastrous night. How could she have ever found this man attractive? Well, he was still attractive to look at, she conceded. But he was a real bore. Certainly no Tommy Lee Jones. When they got back to his car, he turned to her. Would you like to go to a movie? 
She rolled her eyes. I don't think so. Okay, would you like to get some ice cream? She had to fight to keep from laughing out loud. Was he for real? Surely he didn't think the date was going well. No, I'm kind of tired. Do you mind taking me home? A look of disappointment came over him, confusing her more than ever. When they reached her house, he pulled into the driveway and turned off the engine. She reached for the door handle. Well, thanks. I guess I'll see you in class. She was about to open the door when he caught her arm. Wait. Yes? Was this guy some kind of freak? You're probably wondering why I asked you out. Yeah, that thought did cross my mind, seeing as how you've hardly spoken two words the entire evening. Yeah, sorry. He rubbed his ear. I told you I wasn't good at dating. She shook her head. Why did you ask me out? It was your earrings. A furrow appeared between her brows. My earrings? She'd expected him to say something like, I love your comments in class, you're smart, pretty. But her earrings? The nerve! Her face became as red as her hair. And she felt like she was going to blow. What? She blurted loud enough to be heard a street over. Before you go on a rampage, let me explain. You'd better start talking fast. The earrings you were wearing the other day in class looked exactly like a pair that were stolen from a home in Park City a few months ago. Not only was he boring, but also a loon. Are you talking about the theft at Dr. and Mrs. Clifton's home? The ghost theft? He looked surprised. You've been paying attention in class. It was the first tendril of real conversation they'd had all evening. I always pay attention, she said tartly. Now what do my earrings have to do with that theft? Mrs. Clifton had a unique jewelry set that was commissioned by a well-known artist in Morocco. Yes, Salma Amini, she said impatiently. I know, you told us. This won her a genuine smile. I can see I underestimated you. Her eyes blazed. Tell me something I don't know. The earrings had red jewels on the top and were encrusted with bright white diamonds. A white pearl hung underneath. And you thought I was wearing the earrings in question? She had the urge to start laughing in his face. Yes, he said with a deadpan expression. She chuckled. Well, that's just about the craziest thing I've ever heard. I have to admit, you almost had me for a minute. Where did you get the earrings? His expression was so serious that she felt goosebumps rise over her flesh. Was he crazy, or was there something to this? I told you, at the mall, she said flippantly. Dillard's or Macy's, take your pick. His eyes hardened a fraction. This is not some joke. She blew out a breath. This conversation was getting nuttier by the minute. She wanted nothing more than to end this silly date and go inside. Okay. I borrowed them from my roommate. Her boyfriend, er, ex-boyfriend, gave them to her. What's the boyfriend's name? What was this, the Spanish Inquisition? Jeez, Garrett something. She tried to remember his last name, but couldn't. He works at Marsh Interiors. Judging by the startled look on Logan's face, she had the feeling something significant was happening. Oh, but Garrett recently passed away in a car accident, she added. Was he by any chance related to Hank Singleton? Yes. Garrett was Hank's brother. He rubbed his hand across his jaw. Wow. What's going on here? She didn't like the feeling of being kept in the dark. Do you know who Hank Singleton is? He owns Marsh Interiors. He's a great guy. Oh, and he's dating my roommate. She's crazy about him. Then she realized that Logan had a strange expression on his face. What else is there to know about Hank? She asked, dreading the answer. Hank Singleton was the original ghost thief. She drew a ragged breath. What? No, that's impossible. How had she missed that little tidbit? Yes, it's very possible. And true. I have a close friend, a detective, who believes Hank is not the reformed thief he claims to be. Flores thinks he's as guilty as sin. Darby's mind began to whirl. That means that Chloe, she put her hand on her mouth. My roommate went away with Hank. She could be in danger. I have to call her, warn her. Calm down. Hank Singleton is a jewel thief, not a murderer. I doubt your friend is in any danger. But you don't know that. 
She felt like every word out of the man's mouth was a hard slap in the face. All she could think about was that Chloe was in trouble. Everything I'm telling you is merely supposition at this point. We won't know anything for sure until I get a look at those earrings. She tried to process what he was saying, to put her education to work and assess the situation logically. There must be some mistake. The Hank I know is no jewel thief. He runs a business. Yes, he owns Marsh Interiors. He looked her in the eye. I can assure you that everything I'm telling you is true. He put a hand over his heart. I swear it. She tucked her hair behind her ears. There was only one way to know for sure what he was saying was true. But that would involve inviting him in. She began chewing on the inside of her jaw as she mulled this over. Yes, he was dull, but he didn't seem like a serial killer. The worst he could do was bore her to death. Okay, let's go have a look. Twenty minutes later, after completing an exhaustive search through Chloe's jewelry box, Darby turned to Logan. They're not here. He raked his hands through his hair. What do you mean? How could they not be here? Maybe Chloe took them with her on her trip, she frowned. Although it seems strange that she would take along a pair of earrings that Garrett gave her when she's on a trip with his brother. Unless Garrett wasn't the one who gave them to her, maybe it was Hank. Are you saying that she lied to me? I'm just trying to make sense of this, just like you are. She was getting tired of this guy and his insinuations. Chloe wouldn't have lied to her about the earrings. What reason would she have for lying, unless she was trying to protect Hank? Well, there's one surefire way to find out. I'll just call her right now and ask. How about that? His eyes went wide. No, don't do that. Wariness crept over her. Why not? Because if you tip her off, she'll tell Hank, and he'll get rid of the earrings. We'll never know for sure. The whole thing seemed preposterous. I'm trying to understand where you're coming from, but I have to consider my roommate's safety first and foremost. By all means. Call and check on her. Just don't mention anything about the earrings. Like I said before, I don't think Hank is a danger to her. She arched an eyebrow. You don't think he's a danger? She let out a harsh laugh. <laughs> Sorry, but I'm not willing to risk my roommate's safety for something you don't think. I know this is asking a lot, but I promise your roommate will be fine. He's not going to hurt her. Detective Flores has spent years trying to catch this guy. This could be the break we've been waiting for. She just stood there glaring at him. He touched her hand. Please. Fine, she relented. Oh, and one more thing. Don't let on to your roommate that you know Hank's a jewel thief. That could also arouse suspicion. So you're saying I do nothing? For now. Only for now. When they return from their trip, we'll see if she has the earrings. She crossed her arms tightly over her chest. You're starting to press your luck, Professor. Chapter 25 Despite the fact that they were mourning Garrett's death, it had been a glorious couple of days, some of the best days of her life. Glory's home faced the ocean. Although it sat atop a hill, it was a good football field's length from the beach. It's because of the constant threat of high tides, Hank explained. The lay of the land with its jagged cliffs that gave way to the expanse of the turquoise ocean reminded Chloe of a picture she'd seen of Ireland, although it wasn't as green. There was something rugged and primitive about the land that made her feel free from the constraints of life, free to be herself, free to love. They spent the first two days exploring the winding paths along the vistas and playing on the beach where they built sand castles and searched for shells and driftwood. At night, they made a cozy bonfire on the beach where Hank roasted crab legs, fresh corn, and red potatoes that he purchased at a local market. Whereas Chloe had grown up in a rigid world that followed the rules to the letter, regardless of whether or not the rules had merit, Hank's world was limitless with endless possibilities. He talked of teaching her to scuba dive and sail. Then he asked her if she'd been to Paris in the spring. I would love to take you there. Of course, we would go see the Eiffel Tower and all the museums. But the simple pleasures are what I love the most. The open-air street markets, cafes, pastry shops. She loved hearing the enthusiasm in his voice as he talked about Paris and all of the wonderful things they would do. The longer he talked, however, the more she started to suspect that his fixation with Paris was a way of avoiding dealing with Garrett's death. He'd hardly mentioned Garrett the entire time they'd been gone. 
but then she would catch him staring off into the distance. And when he thought she wasn't looking, she would catch glimpses of such a raw, naked pain in his eyes that it hurt to look at him. She understood all too well, and she knew that he would only be able to avoid his grief for so long. It would come crashing around him hard, and he would have to eventually deal with it. But Hank was strong. He would get through it, and she would be right there to help him. For now, it felt good to have a reprieve from the turmoil, and she was enjoying it as immensely as Hank. It was their last evening at Bodega Bay, and they walked hand in hand on the beach, trying to soak in as much of the experience as they could. It was sunset, and the sky was streaked with orange and blue swirls. The steady roar of the crashing waves was therapeutic. The air had a briny taste. The wind felt moist, reminding Chloe of home in South Carolina. Her pulse increased when Hank turned and looked into her eyes. I'm glad you're here. He was so breathtakingly handsome, with his blue-green eyes and strong jaw. She had to pinch herself to make sure she wasn't dreaming. Me too. Tenderly, he brushed a strand of hair from her face. I'm not ready to go home. I wish we could stay here another week, he said wistfully. She smiled. You say that. But judging from those frantic calls you keep getting from me, Vet and Kate, I don't think Martian Terriers will last another week without you. Plus, I've got projects I need to take care of as well. I know. The voice of reason. He gave her a lopsided smile. You're right. Of course. He paused. Chloe. The very timbre of his voice caused her heart to warm. The moment got deliciously slow. I'm falling in love with you. Oh, how she loved hearing those words. It had been such a long time in coming. Somehow, despite all of the heartache and turmoil, they'd found each other. Her eyes misted. I love you too. She could have soared in that moment. A sense of gratitude flooded over her as she remembered how lost she'd been. And now she was here, in this beautiful place, with a wonderful, good man who loved her. Her mother would say that it was an answer to her prayers, and Chloe was beginning to think she might be right. A deviant smile tugged at the corners of his lips. Who would have thought the first day you stumbled into my office, barefooted, with torn stockings, that you would be the one? Her eyes sparked as she quickly rose to the bait. Oh, yeah? Well, you don't even want to know what I thought about you the first day we met. He chuckled. I can only imagine. Jerk and stuffed shirt are a couple of the descriptions that come to mind. The corners of his mouth turned down. Hey, now I wasn't that bad. You certainly were. You hardly gave my portfolio a second glance and then practically threw me out of your office. He winced. Was I that terrible? Yes, you were. Her voice grew soft. But you made up for it a hundredfold since. I'm sorry he said sincerely. I guess I was a jerk. I had such high hopes from seeing your online portfolio that I didn't know what to think when you came in, looking all ragged and dirty. You were impressed with my portfolio? Absolutely. Do you know how many applicants we received for your position? No. A hundred and fifty-five. I conducted twenty phone interviews and then narrowed it down to five applicants, of which you were one. Her eyes grew large. I had no idea. She let that sink in for a minute before continuing. What was it about my portfolio that you liked? Your diversity. I loved how you could switch between ultra-modern and traditional, and yet the space still felt warm and inviting. That takes talent. Rare talent. Thank you. The compliment sent a burst of pleasure running over her. The truth is that I regretted sending you away like that. And when Garrett suggested that I bring you back in, well, I was secretly glad. He gave me the excuse I needed to redeem myself. If you'll remember, I practically hired you on the spot. A smile curved her lips. Yes, I do. I suppose we'll always have Garrett to thank for bringing us together. She regretted saying the words the instant they popped out of her mouth. I'm sorry. I know it's hard for you to talk about him. He nodded, his eyes growing troubled. I want to talk about it, but I'm not sure how, he admitted. When the time's right, you'll know how. He cleared his throat, his Adam's apple working up and down. 
being here with you in this place that I love so much. It feels right. I can't begin to tell you what it means to have you in my life. His voice caught. And at the same time, I'm so torn up inside, I still can't believe he's gone. When I think of going back and how it will be without him. Tears formed in his eyes, and he looked away, unable to continue. She cupped his face. You'll get through it, and I'll be here every step of the way. He gathered her in his arms. That's what keeps me sane, he murmured. His lips came down on hers, and he kissed her until her blood turned to liquid fire that melted her bones. They clung to each other until her phone started buzzing. He lifted an eyebrow. Your mom again? There was a playful edge to his voice. Hey, now don't go bagging on my mom. She's just worried that you'll whisk me away to some remote location and take advantage of me. Don't tempt me, he said, his voice going husky. She shook her head and laughed. Hank had been a perfect gentleman the entire time. They even had separate rooms. She made sure to keep repeating that part to her mother. She retrieved her phone from her pocket and frowned. It's Darby. I better get it. Darby had called twice already, but she'd missed it due to spotty cell service. Hey! Hey, how's your trip? It's going well. How are things there? Is Beastie doing okay? She felt a slight clutch as she waited for the answer. Unfortunately, due to her history, she was paranoid where tragedy was concerned, always waiting for the other shoe to drop. Beastie's fine. Oh, good. Relief pulsed through her. Hey, you know those earrings that Garrett gave you? She tensed. Yeah? Do you mind if I borrow them? She frowned. Darby never asked to borrow anything. Yeah, go ahead. So you don't have them with you? Was it her imagination or did Darby sound anxious? No, of course not. Did Darby really think she would bring those earrings with her on this trip? The last thing she wanted was a reminder that she dated Garrett. Well, they're not here. I didn't bring them with me. They have to be there. Hank noticed the change in her voice and gave her a questioning look. And you're positive you don't have them with you? No, I don't. Darby, what's going on? Is Hank treating you okay? Are you safe? There was a genuine concern in Darby's voice. Of course Hank's treating me okay. And yes, I'm safe, perfectly safe. Well, maybe you should make a point of going places where you're surrounded by other people. Hank was studying her closely. She tried to discern what he was thinking, but his expression was guarded. What's going on? Tension crawled up Chloe's neck. Oh, nothing. I'm just getting paranoid. I'll wait to talk to you about it when you get home. When do you get back? Tomorrow night? Yeah, tomorrow night. But this can't wait. If there's something wrong, then I need to know. You owe it to me to tell me. Please. There was a long pause. Finally, Darby let out a loud huff. You're right. Hang that stupid professor. So I went on my date with Logan. As it turns out, he has absolutely zero interest in dating me. I'm sorry. Chloe stopped. Wait a minute. If he didn't have any interest in dating you, then why did he ask you out? Here's where it gets freaky. He said he asked me out because of my earrings. Your earrings? Yeah, I was wearing the earrings that Garrett gave you. Logan seems to think those earrings were part of a jewelry set that was stolen from a home in Park City. One of the ghost thefts. The blood drained from Chloe's face. What? That's what Logan said anyway. I tried to find the earrings, but they're not here. Are you sure? She let out a dry chuckle. Believe me, I'm sure. I've turned this place upside down looking for them. Anyway, it gets even weirder. Logan says that Hank is a reformed jewel thief. He's been working with this detective, Flores, who believes that Hank's still doing the thefts. I'm sorry, Chloe. I know this all sounds crazy, but I've been doing some research and, well, I hate to say it, but I believe he's right. Chloe? Are you there? Darby's words seemed to be coming from far away. Chloe's mind whirled as she tried to make sense of what she was hearing. Hank touched her arm, his eyes radiating concern. All she could hear was her blood pulsing in her ears. I'm sorry. I can't hear you. 
I can hear you just fine, Chloe. We need to talk about this. I'm going to have to call you back when we have a better connection. Chloe ended the call. For a split second, it went through her mind that she was on a trip, alone with a man who had a dangerous past. Was he telling her the truth? Had he put his life of theft behind him? Then she remembered that Garrett was the one who'd given her the earrings, not Hank. Could Garrett be the thief? Her mind raced trying to connect the dots. Garrett had gone on all those real estate trips. He was a wild card. She looked at Hank and realized that he was speaking to her. What's wrong? He implored. Why was Darby asking about your safety? His jaw was set in a firm, hard line as he searched her face. She was rattled to the bone and knew it was written all over her face. This is about me, isn't it? There was a world of sadness in his words. She nodded. Darby found out about my past. Yes. He rubbed a hand across his jaw, regret simmering in his eyes. I knew it was bound to happen, eventually. I'm sorry you have to live with my stigma. No matter what I do, I can never escape it. What's going to happen when your mom finds out? She's worried about you going off with me as it is. What will she think when she learns the truth? He rubbed his neck, a tortured look in his eyes. I can't put you through this. This is never going to work. Stop it, she demanded, giving him a hard look. You're not putting me through anything. It's my choice to be here, with you. And yes, my mother will most likely blow a pipe when she realizes who you are. But we'll deal with that when it comes. I'm not worried about my mother right now. We've got bigger fish to fry. What do you mean? I think we'd better sit down. Caution settled into his eyes as he nodded. They found a comfortable spot on the sand. Chloe turned to Hank, hating that she had to tell him this, hating what it would do to him. But there was no other option. Whatever it is, you can tell me. He took her hand in his. She took a deep breath and let it out slowly. Garrett gave me a pair of earrings, an expensive pair of earrings, which are very distinctive. They have these red jewels at the top that are encircled with bright diamonds. Large milky white pearls hang underneath. Anyway, Darby wore them to class and her professor recognized them as a part of a set that was stolen from a doctor's wife in Park City. Hank's face went a shade darker and he swore under his breath. Is it possible? Um, have you ever considered that it might have been Garrett who was the thief? It was about that time that she realized that Hank didn't look surprised by anything she was telling him. He was frustrated and mad, but not surprised. How long have you known? I've suspected it for some time. I'm sorry, he nodded. She thought of something. But you didn't say anything to Detective Flores. With a single word, you could have removed yourself from suspicion. And to implicate my brother. I see. A haunted look came over him. Do you think I'm a terrible person for not coming forward? No, I think you're doing what a good brother would do under the circumstance. The conversation lapsed into silence. I'm afraid there's more. She winced at the pain emanating from his eyes and felt a burst of anger over the entire situation. It wasn't enough for him to have to deal with Garrett's death. Now he had to also deal with the fact that Garrett had become the very thing he'd been trying to distance himself from. The whole thing reminded her of Dan and how she'd had to deal with the double whammy of his death and betrayal. What else? He muttered darkly. Darby's professor has been working with Detective Flores. Hank let out a humorless laugh. <laughs> this just keeps getting better and better. Darby tried to show the earrings to her professor, but she couldn't find them. She searched the house, and they're nowhere to be found. His eyes met hers. Do you have them with you? Goodness, no. I never wanted the things to begin with. The earrings were Garrett's poor attempt to try and buy my affections. Then where are they? I don't know. He shook his head. I'm sorry you got caught up in this sordid mess. I can't believe that Garrett was stupid enough to give you a pair of earrings from a heist. He must have really been desperate to win you over. She gave him a knowing look. Yes, he was. He was smart enough to realize that I was falling for someone else. He gave her a faint smile. What are you going to do about this? I don't know. She nestled into the curve of his shoulder, and he put an arm around her, pulling her close. They turned their attention to the ocean.
letting their minds get lost in the commotion of the waves crashing aimlessly into the shore. Chloe gave the cottage one last look. She was leaning against Hank's SUV, and he was putting the last suitcase in the back. This was such an amazing place. I'm sad to leave it, too. We'll be back soon. They looked up to see an elderly man waving and walking toward them. He was tall and thin with silver hair that was thinning on top. Bradford, Hank said warmly. How are you? Well, considering my age, I guess I'm doing fairly well. The man smiled at Chloe. And who might this lovely young lady be? This is Chloe. Chloe, this is Bradford Polk. He lives in the house next door. Bradford gave her a warm shake. It's nice to meet you. He looked at Hank. How's Glory doing? I haven't seen her in ages. Hank smiled. As feisty as ever. She's had a little scare recently. A mini stroke. Bradford's face fell. I'm sorry to hear that. The doctors expect her to make a full recovery. I'm so glad. It sure is good to see you. This is a record, I believe. What do you mean? Well, Garrett was here last week, and now you're here. Hank jerked like he'd been punched. Chloe was about to tell the man that Garrett was dead, but the warning look on Hank's face stopped her. When did you see Garrett? Hank asked carefully. Bradford scratched his head. Let's see. It was the first of last week. No, it was the middle of the week. Wednesday. I believe, yeah, it was Wednesday. I remember because I had a repairman to come out and take a look at my heating and air unit. Garrett arrived later that night. Are you sure it was Wednesday? Yeah, I'm sure. Suspicion filled his eyes. Why? Did you talk to him? No, I didn't get the chance. He got here in the evening just before dusk. I was out watering my plants when I saw him. Hank gave Bradford a firm look. And you're sure it was Garrett? Yeah, of course it was Garrett. He looked back and forth between Hank and Chloe. What's going on here? How long did he stay? A couple of days. Is there something going on here that I should know about? Hank forced a smile. No, I just didn't realize he'd come into town. Bradford looked unconvinced. It's good to see you, Hank said curtly. We've got a long drive ahead of us and need to be getting on the road. Okay, well, it was good to see you. He gave them a parting wave before shuffling off. When they got into the SUV, Hank turned to Chloe. What do you make of that? Do you think Bradford was confused? She felt cold and hot at the same time. A shaking started in her knees and worked its way up to her hands. She clenched them into fists in her lap. Suddenly it all made sense. No, I don't think Bradford was confused. But how can you be sure? Tears pooled in her eyes. Because I saw Garrett too. He rocked back, stunned, then he frowned. What? The night before we came here, I saw him at my window. Shock registered on his face, followed by anger. Then why didn't you say anything? She let out a humorless laugh. Because I thought I'd dreamt the whole thing. He shook his head, speechless. So she continued. I felt something touch my lips, and it woke me up. I sat up in bed and looked around and I saw Beastie sitting on the chair. Beastie? He said dubiously. My cat. Oh. Anyway, Beastie was looking at something in the window. I followed his gaze and saw Garrett. I let out a scream and Darby came running. She and I both thought I was having a nightmare. He rubbed his neck. Do you often have such vivid nightmares that you have a hard time distinguishing between dreams and reality? She felt her throat close and she swallowed hard. The familiar fear clutched her in a vice grip as she slowly nodded. Compassion came into his eyes. I'm sorry. It's because of Dan, isn't it? Yes. He put his fist into his mouth. But this was no dream. You said you felt something. Heat rose up her neck. Yes. It felt like a kiss. Rage twisted over him. He kissed you? Yes, I believe he must have. That's what woke me up. Why was he in your room? The answer came to them at once as they blurted it out. The, the earrings. earrings. 
Of course, Garrett needs the money. He got in over his head with Sam and his goons, so he faked his death. He'll sell the earrings for cash, cash that he needs to disappear. What do you mean? Was Garrett in trouble? Garrett was, is, a compulsive gambler. He racked up a debt he couldn't repay. Death was the convenient way out. He finished bitterly. The whole thing seems surreal, like something out of a movie. Chloe didn't know what to think. I need to see your room. What? Your room, I need to see it. Was there anything else Garrett might have wanted? She thought for a minute. I don't think so. Then it came to her like a lightning bolt. Yes, there was one thing, a chair. Do you remember that hideous chair that Garrett made Glory keep in her house? He scowled. I hate that chair. Well, I have it. You do? Yes, Glory gave it to me. I've been storing it in my room until I can have it recovered. The night I saw Garrett, I left my laptop on the chair when I went to sleep. When I awoke, Beastie was on the chair and the laptop was on the desk. Her eyes grew large. Do you think Garrett was hiding something in the chair? Hank's eyes narrowed. Yes, I'd be willing to bet on it. Chapter 26 Darby! Hello? We're back! Chloe dumped her purse and bags on the floor and motioned to Hank. Come on in. He followed behind her suitcase in hand. He placed it next to her bags. Darby's not here. Beastie sauntered into the room and froze mid-tracks when he saw Hank. He gave him a cautious look. Hey, Beastie, come here, Chloe cooed. For a second, he looked like he might come to her side, but then he lifted his nose in the air and walked past her. He jumped onto the sofa and curled up, not taking his eyes off Hank. So that's Beastie. Yeah, he's not the most affectionate cat on the planet. She stuck her tongue out at Beastie, but he just kept sitting there staring at Hank. She waved her arm. This way. When they entered the room, Hank went directly to the chair. He felt along the curved back and in the crevice between the back and the seat cushion. Then he turned it around, inspecting the back. A moment later, he'd found the hidden compartment. It was located on the side where the seams of the fabric came together. He sat on Chloe's bed, and she sat beside him. She could tell from the hard look on his face that he was doing some deep thinking. What now? He blew out a breath. Garrett is still out there somewhere. I'm assuming he stashed the jewels or money, maybe even fake IDs. Sam and his guys are determined to collect his debt. They believe Garrett is dead and therefore are coming after me. Fear seized her. What? You never told me that. He rubbed his neck. I didn't want to burden you with it. His voice sounded flat and devoid of emotion. Burden me? Her voice rose. Your life is in danger, and you didn't want to burden me. Calm down. Freaking out isn't going to help. You've got to go to the police. She grabbed his arm. Hank, you've got to. You've got to tell them about Garrett and Sam. She couldn't stand the thought of anything happening to Hank. Please. Her eyes misted as they locked with his. Do it for me. You're right, he finally said. I've thought about this a hundred different ways, and going to the police is the only answer. I'll call Detective Flores on my way home. This made her feel a little better. It's going to be okay. I know, he said. But she could tell from the look in his eyes that he didn't believe her. Chloe was unpacking her suitcase when she heard the doorbell. She paused, wondering if Hank had returned for some reason. She put down her clothes and went to answer it. She looked through the peephole and saw a pizza delivery guy standing outside. Had Darby ordered pizza? If so... Why was she not here to get it? Half of the things that Darby did made no sense. She let out a frustrated huff. She would have to pay for it and hope that Darby reimbursed her. Who was she kidding? She would never see the money. Well, at least she would have something to eat for dinner. She opened the door. Hey! I have a large pizza with extra cheese, the man said in a bored tone. Sure. What's the total? Fourteen seventy-five. Okay, hold on. I'll get my wallet. She took two steps toward her purse when she heard the door close. She whirled around. The burly man had dropped the pizza box to the floor and was coming toward her. His bland expression had become macabre, and a feverish light came into his eyes. Terror overtook her, and she had the sensation of not being able to move. She let out a scream when he grabbed her. Beastie jumped into action and clawed him on the arm. He let out a yelp and threw Beastie across the room. 
tears sprang to Chloe's eyes as she fought like mad to get away. Help! Help! Arms of steel encircled her. She felt a cloth being pressed to her nose. Then came a rush of dizziness before everything went black. Hank sat at the kitchen counter, turning Detective Flores's card over and over in his hands. Once he made the call, there would be no going back. His emotions vacillated between heady relief that Garrett was still alive and searing anger that he'd put him through this. Finally, he picked up his phone and punched in the number. Hello? Jared Flores here? Jared, this is Hank Singleton. There was a momentary hesitation. Uh, yes, Hank. Logan McDonald said you might be calling me. I take it you've heard about the earrings. There was a hint of triumph in his voice. Hank cut to the heart of the matter. We need to talk. Twenty minutes later, Hank's doorbell rang. His blood ran cold when he saw Sam standing there. All evening long, he'd been thinking about what he would do if he got a hold of Sam, and here he was. He stepped back from the door and went to retrieve the pistol he kept in a hidden safe in the bedroom. He tucked it into the back of his pants. The doorbell was ringing insistently when he returned. He opened the door. A friendly smile spread over Sam's face as he leaned against the doorframe, his thumbs in his pocket. Hey, Hank, it's been a while. Cut the crap, Sam. What do you want? His smile turned to a sneer as Sam stepped inside and closed the door behind him. Like I said in the note, Garrett owes my boss a great deal of money. He motioned. May I sit down? He squared his jaw. No. Sam chuckled and began absently stroking his goatee. Always the big man on campus, huh, Hank? His eyes went hard. Garrett has left a debt, and now that debt falls to you. He pulled his pants up higher on his waist. Nothing personal, man, just business. You know how this works. He began grinding his fist into his hand. Don't make me do this the hard way. A hard amusement glittered in Hank's eyes. Is this where he was supposed to throw up his hands and beg for mercy? Wasn't going to happen. How much does he owe? A lifetime of memories flooded him as he stood there eyeing this snake of a man. There was the Sam from his youth, the man he'd naively trusted, the man that started him on his life of crime, the man that had betrayed him with V while he was incarcerated, the man that drove Garrett to fake his death. 350K. Hank laughed out loud. <laughs> right. Even Garrett's not stupid enough to run up that high of a debt. How much is it really? Sam's face fell a notch. 350K, honest. And I'm just supposed to take your word for it. He shook his head in disgust. You're a lousy liar. We're friends, man. Remember the good old days. His voice became as smooth as butter. Let's get one thing straight. You and I might be a lot of things, but one thing we're not is friends. Okay, it's like this. Garrett owes 200K. I swear, on my life, that's the amount. And why is this my problem? He's your brother. Yeah, well, my brother was an imbecile to ever get involved with you. He clenched his fists. Let me tell you how this is going to go. You're going to walk out that door and never come back. And if you're lucky, I might just let you live to see the light of day. Sam shook his head, his eyes taking on the cold, flat look of the predator he was. I just don't see that happening. Hank's senses went on full alert, and he could tell the situation was approaching the critical point. Before Sam could make the first move, he pulled the pistol and pointed it at his chest. What part of this do you not understand? Sam held up his hands. Easy, man. I said get out. All right, I'll go, but first there's something you need to see. Warning bells went off in his head. Something was wrong here. Something was very wrong. He was the one holding the gun. Then why was Sam looking so confident? When Sam reached into his pocket, he jerked back the slide on the top of the barrel to load the bullet into the chamber. Whoa, man, easy. I'm just getting my phone out of my pocket, see? His voice was deadly calm, sending chills running down Hank's spine. He held his phone. I just want to show you a video. It took Hank a second to process what he was seeing, and then the breath left his lungs. He staggered. It was Chloe, and she was in a room, tied to a chair and gagged. Her cheeks were wet with tears, and the sheer look of terror on her face turned his stomach. 
I'll kill you for this. His instincts took over, and he stepped forward in panther-like movements and pressed the gun to Sam's temple. Where is she? He yelled, a hot rage blanketing him, clouding out all reason. He wanted to rip out Sam's throat. If you kill me, she dies. Hank's eyes went wild as he considered the options. Listen to me. There's only one way out of this. You've got to do a job. A job? Have you lost your mind? I've told you that part of my life is over. You want the girl to live. You'll do the job. If my guy Bill doesn't hear from me in the next five minutes, then he'll kill her. Sam had a satisfied smirk on his face. Your decision. A minute later, Hank lowered the gun. What do you want me to do? The blow seemed to come out of nowhere as Sam punched him in the face, knocking him to the floor, sending the pistol flying out of his hand. Don't you ever point a gun at me again. Before Hank could rise to his feet, Sam kicked him viciously in the stomach, knocking him back to the floor. And in case you have any thoughts about starting things up again with V, this is your one and only warning. Stay away from her. Darby was chewing on her fingernails and pacing back and forth across the living room floor, trying to decide what she should do about Chloe. She'd not had any contact with her since that phone call where they'd had a bad connection. Chloe was supposed to have gotten home the previous night, and Darby had not heard a word from her. She'd called her repeatedly, but it kept going to voicemail. She glanced at Beastie, who was sitting on the sofa watching her intently. It was crazy, but she kept getting the feeling that he was trying to tell her something. He let out a loud meow. She frowned. I miss her, too. Her anxiety rose to new heights when she'd gotten the call from Naomi, Chloe's mom. She'd not heard from Chloe either and was starting to get concerned. How well do you know her boss? Naomi had asked. The question burned through her like acid. A part of her was tempted to blurt out all she knew. But it would only add to Naomi's stress. There was nothing the poor woman could do at this point, seeing as how she was on the other side of the country. Think, Darby, think. Not knowing what else to do, she got down on her knees and said a prayer on Chloe's behalf. She'd hoped that it would help her feel better, but it did just the opposite. A cold feeling of dread came over her, and she had the strong feeling that Chloe was in danger. Her heart began to pound as she tried Chloe's phone once more. When it went to voicemail, she knew what she needed to do. She punched in 911. Hello? I'd like to report a missing person. Hank jabbed the doorbell and waited. When no one answered, he pushed it again. Finally, after the fourth time, the door opened. A glower came over Lila's face as she straightened to her full height and pulled her sweater tighter around her ample stomach. What are you doing here? Hi, Lila. It's been a long time. Not long enough. She lifted her chin. I need to talk to Pete. You're not welcome here. Her eyes went hard. You've done enough damage to my family to last a lifetime. She tried to slam the door in his face, but he wedged his foot in. If you don't leave this instant, I'll call the police, she cried. It's about Chloe. She's in trouble. She reopened the door. What have you done? Sam Loudon has her. His voice caught. He'll kill her if I don't do a job for him. Lila's face crumbled into itself like a cake too dense to hold its weight. Her lower lip began to quiver. I warned her to stay away from you, she said hoarsely. I told her she was in danger. A furrow look settled into her eyes, and she seemed to have forgotten that Hank was standing there. I saw it, she gasped. The cold fingers of death were gripping the life out of her. She stared through him. It was horrible. Dread pricked over him, but he pushed it aside. He couldn't let himself get caught up in Lila's madness. He had to stay focused. That was Chloe's only hope. He touched her arm. Lila, please. There's no time. I have to talk to Pete. This seemed to jerk her back to reality. Tears simmered in her eyes. This is all because of you. I know, he said flatly. You're right. It is because of me, and now I have to fix it. Like you fix things with Guy? She bit her lower lip. You promised me you would look after him. I trusted you. I told Pete that you were a good guy and that you would look after Guy. And now he's dead. 
I can't change the past. He said quietly, would the hurt ever end? All I can say is that I'm sorry. He gave her a probing look. There's still time to save Chloe, please. She nodded and stepped back so he could enter. Pete's in the study, she motioned with her head. You know the way. Pete was sitting behind his desk intently inspecting a diamond through a lap. He jumped when Hank knocked. Hank could tell from the way Pete cleared his throat and pushed his glasses up on his nose that his presence had jolted him. Always the consummate professional, Pete stood and extended his hand. It's been a long time. It's good to see you. There was a note of sincerity in his voice. It's good to see you, too, Hank said, and he meant it. Pete was one of the few people that he actually missed having an association with. Despite his dealings in the underground world of theft, Pete was one of those rare people who still believed that his word was his bond. May I sit down? Of course. Pete returned to his seat. To what do I owe this pleasure? He skipped the preliminaries and got down to business. Sam Loudon has Chloe. He wants me to do a job, otherwise he'll kill her. Pete made a steeple with his fingers and brought them to his chin. I see. He looked thoughtful. What kind of job? This coming Saturday and Sunday, Jewelry House Finkel & Company is hosting a private gala at the St. Regis Hotel in Deer Valley. There will be an exhibition of rare jewelry, including a pink diamond that's rumored to rival the Rose of Dubai. The Rose of Dubai, huh? Do you believe that? He spread his hands. At this point, what I believe or don't believe doesn't matter. All I care about is saving Chloe. Sam obviously believes it, or he wouldn't have gone to such great lengths to try and get me to do the job. Surely you're not thinking of doing the heist there. With that level of security in a high-profile area, I'm not sure that even you could pull that off. No, thankfully, it's not there. On Friday evening, Gerald Gunther is hosting a pre-gala reception in his home, where he'll be showing a preview of the jewels, including the pink diamond. Gunther is storing the jewels in a safe that night until an armored truck picks them up and takes them to the hotel the following morning. You're talking about the Gerald Gunther, the venture capitalist and real estate tycoon turned philanthropist, that Gerald Gunther. Uh-huh, the very one. Pete leaned forward and Hank could tell he'd captured his attention. Tell me more about it. How familiar are you with Gunther's estate? I know it's located in Holiday. He rubbed his chin. Let's see if my memory serves me correctly. The mansion is around 26,000 square feet and located on about 10 acres. A grin formed on Hank's lips. He suspected that he wasn't telling Pete anything he didn't already know. Pete was not only one of the sharpest guys he knew, but also the most well-connected. His success as a fence hinged on his ability to keep his ear to the ground, scouting out the best tips. So, you know the place? Yeah, a little. He switched gears. So how are you going to do it? The security in place is almost as tight as St. Regis Hotel, and Gunther has a state-of-the-art safe, which is why he feels comfortable holding something of that value until the following morning. I would suspect that he's also hiring a security team to protect the jewels. Yes, a team of six. Two to patrol the grounds, two roaming the floors, and two guarding the safe. Pete looked impressed. You've done your homework. Hank scowled. No, this is all according to Sam, which is why I need your help. I don't trust him. Pete detested Sam almost as much as he did. Pete looked Hank in the eye. Are you sure you want to open up this door? You fought so hard to close it. You own a respectable business. Put this all behind you. A fierce look came into his eyes. Sam has the woman I love. You could always call the police. Hank let out a harsh laugh. She'd be dead in five minutes after I place the call. You know how Sam operates. This is the only option. Pete began drumming his fingers on the desk. Okay, I'll help you. What do you need? Blueprints to the mansion, and I need to know what type of security system they're using. The company that installed it, also a rundown of the safe, would be nice. A Mesa 382 OE, or so I've heard. Hank thought for a minute. Okay. I can handle that. How are you going to get into the mansion? That's the beauty of it. I don't have to. Sam is getting me in through the catering group. I'll go down to the basement and hide there until the party is over. I'll come out in the dead of night. 
and make my way to the safe. What about the security guards? A trank gun. The cameras? I'll need help with that. Someone who can hack into the security network and be my eyes and ears. Once we learn where the fiber optic cables are installed, we can gain access to the system from there. The person won't even need to go into the mansion. He looked at Pete. What do you hear from Asa Wang these days? Half Chinese, half Hawaiian, and about his same age, Asa was a computer whiz and an expert at creating unique gadgets that could help Hank navigate around almost any obstacle a job presented. In the old days, Asa was practically his right-hand man. Had he gone with his gut instinct and used Asa on the jewelry store heist, Guy wouldn't have gotten killed. Brooding on the past wasn't going to help the present. He pushed his thoughts back to Asa. They had known each other since high school and grew up in the same neighborhood. Several times he'd been tempted to look him up to see how he was doing, but he wanted to put as much distance between himself and his past as possible. Oh, he's still around working his magic. Can you put me in touch with him? Yep, that shouldn't be a problem. Asa's always looking to make an extra buck. From what I hear, Asa was in pretty tight with Garrett, helping him on several occasions. He paused. I just assumed that Sam would have set you up with a team. Hank's jaw tightened. Oh, he tried. But that was my one condition. I do this my way, with people I can trust. Pete was impressed. Spoken like a man who truly knows Sam. That's why you're the best. You don't leave things to chance. He gave Hank a speculative look. How's your brother doing? Hank's eyes widened. You haven't heard? Pete peered over his glasses. Which version? The version where Garrett was killed or the version where he's still alive? Hank let out a half laugh. You know, I figured as much. He spread his hands. Well, I didn't know for sure. Until now. Do you know where he is? The very air seemed to be holding its breath as Hank waited for the answer. Pete began rubbing his hands back and forth over his chin. I don't know. Disappointment pelted over him. But I'm sure Asa does. From what I hear, Garrett owed a truckload of money to Sam and couldn't pay it. Faking a death and disappearing isn't cheap, if you get my drift. I'm sure Garrett's trying to find a way to rake together some fast cash, and that most assuredly involves Asa. Garrett doesn't have your skills. Had he not had Asa backing him up, he never would have been able to pull off a tenth of those robberies I suspect he's responsible for. The wheels began to turn and a new light came into Hank's eyes. I need you to get in touch with Garrett. Tell him that Chloe's been kidnapped and that I need him to find out where she's being held. I need him to rescue her while I'm doing the job. Sam will be so focused on the heist and keeping tabs on me that he won't see Garrett coming. He clenched his jaw. I can't count on Sam to do the honorable thing and let her go. I have to prepare for every contingency. Pete looked thoughtful. You know, that just might work. I like the way you think. His eyes met his. I know you're being forced to do this, but I have to tell you it's good to have you back. Hank acknowledged the compliment with a nod. The corner of Pete's lips turned down in a frown. You know, Sam's not going to let you walk away, don't you? He never had any use for Garrett. Garrett was simply a means to an end. It was always you he was after. You're the genius. A man with your skills is worth his weight in gold. He chuckled. Or diamonds. I suspect that Sam orchestrated this whole thing just to get you stealing for him again. A dark look came into Hank's eyes. Like I said, I have to prepare for every contingency. Chapter 27 Chloe's head was pounding and her throat was so parched she could hardly swallow. Every inch of her body felt like it had been pounded with a sledgehammer and the rope was cutting into her swollen wrists. It took a superhuman effort to lift her head, and she groaned in the process. She was so hungry her stomach was cramping. This was followed by bouts of nausea. She was drifting in and out of consciousness, losing track of time. Had it been two or three days, she couldn't remember. The room was dark, and there was a hollow feel to it, like it was some type of warehouse. She'd barely been given enough water to survive, and a single slice of bread, which she devoured in a handful of bites. It did little to assuage her hunger. At first, she'd been so worried that the man was going to kill her that she could hardly think of anything else. After all, he wasn't trying to hide his face from her. She could identify him. She was still worried that she would die. 
but the immediate needs of her body were starting to consume her thoughts. Then she started to drift. Memories floated before her like wispy clouds that were subtly there yet too elusive to touch. She saw herself standing in front of the mirror and looking at the wedding dress. She'd been so concerned about that stupid dress and how terrible it looked on her, when all along the charmed life she had planned out was an illusion. Dan would die, and then she would learn the truth about him. It almost felt like those events had been another life. So much had happened since then. She felt the uncertainty of moving to a new place and how she'd almost lost her sanity that stormy evening in that lonely rest stop. Dan had come to her then. Would he come to her now? She didn't want Dan to come. All she wanted was Hank. Hank with those fathomless eyes. He could be so serious and then would give her that crooked smile that melted her heart. The feeling of security that flooded over her when he took her hand in his. The electricity that ran through her veins when his lips took hers. Then she thought of her parents. Her stubborn, feisty mom that still treated her like she was eight. And her patient, soft-spoken dad. Did they even realize she was missing? Where was Hank? What did this guy want with her? Why was he doing this? She felt like her heart was bleeding with anguish. She was completely alone, and no one was coming to help. A prayer issued forth almost before her conscious mind even realized it was there. Please, Heavenly Father, help me, please. She kept repeating the prayer over and over in her mind like a mantra, until her head became too heavy to hold up. She closed her eyes and let her chin fall to her chest. Then she was sleeping. A ball of fire was raging above her head. Make it stop, her mind screamed. Chloe squinted her eyes and averted her face in an attempt to block it out. A minute or so later, her eyes mercifully adjusted, and she realized that the fire was in actuality a light coming from a single bulb that hung from the center of the ceiling. It had only looked bright because she'd been in the darkness so long. Her mind registered that something had brushed against her arm. She forced herself to concentrate and saw her captor looming over her. He was big and muscular, with a square face and hair so short he almost looked bald. Drink this, he ordered, putting a glass to her lips. She took a gulp of the water, but then sputtered as part of it dribbled down her chin. Greedily, she tried to drink more, but he pulled the glass away. More, she croaked through cracked lips. He only laughed and then placed the water on the table. He leaned in so that he was eye level with her. Do you want some more water? Yes, please. His blocky hand caressed her cheek. I'll give you water if you'll give me what I want. His voice went husky with desire as his eyes flickered over her. A look of horror twisted over her face. You might like it. He let out a raucous laugh. Now be a good girl and I might even give you something to eat afterwards. He leaned in to kiss her and she spit in his face. Get away from me! She craned her neck in an effort to avoid contact with him. A barbaric look came into his eyes as he slapped her hard across the face. Pain blistered over her. She tasted blood and then felt it oozing from her lip. When he came to her again, she started screaming and writhing against the ropes. He grabbed her arms. Shut up, he ordered. She had the impression that she was staring into the face of the devil as he glowered at her. A wicked light shining in his eyes. She went wild, losing all reason. Then in a blink of an eye, everything stopped. She heard a familiar voice. Move away from her. She looked up and squinted, trying to focus. Garrett? Is that really you? Yes, it's me. The large man sneered. Well, well, look who's back from the dead. Hands up. He turned to face Garrett. What are you going to do, shoot me? You don't have the guts. A look of surprise flittered over the man's horrible face as Garrett pulled the trigger. He fell to the floor with a loud thud. Chloe began laughing and crying at the same time. <laughs> you shot him. Tranked him, actually. Garrett, you really are here, or am I seeing a ghost? Her words were slurred, and her head was loose and dangling like a rag doll. I thought you died and that you were coming back to haunt me. I wanted to see Hank, but at least it's not Dan. He rushed to her side. Let's get you out of here. You're dehydrated and delirious. He cut the ropes and helped her to her feet. Come on, we have to hurry. He put an arm around her, half carrying her as they made their way out of the room. 
They were almost to the outside door of the warehouse when a shot from behind caused them to freeze. Did you shoot someone else? Chloe said dreamily, letting her head fall against Garrett's chest. They turned. So, you're alive and well. Didn't see that one coming. Well, it was a lovely funeral. It registered in Chloe's mind that it was a female who'd spoken, and then she heard the clicking of heels against the concrete floor. Oh, V, you scared me. Garrett let out a nervous laugh. I thought you were Sam. Look, there's no time to explain everything right now. I've got to get Chloe out of here. She pointed the gun at Garrett. You're not going anywhere. Garrett swore. I don't have time for your games. A hard look came over her. I said, you're not going anywhere. She leveled the gun at his chest. If Sam or his boss comes back and catches me here, then I'm a goner for sure. I told you, there's no time. Let's go, he said to Chloe. If you take one more step, I'll put a bullet in you. Her sharp voice echoed through the empty space. Chloe lifted her head. You again, she smirked. You're that horrible woman who thinks she's God's gift to the universe. Well, I've got news for you. Hank doesn't love you anymore. Let it go and move on. Fury twisted over V's face, and she aimed the gun at Chloe. One shot is all it would take to shut you up forever. Her voice had the controlled hiss of a viper ready to go for the jugular. Easy now, Garrett said, keeping his eyes trained on V. Chloe's half out of her mind. The poor girl's been tied up and starved for days. She doesn't know what she's saying. His voice grew persuasive. This isn't you, V. Let us go, for old time's sake. Sam doesn't have to know. Don't let him drag you into his sordid world. Amusement lit her dark eyes as she laughed. Garrett's eyes narrowed. What's so funny? His face fell when he caught sight of Sam walking toward them. Oh, no. He groaned. Sam stepped up to V and put his arm around her. Hello, love. It looks like you have things under control here. He looked at Garrett, surprise flickering over his face. Well, well, he uttered. Back from the dead, I see. This is an interesting turn of events. She handed him the gun. Garrett is worried you might corrupt me. Sam started laughing. Me corrupt you, right. Is everything set for tonight? Yep. Hank assures me that everything is ready to go. Did you make him go over the details with you? I want nothing left to chance, she snapped. Yes, I did everything you asked. Any signs of police involvement? None that I can see. A look of utter astonishment came over Garrett. He looked at V. You're the boss. The words came out garbled like he was being choked. You've been the one running the show the entire time. A smug look came over her face. I guess there actually is a brain behind that pretty face. Although, judging by how you act most of the time, I'd wager that it's no bigger than the size of a pea. She motioned to Sam. Take them back in the room and tie them up. No. Chloe groaned. We can't go back there. Garrett tightened his grip on Chloe's waist. Sam pointed the gun at them. Let's go, he barked. Garrett planted his feet on the floor. Not so fast. V raised an eyebrow. In case you haven't noticed, you're in no position to be making demands. This was never about me, was it? This was about Hank. His voice grew reflective. There are plenty of people who could have done this job. But you manipulated Hank into doing it because you're still in love with him. That's what this whole charade is about. When he saw her face drain, he knew the comment had hit its mark. Then he saw the livid expression on Sam's face. He flashed an apologetic smile. Sorry, Sammy. The truth hurts. She's using you the same way she used me. He saw the blessed doubt creep into Sam's eyes. Shut up, she ordered. Looking at Sam, don't believe a word he says. How does it feel to be the second choice? He taunted. To know that she's dreaming of a Hank while you're holding her in your arms. I'm going to enjoy watching you bleed, Sam barked, his face turning deep purple. Oh, you can kill us now. He locked eyes with V. But I know my brother well enough to know that there's no way he's going to proceed with this job until he's certain that Chloe's alive. In fact, I'm supposed to call him and let him know I have Chloe before he meets Sam at the exchange. He shot V a challenging look. 
That's how you planned it, right? The jewels for Chloe? Yeah, that's how we planned it, but that certainly won't stop me from killing you, Sam said savagely. V caught his arm. Stop, you imbecile. Can't you see he's baiting us? She gave Garrett a malevolent look. I will kill you eventually. But I'll do it on my own terms, after you've outlived your usefulness. She turned to Sam. Get them out of my sight. Oh, and search him. I'm sure he has a phone or some other tracking device. Garrett and Chloe were sitting on the floor side by side with their backs resting against the wall. Bill kept coming in to check on them about every hour. The last two times he came into the room, Garrett pretended to be asleep. Assuming he was no threat, Bill left the door to the room partially open. Garrett could hear portions of the conversation that was taking place between him and V. From what he could gather, phase one of the job was complete. Hank had gotten into the mansion with the catering group and was hiding in the basement. He heard his own name and then realized that V said something about forcing him to make the call to Hank once the job was done. Hank doesn't realize that we have Garrett, she said. We'll make Garrett call him and tell him that he's rescued Chloe. Hank will go to the exchange believing that everything is going in his favor. He'll hand over the jewels, and then I'll meet Sam at the rendezvous point to retrieve them. If Hank believes that Garrett rescued Chloe, then why would he go through with the exchange? Because, you idiot, I've stacked the deck. Chloe's not the only person Hank cares about. Trust me, I know him. He'll show up. You know what to do here. We can't afford to leave any loose ends. Apprehension trickled down Garrett's spine. They were planning on killing him and Chloe. He'd suspected as much. But it chilled him to the bone to hear it spoken out loud. He cocked his head, listening, but they moved farther away from the door. He strained his ear to get the rest. Car and Pineview were the only words he could catch. Car and Pineview. Car and Pineview. He kept mentally repeating the words, trying to figure out what they meant. Was Pineview a place? Was Bill taking them in a car? That had to be it. Pineview. The name sounded familiar. Where had he heard it before? Chloe shifted, and he realized she was waking up. When she opened her eyes, he gave her an encouraging smile. Hey, beautiful. Hey. She rolled her eyes. I know that's a lie because I look like death warmed over. Okay, maybe you don't look so beautiful right now, but you certainly look better than you did a few hours ago. She gave him an appreciative look. Yeah, thanks to you. I was so thirsty I couldn't think straight. He chuckled. Well, you certainly gave V a good tongue lashing, I'll tell you that. Chloe winced. Yeah, probably not one of my finest moments considering she was pointing a gun at us. Well. You've got guts. I'll give you that. Tears wet her eyes. If you hadn't talked Bill into giving me some water, her voice broke. Thanks. It was the least I could do. A smile flittered over his lips. I just wish I could have rescued you like I promised Hank I would. Is Hank okay? A look of such utter longing came over her face that it caused a dart of jealousy to stab him. When he talked to Hank, he was nearly insane with worry over Chloe. She was faced with death and all she could think about was Hank. And then it hit him. Hank and Chloe really loved each other. A sense of loss came over him. He'd never felt a love that deep. He'd spent his entire life seeking out every thrill and physical enticement known to man. The best food, the prettiest women, the next score. No matter how hard he tried, his appetite could never be satisfied. Is Hank okay? She repeated, worry sounding in her voice. He's hanging in there. Her eyes searched his. They're forcing him to do a job, aren't they? Yeah, I'm afraid this thing was one big setup. V wanted him all along. Indignation smoldered in her eyes. She's trying to get her claws into Hank. There was no sense in sugarcoating it. Yeah, that's exactly what she's trying to do. He had the urgent feeling that their time was running out. He needed to clear the air before Bill returned. He cleared his throat. I guess you were surprised to see me alive. No, I wasn't. Really? Not what he expected to hear. Hank and I went to Bodega Bay. The man who lives next to Glory's house said he saw you recently. His face fell. He took you to Bodega Bay? Wow, Hank really does love you. He said quietly. V 
Before she could reply, he switched gears. Bradford's a nosy old geezer. I should have known he'd say something. And let's not forget the incident where you were standing outside my window. He looked sheepish. Oh, you saw me. I wasn't sure. She cut her eyes at him. I saw you all right. You nearly scared me to death. Her tone became accusing. You came back for the earrings, didn't you? He could feel heat rising up his neck. Yeah, I'm sorry. I needed the money. His apology sounded lame, even to him. He could only imagine what Chloe must think about him. And then you saw the chair. His jaw dropped slightly. You know about that. She let out a dry chuckle. Hank figured it out. Poor Glory. She hates that chair, but was so worried about getting rid of it because she didn't want to hurt your feelings. You know, you caused Glory and Hank a lot of pain. They were devastated by your so-called death. The words cut to the quick. I know. I just didn't know what else to do. I was in so deep that I couldn't get out. She gave him a harsh look. Well, you certainly took the convenient way out. He let out a breath. You're right. I've been a jerk. I've hurt a lot of people. His eyes burned with regret, including you. I'm sorry I pressed you so hard about having a relationship. I saw you, wanted you, I went after you. I'm not some piece of property, she said hotly. You wouldn't take no for an answer and it scared me. I know that, and I'm sorry. Sometimes I just bulldoze my way through life expecting everyone to get in line with what I want. He hoped she would recognize the sincerity of his words. I really am truly sorry. She studied him carefully and then nodded. The next part was hard to admit, but he needed to get it out in the open. It still stings to see you with Hank. He paused. But I see now that the two of you are good together. She looked doubtful. I mean it. I want you to be happy. Her face went soft. Thank you. Tears glistened in her eyes. I'm in love with him. Yeah, yeah. Don't rub it in. He said, forcing his tone to sound playful. No need to keep hammering nails in my coffin. She smiled. I'm sure you'll recover the second some babe comes along and catches your eye. Hey, now that's hitting below the belt. You know, you really are like the brother I never had. He winced. Just what every guy wants to hear from the girl who dumped him for his older brother. His stomach growled loudly. Sorry, I'm so hungry my stomach is starting to eat my spleen. She just shook her head. I was that hungry too at first, but now all I want is another drink of water. Water. Why was that ringing a bell? Car. Pineview. Water! His blood quickened. Were they planning on taking them to Pineview Reservoir up near Ogden? It would be the perfect spot to dump a body or two. Chills ran down his spine. He had to act fast. This is going to sound strange, but I need you to turn and angle yourself so that I can have access to your back pocket. Wariness crept into her eyes. What? I slipped a knife into your pocket earlier, he whispered. I've been working on loosening these ropes. I can bend forward enough to retrieve it with my teeth. Her face flamed. Seriously? Look, Chloe, we don't have much time. Things are going to get ugly fast. These guys have no intention of letting us go. Her face went ashen. I figured that, she said quietly. Hurry, there's no time to lose. Chapter 28 The coast is clear. You can come out, Asa said, speaking to him in Hawaiian pidgin. Even though he'd grown up in Salt Lake, Asa clung tightly to his Hawaiian roots. His voice was steady and controlled, taking Hank back to the many jobs they'd done in the past. Like old times, brah. Asa said with a low chuckle, as if reading his mind. I'm glad you're with me on this one. Hank slipped his backpack on his shoulder and then pulled his black mask over his face. Ya yeah, know I'm glad to help. Small kind. Because Hank was supposedly part of a catering group, he'd been forced to keep his tool set light, only bringing the items he absolutely needed. His pulse went into overdrive as he loaded the trank gun. An image of Chloe went through his mind, sending a clutch of anxiety over him. Had Garrett been able to rescue her? He'd texted him earlier but had gotten no response. What if something had gone wrong? What if Chloe were hurt? Or worse, the fear that slithered over him was so intense that it was nearly debilitating. Then he thought about Sam, 
An intense hatred burned through him, giving him the stamina he needed to forge on. All righty, brah. Time to do the job. I got the cameras running on loop, but you need to hurry. Right, I'm on it. Hank's senses went into full alert as he forced himself to concentrate on the job, blocking out everything else. One wrong move could blow the entire thing. He opened the door and looked both ways before stealthily making his way toward the safe, which was located in the study. According to the blueprints, the study was on the main level and adjacent to the control room, which housed the security cameras. That meant he would have to trank four guards before they could alert anyone that he was here. Asa assured him that the tranks he designed would knock out the guards on impact. Hank could only hope that he was right. Tranks were finicky, and you never knew for sure how a person would react to them. His greatest fear was that it might take a long time for the drug to take effect, or that it might not work at all. He pushed the negative thoughts aside, knowing he would simply have to trust that Asa knew what he was doing. He was solely dependent on Asa for this portion of the job because he would have to act as Hank's eyes and ears alerting him to the location of the guards as well as the other occupants in the home. Thankfully, the bedrooms were upstairs. He could only hope that Gunther and his family remained asleep. How does it look? He whispered, making his way up the stairs. Just as we thought, brah, two guards by the control room and two by the safe. His voice became animated. Wait, hold it. Hank paused, his heart hammering in his chest. A rivulet of sweat rolled between his shoulder blades, and he had the feeling that the empty space was closing in around him. One of the guards is leaving the control room. He's headed your direction. Had they somehow realized he was here? Hot prickles covered him as he clutched the gun. He was out of practice, way too nervous. Clean living had made him soft. He took a deep breath, trying to regulate his breathing. He had to get a grip become the level-headed thief once more. Where is he? He growled, stealing himself for the confrontation. Get ready, he's coming. Fifty feet away. Forty. Hank's muscles went taut. Hold it, false alarm. He turned the other direction, he said with a shaky laugh. Relief poured over Hank, making him feel weak. He's in the kitchen, getting a drink of water. Stay where you are, let's see what he does. Okay, he's going back to the control room. You'll be able to train them both at once. When Hank reached the control room, he paused outside the door listening. They're at computers, back to the door. Open the door and do it quickly. Any noise and the guards in the next room will hear it. You sure these tranks will work? There was the slightest hesitation confirming Hank's worst fear. Then Asa let out a nervous laugh. Yeah, bra. I'm about 80% sure. You know how this works. Nothing is guaranteed. Great, he muttered gloomily, just like old times. He closed his eyes and offered up a silent prayer for help. It seemed crazy to think he was praying for help on a heist, but Chloe's life was at stake. Everything depended on him pulling off this job. A calm feeling flowed through him as he put his hand on the knob and turned it. The guard on the left glanced back as he stepped in. The man's eyes widened as he moved to react. But Hank tranked him in the neck. Hank was able to get the second guard before he fully turned around. He watched them carefully if he needed to shoot them again. But they fell to the floor with loud thuds. For a second, Hank feared the guards in the next room would hear the noise. See, I told ya it would work. You still got it, brah, Asa said, a touch of admiration in his voice. Like watching a dancer in perfect rhythm. Now for the other two. They are sitting on the couch watching TV. I suggest shooting the big one on the left with two tranks. Just in case. Cool precision took over as Hank repeated the process once more, tranking both guards with little effort. He breathed a sigh of relief. The hard part was over. Now came the part he enjoyed. Adrenaline surged through him as he stood in front of the safe. While he didn't miss most aspects of his life as a criminal, he missed this. He missed the all-consuming intoxication that flowed through him like a drug as he pitted his intelligence against the safe, doing something that few others in the world could. Pete was dead on about the make and model of the safe. It was constructed of steel with a solid steel door that was an inch thick. Even though they weren't discernible to the eye, he knew the safe also contained deadbolt locks, deep in the body, which prevented the door from being removed during a forced entry attempt. The safe was virtually impenetrable. He smiled. Impenetrable if one were attempting to use brute force. 
His method wouldn't put a single scratch on the safe. By the time he was done, she would open herself up to him of her own accord. He removed the amplifier microphone from the backpack and placed it near the dial. Then he grabbed the industrial marker he would use to write down the numbers. He closed his eyes for a second and cleared his mind. Ever so carefully, he began turning the dial, craning his ears for those distinctive clicks that would let him know that the inner mechanisms were engaging. He felt the sensation of being suspended in space where he and the safe were the only two items that existed. Six minutes later, he held his breath as he turned the handle. The safe opened like clockwork. Only then did Hank feel the after-effect of his nerves in the slight shaking of his hands as he scooped the jewels out of the safe. There were also stacks of bills, but he left those. He had no intention of giving Sam anything except the precise items he was supposed to deliver. Normally, he would deposit the jewels into his pack and make a hasty exit, but there was one thing he needed to do first. You got to get out of there. The guards won't stay asleep much longer, Asa said anxiously. Just transferring the jewels to the logo bag. Gotcha. Five minutes later, Hank had made it out of the mansion. The two guards keeping watch outside were oblivious as he walked within 20 feet of them. He made his way through the trees and to the rendezvous point where Asa was waiting to pick him up. Even in the near darkness, he could see the exhilaration brimming in Asa's black eyes. You did it, brah. There was a fevered excitement in his voice. Hank knew it well, having experienced it many times before. Asa was experiencing the euphoria that came from doing the seemingly impossible. All Hank could feel was relief that the heist was complete and dread over what would come next. Hank looked Asa in the eye. I couldn't have done it without you. I owe you a great debt, my friend. Uncomfortable with the praise, Asa brushed it off with a casual smile. Small kind. He pushed back a chunk of black hair that had fallen over his eye. That's what friends are for. You would do the same for me. He paused. I hope your girl's okay. Yeah, me too. He still hadn't heard from Garrett. He reached for his phone and sent him another text before turning his attention back to Asa. You sure the trackers will work? Asa smiled. About 80%. Hank shook his head and chuckled. Sounds about right. A grave look came over his face. This thing with Sam is going to get much worse before it gets better. I'll need you to help me see this through. But once it's over, you'll need to lay low for a while. Avoid him and the police. I hear ya. He flashed a sideways smile. They'll never find me, brah. I'm like a ghost. Yeah, you are always the real ghost thief. The master pulling the strings. There was a lull in the conversation until Hank spoke. About that other thing we talked about. I'll take care of it. You have my word. He gave Hank a probing look. This really is it then, your last job. There was a note of sadness in his voice. Yeah, I'm afraid so. He shook his head. You really are the best man. The best I ever worked with. He cleared his throat to mask his emotion. The best friend I ever had. He clasped Hank's hand in a tight grip. If you ever need me. The same goes for me. Hank let out a heavy sigh. Let's finish this thing, shall we? The air seemed to hold its breath as V and Bill stepped into the room. V was talking on the phone. Do you see him? Very good. Keep an eye out for anything unusual. Don't underestimate Hank. After he hands over the jewels, you are to leave him unharmed. There was a dangerous edge to her voice. I mean that, Sam. I need him for future jobs. She ended the call. Garrett let out a derisive chuckle. Sam really is a lughead if he believes that. Any fool can see you're still in love with my brother. A sneer twisted over her beautiful face. Not jealous, are you? Poor Garrett, she purred, always losing out to your big brother. She tilted her head. You just don't get it, do you? Looks will only take you so far. Eventually, you have to offer a girl something more than a pretty face. He grunted in amusement. You know that better than anyone. Didn't take you long for Hank to see past your pretty face, did it, V? Annoyance brimmed in her eyes. I don't have time for your silly games. She turned to Bill. Dial Hank's number and put the phone to his mouth. Put it on speaker. She glared at Garrett. You will do exactly as I say, or she gets it. Tears sprang to Chloe's eyes as V put a gun to her head. Garrett clenched his jaw. I understand. 
a look passed between Chloe and him, and he offered her a nod of encouragement. V let out a sarcastic chuckle. How sweet. The phone rang only once before Hank answered. Hello? Hey, Garrett said, swallowing hard. Were you able to get her? The anxiety in Hank's voice nearly carved out Garrett's heart as he shot V a look of pure hatred. She gave him a warning look. Were you able to rescue Chloe? Hank repeated. Yeah, I got her. She's safe. Really? That's great. The relief in his voice made the situation all the more painful. Yeah, Garrett continued. She's perfectly fine. There was the slightest hesitation. So she's fine? Yep. I promise on our dearly departed mother's pine box. A peculiar light came into Garrett's eyes as he locked with V's. In fact, from this view, I'd say your girl is looking exceedingly fine. He paused long enough to note the fury in V's face before continuing. Of course, a good drink of water might help improve the situation. Garrett could tell from the death glare V was giving him that it would only be a matter of seconds before she combusted into a ball of big hair and red fingernails. Gotta go, bro. Good luck on the job. Bill ended the call and then punched Garrett hard in the stomach. He doubled over, gasping for breath. You really are a pathetic weasel, V snared. If I didn't need you as insurance, I would kill you right now. She pursed her full lips and looked thoughtfully at Chloe. You, on the other hand, have outlived your usefulness. Chloe drew in a ragged breath as V continued. You simply made the mistake of falling in love with the wrong man. Nothing personal. Just business. She said with a flip of her hair, but the malicious look in her eyes said otherwise. She looked at Bill. You know the plan. Bill untied Chloe's wrists and ankles and heaved her to her feet. Where are you taking me? She said hoarsely. Leave her alone. Garrett yelled. Stop! Chloe started crying and fighting against Bill, but her efforts had about as much effect as a fly trying to take on a raging bull. He tied a gag around her mouth and tossed her over his shoulder, carrying her from the room. V followed behind them. When she got to the door, she gave Garrett a parting glance. Don't worry, handsome. I'll be back to retrieve you later. Bill's brother, Nolan, will keep a good eye on you. You won't get away with this, Garrett yelled. She gave him a cruel smile. I already have. Hank swore under his breath and clenched his fists. Did you get all of that, Asa? He said into the mouthpiece. Yep, I'm running it through the software now to try and find a connection. From the time they were kids, he and Garrett had devised codes that allowed them to talk in secret. Had Garrett sworn to him that he'd rescued Chloe, he would have known he'd been successful. But because he used the word promise, Hank knew he'd failed. Also, he said that Chloe was fine. The Italian Job was one of his and Garrett's favorite movies. They especially loved the part where fine stood for freaked out, insecure, neurotic, and emotional. He didn't know what the other words meant, or if they meant anything. Hopefully, Asa would be able to come up with something. Sam's car pulled into the parking lot, and he got out of the car. From what Hank could tell, he looked to be alone. Hank stepped out of the SUV, holding the bag of jewels in his hand. Where's Chloe? Sam looked surprised. I figured Garrett would have called you by now. He took her. How easily the lie flowed from Sam's lips. Hank's eyes narrowed. Revulsion rose like bile in his throat as he looked at this worthless piece of scum standing in front of him. But in case you get any ideas about taking the jewels and running or calling the police, I have a guy that will kill Glory on my command. It was all Hank could do to maintain his composure. If you hurt Glory, I swear I'll kill you. Sam held up his hands. Nobody has to get hurt. Lori doesn't even realize the guy's outside her house, and she won't as long as you follow my instructions to the letter. Hand over the bag. Hank just stood there glaring at Sam. I said hand over the bag. Reluctantly, Hank held out his arm. Sam snatched the bag from him and looked inside it. A triumphant smile spread over his face. It seems I get the jewels and the girl. It's been a pleasure doing business with you. He winked. We'll be in touch. He got in his car and peeled off. Hank got back into his SUV. Any luck? Yeah, I think I may have something, Asa said. Are you familiar with Pineview Reservoir near Ogden? 
It all came together in a hard realization that nearly took Hank's breath away. He pulled out his phone. Detective Flores, all went according to plan. I just handed off the jewels. The tracker is on the bag. I have reason to believe they're taking Chloe to Pineview Reservoir. Contact the local authorities. Hurry! Chapter 29 My stomach! Garrett moaned. Oh! He wailed loudly. Help! A younger version of Bill stepped into the room. What's the trouble? He asked suspiciously, pointing a gun at Garrett. I'm sick. I need to go to the bathroom. He grunted. V said you might try something. She said to keep you tied up no matter what. Garrett doubled over in pain. I can't breathe. It hurts so bad. Please, keep my hands tied. Just let me go to the bathroom. He began moaning again. Nolan watched him for a couple of minutes until Garrett began convulsing. Okay. Nolan approached him cautiously and began untying his feet. When Garrett made a gagging sound, Nolan wrinkled his nose in disgust and averted his face. Hey, don't vomit on me. Garrett began coughing as he arose to his feet. Then he stumbled. When Nolan went to catch him, Garrett rammed into him, knocking him back, where he landed on the floor with a sickening thud. The gun fell to the ground. In a flash, Garrett was on top of the startled man and holding a knife to his throat. He jabbed the tip into the man's meaty flesh. I need my phone. A merciless look came into his eyes. Now! Chloe was in the back seat of the car. It was rolling off a steep embankment. She felt herself falling and then heard a loud crash. The car bounced weightlessly like a toy boat in a bathtub. A suffocating panic rose in her throat as she realized what was happening. The car had gone into the water. Water was gushing in around her. She tried to scream, but the gag was still in her mouth. She fought against the ropes that held her hands fast. Horror filled her breast as Lila's warning came rushing back. She was going to die. It was too dark to see, but the cold water was settling around her. Her body began shivering uncontrollably as she sat up and lifted her head to the ceiling in order to capture as much blessed air as she could. The water was up to her neck. Terror clawed over her. She began sobbing in ragged gulps. Her mother's words came rushing back. Pray. The thought kept ricocheting through her mind, growing until it consumed every part of her. She needed to pray. Dear Heavenly Father, please help me. Forgive me for being so stubborn. Please be with me. Help me. No sooner had she thought the words than an indescribable feeling of peace settled over her. The coldness faded, and she felt the warmth of being wrapped in loving arms. Was this what it was like to die? An image of her parents floated in front of her. She thought of Hank and all of the love she felt for him. She fought as the water lifted over her head. Then she saw Dan holding out his hand to her. Two days later, when Hank opened the front door to his condo, V rushed into his arms. She buried her head in his chest and erupted into tears. Hank just stood there and let her cry. When all of the tears were spent, she pulled away embarrassed. I'm sorry, she sniffled. Thanks for letting me come over. You sounded so distraught when you called that I figured it was important. It was. Can I sit down? He nodded. Sure. When they sat down on the sofa, she scooted close to him and put a comforting hand on his leg. He got a good look at her then. Her left eye was black, her lower lip swollen and cut. His jaw tightened. What happened to you? It was Sam. Tears flowed down her cheeks as her solemn eyes met his. I'm so sorry. I had no idea what Sam was doing. She shuddered. What he was capable of. I had no idea he kidnapped Chloe and forced you to do that job. The corners of his mouth went down into a frown. How did you find out? I heard the news report that she was missing. And then I went to the warehouse where Sam conducted his business. I came across Chloe's purse. Her voice trembled as her eyes filled with remorse. It was horrible, she whispered. We had words. Sam accused me of loving you. She gave him an anguished look. I tried to tell him that I loved him, but he wouldn't listen. In a fit of rage, he turned the gun on himself. 
She put a shaky hand to her mouth. I, I'll never. Her voice caught, and she tried again. I'll never forgive myself for what happened. I'm sorry, he finally said. Me too. Were the jewels there? Her eyes grew large as a perplexed expression came over her face. The jewels? Yes, I gave them to Sam at the exchange. He told me that if I didn't hand over the jewels, he would go after Glory. His face went rigid. What kind of monster threatens to take the life of an old woman? A look of indignation came over her. That's horrible. There was a sight of Sam I never knew. It was right in front of me, but I couldn't see it. Hank studied her, an enigmatic expression on his face. Yes, I know what you mean. Silence settled between them. She touched his face, her eyes going soft. Hank, I'm so sorry about everything. I appreciate that, he said tersely. Any word on Chloe? Have they found her? When Hank remained quiet, she continued. I want you to know that no matter what happens, I'll be there for you. Her voice broke. I know you loved her, and that it will take time. Yes, I do love her. Chloe's the love of my life. She's everything I ever wanted and more. He noticed the fury that sparked in V's eyes. I don't know what I would do if I ever lost her. I'm sorry, she said mechanically. I know you loved her, but sooner or later, you'll have to face the fact that she's gone. There was a definite edge to her voice, and her lips had formed a tight white line. Let me help you through this, she urged. I'm right here. He looked thoughtful. What if I told you that Chloe is alive? That she has been found? Her jaw went slack. What would you say about that? He pressed. I would say that's a good thing. Suspicion clouded her eyes. Has she been found? Yes, V, she has. He noticed that her hands had started to shake, this time for real. Chloe is alive and she's doing well. What if I also told you that I was working with the police the entire time? That I put a tracker on the jewels? Her face paled as the beautiful mask slipped away, and he saw her for what she really was, conniving and ruthless. How long have you known? she snapped. Garrett told me, and then Chloe confirmed it. Of course, getting Nolan's cooperation was the icing on the cake. Her face fell, and then it went white with anger. His wife had a family emergency in Baltimore. That's what Nolan told me. Hank looked her in the eye. It bites to be betrayed, doesn't it? You should be more careful who you trust. Your boy sang like a canary, giving the police more information than they ever hoped to get. Rage boiled in her eyes as she stood. I should have put a bullet in Garrett when I had the chance. She retrieved her gun from her purse and aimed it at Hank. We could have been so good together. I'm sorry it had to end this way. She hesitated. I really do love you. I always have. She finished sadly. You don't know the meaning of the word love. He fired back. Goodbye, Hank. I wouldn't do that if I were you. She jerked around as three police officers stepped out of the adjoining room, each pointing a gun at her. It's over, V. Hank's voice sounded as weary as he felt. The whole scene made him sick to his stomach, and he wanted nothing more than to be done. Tears misted her eyes. How could you? She dropped the gun to her side as the officers tackled her to the ground where they cuffed her and began reading her rights. She glowered at Hank. This isn't over. He merely shook his head and dismissed her. You are hereby charged with the murder of Sam Loudon and the kidnapping attempt murder of Chloe Kensley. You have the right to remain silent. When the officers led V out, Detective Jared Flores lingered behind. Well done, he said. The jewels have been traced to a storage facility in Ogden belonging to V. That was a stroke of brilliance to add the logo of the jewelry house onto the bag. V assumed you simply left the jewels in the bag they were already in. Hank gave him a terse nod and rubbed his aching neck. I'm ready to put this whole sordid mess behind me. Of course, there is still the business of your brother. Hank cocked his eyebrow. What about my brother? Any word from him? I told you. The last I heard from him was when he escaped from the warehouse and told me where they were taking Chloe. He gave him a meaningful look. He saved her life. 
That should count for something. I see. You know, when you called me and told me he was still alive and responsible for the ghost thefts, I got the impression that you were going to help me apprehend him. Amusement flittered over Hank's face. Now, detective, he drawled. You can't expect me to do everything for you. I gave you a tip. It's up to you to follow it. That is what they pay you for. He scowled. Don't push me. I'm not sure what you're getting at, he said innocently. Getting back to the heist, the way you hacked into the security system. That took some major know-how, and those tranks were not the -the run-of-the-mill variety that you can purchase at the sportsman's store. They were designed by an expert. A challenge sparked in his eyes. Who's your right-hand man? Hank flashed an easy smile. You know my reputation better than anybody, detective. I work alone. He shrugged. Let me clarify that. I used to work alone. A hopeful expression came over Jared's face. It was dashed when Hank spoke his next words. I'm a changed man. I'm no longer a thief. I've cleaned up my act. His jaw went firm. And I intend to keep it that way. Jared chuckled dryly, but there was a look of admiration in his eyes. I'll find out your secrets, he pointed, one way or another. I'll eventually find out. The lure of the chase is too great to resist, even for you. Hank laughed. I do like you, detective. In another life, we could have been friends. He glanced at the clock on the wall. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have somewhere I need to be. Hank's nerves were jumping like a live wire as he balanced the large bouquet of red roses in one hand and punched the doorbell with the other. He laughed inwardly. He was more nervous about meeting Chloe's parents than he'd ever been about cracking a safe. The door opened, and there stood Darby. She gave him a toothy grin as she reached for the roses. For me? You shouldn't have. Come in, she said, winking. There are some people here who are dying to meet you. She leaned in and whispered. Word to the wise. Mind your P's and Q's around Chloe's mom. Underneath that southern bell sweetness lies a real tiger. But her dad's nice. Hank stepped into the room. Chloe's mom and dad had been sitting on the couch. They stood in unison. The first thought that came to his mind was that Chloe was a mixture of both her parents. Her mother's hair was the same color as Chloe's, but short and rounded above the ears. She had the same stubborn chin and was chewing on her bottom lip the way Chloe did when she was nervous. Chloe's dad was tall and lean and had kind eyes like Chloe. Chloe's mom was the first to step forward and extend her hand. He could tell from the brazen way she was eyeing him up and down that Darby was right on the money. She was a force to be reckoned with. Hello, I'm Hank. Yes, I've heard all about you, she said dryly in that soft southern accent that was reminiscent of Chloe. He then shook hands with Chloe's dad. Hello, Mr. Kinsley. Brian, call me Brian. My wife's name is Naomi. They were every bit as cultured and classy as he'd pictured them. They sat down and began to chit-chat about the weather and every other inconsequential thing known to man until Hank couldn't take it anymore. Was this how Southerners fought their battles? By small-talking people to death. He gave them a direct look. I know you know all about my past. Yes, Noemi said stiffly, adjusting her blouse. He let out a breath. I want you to know how truly sorry I am for all of the pain and suffering that I put you through. Tears gathered in Naomi's eyes, and Brian took her hand in his. The gesture was simple, but it evoked a tender emotion in Hank. These were people who cared deeply about their daughter and wanted the best for her. He continued, I know there's nothing I can say that will erase all that has happened, but you need to know that I love your daughter. His eyes went moist. I love her more than anything, and I'll spend the rest of my life trying to prove that to her and to you. Tears began dribbling down Naomi's cheeks as she nodded. Thank you, Brian said gruffly. Hank looked up and Chloe stepped into the room. She was dressed simply in jeans and a red sweater, and was so stunning that she nearly took his breath away. She gave him a tentative smile as she looked back and forth between him and her parents. Hey! She began chewing on her lower lip. I see y'all have met each other. Her voice lagged as she twirled a lock of hair around her finger. Before he had time to process what was happening, he was on his feet. He rushed to her side and gathered her in his arms. He buried his lips in her hair, breathing in the scent of her. I love you so much. 
He'd not gotten to spend more than two minutes with her since she was rescued, and it was driving him berserk. She looked up at him in surprise. I love you too. He cupped her face and was going to kiss her when her face went cherry red. She pulled back and cut her eyes at her parents. Maybe we should take this up later, when it's just us. It was Hank's turn to be embarrassed. He rubbed his neck. Oh, yeah. He gave her parents a sheepish look. Sorry. Naomi nervously cleared her throat and began fluffing her hair. A smile tugged at Brian's lips. It's obvious that you love our daughter. He motioned. Perhaps we should sit down and discuss your intentions. Chloe's jaw dropped. Dad! Hank laughed and reached for Chloe's hand and linked his fingers through hers. Your dad's right. It's time that I made my intentions clear. Let's talk about it. Long after everyone else went to bed, Chloe and Hank were sitting on the swing in Lila's backyard. Hank had his arm around her, and she was snuggling into the curve of his shoulder. The rhythmic creaking of the swing seemed to be playing against the steady beating of her heart. Well, it didn't take you long to have my parents eating out of the palm of your hand. He chuckled. I don't know about that. Your mom's still not sure, but at least she's giving me the benefit of the doubt. Chloe laughed. Yeah, she's a tough one, for sure. She smiled. But she likes you. I can tell. Her mind flittered over the events of the past two days. Something miraculous had happened to her, and she needed to tell Hank about it. She only hoped he would understand. She swallowed hard. Hank, there's something I need to tell you. He looked at her. Sure. Whatever it is, you can tell me. The night when I went into the water. She saw his jaw clench and a tortured look came into his eyes. I thought I was going to lose you. He hugged her tighter. Me too. Tears pressed against her eyes and she blinked to keep them at bay. I thought I was going to die. She shivered as her mind went back to the black night that had nearly destroyed her. The water was coming in and there was nothing I could do except pray. I started praying and this warm feeling came over me. It was like I could feel protective arms being wrapped around me. It's been a long time since I prayed. All of this time, I was so angry about everything that had happened to me that I thought God had forgotten me. God never forgets, Hank said tenderly. She nodded. I know, I realized that in the car. He was there with me the instant I needed him. All this time, I'm the one that had turned away from him. Hank nodded. She looked deep into his eyes. There's more. In the car. I couldn't breathe. And then I blacked out. She hesitated, not sure how to continue. But he gave her an encouraging look. And then I saw Dan. She saw doubt creep into his eyes. She forced the words out of her mouth. I don't know how, but Dan was with me in the car. Her mouth went dry. I know this sounds impossible, but I believe he saved me. Time seemed to stand still, and then he nodded, his eyes taking on a faraway look. The police officers were searching for you, because Garrett told them where they were taking you. It's a big reservoir. They didn't know where to look. You could have been anywhere. The officers said they heard a man's voice calling for help, and then they found you on the shore. They couldn't explain it. You were unconscious so it couldn't have been you who were calling for help. They never found the man, but the officer swore they heard him. My hands and feet were bound. There was no way I could have escaped from that car on my own. Hank's eyes locked with hers, and she saw the thing she'd craved most, understanding. I believe you, he finally said. Do you? She couldn't stop the tears from flowing down her cheeks. It's the only thing that makes sense. He thought for a moment. That time you told me you were seeing your dead fiancé, you were serious, weren't you? Yes, she admitted quietly. Do you still have feelings for him? Her eyes went wide. Dan? He nodded, his jaw going tense. She laughed, thinking how crazy it was that Hank was worried about her affections for a dead guy. No, not the way I feel for you. I love you, Hank Singleton, she said fiercely. He looked relieved. I love you too. This whole thing, when I kept seeing Dan, 
I assumed it was because a part of me couldn't let him go, but I realized in the car that it was Dan who couldn't let go. That's why he kept coming to me. He was trying to make amends for what he'd done. I felt that in the car. He took her hand in his. Well, he certainly made his amends, and then some. I will forever be in his debt. He brought you back for me. A pained look came into his eyes. I thought I'd lost you. Life has given us a second chance. The corners of his lips lifted in a smile. And I plan to take full advantage of that chance. She thought of something else. Have you heard from Garrett? No, I don't expect to. You helped him disappear, didn't you? Conflicting emotions battled in his eyes. Does that make me a terrible person? No, it makes you a good brother. I'm glad you did it. Garrett was a lifesaver. Her voice trembled with emotion. I don't know what I would have done without him in the warehouse. Despite his obvious faults, he's a good man and I wish him every happiness. He touched her arm. You are everything to me, he murmured. He began lightly tracing her collarbone with the tip of his finger. A tingle ran down her spine as her breath came faster. He gave her that crooked smile that made her go weak in the knees, and then his lips came down on hers, igniting a flame that coursed through her body, turning her bones to mush. When they pulled away, they were both breathing hard. Something caught the corner of her eye, and she saw Dan standing at the corner of Lila's house. She blinked, and then he was gone. Even though she'd only caught a glimpse, she had the distinct impression that he was smiling. And she knew, in some inexplicable way that was impossible to put into words, that she would never see him again. A look of concern crossed Hank's features. Are you okay? She gave him a tender smile, letting herself get lost in those fathomless turquoise eyes. Yes, everything is great. Thanks for listening to Promise Me Love. If you haven't already, make sure to press that like button and subscribe to my channel.